This is Audible. The Failed Coward, Adrian's Undead Diary, Book 4, Volume 4. Written by Chris Philbrook. Narrated by James Foster. March 2011. Continued. March 5th. We are still alive, all of us, mercifully. I wasn't able to write last night, and to be honest, I'm writing this entry on a tiny amount of borrowed time. It occurs to me that it is Saturday night. If the world hadn't fallen apart in June, I wonder what I'd be doing right now instead of fighting off what appears to be an unending siege of the fucking living dead. I wonder what Cassie and I would be doing. She's dead. I think we've proven that. At least, I think I've proven that to myself. I haven't dreamt of her or anyone else since that night. Probably because I haven't really slept at all since then. We are benefiting from our marginal success in fending off the zombies. Oddly enough. Christ, I'm tired. I need to keep this short, or take frequent breaks to go shoot more of them. The entire night of the... Third? Whenever my last entry was, we sat awake in the upstairs rooms watching the crowd build and build until every single open yard of space had at least one zombie in it. There had to be five hundred of them. Just as I said before, there was... AFK. Banging on the front door again. One of them managed to climb over the mound of bodies and tumble down the pile against the front door. I had to lean out the second-floor window with the twenty-two pistol to kill it. Thankfully, we have an abundance of twenty-two LR ammo. We desperately need another damn twenty-two weapon, though. The way we're pumping rounds through the two we have, and the barrels are not going to last if we make it through this. <sighs> I'm having a hard time making heads or tails of everything right now. Based on what Patty, Abby, and I talked about the other night, I know Cassie is dead. Dead, but not gone, apparently. I haven't revisited my writings about my dreams since I wrote them. I get the feeling a lot of emotion will hit me like a truck, and I need to stay sharp until we get through this, if we get through this. Yesterday, we made the decision to reinforce all the windows and doors with the wood I had in the basement. There wasn't much raw material available, but we had a few two-by-fours and one sheet of plywood, and using a kitchen knife with a serrated edge, we managed to quietly score the sheet enough to snap it into smaller sheets to cover the areas we felt were most likely to get hit hard. It was a good decision. The windows in the living room downstairs were broken this morning when the undead reached them. The bodies are stacked high enough now outside that a few of them have managed to walk across the top of the pile and get to the windows. I never accounted for bodies being stacked that high. I guess that was a mistake on my part. This is a nightmare, Mr. Journal. It is the worst thing you can imagine to watch them come, one after another, over and over, reaching and clawing and scratching. They're trying to get inside to kill us, and either we will have enough bullets or we won't. I hope running away is an option if that happens. I think we have enough bullets to last, though. I hope that doesn't turn into another mistake on my part. The crowd is much thinner outside right now, but that's not what worries me most at the moment. Dimly inside, I have the strong feeling we will survive this. I don't think this... No, that's not what I'm trying to say. I feel like this was not an attempt on our lives, this siege. I know, that might sound stupid. They certainly are trying to kill us in here. Gunshot. AFK. Patty shot one trying to climb the deck on the side of the hall. I haven't seen them try to climb before. I hope that's not a new thing they're going to start. Fuck that noise. At any rate, what I'm trying to say is, there's a, I don't know, a feeling about this that I can't shake. I just get the impression that if these things really wanted in to kill us, they would have done it already. Why would they wait for us to fire on them before rushing the building? Why are they all holding books? Why did it take them this long to get here? Why March 3rd? 
Wait a second. January, February, March. At 3 a.m. on the third night of the third month, I have a dream of three people sitting in a white room. I'm suddenly more afraid of that train of thought than I am of the undead outside. Someone or something is trying to send us a message. I need to get through this and figure out what that message is, or the next time the undead come, I get the distinct impression they are not going to wait for us to fire on them first, and they will get in here. I'm reminded suddenly of that zombie with the watch. Tap, tap, tap. Three taps. Motherfucker. Mike from Westfield will be here on the 7th. We need to get this handled before his people drive onto campus and get caught up in what's happening. Gilbert is at his house being as quiet as possible. He said over the radio that there are just a few outside his house, but they're standing outside, almost as if they're keeping guard on him. He told me through the windows he can see that there's one or two of them on each side of his house, like they're keeping him inside, focusing on us here. That's not creepy or anything. More fucking gunshots from downstairs. I gotta go. Adrian. March 7th. Operation Yank Our Asses Out of the Fire has been largely completed. I just woke up from the first decent sleep I've gotten in what feels like an eternity. I'm scared to sleep now. Genuinely apprehensive about putting head to pillow. Ever since the third in my white room dream, followed by the fucking onslaught we've had here. I don't know, Mr. Journal. It's like there's no forgetting about what I saw and what's happened. Things are different today. People are looking at me strange. Maybe it's all in my head, and I'm just hallucinating that they're looking at me strange. I can't say for sure. I guess it doesn't matter in the short term. Where to start? So much bullshit has gone down here, it's hard to find a single moment or event to start with. I mean, oh, fuck it. Where did I leave off last? I think it was late evening on the 5th? Yeah, so... We had another surge right after I hit save and shut the laptop. The entirety of the day and evening of the 4th, we were at the windows of the second floor firing down into the crowd of undead pressing into Hall E more or less non-stop. Ironically, they didn't start attacking us initially until we started firing on them, which was odd, to say the least. We know they saw us through the window, so it's not like they didn't know we were in here. Almost like they were giving us time to prepare or something. Definitely fucking odd. I may or may not have said already that we formulated a battle plan that revolved around using the twenty two caliber weapons primarily. We've got an abundance of that ammunition here, and well, it made sense to use as much of that as possible before we switch to anything else. All we have for twenty two weapons right now are the Browning pistol and the TAC-22. We had some issues when we poured it on, too, not surprisingly. Firing over three or four hundred rounds in any situation is pretty bad for a gun. Wear and tear, residue builds up, the barrel and internal shit gets really hot and can warp. There's just a plethora of things that can go wrong. Military-grade weaponry is designed for hard use, but we're sorely lacking in that kind of stuff. Two hours into our Waco-style standoff with the Horde, we started having jams. Stovepipes mostly with the pistol, but not long after, the rifle started to fail. These guns are simply not designed for that volume of fire. We switched out once it was clear the guns needed to be cleaned and given a rest. Now, in my infinite wisdom, I still had not taught the girls how to fully break them down and clean them, so we wound up misfiring a lot of rounds until we got new weapons to the windows to keep the rate of fire up. Gilbert kept radioing us every five minutes, asking how we were doing, and as we could, we kept him up to date. Our second best option for ammo was the M15 and the crate of 556 we'd just bartered for. However, none of the girls had fired the M15, which meant I had to clean the guns and do all the shooting myself, which wasn't the best idea. We opted for Abby to go to town with the Beretta, firing very slowly and limiting her to 30 shots. That gave me enough time to get the 22 rifle clean for Patty and get her back in the fight. I cleaned the 22 pistol while Abby waited and and I gave it to her. 
I let the two women resume our firepower session, and I got us fresh drinks and food so we could keep up the barrage. I also checked all the doors and windows on the first floor to ensure nothing had gotten inside, and we were good to go. That process went on for something like ten hours. Eventually, we had killed so many of them, the bodies were stacking up so high, the windows were in danger of being smashed, and then the zombies could find a way to get inside. About that same time, the number of zombies outside began to thin, but they kept coming in waves as more and more made their way across the bridge and into the center of campus. The thinner mass of undead meant we could rest some, though, and I let Patty take a break. Abby refused to leave me alone, That girl is a worker, Mr. Journal. There's just no fucking quit in her. I watched her that day and night as she fired her little pistol down into the crowd, and she's a machine. She lines up her shot, controls her breathing, and gently squeezes the round off, one after another. Textbook. If I had a camera, I could use her to teach other people how to shoot. It's crazy to think she was just a normal, nerdy high school girl a year ago. Today, she's a hardcore post-apocalyptic badass bitch with a snarky sense of humor. I'm smiling just writing it. I'm so fucking proud of her. We pissed through over a thousand rounds of twenty-two the past few days. I haven't done an official count since, but we were firing a lot of bullets. The weapon jams came and went, and got better when we cleaned the guns and gave them a break to cool down. Unfortunately, while the twenty twos were down resting, we switched to the M15 and the Ruger M77. We had a fair amount of two seventy kicking around, and with the additional range afforded by a scope, I was able to let Patty warm up to the M15, and I hammered down a handful of the undead farther out. We saved all the brass on the outside chance we find reloading gear. Sooner or later, we're bound to. Upside, killed a lot of fucking zombies— Downside, we pissed through all but five rounds of 270, and we burned up 300 or so rounds of the 556. This was such a bitch. I mean, I can't say I didn't expect us to have to deal with the undead, but not all at once, and not right here on campus. Well, good fortune Mike brought all that ammo for the trade. Wow, right? Either I've got a guardian angel, or the devil takes care of his own. Shrug. Where was I? So, yeah... The entirety of the past few days have been a shitstorm. The 4th, 5th, and 6th were all the same, waves and waves of the cocksuckers drawn in from the noise we were creating. We did notice some weird shit. Remember how I said they were all carrying books? Well, after we started firing into the huge crowd, they tossed the books and sort of returned to normal. None of the additional dead folks that came to campus had books— Just the first two or three hundred, or however many we had. Gilbert was never attacked. He also never attacked the undead near his house. Here's the weird part. The undead that were near his house never left when we started shooting, which just trashes the idea that they're all drawn to noise. I have no idea what to think about that. They were clearly watching him to make sure he didn't leave to interfere with what was going on here, which tells me... They are either far more intelligent than we've been giving them credit for, or someone, somewhere, somehow, is controlling them. Not fucking cool. Gilbert laid low with his AK and remained ready in the event we suddenly were overwhelmed. Fortunately, we never got to the point where running away was our only option. The door held and the barricades I built for the windows cracked, but held out until our reinforcements arrived. Speaking of which, this morning, a few hours after dawn rolled in, the campus apparently fully repopulated itself. A few hours prior to dawn, we declared a ceasefire because the campus had more or less been cleared out. We figured if we kept low and didn't show ourselves through the windows, we might get a few hours of rest. I'm happy to report we got about four hours of sleep. When I poked my head up high enough to look outside— there were at least another hundred undead moving about in the area of the campus. I had this odd feeling that I was watching hound dogs sniff out their prey. I was just busted and broken, because I knew we'd have to blow through a ton of ammo to get the damn campus clear, and I knew the Westfield folks were en route. We got Gilbert on the radio and went over what to do. We agreed that starting at about 11 a.m., we'd start calling for the Westfield folks over the radio. Our radios probably have a five-mile reach, or maybe more, so 
We hoped we'd get them and alert them to the situation before they just drove in and got mauled. Gilbert made a transmission every 30 seconds or so for about half an hour until Mike finally came back. I won't go into the whole conversation, but between all of us, we formulated a reasonable plan that wound up working out fairly good. Mike only came with one Humvee, but he had Gavin and another one of his soldiers, a kid named LaFrenz. All three had full combat loads in their M4s, which meant they had plenty of firepower. Despite a whole bunch of crossed fingers, the Westfield Armory had no up-armored Humvees with 50 cals in a turret, or M109 grenade launchers. Shit, that would have been sweet as hell. Nonetheless, the two vans were still obstructing the bridge, so driving onto campus was out of the question. We decided that it would be best to lure some of the zombies away and divide and conquer. Mike and company rolled into Gilbert's place, and the four men managed to wipe out all the undead up Auburn Lake Road and around Prospect Circle in just a few minutes. Apparently, there were very few still walking up the road. Gilbert loaded his old ass into the Humvee, and the men came down the remainder of Auburn Lake Road and stopped short of the bridge. They engaged the small number of undead on their side of the bridge and proceeded to light up the undead near admissions and the staff offices. Now, from our perspective, we saw the undead turn and start moving instantly. They immediately went to the source of the noise, and that was our cue to start shooting. Once the crowd was halfway to the Humvee or so, we started firing— and then the undead were lost as to what to do. Monkey in the middle. Half kept moving toward the other guys, and half stopped and came back towards us. The monkey in the middle tactic bought the soldiers and Gilbert about thirty extra seconds, and they piled into the Humvee and backed up fifty yards and out of our sight. They stopped and continued firing on the advancing crowd. They had to do a retreat like that two more times, and by then we had eliminated almost all of the zombies that had been surrounding Hall E. I radioed to them we were all clear and they could return, and after a handful of shots, they said they were returning. For the first time in... four days? Patty, Abby, and I left Hall E. We had to go out the side door where the deck was because the front fire door where Big Blue was stored had bodies piled up four feet deep. The smell outside was bizarre and horrible, to say the least. So much blood, gore, and brains and fucking nastiness. But the cold, wet weather puts a weird spin on it. It's like the smell is there, but it's faded or something. Not sure how to describe it. We moved through the campus, trying to see if any of the downed bodies were still alive. And once we'd taken care of everything still twitching, with bat and sword and halligan, by the way, we moved the vans out of the way and let Mike and company onto campus. As I was greeting them with giant hugs and handshakes, I noticed there were massive swaths of footprints through the snow on the frozen lake. It looked like they marched right down the embankment and across the ice, totally avoiding moving around the vans. Not that it was difficult, but it was single file to get past the vans on the bridge, and the ice became a zombie freeway. Fucking winter. And how did the fucking things figure out the difference between single file and open space? Shit, I hope they aren't getting smarter. How do dead things learn? Makes no sense. Well, I guess it makes no sense that the dead have come back to life. Priorities, Adrian. Once we exchanged greetings, we all took stock of the situation, and the place was a mess. Mike and his guys gave us a hand clearing out the bodies, and it took us all fucking afternoon straight to sundown to move them all back to staff housing. I was smarter this time and made sure to throw some of the wood we'd gathered for the wood stove in Hall A so the flames would stay up. We lit the fires using gas as a little kickstarter as the sun went down. The bodies are still burning, and thankfully the wind coming across the lake is moving away from us. Otherwise, the smell would be unbearable. Strangeness abounds. Not one zombie came up the road while we were getting everything done. You'd think we would have seen one or two, but nay. Not fucking one. Gilbert performed security for us while the rest of us threw up all over the place. It is vomit-inducing labor moving that many dead bodies. They're heavy as balls, for one, and the smell is nasty. But when you pick up a body that has a popped head and the brains slide out onto your boot, it's a pretty strong, rough image to choke down. I know I threw up twice, and I've got a cast-iron stomach. 
When we came back from lighting the fire, Gilbert offered to make us food, and the men from Westfield agreed that staying the night here would make the most amount of sense. I finally let them inside Hall E after all their help, and from what I saw, they could have given a shit at what was inside. Most of our food was on display, and they didn't seem to care. The guns are stored in a few different spots all over, so they didn't get an eye on the arsenal, but like I said, exhaustion plus stress plus a little vomit takes a lot out of you. We half-assed a meal and ate it in the living room and kitchen together. It was a sort of nice moment. We didn't talk much, but when we finally did, the news was interesting. Mike removed himself from the election in Westfield. He felt that it was important that there was a separation of military power and politics. He talked about it some, and it did make sense. It would have been easy for him, as the most martially skilled and socially connected guy there, to just take the damn school over and turn it into a military state. He felt a non-military person should be in charge. Therefore, Lisa Goldman won in a landslide. Chad ran for office and managed two votes, which meant someone other than him voted for him. That fact was not lost on Mike or I. Two snakes in the grass to watch out for. I'm happy hearing that Lisa won the election. When I met her, she was smart, funny, level-headed, well-educated, and struck me as a capable leader. What kind of scares me is she is really important to everyone. She's the most educated person when it comes to medical care, and if she decides she wants something done, she can simply refuse care to people to get her way. I, I don't think she's that kind of person, but... I've seen small amounts of power ruin otherwise normal folks before. Patty dragged Abby upstairs, and I'm fairly sure she put a padlock on her zipper somehow. I took a nap. I woke up. Mike was passed the hell out on the couch, and Gavin was in my recliner with Otis balanced precariously on the armrest. It didn't occur to me that I hadn't seen my cat in days. All the noise from the gunfire must have driven him into hiding— I feel bad now when I think about the fact I more or less forgot about him, but I guess I had more things on my mind. I waved to the friends who was awake and watching out the window and got something to eat. I shot the shit with him for a bit, and he seems nice. I think he was from the lieutenant's school, though. Very dry and very military-esque in his mannerisms. Kept calling me sir and stuff. Kind of funny. Like I said, he struck me as a good guy. I'd say he's about 25-ish five and a half feet, short brown hair, a reasonably normal fella. He's pockmarked, though. I suspect he had a bad case of acne in his teens. I left him downstairs to watch for more undead and came up here to write this, and here I am, writing. Before I came up for my nap earlier, I left it with Mike that we'd figure out a trade tomorrow, and he was in agreement. I know he said they wanted more water, and that we have. We desperately need nine millimeter now for Abby's Beretta. We're basically out. The ammo I left with the SIG would have come in handy. Next time we go to Westfield, I need to stop and pick up the shotgun and pistol I left there. I also need to get intelligent about finding a way to get more water moving back and forth so the trips are more worth it. At the rate we're going, it's almost a waste. I can't imagine ten gallons of water a week is really worth it for them. I bet they're melting a lot of snow to get enough water to survive— Otherwise, they'd be up Shit's Creek. We really need some larger-scale storage containers. What would rock would be a milk truck. I wonder if Lenny knows where we can find a milk truck, because diesel is a plenty right now, and that'd be an ass ton of water. We could fill that bitch once a month for them and let them offload it as needed, or into larger storage containers at the school. All this time shooting has sent my right ear back into the toilet. Can't hear for shit out of it. I wish I could sue these asshole zombies. I could get a fat settlement out of this. While I was going deaf, I also came up with a neat idea to get some gas. I want to talk to Mike and Gilbert about it first, but we might be able to get the gas out of the gas station a few miles away if my idea will work. I'll deal with those problems later, though. I'm far too goddamn tired to rack my brain for solutions to complex problems. I kind of wished I could make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich right now, I don't think Mike brought bread, otherwise he probably would have brought it in already. It's funny what you miss when the world goes to shit. Adrian Sweetest Amy
Amy pressed her head firmly back into the soft pillow as Jason gently eased his way inside her. Her whole body tingled as he began to thrust deeply into her with long, tender strokes. He started slowly at first, but when she unconsciously let a guttural moan slip out, his speed began to pick up instinctively. Despite being a great lover, Amy had broken up with Jason a few weeks ago anyway. He was only in her bed and inside her this morning because she had a moment of weakness and she hadn't gotten laid since their breakup. Jason rested his body gently on top of her, pushing his heavily muscled chest into her soft breasts as he continued to slide in and out. Awkwardly, he tried to force her into a passionate kiss, and she deftly avoided it by grabbing the back of his head and pulling his mouth down to her neck. She used her other hand to dig her nails into his ass and pull him into her vigorously. She caught a sudden whiff of his sweat, and her mind raced to darker and naughtier places. Amy wanted to get laid, not give him the impression she was in love with him. The faux passionate gesture caused him to pick up even more steam, and he began to drive his hips downward into her, sending her ass into the springs of the bed and her pussy closer to the edge of a climax. Ah yes, she thought. It was going to be well worth having let him in. Amy listened to Jason get dressed in her apartment bedroom with her eyes closed. She could sense the growing light of the late June morning through her eyelids. With a stretch that elicited a crack in the center of her back, she yawned loudly and opened her eyes to watch her ex-boyfriend put his uniform on. She was too late to see him shirtless, frankly, the only reason to watch him get dressed in her mind. But she did get to see him put his gun belt on. That also had some appeal. Strong man with a weapon? Sure, I'll have a bite of that. Jason was a patrol officer for the police in her small town. He hadn't been a cop long, but she'd heard from various sources he was popular with the other officers, and she knew he'd do well. He had a quiet confidence that was hard to miss. Despite being in his mid-twenties, and thus a few years younger than her, but she'd never admit that to anyone, and very attractive, he and his situation was too much for her to handle. The danger of living night to night waiting for the phone to ring with bad news about him wasn't the life she envisioned for herself. It didn't stop her from wanting him inside her every once in a while, though. She'd deal with the guilt of leading him on later. She really had to figure out a way to get laid without asking him over again. Other dicks in town needed to be made into a priority. It almost made her want to flirt with one of the seniors at the private school she worked at, She tingled and throbbed a little at the thought. Then her conscience flared and she bit her lip. No, Amy Gibson, bad girl. No boy toy students again from work. She laughed at herself in her head at her own absurdity. Something funny? Jason asked her quietly. What? Oh, no, just thinking to myself about work and stupid stuff. Sorry. Amy felt like an idiot for apparently laughing at herself out loud. Jason smiled at her and adjusted the holster on his hip. I gotta go back to the station. Chief said there's some weird shit going on, and he needs me to pull an extra shift today. He shrugged. I can use the money, that's for sure. Amy nodded, feigning interest and concern. Was that the call you got earlier? Well, be safe, Jason. Your mom will never forgive you if you got hurt. Yeah. Hey, um, when can I see you again? He sat on the edge of her bed and rested a hand softly on her thigh. Amy slowly and delicately removed his hand and sat it on the bed next to her. Look, Jason, this was fun, but you know we can't last doing anything more than this. You know, this. She gestured to the crumpled sheets with the moist spot in the center. Jason nodded knowingly. He looked a little hurt, and she felt the sharp pang of guilt hit her like she'd been stabbed with an icicle. Her face twisted slightly into a frown. I'm sorry. Jason stood up and took a deep breath to calm his emotions. He pinched the bridge of his nose and shook his head in thinly veiled frustration. After a second, he nodded several times, almost shaking off his feelings for her like they never existed in the first place. No, yeah, I I know what you mean. I get it. I'll get going, darling Amy. Have a great day at school. Obey the speed limit. Jason turned abruptly and left the small apartment bedroom. She heard the front door shut gently, and she realized with finality she'd hurt him for the last time. He wasn't even angry anymore. He was just gone. 
She shook her head at her own stupidity and got up to get dressed for work. Some days you should not get out of bed. June 23, 2010 was one of those days for poor Amy Gibson. The worse her day got, the more she realized she never should have answered Jason's midnight text either. Booty call failure. Come to think of it, her bad day started even before she got out of bed. Three orgasms notwithstanding, Amy still felt like a giant bag of douche for sleeping with him, then sending him away like he was a rental. Her entire day had been a fucking nightmare, and it proceeded to get worse when she got in the shower to get ready. Amy had fallen into the habit of listening to the morning radio shows in the shower to help her wake up. The idiots were always burping and farting and joking around, and their humor always kept her conscious long enough to wash and condition her auburn hair, the hair she could never, ever figure out what to do with. This morning, the radio shows had nothing but weird, horrible news from around the world. The normally outrageous morning show was subdued and serious, and that woke her up far more than their standard raucous behavior. They were reporting hundreds, if not thousands, of deaths worldwide due to random outbreaks of violence. They kept repeating over and over how scary and unnerving the videos rolling in were. Obviously, she didn't see them in the shower over the radio, but... The descriptions chilled her to the bone, even under the steaming spray of the shower head. The main radio host kept saying the attackers were zombies. Zombies. Straight out of a late-night horror movie. The hosts described their faces as passive, drained of life. They had strange white eyes, and they moved forward with limitless intensity, lashing out when they got close to the living. From the sounds of the radio hosts, Hollywood's worst nightmare was spreading across the globe, one shuffling undead foot after another. She hoped it would stay far from where she lived and wherever Jason went that day. Amy listened to the morning show intently in her car as she drove up the rural roads to work. She watched the roads and houses around her with guarded anxiety, waiting for a mob of blood-soaked neighbors to appear suddenly. It occurred to her she watched too much bad television. Naturally, of course, after she put her tuna fish sandwich into the small fridge, the first thing she did when she got into her office was head straight to the Internet to search out every single video she could find. Her co-workers in the admissions department at the school she worked at flocked to her desk to watch the videos over her shoulder. None of the women could keep their emotions in check. The videos were the worst thing they had ever seen, and no matter how bad they were revolted, none of them could look away. No matter how many times she replayed her Lady Gaga CD, she couldn't shake the reality of what was happening. Only a few hours into the day, the concerned parents began calling and then showing up frantically on campus. When she could steal a moment, Amy went back to her office and checked out more videos that were being posted hastily by people across the world. London, Brussels, Moscow, Cairo, Rio, Beijing, and the list went on and on. The longer the day went, the larger the spread of the violence, and the more obvious it became to her that this was the worst event mankind had ever faced. The dean of the school handled it professionally. He sent out emails every thirty minutes to advise the staff of what was happening. Late in the morning, the hoity-toity parents of the spoiled brats attending the school started calling to make sure their wunderkind were still safe, and by one in the afternoon the parents started rolling into campus in their luxury sedans and freshly waxed SUVs to rescue their children from the ravages of a worldwide apocalypse. An apocalypse that had yet to arrive on campus, mind you. Campus was like Grand Central Station for hours as parent after parent streamed in to rescue their child. Amy lost her entire afternoon dealing with asshole parents arguing and looking for their kids. Every system was abandoned as she and her admissions co-workers tried to connect child with worried father or worried mother as fast as humanly possible. She would call into the classroom the kid should be in and tell the teacher to send the child to the admissions building at the entrance to the campus near the bridge over the river that fed into Auburn Lake. The child would come running, and the parent would spirit their offspring away, worried to death over them. Occasionally, the child wouldn't be where they were supposed to be, and the parent would shit a pile of bricks while Amy made the chain of calls to find the kid. If she had to watch one more yuppie bitch cry about her darling Hannah or Emily or Tad, she'd retch. 
At a little after five, right when she should have been going home for the night, she actually did throw up. Amy was standing in the lush green grass just outside the admissions office, talking to yet another sad-faced moron looking for his son. She reiterated her, don't worry, everything is fine, speech for the nth time as a small BMW zipped towards the bridge like a bat out of hell and swerved to avoid a freshman trying to cross one of the campus streets. The male driver jerked the wheel far too fast for even the luxury car to cope with, and the BMW instantly barrel-rolled down the street with a horrendous series of smashes. Like a scene out of a movie car chase, the black luxury vehicle flew over one of the granite benches situated next to a sidewalk. Amy could see the look of terror on the mother's face straight through the windshield. Amy's blood ran cold, and her breath emptied out of her lungs. The entire front end of the car crumpled on the final roll, and the BMW came to a rest leaning on its side against the center school building. Amy stood slack-jawed for what seemed like an hour as onlookers rushed in to help. Chaos ensued. Dozens of students stood around, sobbing as the rescuers pulled three people from the wreckage. Amy herself couldn't build the courage to run in to help. All she could muster was one slow step at a time, compelled to get closer to see, but not brave enough to become part of the scene and actually lend a hand. One of the school's athletic coaches yanked the driver out of the overturned car. The driver's left arm had been pinched in the rollover and was smeared like brie all over the street and car door. His arm from the elbow down was a crushed, bloody pulp. The bones were torn into shards, and all Amy could think of was that it looked like giant red chopsticks protruding from a mangled stump. He bled out as Amy lost the contents of her stomach onto the street. The mother's legs were crushed by the dashboard. Her moans of agony were so powerful every time her lungs expelled a scream, the crowd retracted as if they felt every moment of her pain themselves. Amy had never seen so much human emotion and was utterly overwhelmed. Her eyes widened in shock as the backseat passenger was removed. He was one of the school's freshmen, just a tiny little boy practically, with short dark brown hair and freckles that stood out like chocolate chips on a cookie. He was adorable, and he was struggling to find the strength to breathe. She heard someone say under their breath that he had a crushed pelvis. Amy's eyes filled and overflowed with moisture, and she crumpled in the middle of the campus street, crying. Amy scuffed her knees badly on the pavement, but felt none of the pain. Her shock was too deep, too thorough. A bowel-wrenching scream broke her misery. Amy couldn't make out what was happening through the crowd in front of her, and she lurched to her feet just in time to see the now bleeding coach stagger backwards, away from some impending danger. The coach's gray sweatshirt had a wet red halo spreading from the neck down, and his color was visibly draining away. The crowd obscuring her view started to dissolve. Many were backing away slowly, their eyes locked wide open at whatever she couldn't see. Those not watching had turned tail completely and were running away screaming, as if their mortal souls depended on it. When the crowd had dispersed, Amy saw that the father had died, and was now nearly on top of his own son. The son's wheezing breath suddenly caught the attention of the clearly zombified father, and with a savagery Amy had never seen before in her life, the formerly loving father ripped down into his son's body. The auburn-haired office worker stood in the middle of the street with rivers of screaming people running past her, trying to get away from the father murdering his own son. She was jostled about to and fro as they ran for their cars or ran for shelter behind locked doors. All Amy could do was sit in the middle of the street with her skinned knees and watch. The corpse father dug his teeth deep into the soft, smooth skin of his child's stomach and tore back viciously, ripping a wide, ragged hole in the flesh. Amy watched as he buried his face in the bloody hole and pulled back a mouthful of his son's pink and purple intestines. His teeth snapped shut on the ropes of meat, causing them to pop like fresh sausage. Amy dry heaved suddenly, and as her rationality returned, she backed away and started to run for the admissions office. That at a nice, thick door. 
Many hours later, banging on the door and the yells of clearly living parents brought her out from under her office desk. The sun had just about set, and Amy had just gotten used to listening to her phone ring over and over. She was far too paralyzed with fear to reach up and answer it. Plus, she knew no matter what the call would be, she didn't have the wherewithal to deal with any more problems. She listened to the evening radio host on her favorite Top 40 station instead of answering the phone. He was normally a veritable fountain of wit and humor, but tonight all he did was take calls from people trying to share information about how bad things were. She was particularly frightened when she heard the tenth person say that the bitten are infected. All she could think about was black and white horror movies from the sixties and the bite of the infected zombies. She felt her body head to toe in the darkening office to make sure she hadn't been bitten somehow unknowingly. She was clean and thus would survive. In a moment of irrational panic, she almost grabbed her phone to call Jason, but after their awkward morning, her guilt prevented her from using him once again. This time, she'd figure it out on her own or die trying. No more hurt for Jason. The parents outside banging on the door of the admissions office finally broke her fear sometime around 7.30 in the evening. When she heard them yelling for help, her nerve finally reached critical mass, and she crawled out of the dark office, checked them all through the windows to make sure they weren't bitten, and opened the door. She immediately wished she hadn't. A man wielding a shotgun pushed his way into the doorframe forcibly and unleashed a frustrated insult at her. What the fuck, lady? What were you waiting for? We could have died out there. Where the fuck are our kids? And where's my son, you dumb cunt? Amy swallowed the thick mucus in her throat and choked down her fear. He was just scared, like her, she told herself. She took a deep breath and assessed the ten or so parents arrayed in the front yard just outside. They looked frazzled at best and emotionally broken at worst. Sir, who's your son? I'm Dan Haggerty. My son is Dale Haggerty. He ain't answering his cell phone, and he isn't in his dorm room either. There are dead people all over this goddamn place, too. Can you find my son so I can get the hell out of here? Dan, I'm sorry you can't find Dale, but calling me a dumb cunt doesn't make me want to help you faster. In fact, it makes me want to tell you to go fly a kite. Now, if you can ask me nicely for help finding your son, I'd be happy to do so. Amy's sudden courage gave her a rush. She couldn't even believe she'd just told off a man holding a shotgun, a big one at that. It looked bigger than Jason's. Dan's face went from angry to embarrassed in the beat of a drum. He obviously was operating on adrenaline and fear by this point, and his mouth had apparently gotten away from him. Look, I'm sorry, miss, but my son is missing, and I've seen a lot of dead people walking around today. Some of them got up and ate other people, and then those people got up and ate other people. I need to find my son and get out of here before he gets eaten. I'm sorry I called you a nasty name. Dan turned and gave his apology half to her and half to the crowd of worried parents gathered around. Far off in the background of campus, they could hear yells and hollers. The flicker of fires could be seen dancing on the sides of some buildings where other cars had crashed while Amy was hiding. Amy was struck by the absurdity of it all. This morning she'd been laying pipe with her ex, and now she was stuck late at work, trying to calm down a shotgun-wielding fuckface in the middle of an entirely unbelievable zombie apocalypse. The drama of it all was silly. Thanks, Dan. Who else is everyone here waiting for? A chorus of parents burst out the names of their children, and with experience born from years of listening to parents bark out their kids' names, she mentally noted them all down, and went back to her office. The parents huddled together, backs to the admissions office door, watching for any undead maniacs that might come at them from the darkened campus. Amy daintily made her way through the pitch-black building to her office in the back. Without a thought, she hit play on her small radio, and Lady Gaga issued forth again. Force of habit. The network was still up on her computer, and she accessed the school schedule for Dale. Within seconds, she had where he was supposed to be for the entire day, and moments after that she had the schedules for the other kids the parents were here for. Amy wasn't gifted like some of the kids here, but she saw the pattern immediately. They all had third-period English with Mrs. Goodell. She reached for the phone and dialed the extension for the offbeat English teacher's classroom. 
After three rings, the phone on the other end answered, and Amy recognized the soft lilt of Mrs. Goodell's voice. Hello, Amy. There was a strange pause and a pain in her tone that came over the wire and hit Amy. She knew instinctively something was amiss in the classroom. Erica, I've got some parents here that are looking for their kids. I'm thinking they might be with you, or maybe you know where they went. Amy tried to keep any accusatorial tone out of her voice. Erica's response told her she failed. I didn't do anything to them, Amy. I've got them all locked up in here until the police arrive to escort them all safely away. I just can't open the door and let them out. We've been watching CNN all day, and it's clearly not safe to let these kids out. Amy could hear panic in Erica's voice. That was highly uncharacteristic of the laid-back and bohemian woman. She was always about calm and peace and working together to overcome obstacles. Hearing her talk like that made Amy shiver. If Mrs. Goodell was freaking out, then the world really had unraveled. Erica, I've got a pretty pissed-off dad with a shotgun here that wants to get his son out of your classroom. I think we need to open that door and let those kids go now. He might take that gun to your door and open it without your permission, and people could get hurt. Amy turned to face the doorway, twirling the phone cord in her hand. She froze when she saw Dan standing in her office doorway. Where's my son? Dan asked her in a threatening voice. The steady beat of Lady Gaga in the background made the situation almost humorous. Almost. Third floor of the classroom building, Mrs. Goodell's room. She's got him safe there. For no reason Amy could decipher, she sat the phone back down in the cradle, hanging up on the English teacher. Dan nodded as if the world suddenly made sense. Why is he there? Is he hurt? No, Dan. Mrs. Goodell has him in there to keep him safe. She was waiting for the police to come. I think if you go there, you might be able to calm her down. Just gotta be calm, okay, Dan? That crazy bitch. There are no more police. They're all fucking dead. I'm going to go fix that bitch and get my son and get the hell out of here. Dan jabbed a finger at her and spun on his heels. He marched out of the building and right past the confused and frightened parents in the lobby. Amy felt the dread grow in her belly with a twisting ache. Less than half an hour later, a dose of salvation walked up to Amy. One of the overnight dorm supervisors had arrived on campus for reasons unknown to Amy. He had no reason to think he had to work that night, but she was glad he arrived. Adrian was the definition of man, holding a military-style rifle and a pistol sitting menacingly on his hip, and when he walked silently onto the lawn to see what was going on with the worried group of parents, each and every other person shut their traps loud enough you could hear their teeth clinking together. Adrian had a presence that politely demanded respect. Amy noted that her worry dissolved at the same time, one person's fear is another's salvation, she dimly noted. What the fuck happened to you, Ring? Most of the staff here at Auburn Lake Preparatory Academy simply called Adrian Ring. That was his last name. As she asked him, she eyed the head-to-toe blood splatters and smears on his face and clothing. Adrian Ring looked down at his clothing, and after a second to let the situation soak in, he looked up at her and smirked. It's kind of shitty out there, and... I've had a very long day in that shit. He nodded in the direction of the bridge that led towards town. Amy swallowed hard. His expression said a lot. Ring was a veteran, army, she thought, and she knew the scuttlebutt on campus said he had been in the shit in Iraq. If he said it was bad, then it was bad. Really bad. Adrian looked at the other parents with a mixture of sympathy and disgust. Much like the other staff at the school, the parents were often tolerated with disdain. They were usually rich, usually assholes, and almost always got in the way of their children's education and happiness. Amy noticed that the longer Adrian was there, the less afraid of him they became. What's happened here today? I was hoping this place would be empty, Adrian asked Amy as he slowly assessed the campus looking for danger. His wariness and experience with danger was as obvious to her as a street sign. She felt safer and safer with every moment's passing. Amy filled him in as the summer's heat faded into the comfortable June night. She had to stop a few times as they heard loud booms emanating from the direction of the school building Dan had headed to. The parents' frantic demeanors nearly leapt out of control. Adrian calmed them down with a simple shush and a stare. 
Amy couldn't believe his presence and calm, even as she told him about the horror of watching the car crash turn into a horror scene. All he did was nod at her and smile gently as the emotions came back. She suddenly wished she'd talked to him more before today. He was a pillar of strength, and she desperately needed someone strong to lean on. After she'd stopped for the last time to listen to a gargantuan series of shotgun blasts, she told Adrian about the situation in the school building. He stood there, impassive in the face of the parents pleading to him for help, until finally he spoke to all of them. Get in your vehicles or get in a building. It isn't safe out here. I'm going to go to the classroom and make sure that moron doesn't kill a kid or kill Mrs. Goodell, and I might even stop him from killing himself. That elicited a small burst of nervous laughter from the parents. Amy didn't think any of them would lose sleep over Dan getting shot. Amy smiled at Adrian as he turned to her last. Get safe inside. I'll be back in a bit. If I'm not back after twenty minutes, try calling the cops or just get the hell out of here. This is bad news, Amy, and things will never be the same again, okay? His big brown eyes looked right into her core, and even in the waning summer light she saw the fear inside them. He was scared, just like her, but he had the guts, the skill, and the willpower to do what needed to be done. She envied him immediately and felt disgusted about herself all at the same time. Her thoughts raced to Jason as she walked inside the admissions building— Jason and Adrian were cut from the same unbreakable cloth. Gunfire tore the relative silence apart not long after, just as the first handful of missing kids came streaming across the campus toward their thankful parents, there were two loud booms from the building. Amy flinched powerfully when the noise of the heavy shotgun blast reached them. All she could think about was if Adrian had been shot. Amy dimly wondered if her heart could take being walked away from by one man today and the loss of a guy she may or may not have just realized she had a crush on. She struck the thoughts from her head as the kids ran into the clutching arms of their parents. Amy forced a scared smile as the parents who had greeted their children wept for joy. She watched the agonized faces of the parents that hadn't gotten their kids yet, too. They stood still, pleading eyes fixated on the distant glass double doors of the three-story brick classroom building, waiting for their beloved kids to come running through it at any time. Amy suddenly felt like an enormous piece of shit for making fun of them all these years. Experiencing their pain step by step made them seem awfully human. Just as one of the fathers began to sob, fearing the worst, the front doors of the building burst open and several more of the kids stumbled through, obviously injured. Together they supported each other as they hobbled the hundred or so yards to the admissions lawn. The parents were frozen with worry for the longest time, but one by one the remaining family members burst out of the admissions lobby and ran to their children, grabbing them and offering what aid they could. One of the young girls being carried by her father was hurt badly, and Amy knew she'd die. Amy motioned to a clean spot in the grass, and the father rested his bloody, frail girl down. She was porcelain-skinned, and the tiny wounds from the shotgun pellets she'd been peppered by stood out powerfully. They oozed her dark red life in a dozen streaks all over. Her blouse had been ripped asunder by the shockwave of the blast, and her developing teen breasts had caught the worst of it. Her heart was directly in the path of at least five of the small wounds. Her father spoke to her in a panic, lifting her limp head to face him. Isabel, Isabella, baby, don't go. Don't go to sleep. Daddy's here now, and we're going to go see Mommy at home in a bit. You just got to stay here with Daddy a little longer, okay, baby? The father's voice trailed off as his daughter's eyes glazed over and all the life drained from her body. Her head slumped into his hands, utterly devoid of the spark of life. The father was silent for a time, and then issued a scream that nearly broke all the glass on the shattered campus. Everyone, Amy included, couldn't help but join in his tears. The tiny girl's death hit home for all of them after the anxiety of waiting so long for their own children. Amy wiped her eyes clear of the tears, and in a moment of typical Amy selfishness, she made sure little Isabel or Isabella hadn't been bitten. She saw no bite wounds on her body and breathed a silent sigh of relief. 
The father doubled over on top of his baby girl and let his tears flow into her barely covered, destroyed chest. One by one, the parents fell to the ground hugging their kids. The outpouring of relief and emotion was raw, tangible. Amy picked out bits from their conversations and tried to piece together what happened in the classroom. Dad, that guy shot the teacher and his own kid. Dale was a fucking zombie, Dad. A young boy. Mom, I got shot in the leg. I got hit. Jeez, it feels like bee stings. A girl, a senior, from the sounds of it. Are we going to the summer house on the lake or what? Mom, Dad, it's an island. We could be safe there, I think. Another boy, maybe a junior, Amy thought. Mom, I was bitten up there by that fucking jock asshole Dale. Why the fuck would he bite me? A young boy. Amy snapped to reality when she heard that, her head twisted to the side to find the face of the young boy who'd just said that. He was off to the side and sitting cross-legged, holding out his arm to show his worried mother the handful of large round bite wounds on his arms and shoulder. Amy opened her mouth to yell out a warning, but she was interrupted by a chirp from the grieving father. Ow! Isabel? The father sat back on his haunches and looked down at his previously dead daughter. She was stirring, and now Amy could see her mouth was covered in blood. She'd bitten her father on the shoulder as he wept on her chest. She turned her head on the grass with predatory menace and stared up at him. Her eyes were white and glassy, and they regarded the bitten father with a vaguely confused expression. Isabel, the father exclaimed with joy, but was cut off as his beloved little girl snatched at him and yanked his neck straight to her perfect dentist corrected, snapping teeth. Amy watched in the faint orange streetlight haze as a stream of dark red blood shot out onto the grass. In the light, it looked like oil. The father choked out a gagging wet plea for her to stop, but his weight went limp, and he came down fully onto the little girl that had just snuffed his life. In his final moment of strength, he managed to roll off her, setting her free. With the same evil predatory grace, she slowly rose to standing and regarded the rest of them with the same confused white-eyed glare. The parents and children fell backwards, crawling away from the monster that had just slain its own parent. Blurts of dismay and fear racked the parents as little innocent and dead Isabella stepped calmly over her father's body. Amy shuffled away on her back, trying to get towards the heavy door of admissions that represented safety. Her elbows moved off the soft green grass and scraped across the brick walkway leading up to the door, and Isabella turned her head as fast as the crack of a whip to her. Isabella's lips trembled almost in feral joy, and she pounced on top of Amy. Amy pressed upwards with all her might, grabbing the thin shoulders of the dead teenager the corpse's strength was diminished from life, but her whole mass was on top of her. Amy grabbed fistfuls of the torn blouse to have something to hold on to, anything made for a better grip. After a few seconds of struggling, keeping the girl's mouth far from anything she could bite, Amy decided to roll savagely to toss the girl aside and make her break for it. She was interrupted by a sharp stabbing pain on her shin. Amy let loose a blood-curdling scream as she felt each individual tooth sink into the thin layer of flesh on her leg. A burst of adrenaline surged through her suddenly, and with tremendous effort, she heaved the girl to the side. She was betrayed by the blouse. The thin fabric couldn't deal with the adrenaline pumping in her veins, and when she ripped the shirt aside to toss poor, dead Isabella, the fabric ripped apart, letting the little girl fall directly on her. Amy didn't have time to scream. She watched Isabella's mouth open with a dim realization she was about to be murdered. Amy's mind slowed as the little girl's blood-covered mouth descended with unholy accuracy right for her exposed throat. The pain in her leg had gone, despite the fact that she could still feel a distant tugging and ripping on the meat there. Amy's mind put two and two together and realized it was likely Isabella's father. He, too, was dead, just like the daughter that had killed him. And now, just like Dan Haggerty had said just a bit ago, those dead people were eating her, too. 
Isabella's mouth hit her with a vaguely sexual wet slap, and Amy felt the hard surface of her teeth clamp down like a vice on the soft skin of her trachea. The pain was a white-hot flare that ran deep into her skull and blinded her. With detached emotion, she felt her heart flutter in her breast. Out of the edge of her eye in the corner of Isabella's mouth, she watched a dark, oily jet of her own blood fly up into the night. It came down on top of the both of them, hitting her fully in the face. It didn't feel like oil on her skin. Through red-tinted eyes, she watched what she could see of Isabella's face gnaw at her neck. Amy wondered, as life slipped from her, if all those phone calls she'd ignored earlier was Jason trying to get in touch with her, to tell her he loved her one last time, maybe to tell her he was on his way to rescue her, her night sewn of unbreakable cloth. Darkness wrapped around her. There was no tunnel and no white light, just darling Amy, sweetest Amy. Afraid and all alone in the void. March 8th Today is a better day. It wouldn't have taken much to improve over the past few days, though. I guess saying today is a better day is a lot like saying I wiped most of the dog shit I stepped in yesterday off my shoe. Just most. I don't know. Today is actually a much better day, I suppose. Mike and company finished up our trade today before they left for home, and we started talking about something that intrigues me a great deal. I'm sort of shocked I hadn't thought of this in depth more as well. It pays to talk to friends about stuff. Amazingly, they have useful input. Hooray for not thinking in a vacuum. So, after everyone woke up and became largely coherent, we had a small breakfast. Gilbert showed up early, and we had enough supplies to make more pancakes for everyone. Mike actually dug into the trade shit he brought over strictly to help feed everyone. He didn't ask for anything in return, either. Nice guy. After we ate, Mike sent Gavin and LaFriends out to patrol the campus to make sure there weren't more wandering undead moving about. While they were gone, we finished up our trade. We refilled all their empty water jugs, as well as ten more gallon jugs they'd gotten during the time since our last trade. Mike asked for dish detergent, some laundry detergent, and wanted some canned fruit for the kids. He also mentioned that they would be needing baby food soon, and I dug out the stuff I'd amassed as well. He was very pleased to get what I had. He also mentioned that they would require formula and such as well, so if we could get more of that for them, that'd be great. So I ponied up all that crap, and in return, he gave us three bottles of milk, one dead chicken, a dozen eggs, five gallons of gasoline, five boxes of mil-spec 9mm, 250 rounds, and a spare IOTV they had from the guard base. I guess they have more vests back at the school, and Mike said he'd be willing to hook us all up with vests over time. Once we completed the trade and talked about trying to find a more substantial way to transport lots of water, as well as retrieve gas from another gas station, Mike made his first diplomatic gesture to us from their new leader, Lisa Goldman. Lisa and Mike both thought that we should abandon campus and relocate to the Westfield School. After hearing their well-thought-out sales pitch and taking a few breaks to run to the windows after hearing gunshots, I politely told him I wasn't interested in moving, and Gilbert said the same. After a quick exchange, Patty and Abby both said they had no interest in going anywhere as well. I then started to send a sales pitch Mike's way to have them come here. As great a place as the school they're in now is, I think Alpa is better. I gave him the pros and cons, and just like me, he politely declined. He also pointed out that he wasn't the leader, and no matter what, he'd have to go back to Lisa to get a more official decision. That's when Abby spoke up. She suggested that we maintain and occupy both places, because they both had value. They were safe, defended, and far enough apart that it was highly unlikely that both places would fall should something happen. She made a good case for both locations, but made a strong point in that populations were vastly different, and that because Alpa was a much larger place with plenty of open housing, we should have more people here. Peeling off a handful of people from Westfield would lower their burden there, both on food, electricity, and water. We have plenty of electricity and water, as well as a fair amount of food. 
When spring hits, we can start our crops here on the athletic fields, and she suggested that Lenny could give us or trade to us enough chickens to start our own mini farm. That way, instead of relying on a single location for milk, eggs, and poultry, we had two. It wasn't about trade, it was about survival. I mean, shit, this is a literal moment of having all our eggs in one basket. She went on and on and even came to the enlightened conclusion that we could easily take on as much as another six people here with no problem. She'd done the math on her own, apparently, and she was convinced we had enough food to make it to fall with no problem. The more I thought about it, the more sense it made to me. We could use extra hands to get things done here, and I'm sure there are Westfield people itching to get the fuck out of that high school. Who the hell wants to go back to high school? Mike had to agree with her, at least on some levels, and he conceded that he'd bring the idea to Lisa. Mike was certain that there would be some people that would want to get out of there, but we needed to move slowly on this for plenty of good reasons. Look at what happened the last time a place took new folks in. Kaboom. Gavin and the friends returned shortly after that and said they'd killed two more undead wandering near the bridge. The weather the past few days has been cold and raw. The two guys were shivering their nads off as they told us the story. It was cute when Abby leapt to Gavin's rescue with a warm towel and a hot chocolate. Those two are adorable together. I actually watched Patty's face intently as the two youngins did their little dance of romance. Patty actually looked happy as Abby attended to him. I think she might finally be seeing this less as Abby being taken advantage of and more of Abby being happy. It's been a long time since that girl was genuinely happy. I can virtually guarantee you who the first person to sign up to move here is. I'm no Nostradamus, but the writing is on the fucking wall about those two. Plans moving forward. If Campus and Auburn Lake Road remain reasonably silent in terms of zombie movement, we've got a lot to do. We need to get gasoline pretty ricky-tick here, yeah, we're not out, but our barrel reserves are low enough to make my asshole itch. I'm uncomfortable about it, to say the least. Tomorrow morning, if all is well, Patty and I are going down to the nearest gas station heading towards town. It's right near the spot in the road where Brian and I had our meeting, and he flipped out over the fire trucks. Maybe two miles from the gas station Sean torched. We're going there to assess a few things. Is the gas station surrounded by undead? If it's swamped, we'll make a hearty pass at clearing it out as safely as we can. Are the pumps manually operated? The station nearby had old pumps that you could use a crank on, but I don't know if the new gas pumps have that option. And lastly, we'll need to see how much gas is actually left in the tanks. I'm hoping there's a thousand gallons or so. If we find more than that, fantastic for us. If possible, I'd also like to find and procure a decent diesel truck as well. As awesome as the Tundra has been, it's gas-operated, and we really need to conserve all gasoline for our generators for electricity. As I said before, Mr. Journal, there is a plethora of diesel around, but gas is going to get hard to find shortly. So, that's my agenda. Patty and I to the gas station tomorrow morning. Hopefully all goes well for the campus tonight and into tomorrow, so that's an option. After that, we'll just have to see how that goes. We made final arrangements that they would come back here on the 14th for our next trade meeting, and that I'd try to track down more of the random crap they needed in the meantime. Mike and crew made their departure at about noon. Abby and Gavin said their longing goodbyes off to the side, and they had that awesome moment where you could see they wanted to maybe kiss each other, but with witnesses nearby and nerves, they just had an awkward moment of silence looking at each other. I'm starting to root for those two, I'm being romantic vicariously through them. Oh, almost forgot to mention the best part. When I went out to send them off, Mike sat down in the passenger seat of his Humvee and saw something on the dash. He smiled slowly and grabbed whatever it was he saw and hopped out again. He said, These are for you. I made sure business was taken care of. He handed me what he found, and they drove off. A dark crimson streak of blood ran across one round lens, He'd handed me Sean's glasses. Adrian. March 9th. Mr. Journal, I feel like I got ran over by a truck today. Ironically, that's not far from the truth. Earlier today, Patty and I made our first off-campus trip in days. 
We went down Route 18 towards downtown to check out the closest gas station. I think I woke up around 8 a.m. after having yet another night of fitful sleep. No exceptionally strange dreams, or waking up screaming, or worst of all, ugly dreams about Cassie. I think I woke up three times to take a piss, which is unusual for me. I wonder now if I'll sleep like shit from now on because I'm more afraid of dreaming than I am of dealing with the real world. Damning revelation if there ever was one. Patty was up shortly after I was, and we packed a day's load to head down to the gas station. The weather the past few days has been chilly, but not frigid, and there's been a lot of rain. We've seen the lake ice crack in places, and the river is high and moving right along. We opted to use the plow to head downtown with. Patty moved with her pistol and the TAC-22, and I went with the Glock and the M-15. Abby held down the fort while we were away, and Gilbert kept in radio contact. When we loaded the truck, we were extra super careful to watch for more roving zombies, but we saw none. On our way out, I took a few minutes to check our pyre, which had more or less burnt out in the rain. The smell was righteously fucking nauseating, and we made a pact to return tomorrow to try and get the fire going again to destroy the rest of the bodies. After that, we made our way down Auburn Lake Road and turned onto Route 18. The road almost the entire way was clear of zombies— Neither of us spotted anything moving until we were in eye shot of the gas station, and we were driving very slowly because the road was pretty slick. The recent rain has obliterated the snow where we've been plowing, and with the temperature dips at night, the remaining moisture was fairly icy. Patty spotted the first undead asshole walking through the front yard of a small house. The freak had somehow gotten tangled in a clothesline and was spinning around and falling down trying to get himself free. I didn't stop to deal with him. I just wanted to get our mission accomplished. The gas station belonged to a small chain local to here called Moe's. Moe's has maybe 20 places across 10 towns in the area. All the stations are the same. Large bays where there are about eight pumps arranged in single file and a single brick convenience store structure with large glass windows set behind the bay. They're well known with the drinking crowd for having an exceedingly well-stocked beer supply. Moe's sits on a street corner facing Main Street. The gas station parking lot had perhaps five undead in it. Moving around within fifty yards or so, there were about ten more shamblers spaced out sporadically. Patty and I formed a quick plan to ram the undead in the parking lot with the truck, then shoot the footmobiles from a distance. I sped up and hit the parking lot going about twenty-five miles an hour. Three of the undead were ripped apart by the plow on my first pass across the parking lot, and when I backed around to hit the others, I drove over one of the walkers I'd missed— and then smashed the last one into a parked car. The walking corpse was pinned and immobile, and when we got out of the truck, I took one of the Halligan fire tools to the thing's head. Poor woman's skull cracked open like an eggshell. took me a few seconds to fling the rotting brain tissue off the fireman's tool. After that, Patty and I picked a street, and we started taking out the walkers moving in on us. There were enough of them around us that trying to kill them with melee weapons would have been dicey. Patty took out her targets quicker than I did, which says a lot about how good a shooter she's become. Accountant Schmishmountain. Once we were sure things were settled, we checked on the few things we needed to at the station. On every pump, there are gauges that tell you how much gas is left in the underground storage tanks. I'm not sure how to read them, but... According to the gauges on the pumps, I'm fairly certain that between all three grades of fuel at the station, there's something around 5,000 gallons in the ground. Motherfucking huzzah. I busted open the front of the pumps to check for manual hand cranks, and there was no attachment for one. I was really hoping for one. Mike and I talked about a solution to getting the fuel out fast, and we'll have to try that idea to make this worth it. To double-check the fuel supplies, I went to the small lids where the fuel trucks load the tanks, and using a screwdriver, I popped them open one by one while Patty covered me. I saw the faint reflection off the fuel of my mag light, so I knew there was enough fuel to make a full-on retrieval worthwhile. I asked Patty to pull the truck around while I checked the store for remnants. Two of the large panes of glass on the front of the store had been busted in, and I went into the frames to get a clean look inside. I had a moment of deja vu when I remembered getting gas here when the shit hit the fan back in June. I remembered pumping my gas covered in blood, holding my shotgun, and I immediately recalled the look of the cashier watching me through the window. Time flies when you're fighting for your life. The store had been stripped of everything, right down to the scratch tickets at the counter. 
where the people who stole them planned on cashing them in mystifies me, but they were gone. Some folks will fucking steal anything. I didn't see anything moving around inside the store, so when Patty pulled up to the curb, I opted that we get out of Dodge. Now, I love Patty. She's a wonderful woman, and I'm quite fond of her. However, she's not used to driving a truck with a giant yellow plow on the front of it. When she came up to the curb, she pulled in too close and clipped a large metal rack that was intended to hold jugs of windshield washing fluid and sent the damn rack flying straight at me. I had nowhere to go but dive in the parking lot directly in front of the truck or attempt to leap like Otis over it, and neither of those options happened. I took the damn rack straight in the fucking guts and got slammed against the friggin' brick side of the store. I had the wind half knocked out of me, and I doubled over holding my midsection. Patty nearly shat herself when she saw me get hit, and she leapt out screaming to lend me a hand. Mercifully, she put the truck in park before she got out. Adrenaline rocks. The damn rack was wedging me against the wall, and I hadn't gotten it off of me yet, and Patty grabbed the thing with one hand and flung the fucker ten feet. All I could think of was the urban legend of the grandfather who lifted a tractor off his grandkid. Granted, this was a little different, but she tossed that hundred-pound rack like a boss. She helped me into the truck just as a few more zombies started to come down the street about fifty yards away. We'd attracted attention. Patty stopped and plinked them dead with her rifle, and she drove us away. I noticed when we were making our escape that daycare building we'd seen the day of the meeting with Brian. Now, I know that building will have undead kids in it. I mean, that's a given, right? At this point, Mr. Journal, you and I both know what my luck is like, and it's easy money that building is filled with a dozen kids permanently stuck at the terrible twos. Little evil bastards slowly rotting away with heads filled with sharp, murderous baby teeth. Anyway, in my delirious state of hip and stomach pain... I realized that the daycare building still had all its windows intact, and that very likely there would be baby food and possibly formula inside. My greedy little nugget immediately decided that we needed to hit that place to get inside and see if anything was available. The two pregnant girls in Westfield are going to be needing a lot of baby food and formula when the kids are born. Patty smashed a few more corpses down with the plow blade on the way home. I can't be certain, but I think I saw some satisfaction on her face. It had been a while since we were able to use a vehicle to take some of these fuckers out. I know it felt good when I did it. By the time we reached campus, I was much better, and I got myself into Hall E without too much pain and effort. Of course, sitting here right now, ten hours later, I'm feeling it. I've got an enormous bruise all over my side and stomach that looks faintly like the metal grid pattern on that fucking rack. I'm going to be sore for days. Patty has apologized a hundred times already, and Abby took a couch pillow to her mom's head for trying to kill me. Funny to watch the daughter scold the mother. Someone once told me that as we age, our children become the parents. I hope this isn't the first sign of Patty reaching old age. She isn't that old, really. We're all laughing about it now, of course. Oh, before I forget, while we were away, Abby spent some time cleaning up outside, trying to gather all the books the zombies brought onto campus with them. She seemed somewhat shaken talking about it. I guess from what she saw, there was no rhyme or reason to the books. Some were Twain, some were King, some were textbooks, some were romance novels, and there were a few coloring books as well. That tells me the books were some kind of symbol, some sort of message to someone, likely me. I need to think on this at length. Otis is lying here on my bed with me, across my feet. He's such a godsend for keeping me warm at night. I forget how much heat the little guy puts out. When he's gone at night, I notice I wake up looking for warmer blankets. I know he's snuck away and down the hall to Abby's room a few times to cuddle with her, which is nice. She's adopted him officially as her pet, too, and I can't read Otis's mind, but he seems pleased with this. I spent the majority of today chilling out on the couch in the living room, on my stomach. Oddly enough, it actually felt better being on my stomach than any other position. I've come to the conclusion that I am suffering from karma over sharing the story of Patrick getting shot in the ass. He had to be on his stomach, and now I've put my own stomach time in. Patrick, if you're out there listening, wherever you might be, I'm sorry, dude. But even you gotta admit... Getting your ass perforated the way you did is pretty funny in retrospect. <sighs> I miss my friends.
If I can move around decently tomorrow, we're going to get things ready for a return trip to the gas station the day after. I'm going to load all but one of the fuel barrels into a truck so we can restock everything. We're going to head down in two vehicles, secure the area, set up our pumping apparatus, which I need to make sure works tomorrow as well, and get every drop we can while we're there to make the trip worth it. You know, I friggin' forgot to check the diesel tank while we were there earlier. Oh. oh well, can't be perfect. I'm going to hit save here, head downstairs for a glass of milk, pop some ibuprofen and a couple of melatonin, and hit the sack. I'm sort of hopeful right now I see Cassie in my dreams again. Maybe I'm finally reaching a point where I'm not afraid to sleep. Or I just really miss the woman I love most. Till we meet again, Mr. Journal, Adrian. March 11th. Sup, dog. Hope all's well with you, Mr. Journal. Things are pretty good with me. We've had a highly eventful past couple of days here, and I'm happy to say we fought through the bullshit and got what needed to be done done. Where's my cigar? Our primary concern the past couple of days has been preparing for a fuel run and then doing that fuel run. It certainly illuminates how difficult life is now when... It's a two-day process to get gasoline safely. Before the shit hit the fan, we'd hop in a car and zip down to the closest station, and with a swipe of the ATM card, we'd have a full tank. Ooh, how I miss that. Not that rolling into town loaded for war doesn't have its upsides. Occasionally, I realize that I'm standing in my town wearing body armor and holding an assault rifle, shooting at zombies, and I'm sort of forced to smile out of amusement. Sad that I find that amusing now, I guess. Yesterday we gathered our resources and finalized our plans. Now, getting the gas out of the underground storage tanks in an efficient manner was the make-or-break fact of this whole process. If it took us too long to get the fuel out, then we ran the risk of being overrun by the undead or wasting excessive amounts of ammo defending ourselves. It's this enormous ballet of resource management. More time means more danger. More danger means more bullets, etc., etc. I told my idea to Mike about getting the gas quickly and safely using a sump pump. Mike said that they'd actually used an old sump pump themselves to get the gas out of the tanks in Westfield. He said they used two different pumps with success. One model was a standard plug-into-the-wall model that they'd powered with a converter off one of their truck batteries. He said it worked awesome but the risk of sparks creating an explosion had everyone shitting bricks the whole time. Eventually, they located an older manual crank sump pump in a basement of an older multifamily home. Same basic principle applies. You work the pump mechanism with one hose in the gasoline supply and the other in a storage receptacle. And as long as you're well greased and don't make any sparks, you simply crank out the gas you need and then get the fuck out. I knew I'd seen one of the manual sump pumps in the basement of one of the houses in the vicinity, and it was our mission yesterday to find it. it. Took us all morning and into the afternoon to locate one, and wouldn't you know it, it was at the giant farmhouse at the end of Jones Road. Gilbert found it. I wound up salvaging a pump out of one of the houses near the old gas station, but it was electric, and thus far more scary. Gilbert said he had an AC-DC converter at his place we could use if it came down to it, it's always good to bring a backup plan. Fortunately, we found enough O-ring clamps and hoses to test to make sure we had a good fit. I was scared any rubber hoses we'd find would be dry-rotted, but after about thirty houses, we found ones that would work. After we picked up a bunch of stuff out of the houses, we came back and emptied all the barrels into a single full barrel. We had to move the hand crank around a few times to get it done, but the end result was all but the one barrel in the back of the plow truck. We also topped off the generator tanks and filled the fuel tanks of the vehicles we use most. That way, we could get the max fill on our containers. Once done with that, we formed our basic plan for today over dinner. I was pretty sore at the time, too, from taking that metal rack to the guts. Mr. Journal, I tell you, man, it was nice to sit down. Nothing's broken, but my whole stomach and all of one hip is a pretty sweet checkerboard bruise. Sore as a bitch. Once we'd gotten our basic plan down, Gilbert and I taught the girls weapons maintenance. I know I've said I like cleaning guns, and I still do, but cleaning all the guns all the time does get old. 
Fortunately, both women have a good eye for what needs to be done, and they took to the process of weapons maintenance fast. Patty seemed to really enjoy it. Maybe that's some remnant of the mom flaring up. She strikes me as the kind of person who kept an immaculate house. Gilbert and I showed them how to clean their own weapons as well as the M15s in the event we had another horde show up and we had to cycle through the weapons again. Gotta keep all the guns in the fight, as they say. Gilbert shuffled off to his humble abode right before we had dinner. He said he was tired and wanted to make something small for himself to eat. He seems better health-wise now than he did a week or so ago. I think the stress of it all gets to him sometimes. Not that he'd admit it. That white-haired dude is harder than nails. Patty, Abby, and I had a small dinner, and we plopped ourselves in the living room and watched a few movies. Separately, we wandered up to bed once we were tired. I slept soundly last night, happy to report that. As a group, we all met after eating breakfast. Gilbert has been using the truck instead of the snowmobiles to get around since we had the few days of rain. The snow is much lower today than it was over January and most of February, and we're experiencing this sweet freeze-thaw sleet cycle that has everything covered in either ice or snow that's so friggin' hard it's more like concrete. We decided we'd take the plow truck for the plow, and the fact that we'd loaded the barrels and empty containers into it already. Gilbert would also take his Chevy, and we'd roll into the gas station just like we did the other day, hit him with the plow, then pick off the stragglers. Abby and I would set up and operate the sump pump while Gilbert and Patty pulled security for us. We would fill all the small containers first and then fill the barrels. If the gas station was overrun with the dead, we'd use the plow to kill as many as possible, then kite them away from the station and kill them as needed. We took off some time around 10 a.m. It was another chilly day, somewhere around freezing with a reasonably stiff winter breeze and sleet that came and went randomly. We all bundled up good, but I didn't take gloves. I thought they might cause static, and I really wanted to avoid that. The drive down to the gas station was smooth, and we kept in radio contact, calling out what we saw on the sides of the road. Not much to report. We did see that moron zombie still caught in the clothesline, which got Abby laughing so hard I thought she was going to have an aneurysm. I made an audible at the line of scrimmage when we got close to the daycare. I wanted to check it out while we had time and were in the neighborhood. The parking lot had foot-deep crusty snow covering it, and Abby volunteered to walk on top of it to check the windows. Just like Legolas, she sprinted right across the top and peered in a bunch of the windows. She walked around the rear of the building and made her way back to the truck calmly, so I knew she wasn't too spooked. To make a fairly long story short, she said there were no visible undead kids in the daycare. She also said the place looked deserted, and it hadn't been ransacked as best as she could see. That left me with the hope that we might find some food for kids and stuff. Even diapers at this point would be awesome for trade. I'll take what I can get, I suppose. After hearing all that Abby had to share, we pulled away and went to the gas station. I ran over one zombie with the truck in the remaining distance, and when I dropped the plow blade to clear away the snow near the gas caps, I hit one more. We didn't pass any others on the way, and in the surrounding vicinity, we didn't see any either. A clear area meant we were a full go. I backed the truck right up to the gas caps, and we started our operation. The caps came off after some solid wraps. Apparently, they'd frozen solid over the past couple days from that wonderful freeze-thaw bullshit. Once the first cap was up, we got the sump pump down on the ground and the first hose into the tank. Abby jumped into the back of the truck and started to assembly line the small gas containers. After a few miscues where I knocked the hand pump over or the hoses got moved around, we were in business. The gas came out a lot faster than we'd expected, and we wound up wasting a fair amount of gas until I got the speed of the flow down. It took us less than five minutes to fill every last gas can we had, and that's quite a few now. Once those were full, Abby took the longer hose, and we started to fill the large 55-gallon barrels. Those took a little longer than five minutes to fill. We had to slow down our pumping speed for a few reasons. A few seconds into the first barrel, Patty and Gilbert started encountering roamers moving into our area. Patty called out their presence and waited as long as she could before she started taking them out one at a time with her rifle. Once the noise started, we knew the clock was ticking before larger amounts of undead made their way to the sound of gunfire. When we started pumping again, I went nuts and wound up knocking over the damn pump a few times and 
Even tugged the damn hose out of the barrel on Abby, and she got an entire pant leg covered in gasoline. We recovered, though, and within seconds we had a good rhythm going, and the barrel was filling up fast. I can't say for sure, but I want to say we got the first barrel filled in a little under ten minutes. Once we got to the subsequent barrels, we were going from empty to full in something like seven or eight minutes. Of course, with all the barrels we had to fill, that's about half an hour's worth of time in the open. Even without the zombie threat over our heads, the cold was a bastard. Of course, once the zombies start showing up, you start to forget about how cold it is. After the first batch of roamers was dispatched by Patty with the twenty-two, it was quiet for some time. As we were finishing up, though, a few more started to manifest in the distance, and we managed to wrap it up before we had to engage them. Abby actually flipped out at Gilbert as she was getting off the truck because he was about to shoot a zombie. We were surrounded by gas fumes, and... A gun going off that close to us could have set the whole place on fire. Gilbert lost all the color in his face when he made the connection. He was about half a second away from damn near blowing us sky high, and he hadn't given it a thought. He backed away to a safe distance and snapped off a single, powerful three oh eight shot and killed the zombie. Abby just looked at him in amazement. She was shocked at what he almost did. Gilbert looked a little ashamed as well. I didn't say anything or give him a dirty look. I drained the hoses back into the underground storage tank and got everything more or less as clean as I could get it. With just a few more zombies coming into rifle range, I decided I really wanted to get inside the store to see if anything was left behind. I asked Patty and Gilbert if they thought we had ten minutes to spare, and they both thought we had the time. I smashed out the small shards of glass remaining in the broken window frame at the front of the store and climbed inside. Abby covered the front while I cleared the interior. Most of the store was cleaned out, and there were no undead inside. There was an epic pool of blood on the floor near the busted windows, though. I'm fairly sure someone who came in there cut themselves open on the glass when they jumped in. That someone didn't take the time to get the glass out of the way, and looks like they paid the price for their stupidity with a few pints of red innards. I snagged plastic bags from behind the counter and took everything I could find— Motor oil, shitty flashlights, few things of various batteries, lighters, condoms, energy shot drinks, car fresheners, few car ice scrapers, a bottle of diet generic cola, three rolls of toilet paper, and some miscellaneous bullshit that may or may not be useful at a later date. I'm starting to see some wisdom in the Patty and Abby school of loot acquisition. Bring everything home and sort it out later. As I handed Abby the bags of shit I'd gathered up, I realized I'd forgotten to check one of the largest areas in the store. I recalled that the coolers here had a walk-in door in the back so you could wheel a dolly right into the cooler directly. I told Abby I would be right back. I found the heavy-duty refrigerator door and yanked it open quickly, stepping back. Nothing moved inside, and I found a mother load. Stacked about waist-high, running ten feet straight along the back wall of the cooler were twelve packs of soda beer, energy drinks, and various other beverages you find at convenience stores. I grabbed the dolly sitting in the hall and stacked as much as I could and wheeled it out the front door. Abby busted a mega nut when she saw me wheeling it out and laughed again. Apparently, I was grinning ear to ear, screaming, Yahoo! as I ran across the parking lot, pushing the dolly, but I don't remember that at all. I think she's bullshitting me. I dropped the dolly near the ass end of Gilbert's truck and ran back inside to get the second load of soda with the other dolly I saw. When I was about three quarters of the way done loading the drinks on the dolly, I heard Patty and Gilbert's guns start barking at the undead outside. A small pack of dead folks had come out of the woodwork somehow and were alarmingly close to us. I wheeled the dolly out the front door again, stopped, and drew the Glock to help. I snapped off a small number of rounds to kill a few as Abby got everything loaded into the trucks. Once everything was clear enough to move safely, I helped Abby load the rest of the beverages into the truck, along with the two dollies, and we all piled into the trucks. We were history. The plow truck drove like shit with all the extra weight from the full barrels. I nearly lost control rounding a reasonably gentle corner due to the barrels shifting sideways and a slick sleet covering the road. Luckily, I was paying attention and avoided losing all the fuel we'd just worked so hard to get. The roads home were clear of danger, and it didn't appear that we had led any undead our way towards campus. Our first stop was Big Blue. We topped off Big Blue out of one of the barrels, then topped off the other barrel we'd left behind on campus. That meant the one barrel in the trunk was empty enough to get off the truck using the engine lift we'd used to move the stove. 
Once that was down, we topped it off with the barrel still in the truck. You get the idea. In the end, we had all our gas cans full, and all our barrels topped off, except for one that was about half full. All in all, a laborious process, but very fruitful. I think this was totally worth it. I want to say we only had to fire maybe 20 or 40 rounds in total, and those were all kills, so in reality, we can't say those rounds were wasted. We need fuel, we need trade supplies, and the zombies need to die eventually. If we're going to do it, do it right, I suppose. Plus, all those drinks stashed in the cooler were a complete hardcore loot haul. After all that, I was a physical wreck. Everything was sore. Between the pounding from the damn rack I got courtesy of Patty and the constant cranking from the sump pump, I was a done boy. I wound up taking a two-hour nap until dinner. Patty was nice enough to crack open some cans of food and warm it up for us, and she brought me a plate on the couch where I passed out. (laughs) I fell asleep with my body armor on, too, which was funny. I haven't done that since Baghdad. Incidentally, not particularly comfortable to sleep in. Exhaustion is a powerful sleep aid, though. Everyone has settled down for the night. Gilbert headed back to Casa de Donahue for the evening, and Abby and Patty both headed in early. I'm sitting in the recliner right now watching Voltron on DVD and typing this. Otis has taken up residence on top of my Glock, which is sitting in the holster on the end table in arm's reach away. That cat loves guns. Can't get enough of sleeping on them. I'm not entirely sure what's next on our agenda, now that we're fueled up for a few weeks or so. I'm thinking we either go hunting to bag some deer, or maybe start clearing houses, or both. I'm fairly comfortable telling the other three to go off and do shit on their own now. I'd really like to head off into the woods early, early tomorrow and get some nice quiet time with the savage. Even if I don't kill anything, I'd be satisfied with some time away. Uh, Yeah, that sounds good. My alternative plan is to hit the daycare, but I'm far too sore to attempt to clear a building that size, especially one filled with pint-sized abominations a foot aside. Fuck that noise, Mr. Journal. Although, it might be amusing to try and clear a building using only a weed whacker or a four-iron. I'm a sucker for a challenge. Can you say suicide? Anywho, I'm headed in. It's an early night for Mr. Ring here. If I sleep well, I'll be up with the chickens and out into the woods looking for a twelve-point buck filled head-to-toe with yummy venison. Man, I'd love a big fat bastard with extra meat to trade to Mike on it. I'm gonna pop open a root beer. Or an orange soda. Or both. Fuck, I earned it. Adrian. March 12th. Fortune favors the bold. And the really quiet. Bagged a deer today. Wasn't the fat bastard I was hoping for, but it was a deer nonetheless. A small buck, maybe 110 pounds. I can't be certain of the weight because I didn't get on a scale holding it. I woke up early as I expected I would and decided to head out early to get set up in a hide before too much light got into the sky. I warmed up a can of chicken noodle soup and put it in one of the thermos containers we've had here forever. I grabbed up a few granola bars as well, and after stogging down a can of corn and a can of peas, I layered myself up good and marched into the woods. I walked out past the athletics field and the giant funeral pyre that still needed to be relit. It smelled horrid, in case you were wondering. Realizing that the bodies were putting off a wretched odor, I checked for the windage and made sure I went upwind and far from the pile of half-burnt bodies— I knew the deer would be scared away from the smell, and I wanted to minimize the chance I'd be sitting in a dead spot with that scent on the air. I put a solid mile down into the woods before I noticed animal tracks in the snow. I'd never been out to this area of the campus, and was kind of surprised to find a small stream heading north-south. I'm not sure how deep it is normally, but with the thaw we've had mixed with the few days' rain, it was definitely too deep for a zombie to cross. Finding that little gift was a pretty pleasant surprise. I don't know if you remember, Mr. Journal, but I was pretty desperate to wall off this backside of campus long ago, and knowing that stream is there makes me less antsy about it. It might also explain why we haven't had any undead wandering through the woods to get onto campus in this direction. I am, however, a little weirded out that there's a fair chance a zombie got swept away in the stream's current and is now trapped underneath the lake ice, bobbing around, waiting for spring to make its escape. 
That might keep me up a night or two. It'll have to get in line with the other shit that keeps me up at night, though. Anyway, moving up to the stream in a few places, I noticed several sets of tracks. I'm not positive, but there were at least three or four sets of deer tracks in the same 30 or 40 foot area. That's a great sign, as it means there are more deer right in our backyard should we want to hunt more. I don't want to overhunt them, though, at least not this winter. Next winter, after they've had an uninterrupted breeding season, we can hunt more, but for now, I want to give them a chance to repopulate. I found a downed tree that had a nice elbow and a thick branch and set myself up with a good field of view of the stream and the woods. I made myself comfortable, relaxed, and waited for something to come by. I came to the realization while sitting there in the woods that I miss my family. I miss hunting trips with dear old weird dad and my odd brothers. We hunted a fair amount growing up, and dad was very much an outdoorsman. Sitting there on a cold March morning, sipping my thermos of hot soup, all I could think about was being fifteen and waiting for my first buck to walk by. I'd been reminiscing for a few hours when the deer I took down crept up on the stream for a drink. Without moving too much, I lifted the savage and let it dip its head into the stream to get a drink. Mid-swallow, I clicked the safety, which froze the deer like a painting. A fifty-yard shot later, and I was hoofing it to make sure it was dead. The shot hadn't killed it immediately, and it had put about twenty yards of real estate behind it from where I'd shot it. It was dead in the snow when I found it. Using my uncle's old hunting knife, I gutted it and started the hour-long process of dragging it back to campus to preserve. I radioed to the girls and Gilbert that I'd gotten a deer, and a cheer came back. I tell you what, fresh meat and hide goes a long way towards cheering folks up. Gilbert met me at the ass end of campus with his truck, and we drove to the maintenance building I'd converted into a smokehouse. He helped me dress it and make all the right cuts. I tell you what, he's done that before. Even though this deer was smaller than the one I'd gotten last, he salvaged the same amount of meat off it. We didn't have enough salt to brine any meat this time, so we relied on smoking it. We also set aside a few steaks to enjoy for dinner, and I assure you, Mr. Journal, if this journal had taste-o-vision, you'd be in hog heaven. It was beyond phenomenal. While Gilbert was getting the fire going for the venison smoking, I snagged a small two-gallon gas container and a few armloads of wood and drove back out to the pyre to get it relit. I got the wood put into strategic places and used a gallon or so of gas to get it all going, and voila, pyre was relit. After I threw most of my yummy soup up due to stench reasons, I headed back to the smokehouse, and Gilbert gave me a huge pat on the back for bringing home the bacon. And the deer hide as well, which Gilbert says he can use. I still had the hide from before as well, so now we have two hides to use. Yay for us. After that, I decided I'd spend the rest of the day being warm inside and messing with Otis. He's been pretty cheerful lately, and I felt like obliging his frisky nature with some attention. Over our venison dinner, we four went over plans for the near future and all the possibilities of what could happen with new folks arriving from Westfield. Everyone is scared, but also very excited. Abby is more hopeful and excited over the possibility of Gavin coming to be here, which shouldn't surprise anyone with a functioning heartbeat. We also discussed the timing of getting more shit accomplished. We need to build barrier walls around campus that can fully secure the area. At the very least, we need to start the dialogue with Mike about getting additional manpower here to help us with it. This will really be an issue once warm weather comes, as the undead will be able to get around easier, and we'll be out in the athletics fields planting and maintaining our crops on a regular basis. Last thing we need is one of us to get jumped while we're bending down to stick a cucumber seed in the dirt. We also agreed that the daycare was a ripe target for clearing, if only to make sure it wasn't filled with undead children. Patty seemed very adamant about making sure we put them to rest at the very least. I had to agree with her on principle. It's creeping me out right now thinking about the possibility of there being a building filled with kids scratching and clawing their way out, one tiny broken fingernail at a time. If we get any food or diapers or formula out of the place too, then fantastic. If not, then we've done our good deed for the day. None of us felt comfortable doing it tomorrow on such short notice. Mike will have to wait a bit for his baby formula supplies. We'd passed a few houses that were far enough from downtown that we could clear them without too much fuss, and the girls were all gung-ho about clearing them. 
Gilbert said he'd be more than happy to go with them, which means I got a day off tomorrow. I think I'm going to try and figure out a way to destroy the ice near the bridge to cut down on the likelihood of any zombies using it as a fucking freeway again. After that, who knows, maybe I'll channel 13-year-old Adrian and watch some porn on the big screen while everyone's away. If I'm lucky, maybe Otis will sit on the couch near me, watching with that quizzical look on his face as I do it. The day after tomorrow, we have our meet with Mike here, and I'm hoping we've got some good stuff we can trade him. I know we'll have extra venison we can trade, but I'd like to find some other things he might want. I also hope he's got some kind of a firm answer as to how many folks may or may not be interested in moving here to help even out the populations and give us some extra labor force. Either way, it'll be nice to see Mike and company. I am a big Mike fan. Adrian March 14th It's unreal how busy some days are around here. The past couple of days have been hectic, run-your-ragged bullshit days. I have that pleasant, I accomplish shit and thus feel good about myself glow. Almost satisfying as the sex afterglow. I mean, definitely not the same as that, because, shit, sex afterglow is pretty good stuff, but this is still nice. More comparable to the, I just had a really satisfying piece of cake afterglow. Campus security, since our massive onslaught, has been priority number one for me. Everyone has been walking on pins and needles because we've had so many zombies up Auburn Lake Road and here on campus. We never actually counted the bodies, but there were hundreds and hundreds up here after the third, and my bizarre dream about the white room. Ooh, sudden urge. I am compelled to capitalize that suddenly into the white room. That seems more correct to me for some reason. Odd sensation ran up my spine after I wrote that. The weirdness never stops around here. Knowing that the ice on the lake became a major liability made me want to break it all as best I could so the zombies couldn't fucking walk across it again. I knew it'd be tough and possibly dangerous work, but I really felt it needed to be done, if only to let me sleep at night. Yesterday the weather was pretty sweet, and instead of accompanying Patty, Abby, and Gilbert out on their small house-clearing project, I decided I'd play Adrian Smash. The girls and our elder Green Beret operator went off down Route 18 toward our new gas station to clear three houses they felt safe doing. They were good-sized homes, spread a fair bit apart, and with proper procedure they were confident it would go well. I think they felt pretty good about hiding their nervousness to me too, but I could see it in their eyes. It almost made me go with them, but they really needed this for themselves. Breaking the ice turned out to be much easier than I thought it would be. After eating a late breakfast solo and watching some porn on the big screen with some hand lotion and a tissue, also solo, much to my dismay, I grabbed an eight-foot length of two-by-four from our wood supply and headed to the bridge. The recent drizzle and subsequent fog has unnerved the piss out of me, but it has eaten away at the snow and ice like acid. The snow is half gone from our February high, and the ice around the bridge at the mouth of the stream-slash-river is busted into large chunks that appear to be somewhere around four inches thick. Seeing that it was already broken up somewhat, I simply leaned over the railing of the small bridge and hammered the end of the two-by-four into the edges of the large slabs of frozen lake. Repeated smashes chipped away dinner-plate-sized bits that floated away from the larger chunks. I did this for about four hours, taking a break every thirty seconds to make sure nothing was creeping up on me. I took a lunch break, finished off the last of our milk, and boy did I hear about that when the girls got home last night, and made myself a package of ramen noodles and mushroom soup. Not too shabby, all things considered. I put more hickory sticks on the fire in the smokehouse treating the venison we got the other day, and... I migrated my tired ass back to the bridge and smashed apart the rest of the huge icebergs near the bridge. I was happy with the situation there and made my way up river away from the lake, making sure the ice across the stream couldn't hold the weight of a person or a zombie, as the case may be. I worked up the stream for a few hundred yards out past where Hall E was. Worked up the stream? Ugh, sounds like I'm having a problem pissing. The majority of the water was open and pretty safe in terms of a potential crossing, but 
There were a few points where the ice spanned from boulder to boulder, and if a zombie had even a stitch of balance, they could make it across. I couldn't smash all that ice, but a few well-aimed glock shots broke it up enough without me risking my ass falling in the river. Good luck had it that I wrapped up just as Team Vagina plus Gilbert returned with the tundra and the Chevy overflowing with lootage. I don't think I've ever seen the women quite that giddy, positively overwhelmed with joy. Even Gilbert was grinning and laughing, and that shit is just infectious. I laughed the moment they hopped out of the trucks, and the entire time we unloaded everything into the cafeteria and the halls we're using to store stuff. Once I saw what they'd come back with, I couldn't help but get a wee bit silly myself. The three houses they had cleared were reasonably affluent homes that were left untouched after June. They were pristine and very well appointed. The largely useless yet cool loot was jewelry, clothing, perfumes, cologne, and bedding. The good shit they got, though, was awesome shit. You know those temper memory foam beds? One house had two, and one of the other houses had two more, and they got all of them into one truck. Gilbert already had one at his house, and now so do we. I slept last night on a cloud of happiness and and comfort. Granted, I've traded in room space for a queen-sized bed in a small dorm room, but fuck it. I slept like a goddamn baby last night, and I love sleeping. I don't mind having to walk across my bed to go to the closet. The ladies also brought back a metric assload of booze. We are now knee-deep in the expensive shit as well as the cheap shit. Very exciting for trade bait, for sure. They also came back with boxes of canned food, as well as more soda and pasta, boxes of crackers, bags of flour, huge supplies of all kinds of spices and salt and pepper, and a ton of awesome kitchen appliances. Apparently one of the houses was owned by a chef or restaurant owner. It was a major food score, to say the least. They also had more stuff of no particular note, but the best of the best stuff they left behind, and we retrieved it this morning— one of the houses had another gas-powered generator, a pretty robust one as well. It took us all morning to get the damn thing out of the house and into the truck. Right now, we've got it in the gymnasium to power our larger wood shop. No final home for it yet. Amongst the three houses, they managed to find another Mossberg 12-gauge shotgun, two hunting rifles, one in two twenty three and one in thirty out six, as well as a three fifty seven revolver and a three eighty Walter. I haven't done an ammo count yet, but it looks like about 30 to 50 rounds in each of those calibers. The rest of yesterday evening was us going through and categorizing the stuff they brought back. Gilbert used some of the new food to cook us all an awesome dinner, and oddly enough, Abby was attached to his old ass the whole time. Patty said they had a nice heart-to-heart -heart about the whole Gavin issue, and Abby does really like him, and Patty is now on board with the idea of them playing house. I think Abby watching Gilbert cook was the first moments of Abby's willing domestication. I almost cried watching her help Gilbert. She must really like Gavin. Abby of eight months ago would have told a boy to go fuck himself sideways with an Xbox controller if he asked her to make dinner. Our little girl is growing up. I really wish Charles was here to see this. I miss Charles and Randy. I hadn't thought of them in some time, but... Last night and today with Abby and whatnot, they've been on my mind. I feel like Abby's surrogate father now to some extent, and I almost feel like I'm stealing Chuck's glory. Hmm. I hope I can do justice by his wife and daughter, I suppose. I'd hate to think I failed them as a protector, and even more so as a friend. After dinner and organizing, Gilbert sauntered home, and the girls and I watched a chick flick in the living room. We all crashed reasonably early so we could head back to the house and retrieve that generator this morning, which we did. Oh, I totally forgot. The girls cleared the three houses themselves with Gilbert providing exterior cover support. The girls encountered something like seven zombies during the house clearing, and they said they handled them with no issues. I am very proud. Today, however, was a bit messier. Their activity yesterday drew in about twenty-five undead, which made for a small bit of trouble. We took the plow truck and Gilbert's Chevy, and I took out about eight of them with the plow. The rest we took down with accurate rifle fire. 
Messiest part of the whole damn morning was having to smash the heads of the not-quite-dead folks I hit with the plow. I went to kill one of the male zombies I hit with the truck and noticed, just as I was about to brain them with the halligan, that I knew him. It was one of the teachers from the school, Mr. Chin, our Chinese language professor. He had the summer off last year and wasn't on campus when everything went down. I wonder if he'd still be alive if he'd gone to work June 23rd. I wonder if he would have survived with me, and instead of having me stave his forehead in today, he might be helping me do the same to someone else. The twists and turns life takes, I guess. I killed him, like the rest of the zombies before him, and we got the generator loaded up. To save on energy, we used the engine lift to get it out of the trucks and into the gymnasium. It was fortunate we did so, because not five minutes after we got into Hall E to clean up, Mike came over the radio saying he was a few miles out and heading in shortly. Mike came in a single Humvee loaded to the gills with goodies for us to trade for. He also brought Gavin, Ollie, and Ollie's woman, Melissa, and officially they are a couple now. Ollie and Melissa are sugary sweet and obviously very happy being together. Gavin shot his skinny ass right to Abby the moment the truck door opened. They paired off and spent the entire visit together, pulling security outside. On at least one level, I was happy having them do that. I mean, hell, Gavin has military experience, and I'd go into the bowels of hell with Abby now. As long as the two of them don't drop their pants and go on a sexual expedition somewhere down south, I feel very safe. I hope to fucking hell they've got the good sense to wear a friggin' rubber, though. We don't need another pregnant person here. Speaking of pregnant people here, Ollie and Melissa are expecting. Can't say I didn't see that coming, though. Those two look happy as pigs and shit. And interestingly enough, they are interested in relocating here to live on campus. I know, weird, right? Never saw it coming with Ollie. I got the impression he and his dad were inseparable. I figured he had worked on his dad's farm his entire life and would never want to leave there. Ollie and Melissa had such solid reasoning for coming here, though, none of us could deny the logic of it. Ollie has run his father's farm with him since he was old enough to be helpful to his dad. That's a lot of useful experience to spread around. When spring hits and we start planting, Ollie already knows how to do everything. All we need to do is be Ollie's brute labor, and he's our agricultural brains. Ironic that my first impression of him was that he was dim-witted. Turns out he's pretty smart. He's just moving at a different pace than the rest of us. Add to that the fact that my first meeting with him was at gunpoint, and I guess it's easy to get the wrong impression about folks. He and Melissa also went on about how they wanted a fresh start with fresh air and new people. She went on at length that the school had too many sour memories in it for her due to Sean's asshole nature, and she wanted out one way or the other. With everything else, it makes a lot of sense for them to come here. I like Melissa. I can see why Ollie digs her. She's a smidge chunky, but not fat. Mid-length brown hair and a pretty warm smile. I think she's about thirty, but it's hard to tell. She has a very youthful face, and I wouldn't be surprised if she was years older than she looks. She's chesty as all hell, too. When she gets laid into pregnancy, she's going to have boobs the size of motorcycle helmets, poor woman. Her back will be busted. I also get this odd feeling about her. I like her, don't get me wrong, but she seems seasoned or something, like sort of hard. I got the same feeling from some of the soldiers I served with after a while. You get this certain expression or way about you that just exudes experience and a history of dealing with shit. I think her experience with that day was pretty rough or something. I think Ollie deeply loves her, and I think she loves the stability he represents. He's got this unending charm that just pervades everything. His kind of round face, easy manner, short red hair, and big smile are welcome wherever he goes. You can see how much Mike admires and appreciates his company. You can also see the pain in his face when Ollie and Melissa talk about leaving. We talked about just them for over an hour, and the consensus opinion is that they were more than welcome to move here at the end of the month. That would give us about two weeks to change our minds about it and also allow them time to pack, say the goodbyes, and let us prep an area for them. We're thinking Hall A is the obvious choice, but 
The more I think about it, I'm wondering if Hall B is the better idea. Hall B is the closest dorm to the athletic fields, and if Obby's going to be our HFIC, head farmer in charge, then he ought to be close to the fields. It'll cut down on his walking and on any gas he might waste going back and forth over the summer from Hall A to the fields. Of course, you realize, Mr. Journal, we'd have to install a generator on Hall B as well as try to find another wood stove for there as well so next winter we save on our heating oil supplies. Hmm, I'll figure it out. There's always work to be done. After that discussion, Mike made the expected announcement that Gavin was interested in coming here too. Now, as much as we want Abby to be happy, we desperately need this to be worked out clearly and make sure that Gavin understands the reality that moving here for a girl might not be the best idea. We all talked and agreed that if Gavin was well aware that a relationship might end and it could be ugly, he was more than welcome to come and stay here. We also agreed his answer would not come today and he'd have the same waiting period. Mike said he'd handle the talk with Gavin later when they got back to the school in Westfield. Mike also said there were five or six other people interested in coming here, but for the sake of maintaining sanity, we had to agree to take on more women. We were taking Ollie and likely Gavin from them, and they were already super lopsided with chicks. If we don't take females in from there, the school will turn pink and soon be filled bottom to top with shoes. I told Mike we'd take a few of the pretty women off his hands. He laughed, but I think he wanted to shoot me some. Our trade for the day was large and in charge. Mike positively busted a nut when we told him we had a few venison steaks for him. He immediately said he was interested in that, as well as four of the twelve packs of soda we got the other day and a few bottles of various liquors we'd acquired over time. We refilled all of their water jugs again, which is saying something, because every time they come here to trade, there are more water jugs. For all that, we got four bottles of milk, a chicken to eat, four loaves of hearty fresh bread, a dozen eggs, an M4 rifle with four empty magazines, and another IOTV from their base. Mike said he had a spare ACOG to mount on the M4 if I wanted it. I said, hells yes, I'd kill for an ACOG. He said he'd make sure it was available on our next meeting. All of that seemed like a fair trade to me. I also confirmed with Mike that if Gavin left to join us, he'd keep his guard gear and weapons. Mike said, of course. They had spare gear anyway, and his stuff could go with him. Incidentally, that in and of itself is almost worth telling the kid to move for— Another rifle and pistol on the team. Mike officially extended the offer that if we bagged another deer and wanted to have a cookout, he'd guarantee ten people would make the trip to help with manual labor. He was thinking of helping to build walls on campus, as well as fortifying other building windows, and even working with Ollie to get the crops planted when we get to that point. I thought that was a hell of an idea, and I was down for it, so if I get another deer in the near future, we'll arrange a badass cookout and hopefully get this damn work done. Everyone took off after that. Abby and Gavin looked like they were on cloud nine after getting some time alone together. I just hope they were responsible young adults and did their jobs. And if they took a break to insert tab A into slot B, then they used a condom or a very effective pullout maneuver. As I said, another baby would suck, almost as much as having to take Abby out of the rotation for dangerous work. We decided that March 31st would be our next meeting and that we would make the trip to Westfield to visit them. Of course, it's almost impossible to deliver the water to them that way, but Mike said that was fine. All the rain we've gotten has curtailed their fresh water demands. He reiterated their need for hygiene products, and he also suggested if we could get more canned fruits, that'd be swell. We've got a ton in the cafeteria, which is great. And with that, they departed. I'm happy right now. It was a great few days here, and I feel like things are on the upswing. I'm sleeping good, I've got a new amazing fucking bed, and we've got fresh food again, and it looks like we're adding new people who can really add something to the little family we've got. Mr. Journal, I am also aware of the fact that every time things start to look good, things go south like a motherfucker. Maybe I should curb my enthusiasm. Shut my pie hole and be a curmudgeon bitch. Ugh, life sucks. I hate whatever it is I need to hate to satisfy karma. Adrian March 16th 
It occurs to me I need a friggin' plan here. Like, a good plan, too. I'm sick of this stumbling through life with a perpetually confused look on my face. I move from infuriating moment to joy back to pain, over to happiness, and wind up slowly pushing a series of turds down the drain with my big toe and hoping nothing peanutty scratches my skin. I'm doing okay, but I'm doing far too much last second winging it. I've hatched a devious plan for the next few weeks. Warm weather is coming, and things here on campus seem to have quieted down to the point where I feel like we can do shit outside without level 10 danger alerts every moment. I have no scale, incidentally, for that level 10 alert. I'm just implying that level 10 is bad with that, Mr. Journal. It's probably safe to assume that a level 1 alert is something like, I had too much coffee this morning and I can't really trust a fart today. Actually, depending on how much coffee you drink, that could probably rise to a level 4 or a level 5 emergency. Okay, let's say I can't find my fingernail clippers is level 1. Impending doom via zombies is level 7. And holy shit, I'm looking at 500 zombies marching at me right now, and I have no reasonably strong structure to hold up in or anything convincing to hide under is like level 10. That gives us a scale to work with. So, my plan consists of several phases that need to be done in a fairly certain order. Our standing orders are to fortify campus as best we can, when we can. My priority with that is making Hall B zombie-proof. We will be fortifying the lower doors and windows immediately. We actually started the job yesterday. We also need to replace the window on the second floor that busted out. Remember that, Mr. Journal? Cascade of teenage girl zombies? Blech. And a whole dorm room is soaked from rain and snow to the rafters, and we might need to yank up the floor to purge it. Once the doors are fortified and all the windows on the lower level and basement are secured, it'll be pretty much safe for human habitation. We need to get the generator placed in the basement, too, but that's peanuts, all things considered. We need to source a wood stove for Hall B as well. The kitchen-slash-dining area would be a great spot for one, as would be the central foyer so the heat can rise up to the second floor. I can envision little red-headed kids running up and down the central staircase in there, too. It makes me happy and warm and fuzzy and stuff. Next on the agenda is to hit that daycare like the zombie baby apocalypse. For them, I mean, not for us. We could use any supplies contained inside, and the thought of having any undead children inside sours my milk. Worst case, it's another cleared building— Best case, we score some baby food, formula, diapers, baby wipes, regular food, baby clothes, whatever. And in actuality, this is the first time I've even considered the fact that we need baby clothes. I guess it's not a desperate need, but if we need to hustle out to escape, I'd rather any little tykes we have not be butt-naked. After we hit the daycare, I want to start heading deeper into downtown to recon. I know from what Brian said this side of town hadn't been touched by his people, and if my memory serves, we've got something like 200 homes left in that area. Never mind any businesses that may have survived looting. I'm sure by this juncture there are other survivors that at one point or another looted places, but with any luck they're either still alive and hopefully willing to join forces, or they're dead, and what remains of the shit they stole is at their houses. Yeah, I'll concede that's a dick thing to say, but it's the reality of the matter. I want to return to Stig. I'm sure there are still usable scraps left behind. I'm also curious if there are any items worth taking from the surrounding businesses in the industrial park. Even shit like pallet jacks would be really nice. If we can get a semi-rig up here too, sweetness would ensue. My kingdom for a forklift. Preferably an electric one, but... I'll manage with a propane-powered one if need be. Shitty news is the lumber business in town went out a couple years ago when Home Depot moved in a few towns over, so bulk lumber will be hard to find locally. I might be able to find some at some of the new constructions on the outskirts of town, though. I know there was a housing development getting started out there last summer, and with any luck at all, their wood was covered and well-protected. If we can score a truckload of good lumber, our lives would become much simpler. There's always the idea of building a concrete wall, but we'd need a lot of blocks, and those take a fairly long time to set up. Regardless of the specific building supplies we use, good fences make for good neighbors and distant zombies. Tomorrow we hit the daycare. 
I'm, well, I'm scared to do it, but it's necessary. I feel it in my bones that we need to find out if that place is filled with dead children, and if it is, then we need to handle it like adults. If it's clean, then we take what we can and get the fuck out. After the daycare, we start to look at revisiting Stig. After Stig, if that goes well, then we can recon town, and if that goes well, I'd like to get back to my home and see if Cassie made it back there before she died. Closure for the win? Adrian. March 18th. I didn't have the energy or the will to sit down and talk about what happened at the daycare after we got back last night. I assure you, it was a draining experience. I'll go into it at length in a moment. Today was a day for us to unwind and scour the memories of that place from our collective heads. Yesterday was a douchebag day, and today we douched out yesterday's memories. As fresh as a summer's eve, if you will. Much like yesterday, we dealt with fire today. We relit the last embers of the giant pyre in the staff housing area of campus. The enormous pile of bodies has been burning for so long I can't even remember when we lit it originally. After today's work getting a good flame going, I think the corpses will be destroyed within a day or two. We had to use a large portion of the firewood we chopped up for the wood stove in Hall A, as well as another gallon of our precious gasoline to get it started. The damn rain and sleet and shit we've been dealing with have hampered the flames hardcore and driving me up a wall here. While Abby and I were doing that, Gilbert and Patty sorted out the shit we brought back from the daycare. Gilbert was useless with his injury, though, and from what Patty said, he more or less hung around bitching and making a terrible effort at lending moral support. I think he'll heal up nicely, or at least adequately, but at his age it's anyone's guess as to how long it'll take. My trusty sidekick and I hit the smokehouse and made sure the flames were burning slow and that there was plenty of smoke. We wound up having to trudge back into the outskirts of campus to find enough of the right kind of branches to ensure the smoke would be adequate to cure the meat. Pain in the ass mucking through all that damn snow sludge. It's a wonderful consistency right now. Always finds a way to get into your boot and soak your socks. Our labors completed for the day, we... Retired to help Patty finish sorting bullshit and have a decent sit-down meal. We forced Gilbert to stay here last night as well as tonight, and he's holding a grudge about it. I can hear him again tonight bitching under his breath a few rooms down the hall. He's so damn funny. It's just like dealing with kids. Yesterday. Yeah, about that. Huh. <sighs> I'd say we geared up for the apocalypse, but that'd be doing everything we do when we go out on a normal day, no justice. I should say that we rolled out with much more gear than normal. Extra ammo, extra food, extra medical supplies, spare fuel, and a few new additions to our battle plans. As I said, we've accumulated new IOTV armor from Mike. That's heavier-duty military-issue body armor. I'm rocking it, and Abby's wearing our second set. I haven't had a chance to sight in the M4 Mike gave us the other day, and until I know how it shoots, I'm not taking it anywhere. Thus, I rolled with the M15, Patty with the TAC-22, Abby with her handgun assortment, and Gilbert rocked his AK. Oh yeah, I also brought my trusty 12-gauge, and I made sure there were halligans on the truck as well. Go me. Abby made a funny offhand comment about taking on the herd of undead ankle biters right as we were about to leave, and it suddenly hit me that we had shin guards in one of the athletic storage closets somewhere. Don't know why, but it seemed vitally important to bring them. It took me twenty minutes to find them, but it turned out to be well worth it. We all strapped a set of girls' shin guards on our legs, and Patty and Abby actually took the time to fashion half-assed forearm guards out of a set of them in the truck on the way to the daycare. I think they're planning on actually making more professional versions soon. I'm all for it. They seem to stop bites pretty effectively. We rolled in two vehicles down to the daycare. Once again, there are no good reasons to go in a single vehicle unless we have to. Because we wanted something diesel-powered and beastly, we took the heavy rescue truck, and Gilbert drove his Chevy. The girls all rode with me in the HRT, and Gilbert drove himself. Our plan was the same as every other house clearing, recon the exterior of the building on all sides and ensure the vicinity was clear from threats, check in all the windows of said building to ensure we had a better idea of what was going on inside, 
open the front door and clear the house room by room, one panic-stricken heartbeat at a time. Loop building for anything usable? Leave building. The first few phases went like clockwork. Abby bounded across the snow to check the sides and back of the daycare, and the rest of us made sure the streets and vicinity were safe. When we drove up, there were no undead anywhere to be seen, which gave all of us the creeps. The proverbial calm before the storm, as it turns out. Abby took a solid ten minutes to check all the windows of the daycare, and just like the last time, she returned saying there was nothing visible anywhere inside the building. I wasn't comforted by that, and neither was Gilbert. We had visions of zombified children hiding under little plastic play tables and inside counters and cabinets. <laughs> Gilbert pulled road security for us while the rest of us kicked in doors. I went in number one in the stack with Patty and Abby. I rolled with the gauge. They went with pistols. Brace yourself for this, Mr. Journal. There were no children in the daycare. Sort of. The stench was overwhelming, though, which was a real kick in the pants. Usually that much stink meant a plethora of undead, but there were none to be found. See, sort of. See also, God hates Adrian. I kicked in the doors that were locked and opened the doors that weren't. Not one shotgun blast happened the entire time we went from room to room. We had some pants-wrecking moments when items were bumped off shelves or tables and they fell on the floor or hit one of us, but we encountered jack and shit overall. See again, sort of. After the most tense half-hour in my entire life, we started to take stock of our haul. The ground clearance on the HRT and the Chevy is pretty impressive, and with the snow melt, we were able to drive them both across the parking lot slash driveway and right up the front door. I had to shovel out the walkway and the steps, and I tell you what, I'm glad Patty thought to grab one of our snow shovels. We snagged two cribs, a bunch of toys, a stroller, 17 boxes of diapers in various sizes and flavors, baby wipes, baby oil, baby powder, baby shampoo, baby aspirin, books on how to raise kids and deal with health ailments, Pedialyte, etc., etc., and then there were snacks— Jumping Jesus, there were snacks. They had fruit roll-ups, granola bars, crackers, candy, and almost every form of small fruit snack imaginable to man. We took it out of there by the case. We took a short lunch break to try out the fruit roll-ups a little before noon. We shut the front door of the daycare due to the smell of the trash that had never been removed. Months-old rotting diapers and food waste had only improved with age. Update on fruit snacks, Mr. Journal. Still very yummy. Anyway, Gilbert gobbled down some little fruit chews and went inside to get a head start on getting the last bits of stuff out. The girls and I were remarking how much of a relief it was that the weather was decent and how the place was nice and safe when we heard a loud crash and the world ripped apart inside the daycare. Gilbert's AK goes to full auto and he just emptied an entire magazine into... something. If you've ever heard an AK get emptied like that up close, it's a pretty distinct and bowel-emptying noise. I know a lot of guys who had buddies get torn open by that zipper sound. It brings back some bad memories. I launched off the back of the Chevy and snapped up the shotgun. It was the closest gun to my hand. Patty and Abby froze for a split second, but I was in the door and heading to Gilbert like a missile. I could hear him yelling from what sounded like the back of the building near the kitchen. Get the fuck holy jumpin' little cocksuckers! There were a few more colorful uses of the language as well, but to retain what little dignity Gilbert has left, I'm going to omit them. I went down the hall with the shotgun up looking for Gilbert or signs of danger. In the back near the kitchen, there was a huge floor-to-ceiling bookcase tipped over face down on the floor— it had fallen down somehow, and Gilbert had managed to get his toes on one foot trapped underneath the edge. He was still upright and dangerous, but when the bookcase had fallen over, it revealed a doorway heading to the basement. The smell wafting upwards into the kitchen from the black opening into the cellar was easily one of the worst things I have ever breathed in. Even right now I'm coughing, and I think it's just psychosomatic. 
Gilbert's spray of rounds had decapitated at least three small kids that burst through the opening to the basement. He was literally rooted to the floor at the doorway, and from below I could see a mass of glistening white eyes floating up the stairs towards us. All the children had been trapped in the basement the whole time. Someone had shut them down there and pushed the bookcase in front of the opening to hide the door. I recall now seeing that the doorknob had been removed so the bookcase could slide flush against the wall. I had a split second to make a decision. If I was wrong or hesitated, Gilbert would be killed. Panic couldn't happen or my friend would die or I might die. Phew. I pulled the shotgun's trigger and sent a spray of pellets down the stairs into the dark. Some of the eyes went black, and I heard little bodies tumble away into the depths of the daycare cellar. Without putting any thought into it, I racked and fired the Mossberg over and over until it clicked dry. I stepped on the bookcase to get into the doorway, which caused Gilbert to scream out in pain. He claims that was the moment his toes broke. We can't be sure. He's got no right to bitch at me, that's for sure. At least he's still alive. I dove into the doorway and started to reload the shotgun. Behind me, I heard Patty and Abby arrive in the kitchen and start to help Gilbert. We yelled and hollered as I literally used my body to block the basement. Right about then, the girls started yelling that the bookcase was too heavy for them to lift. I looked back to them to assess, and when I turned to check the basement below again, more of the white eyes had appeared. In the dark, all I could see was the reflection off the milky white haze in their eyes. Creepiest thing I have ever seen, easily. I let loose a couple more shotgun blasts to buy myself some time, and I sprinted up the couple of steps back into the kitchen. I jumped over the bookcase and tossed the shotgun to Abby, who caught it like a champ. Anything comes up the steps, blast it, I hollered to her. She swallowed hard and jumped over the bookcase to block the doorway with her tiny body. I motioned for Patty to get the fuck out of the way, and I Hercules tossed the bookcase. It smashed in the glass window on the stove when it landed kitty-cornered. Gilbert lost his balance and stumbled backwards, smashing his ass end into a kitchen counter. He yelped in pain and called me a few very choice names, but he was free. I think I told him to shove his attitude up his ancient asshole, and Patty and I grabbed him to help get him outside. I told Abby to follow us out. Down the hall and through the rooms we went, half helping, half carrying old man Donahue with the busted toes. Patty went ahead and opened the passenger side of the Chevy, and I got him in. I turned to make sure Patty and Abby were okay, and all I saw was Patty. Abby never followed us out. Patty's face went white as a sheet when we heard my shotgun start going off inside the daycare. I told her to stay put. Sitting in the bed of the Chevy was my M15, so I snagged it, flicked it to three-round burst, and headed back inside towards the sound of my Mossberg. I don't think I've had a heart attack before. I mean, I can say comfortably that up until yesterday, my heart has always beat in a normal fashion. When under stress or when I'm scared, yeah, sure, it hammers away, but that's normal. When I came down the hall and saw Abby on her back, pinned to the fallen bookcase by a twenty-something girl zombie with at least three or four more toddler-sized undead biting and scratching at her legs, my heart completely stopped beating. See... God hates Adrian. My heart didn't beat again until I was done smashing them off her. I didn't fire my rifle so close to her. I might have hit her. Bitten or not, I wouldn't risk shooting her until we were safe, and I could wrap my mind around it. I brought the collapsible stock of the M15 down on the back of the skull of the bitch on top of Abby, staving her spinal cord apart where it met the brain. Her weight sagged onto my little girl, and I started straight up punting those bitch-ass kids down the stairs. One of them flew so high in the air, it bounced off the sloped ceiling of the stairs before tumbling with a crunch into the dark. I don't even remember how many I kicked. Abby was crying and bloodied as she shoved the bitch off her, and I emptied my magazine down the stairs to try and kill off the apparently never-ending supply of dead kids. She stood up, and I barked out to her to get an axe from the rescue truck. She returned with one of the heavy-duty fire axes just as I made a magazine swap and squeezed off a couple bursts. I handed her the M15, and with righteous fury, I took a few steps down and smashed the top few steps apart. The little legs of the dead kids couldn't make the jump up a few steps, and they were trapped. I grabbed the shotgun and her, sobbing and all, and let her out. 
Patty took her, and I grabbed a Zippo lighter, one of the firefighters left in the truck, and one of the two-gallon tanks of gas we typically bring as spare fuel. I drew my Glock and headed back inside with arson on the mind. The house took a bit to catch fire with intensity, but it did. We drove the trucks out into the road to get away from the heat, but I tell you what, once it was going good, it went up like a house of matchsticks. We could hear the fire alarms beeping from outside. Good batteries. Guess the sprinkler system didn't survive the apocalypse, though. As it burned with a terrible roar, we checked Abby for bites or wounds. She was scratched something fierce and had a pretty bad cut on the back of her head from being tackled by the bitch zombie, but otherwise she was fine. Her shin guard saved her from all the bites. My mind kept repeating over and over her joke from earlier. Undead ankle biters. Had she not busted that joke and I not thought of the shin guards, Abby would be dead right now, and I might be eating the barrel of my Glock, too. Gilbert has three broken toes. They're mangled-looking, all bruised red and purple, but they should heal well enough for him to walk as well as he could before the injury. He's got some Percocets for the pain, and he has decided that sipping on some Johnny Walker Blue Label is the best medicine, which isn't really all that bad of an idea. Everything was under control for the few hours it took for the house to collapse. We kept moving further and further away from the fire as it got more and more intense. Eventually, the sound of our gunfire drew in shamblers, but luckily it was just a few, and Patty snapped off some twenty twos and took care of them. Once the fire subsided, I asked Patty for the TAC-22, and I walked back to the smoldering hole in the earth where the daycare was. I felt safe in approaching it, as the foundation was pretty deep, and I thought the undead kids would be trapped down there anyway if they survived the fire. Many of them did survive. They were charred and blackened, many of them still smoking and stumbling around in the rubble-strewn cellar. I counted ten. Once I started shooting, they all turned on me and made a rush to try and get at me, but they couldn't get out of the basement. I was killing fish in a barrel, burnt, rotting, undead children instead of fish, though. See, sort of. See, God hates Adrian. See, vomit. That's why I'm scared of zombies that are on fire. The flames don't kill the brain. The bodies get set on fire and the bodies are damaged, but they're just as dangerous as ever. More so if they're still aflame. It takes far too long and too intense a flame to risk killing them with fire. I'm so glad I didn't use fire as a means to kill them before this. The daycare was a little different, mind you, being that they were trapped in the basement. This worked out, and even so, only barely. I don't think it would work out as well otherwise. I think, officially, this was our closest call with death yet. It feels like it to me. Maybe it's because I thought Abby was bitten. That moment of despair where someone you really care about is in mortal peril. Reminds me so much of Iraq again, but this is so different. More than our lives are on the line here. I can tell that much just from my dreams. <sighs> I got everything back sometime around four or five in the afternoon. No one wanted to unpack anything, and it looked like the weather would hold overnight, so we brought the food in and left everything else. I had to carry Gilbert inside, too, because the pain in his foot was off the damn chain. He couldn't even support his weight walking from the truck. After collapsing where we could, we cleaned up Abby's scrapes and bruises and watched her go positively schizoid looking for bite wounds. She was certain somewhere, somehow, one of those little bastards got her. Fortunately, no teeth marks were found on her. It does raise the question in my mind of what constitutes a lethal bite. One tooth? Four teeth? Any form of wound caused by anything oral at all? Hmm, I don't know. Play it safe, and don't get any injuries at all from anything anywhere near the mouth of a zombie, I guess. I'm practicing zombie bite abstinence. We have adjusted our plan slightly to allow for recuperation. As I said, we did little today, and tomorrow we plan on doing little at all again. Campus activities. The day after that, I plan to head into town solo. Gilbert's foot is very painful, and there's no expectation that should he need to move on foot, he can. 
bringing him anywhere off campus right now would be a mistake. Patty can go with me, I suppose. There's nothing to keep her here. Abby seems a little distraught. She's jumpier today than she ever has been, and she seems twitchy, bitchy, and frayed. Bringing her into potential danger so quickly might start the whole PTSD cycle, and I can't afford to lose her to that. Incidents like this make me wish Gavin and Ollie were here. More able bodies to deal with violence. Able minds? Now, well, that's a different question, I guess. I'm heading out on the 20th. If all goes well, we can start making real plans for driving a wedge into the town, finishing off the undead there, and maybe finding survivors. I can say this with certainty today. I am less enthusiastic about children being here now. Adrian March 20th Despite how large campus is, it astounds me how large the world is outside of it. For the most part, I have been cooped up here on campus for almost nine months now. This town is huge, Mr. Journal. Gigantic compared to this friggin' place. As you can probably surmise, I'm not dead, which means my trip downtown was a success. I've learned quite a bit about the barrio, so to speak. Keeping with the theme of trying to make constant progress on campus... Yesterday, we went back to work on Hall B. We've ripped out the rug, the pad underneath it, the drywall, and all the furniture in the room where those girls died. The furniture went on the smoldering funeral pyre, which was largely burnt out, but with the fresh infusion of grody-ass lumber has flared up for a bit. The bunk beds and dressers and chairs and desks of that room were heinous, Mr. Journal, filthy and crusted over with thick, dark blood made me want to hurl just looking at the stuff. After we tossed that shit out of the window and got it on the burn pile, I grabbed a spare window out of the maintenance storage area, and we got that busted one out. All we need to do now is find drywall and new rug padding and a rug and some fresh paint, and the room will be good as new. I am so all over that task. I think that job has Ollie written all over it. All of the windows and doors on the basement and first level are now barred with two-by-fours and three quarter-inch plywood barriers. I did them the same as the Hall E barriers, so the upper window can be lowered and you can shoot over the barrier. They're reinforced with three two-by-fours per window, and they're attached with some heavy-duty screws right into the frames of the window and house. It'd take an army to beat them down. One just about the same size as the one we repelled a few weeks ago— Maybe I need to start looking for iron bars. Hall E's window barriers held, so they can't be all bad, I suppose. Nothing like a good field test to reassure yourself of something. Beyond that, we did Dick yesterday. Gilbert is now a really big fan of Percocet and Johnny Walker Blue. He's gone through a whole bottle of the stuff, th the liquor, and he's taken a perk every five or six hours so we can walk around. As long as he's three sheets to the wind, he's pretty funny, and Patty is in stitches babysitting him. She's telling us some of his more hilarious war stories when he's blacked out on the couch, and they put my shit to shame. I feel like a choir boy boy scout virgin when I hear his shit. I just pale in comparison. Adrian Ring, chairman of the Knitting Club, wearer of tidy whities that's neither here nor there, though. I need to make some progress on this so I can go to bed. It's been a long day and I'm tired, plus Otis looks cranky. He's glaring at me from the foot of the bed, and I think he wants me to stop clicking incessantly on this keyboard. Patience, buddy, I feed you. Understand the food chain in this household. I love you, but my patience does have limits. Speaking of food, our indoor gardens have borne us good food the past few days. Forgot to mention it earlier on. We've got some small tomatoes, which are to die for, and we're using fresh herbs and spices to make things interesting. Very cool. I wish I could celebrate this more, but I want to go to bed, and I've still got a good chunk of shit to talk about. So, anyway, the weather continues to hold for us, and the snow seems to be shrinking every time I go outside. Under normal circumstances, I'd take the plow out just to have the snow removal option, but... Even in the places I haven't cleared the snow, it's only four or five inches deep at most now. 
The trade-off is periodic fog in the evenings slash mornings and the running water. Sewer drains across town haven't been cleared all winter, and the runoff is just streaming down the streets near the curbs. In some spots, the water is six inches deep and fucking cold as balls if you step in it. Moral of this whole story is that to save gas, I left early this morning with the HRT. I also snuck out by myself early early. I knew Abby would put up a stink, and frankly, I didn't want to deal with Patty. I've been jonesing for some me time anyway. I keep thinking about the time in Westfield when I was spying on the folks at the school and how awesome it felt to be on my own, doing my thing. I don't know. It's the little adventurous boy in me that misses getting lost in the woods with his brothers. I left with a bunch of food as well as copious amounts of ammunition and water. I fully expected to have something go bad on me and not be able to drive back today. Obviously, I made it. One handwritten note to explain my absence later, I was off. I trucked off in the fat pig around 7 a.m. right as light was good enough for me to see everything comfortably. I sort of timed it so the light would be better when I got downtown, too. As I said, downtown is enormous. Legit huge. I've long since forgotten how many side streets there are all over the place— there are little cul-de-sacs with four houses at the end of dead-end streets, side roads that connect to other side roads, and a bunch of the downtown streets as well. I didn't count precisely, but I know there were at least 250 homes that appear to be unravaged by fire or looting. Speaking of fire, there are a lot of burnt-out homes in town. I don't know how it happened, but I'd guess and say as much as 10 or 15 percent are history— Idiots fucking up home heaters or wood stoves or electrical shorts or candles or cigarettes. Shit, I don't know. My point is, there are a lot of flattened and charred homes. Based on today's recon mission, it appears that the population of undead on this side of town is remarkably low. By driving slow and honking the amazingly loud horn on the truck, I was able to run over nearly 40 undead today. I'd guess and say that was probably half of the undead I saw the whole day, too, which is either awesome or fucking horrifying. I'm hoping it means they're all dead and not waiting patiently at Stig or at another survivor's home. Speaking of which, not one sign of life anywhere I went today, despite all my horn-blaring zombie-drawing antics. Speaking of zombie-drawing antics... I think setting up noise stations to draw in the undead is a really solid strategy. It worked fairly well when we hit Stig to rescue Patty, so it stands to reason that if we set up some kind of really loud stereo or noise that went on for a prolonged period of time, we might be able to draw in large amounts for a turkey shoot. If we didn't want to shoot them, we could hit them with the plow over and over and over again. Obviously hoping for the best that the windows don't get smashed out or we get a flat. It's not a perfect plan, but... Ooh, a ditch. A giant hole in the ground that we can lure them into, like the foundation at the daycare. Then we can actually use fire to kill them effectively, or we could poke them in the head with sharp sticks or something. I might be on to something with that idea. Once Gilbert gets off his liquor and painkiller binge, we can talk about that. Otis is still giving me the stink eye. All right, so our area of town leading almost right to the center of downtown, School Street, where my mom lived in the home, is pretty clear of undead and has about 250 homes in it. Businesses are more of a problem, though. Most of the businesses on this side of town were cleared out hardcore that day. The grocery store, the pharmacy, the hardware store, etc. There's a coffee shop, a few small restaurants, two small gas stations, one of which we already cleared, a corner store market, and a smattering of at-home businesses that may or may not be of any use at all. The two that stuck out to me as possibly awesome were a knitting supply shop, Yarn Heaven by Doris, and one of the local contractors who did heating and cooling stuff, Tyler Matheson HVAC. One place that still might be worth hitting is the town's health clinic, I'm petrified of that place, though. Hospitals and clinics were hot spots for the undead when the shit hit the fan, and I'm concerned the dead might still be in the building, in force, in large numbers, cranky and hungry. 
I did find one of the housing developments on the fringe of town I was thinking of. There were five houses, all in various states of construction, and an ass load of raw materials lying around. The houses themselves were falling down and rotten due to the exposed innards, but I'm pretty sure I saw two large pallets or stacks of bricks, which would be very nice to get back to campus. Sitting on the side of the road, there was as well a Gigantor F-350 diesel dually. Getting that home and in working order would be swell, as we could use that instead of the Chevy and cut down on our gas consumption even more. Truck retrieval is not a huge priority for us, though. We've got access to enough gas to last for some time, and supplies are a higher need in my mind. That, and decimating the remaining undead in our local vicinity, seems to be really important. Imagine a life without undead in it. Seems completely impossible to me. Fuck off, Otis. Seriously. Eating my crotch is not a persuasive way to get what you want going to punt him like one of those kids from the daycare here in a second. And if that didn't seal the deal for me to go to hell, I don't know what will. Where was I? Oh, yes, what to do now? I didn't go all the way to Stig, but I am pretty sure we should at least make a run to the industrial complex and see what's left there. I'm almost wondering if we should wait until we have more bodies here. I don't want to wait that long. If we drive over, check it out, and come home, there's no skin off our teeth. I think we've thinned the herd in town so substantially with the Stig explosion and the recent mass assault on campus that we can assume it's safe enough for a drive-by at least. You catch that? Assume. I know, right? Kiss of death much? I should really learn. Definition of a slow learner. Eh, whatever. I guess it's my lot in life to be stupid and write my exploits down here for no one to read. My best friends are a cat with a brain the size of a pecan and a laptop I've named Mr. Journal. I've gone through enough lotion since the apocalypse keeping my manhood thoroughly moisturized to fill a pond. I've shot people lately, chopped the heads off of zombies, and don't even get me started about bite wounds to my crotch. That's the real root of the lotion needs, by the way, Mr. Journal. I am keeping my crotch from scarring, I swear. Kind of sad when I think about my life in those terms. Holy off track. Tomorrow is a relaxation day yet again. My goal for tomorrow is to convince everyone that we should make the trip to Stig on the 22nd. I think the girls will be on board, and if I can get Gilbert to cut back on the sauce, he'll go for it as well. I think by then he'll be good to go, or at least he'll be able to render some kind of coherent advice that will make our lives useful. If not, I'll see what the girls want to do, and we'll take it from there. Otis now gets his wish. Good night, Mr. Journal. As always, your company has been a great way to waste time. Adrian March 22nd I sit here often on the nights I make the time to start an entry and wonder how exactly to start writing. Some nights I open a document and my fingers have a life of their own, and it is almost as if I am able to connect my brain directly to the screen and my thoughts fly out with little effort. It's like I'm a marionette and my fingers are the puppet. Other nights I sit staring at the screen, and despite whatever it is that I want to write about, I can't find the words or my fingers flat out refuse to do my mind's bidding. Tonight is one of those nights. In fact, were I not talking about how hard a time I am having writing, I'd still be sitting here staring at a sheet of white pixelated paper. We returned to Stig earlier today, and we probably shouldn't have. It's obvious to me now that we should have waited. That whole hindsight thing is a motherfucker. Gets me every time. Yesterday we made preparations for our trip to Stig earlier today. My main goal for yesterday was sighting in the M4 I got from Mike. Turns out it was already sighted in for dead nuts at about a hundred yards. Shoots straight and true, which tells me someone already used that weapon. I don't know anyone who took one of these bad bitches out of the packing grease and had it shoot properly. I'm not naysaying U.S. government-issued equipment, mind you. I'm just saying everything we used was made by the lowest bidder— from can openers to helicopters. Just saying. While I was sighting in the M4, which ultimately might be dumb of me if I get an ACOG off mic, 
I had Patty and Abby work on magazine changes and snap aiming drills with the two M15s. Functionally, they're the same as the M4, and with our lack of spare twenty two weapons, it seems likely we might need to rely on them a little more often in the near future. Plus, the range of the 556mm round is better, and I've had several rounds out of the twenty twos splash off the skull of a zombie. They're not high velocity enough to punch through every skull, especially the forehead where the bone is extra thick. Lucky hit on the eye or the temple or the back of the head, it's no problem. Anyway, as I ranged in the M4, they did magazine changes, and we worked on going from safe to semi, then to three-round burst, and back and forth. I gotta tell you, though, as a general rule of thumb, three-round burst has never been popular with me. The muzzle lift sucks on shot number three, and really, we're almost never in situations where we need to lay down a hail of fire that fast. A good example of where quantity does matter was when Gilbert was stuck near the basement in the daycare. I wanted to send as much lead down that staircase as I could to buy us time. Normally, I'd set it to semi-auto and aim each and every shot. I explained to the girls the same idea, and they agreed on principle three-round burst was a waste of ammo— They really agreed after watching how hard it was to aim the entire pattern of shots on a target. Neither of them was able to get all three rounds into a skull-sized area, which means every pull of the trigger they'd likely be wasting at least one bullet. And we just can't have that. For our run to the campus, we opted for the HRT and the plow truck. We all decided that two vehicles were needed, and the plow could be needed if there were any weird snow accumulations anywhere along the way. And just like our trip to the daycare, we stocked up on supplies, assuming we'd not be coming home. I also knew we'd be hitting a lot of dead bodies with the trucks, so I made sure we had two spare tires for the plow in the back of the truck. Broken bones flatten tires. We don't really have spare tires for the HRT. That's a big risk. For this trip, the girls took the M15s, I took the new M4, and Gilbert rolled with his trusty AK. I drove the plow with Abby, and Patty drove the HRT with Gilbert, riding shotgun. We departed something like half an hour after sunrise, and made good time on mostly clear roads to the area Stig was in. We took the direct route, straight through downtown. There was little reason to avoid drawing in zombies, as this recon mission was more of a recon-to-contact situation. Essentially, we wanted to pick a fight today, and we definitely got one. In the light of day, downtown was awful to look at. All of the windows of the local businesses have been busted in, and the snow drifts over winter pushed their way inside. Most of the snow is gone from inside, but you can see the wreckage. There are bodies everywhere. The worst of the bodies are the ones that are trapped under the snow. People were killed, or zombies were killed, and then the snow fell. Now that it's melting, there are dozens and dozens of decaying corpses being revealed. Some are still purple and bloated, twice the size of normal. It's disgusting. Abby stopped counting when she got to fifty zompops. Luckily, none of the bodies being revealed appeared to be zombies, but we did see a few undead that were stuck in deep snow that had yet to melt away and free them. We actually had the time to stop and kill two of them before we got into truly dangerous territory. I left the truck running and smashed their heads in as they reached out at me, buried in heavy wet snow up to their waists. I'm thankful for that, I guess. Just past School Street, the undead population got noticeably thicker and more aggressive. Maybe aggressive isn't the right word. They attacked us, as any undead asshole would. As soon as they see or hear you, they turn and shuffle in your direction in this urgent apathy. I don't know how to describe it, like flesh-eating robots. Incidentally, Urgent Apathy would make an awesome band name. It could be emo or punk or whatever. I'm so fucking creative. We slowed our drive speed down, so we drew in a reasonably large following of undead. By the time we reached the industrial park that contained Stig, Gilbert said we had along the lines of 75 dead folks heel-toeing it behind us, It was a pain in the ass to drive that slow. I wasn't plowing as we went, and the few inches of slush left in the street hindered the retards just enough that we almost hit the gas and said fuck it. We didn't, though. Patience saw us through the irritation. I did drop the plow when we reached the park. I wanted open area to move around in if we got out on foot. 
I scooted ahead of Patty and told her to keep plugging along slowly. When we rounded the curve into the parking lot near the ruins of Stig, I knew this was going to be a rough day. Milling in the wreckage of the explosion was at least another hundred undead, and as soon as they heard my giant yellow plow scraping the pavement, they turned on us and came shambling over to say hi and try to eat us alive. You gotta hand it to the undead. They're always looking out for you. Attentive hosts. Now, we needed a way to kill these assholes efficiently and safely. We could just drive away and kite the fuckers, killing them a few at a time, but that was a big drain on bullet resources. The obvious choice was to use the two vehicles and Grand Theft Auto the whole crowd. Everyone was on board with that idea. Despite being the smaller vehicle, the plow is actually the better vehicle for ramming pedestrians. It has a giant metal ram on the front, and we brought the spare tires for it if we got a flat. Over our radios, we talked the plan over and made sure we knew what to do. We wanted the HRT stationary. It was high off the ground, heavy duty, and we wanted to avoid a flat on that thing like we wanted to avoid getting between Lindsay Lohan and a line of blow. Incidentally, I'd love to see what she looks like right now probably the same, dead or alive, or much better if she's off the stuff. I asked Patty to do a single loop in the large open space of the parking lot on the side of where the stig plant used to be, and then had her stop in the center. Once parked, I had her go off on the damn horn. While she did that, I drove in slow, wide circles around the parking lot. Eventually, we had the entire crowd of zombies going every which way. Some were attracted to the horn, some to the plow as we drove, and others couldn't make up their damn mind what to do. Abby and I laughed our asses off watching them putz around. We reached a critical mass when they started to climb their way up and onto the HRT. Playtime was over. I gunned it to pull away from the mob and spun us around. Abby and I made sure we were buckled in, and I gave it some gas and started to mow the lawn. Hitting that many people with a car... Is actually sort of weird. Ever get your car stuck in the mud or deep snow and you give it gas and it moves forward much slower than you'd expect it to? Same idea, only the resistance was stacks and stacks of zombies pressing forward towards us, reaching up and over the hood. I wound up having to gas it like a bitch to break through the heavier portions of the crowd. I asked Patty to lay off the horn for a bit, which took the heat off the HRT truck. After two or three gory swipes of the parking lot, I'd managed to knock down and incapacitate maybe half of the undead. By that point, the bodies were so thick on the pavement we couldn't drive anymore. The plow simply didn't have the torque to push the bodies lying on the ground away. They just tumbled onto the blade and stacked up like morbid cordwood. So Plan B quickly formed, and we relocated to the Industrial Park Street. No flats occurred either, which was a godsend. Once in the road, we did the same thing on a smaller scale and managed to take out the mobility of the remainder of the undead. After that was finished, we had to actually kill them. That's when things got... weird for us. Smashing in the skulls of the undead is dirty, depressing, mind-numbing work. I'm reminded of those videos of seal hunters clubbing seals that were too stupid to slither away and escape into the ocean. It's the same basic idea, only with rotting animated dead bodies and severe emotional distress as you destroy the bodies of people you recognize from work in town. Unhappy and dangerous work. We started in the road where we wouldn't be surrounded by the dead and worked our way in slowly, hitting every single body in the head with heavy blunt objects. The Halligans became our best friends. Gilbert took Patty's twenty two rifle and sat on the back of the truck, plinking away anything that could move faster than a crawl. He was our black comedy routine as well to try and cheer us up. Oop, fat chubber at ten o'clock, moving at one half mile an hour, followed by a crack from the rifle. Careful, Abby, ten feet to your six. That skinny bastard ain't dead. I think he wants to take Gavin's place in your heart. Oh, wait, he just wants to kill you. Then another snap of the rifle. I'm glad I stole the remainder of the Johnny Walker from Gilbert, otherwise he'd have shot us to death in a drunken stupor. As I said, things got weird. An hour into Gilbert's sit-down corpse insulting comedy routine, Patty started to get emotional as she had to kill people she recognized from her short time at Stig. 
I reckon this is the first time she's had to kill zombies she recognized on Moss. You know the great thing about Team Vagina? They do everything together, including having mental breakdowns. I physically had to restrain Patty and Abby from curb stomping dangerously into the fallen mass of dead folks. They dropped all sensibility after a bit and started to get dangerously surrounded by the dead. Gilbert and I started to yell and scream for them to slow down and back off, but the two of them became too grief-stricken to listen. I had to unsling the M4 and drop the Halligan to get their attention. A handful of shots and a firm grab of the arm got Patty snapped out of it. I dragged her twenty feet back to relative safety and shoved her up and into the front seat of the HRT. Abby stood in shock, watching as I manhandled her mother, and she nearly got bitten again as I walked up to grab her too. She snapped out of her staring session when I stopped to shoot the damned zombie just a foot away from her leg. I couldn't risk the adult zombie testing her shin guard's strength. They may protect against little kid bites fine, but I wasn't risking it. I dragged her back to the HRT and threw her ass inside with her mom. They were safe in there, and I could focus on the task at hand. I should have seen that coming, Mr. Journal. I'm such a penis sometimes. I overlook the emotional toll tasks can take on others far too easily. I forget not everyone has been through what I've been through— I forget that I was gifted with a weird kind of short memory for bad things. I forget that I hurt the people I care about. I forget that Abby and Patty are two family members short, and I dragged them back to where they died and asked them to destroy the dead bodies of folks they knew. Too ignorant. Too much to ask of these people. Asinine, really. I forget that my decisions may have cost me the love of my life— I need to be smarter than this if I'm going to survive, and if I'm going to keep them safe. I worked alone walking amongst the fallen dead for an hour. Gilbert stopped his comedy routine and focused on keeping my ass safe. Largely in silence, I brought the firefighter's tool down more times than I can remember, and my shoulder is sore as hell tonight as a reminder. The wages of ignorance, I suppose. After my hour of solitude— just me and the couple hundred mangled, mostly dead folks, the women came out and rejoined me. I gotta tell you, Mr. Journal, it was difficult to tell the difference between them and the zombies. Lowered heads, silent, blurry-eyed, and emotionless. I stopped in the middle of the parking lot and pulled them both in for hugs. I told them I was sorry and just held them for as long as they let me. They held on a long time. I had regret. By then it was nearly mid-afternoon, and we were starving. The stench coming off the parking lot was almost as bad as the smell coming up from the daycare basement. Gilbert suggested he and the girls go in the HRT and pull away to eat lunch. While they were gone, I ate some of those fruit snacks we got the other day and gingerly pushed all the dead bodies to the far corner of the parking lot with the plow. Fed, somewhat energized, and largely free of imminent zombie danger, we went to work on searching what remained of the Stig building. Long story short, more than you'd think. One whole side of the main office complex remained, essentially the area where Patty was doing her guard detail that night. The explosion ripped the warehouse and factory to shreds and demolished half of the offices but left the lower floors of the front of the building unscathed. The rooms we could get into were filled with clothing, tools, and miscellaneous supplies. We found a locked closet loaded with hygiene supplies, both personal and industrial. Abby monkey-climbed her way up to the second and third floors using the remnants of the stairwells and found our old Marlin 60 rifle somewhere. It was rusty as hell, but I think we can get it working again. I'd love to get a second twenty two rifle into the mix. She also found multiple other weapons that were rusty as shit— as well as a few mixed boxes of ammunition. Not sure if the ammo's still good, but we'll figure that out soon enough. The warehouse and factory were complete wipes. A three-foot-deep crater was at one end of the building, and demolished factory equipment stood like twisted tombstones on the remnants of the cracked cement shop floor. Each one was a memory of the people who might have operated it before everything went to hell. I couldn't help but wonder where Charles and little Randy were when the blast happened. I hoped they were right in the center of it, so they went fast. I'd like to think they didn't suffer much when it happened. 
It was nearing dark by then, and after Gilbert started popping off a few shots to take out wanderers coming in from the surroundings, we elected to get out. We've made a commitment to come back to the park, though, and check through the other buildings for anything we might be able to use. I think it's safe to say Brian and his people ransacked the shit out of these buildings, but from what Patty said about them being perpetually surrounded by the dead all the time, there's actually a chance there are some things we can use left behind. As before, the worst case is we clear some buildings. Check that. Worst case is someone gets killed. But I'm going to operate under the mindset that injury and death are not an option. Therefore, worst case, it's just a collection of cleared industrial buildings. Positive thinking, right? Abby and Patty face-planted from exhaustion as soon as we got back. Gilbert needed help getting back into the house due to him leaving his pills and liquor here. I think tonight will be the last night we force him to stay here. As long as he's got a painkiller in his system, he can get around okay. Not to mention, the area around campus seems to have quieted down considerably. Let's hope we didn't lead yet another group of undead back here, though. That would figure. Tomorrow is a sit-and-do-shit day. I might work on cleaning the weapons we found and seeing if they're salvageable. My hope is they are. I'm hoping Abby and Patty can put their heads back in order tomorrow as well, because one way or the other, I'm going home this week. Adrian March 24th I need to go home. It took everything I had not to stop there today. Man... The other side of town near Stig seems to be largely empty of the undead. It seems as if our recent mass destruction of undead at the Stig plant has reduced the numbers over there to a fairly manageable amount. Not to take away from what Brian and his people accomplished when they were looting and clearing those areas, and the explosion at Stig that killed them too. I'm sure that blast took out plenty of the undead as well. If there's any justice left in this world, it did. I don't quite know how to describe my emotions right now. Mentally, I feel like I'm at wit's end, and I'm not sure why. I feel nervous and pensive. I'm short-tempered. I feel angry over the things that have happened to me. My sense of humor is gone the past few days, and all of this makes me angrier. I hate being the person I am right now, and I hate not knowing why I'm being this way. I think this is what it means to feel helpless. Yesterday, I had plenty of time to think about my situation, and I damn near put an entry in to talk about it, to purge myself in this electronic confessional I've created for myself. How many Hail Marys do I need to say, Mr. Journal? Do I need to put on my yarmulke and stand at the wailing wall of the laptop to beg for inner peace? Do I need to sit at a waterfall and contemplate the Vedas to discover the source of my inner turmoil? Man, I need a break. I need to get home. I need to get inside my place. I need to figure out why there is a black BMW parked in my parking spot. I need to figure out who parked it there. I need to stop listening to my radio waiting for Steve to call at noon. I need to move past my fetters and get the fuck over this. I need to shut up. I need to grow a pair. Yesterday, I got the weapons we found in the Stig ruins in working order. Well, I got some of them in working order. About half of them were so pitted from rust I wasn't comfortable using them. I stripped them for parts and started our official campus armory. In the basement of Hall E, there's a staff office that's fairly large and has no windows. I showed it to Gilbert and asked him if he could work his magic in our wood shop and get some racking and a workbench put together. His eyes lit up like a Christmas tree, or menorah, if you prefer, and he agreed to get on it by week's end. He's pretty much off the booze now. He's only taking half a pain pill at a time as well, which is good. He's hard as a railroad spike, and seeing him struggle with the pain of having several smashed toes was tough to watch. It was pretty funny watching him drunk, but as we know, drugs, booze, and firearms almost always leads down the road to ruin. Accidents happen. Around me, they seem to happen often. 
I'm like an unlucky rabbit's foot that gets you pwned, often and usually anally, sans lube or reach around. I am a walking colon examination. It took me almost all of yesterday to get the guns cleaned. Abby and Patty chilled out and emotionally decompressed after the stress of visiting where their family was ripped apart. I'm not sure how they are mentally today after going back out into town with me, but they seem stronger today than ever. They're... harder. I know this sounds bad as a general statement, but I've ragged on the girls a lot for being emotional wrecks, and I don't think that's entirely fair to them. I know the stereotype is that women are emotionally weak, and I want to dispel that right now. Patty and Abby are as strong as me, and likely even stronger. I am only holding on to my sanity by the slimmest of margins. They've been through hell, lost everything, and they're still here, right by my side, still standing, still strong. Granted, they both have moments when their core is revealed and they become emotional, but honestly, I'm no different. I just hide it from them. They break down in public where they can get supported. I break down in private so I can hide it and protect my foolish pride. It's like I need to stay strong in front of them to protect my own self-image of the strong, able man I think I am. If I feel like they doubt me, I'll doubt myself— and then I might hesitate or question myself when it matters most that I do not. I can't afford to panic. Panic will get us killed. I don't know, Mr. Journal. I spend so much time and thought attempting to think about what I need to do next, and I think I need to let someone else do some planning here so I can focus on putting my own head together. All the King's men need to get to work on this, or poor Adrian will go mental eventually. Maybe I need to start building a padded room here on campus. I think getting into my old place will help a lot. Ever since we've started down the path of exploring and thinking about clearing out that area of town, I've been obsessed with getting home. I didn't even really like that fucking condo, but it represents something much more to me now. I can't help but think about how Patty lost her shit when she and I stopped at their family home in Westfield. I wonder if I'll do the same when I see my bedroom again. When I see the pictures of Cassie and I on the wall. When I realize the life I lost when the world started dying. I dreamt of Steve last night. I can't help but think about how we've only dreamt of the dead since June. I keep telling myself that this is just my mind playing tricks on me. I keep telling myself that the power of suggestion is at work here. I convince myself that I am only remembering the dreams of the people that I think are dead because that's what we've talked about. Then I remember that every night before I go to bed I sit and tell myself a hundred times or more to dream about playing basketball with Abby or to dream about sipping scotch with Gilbert or cooking a bad dinner with Patty. A hundred times a night I tell myself to dream those dreams and every morning I wake up and there are no dreams of the such to recall. My nights are empty of dreams of the living. I dream of the dead, or I dream nightmares where I'm alone. I'm always alone, it seems. I think about the white room dream as well. I don't know what to make of it. I am genuinely befuddled by it. I'm also at a loss regarding the fucking texts the undead brought here. I know it was a message to me. I can't fathom what the message was. It's beyond me right now, and I hope I can figure it out before it's too late. Today, we ventured out into the town again to explore the area where my condo is. On one hand, I'm glad we went. But the other hand is wishing we hadn't. Have you ever gone out early in the morning, just as the sun has started to rise, but before the world has woken up? It seems to be this way mostly during the summer. There are no pedestrians anywhere, and the cars have yet to start their work bringing their owners off to wherever it is they need to spend their day. The world is cool and dimly lit by the sun that's yet to peak fully over the horizon. The whole world seems empty. No birds in the cloudless sky, and no sound of the shuffling feet of the undead. There were no noises other than the ones we made. That's exactly how the area of town we explored seemed earlier today. Empty.
We drove across town in our two-vehicle convoy and encountered nothing. Not one zombie, nor one survivor. We saw no lights, no animals, and no movement. It was like the whole town had hit the pause button, and we missed the memo. I wanted to use the complete void of activity to get inside Steve's apartment to check to see if he'd returned, but I was voted down by the crew, rightfully so. We really should not have made any noise or stopped to attract attention unless we had a plan or had a damn good reason, and looking for Steve with no notice was not a good enough reason. The parking lot at his small apartment complex was pretty empty of vehicles, and as I said, it was totally empty of survivors and zombies. Very creepy. If you recall, Mr. Journal, not far from his apartment is my place. Cassie in my place. Otis's normal stomping grounds. Home, or what used to be home before this bullshit started. We planned our driving so we would hit the condo on the way back, and that's what we did. As I said, there are two rows of condos in my complex. The two rows are perpendicular to the street, and my condo is on the left row, slightly below the row on the right. Essentially, my place is downhill from the other row. Our parking lots were flush to the front of the condos and were just barely large enough to fit all the residents' cars and have room for a few guest cars as well. In the whole complex, there was something like 30 units of homes. My unit is nearest the street. Parked directly in front of my unit, slightly cockeyed, was a black BMW 7 Series. A beautiful car. One that Steve would probably have stolen if he made it into this city to the only dealership I'm aware of. He could have done it, too. He had the balls and the smarts, and from the letter he read, he was serious about having some fun while the world burned. Most of the snow had melted off the car. Our parking spots were out in the open and got hit by sun almost all day normally. The fact that there was still snow on the car meant it had been there quite some time. We haven't had any substantial accumulation in a long time, it seems. It has to be Steve's car. It has to be. Why else would there be a luxury vehicle parked in front of my place? He said he was going to steal a nice car. On his note, he said a Benz, I think. I'm sure he'd steal the best thing he saw, though. Or maybe he didn't make it to the Mercedes dealership. I think the closest Mercedes dealership is right near the mall, and I can't even imagine the fucking nightmare the area near the mall turned into. Too many people have already seen how that story ends. Anyway... All of the windows in my place were intact. I couldn't see through the curtains if there were any barricades on the windows or door or anything, but I had a strong feeling that Steve was inside. Instinct, maybe. Tomorrow we lay out our plan for going back to my place. That is all we're intending to do on that trip out. From what Brian said before he died, he and his people had not reached my condo complex yet, and if I'm lucky, all of my original possessions will still be there. If that goes well, and I'm not an emotional wreck, we will gather all my things and come back here, to my new home. Tonight, I hope to get a good night's rest. I wish to dream of puppies and bunnies and pretty girls and good friends and good times. I'm fully prepared to be disappointed. Adrian March 26th. We're about to leave to go downtown to check out my place. I normally don't get nervous, but right now I'm so puckered only a dog could hear me fart. Before I go, I wanted to mention that I've had some pretty fucked up dreams the past few days. I don't know why, but I've dreamt of Steve. I've almost had the exact same dream two nights running now, the night of the 24th and the night of the 25th. Yesterday morning and today, I awoke with vivid memories of seeing Steve in my home. He was living off what I left behind in my place. It seemed like he survived several weeks, sneaking from condo to condo at night, taking what he could, but he was limited because he was hurt somehow. Something wrong with his leg, I think. Maybe it was his foot. At the end of the dream, I saw Steve sitting on my couch, putting a weapon in his mouth and killing himself. I don't know why he did it, but I know. He killed himself. This morning's dream went further than the night before. After Steve killed himself, there was a passage of time. I remember seeing the snowfall, and 
I can recall it piling up high enough to block all the windows on the first floor of my place. The interior of the condo turned bluish and muted from the light slipping through the snow, and I can remember feeling Steve moving around the condo. He was dead, undead. The dream this morning ended with the snow melting and light outside my home gently growing in intensity until it was like a spring day. I can recall the distinct smell of death inside the condo. The very last moment of this morning's dream was the front door opening and Steve lurching to the door trying to get at whatever had opened it. We're off in a few minutes. All the preparations are made and the vehicles are running outside to warm up. I'm going to hit save and close the laptop and finally go home. I hope for once my dreams don't come true. Adrian March 26th, Second Entry I can't sleep. I'm afraid to dream. I'm afraid they'll come true on me again. I don't know how to wrap my feeble soldier brain around this bullshit anymore. I'm fucking done with trying to figure this out. I'm fucking done with cryptic messages and indecipherable nightmares. I want to wake up tomorrow next to Cassie and realize this was all just the worst fucking dream anyone has ever had. But that's not in the cards, eh? Nope, not for me. It's almost 11 p.m. Abby and Patty are downstairs fighting to stay awake in case I do something stupid. Gilbert came back here to the campus with us to make sure I didn't kill anyone or myself. I'm not feeling suicidal, but I'm glad he's here. I feel like if something happened, I could not give a shit and still be okay for tonight. Not giving a shit is about all I've got left in me anyway tonight. I'm struggling enough to give a shit about writing this. I need to write this. I need to write this. I've sat here for 15 minutes trying to figure out how to write what happened today in a manner that does it justice. I've started it five times and erased it five times. I've said nice things, I've said mean things, I've said some insulting things, but the more I think about it, I just need to say it as simply as possible and then deal with whatever comes out of me. Deep breath in, enter, tab, type it. I shot Steve in the face today. Once more for the people in the back row, my best friend Steve. I shot him in the face today. He was already dead, but I shot him anyway. He was going to eat me. I don't think he wanted to either. That's not fair. I know he didn't want to eat me. I'll explain how I know that in a second. Town was empty again today. I don't know why. We've left plenty of undead behind on our previous jaunts. Just going by population, there should still be thousands of them in the vicinity. There's no rational reason for them to have disappeared, unless someone else, somewhere else, is making a lot of noise and has attracted them away. I guess that's a pretty fucking rational possibility. I get the impression that's not the case. I get the feeling the powers that be are orchestrating events every now and again. I think the past few days they've purposefully parted the Dead Sea for us to make this little pilgrimage. The more I think about it, the more that seems like the most rational thing that could be happening. The books? Gotta be something up above, or down below. It's making this happen. Why am I less scared of that reality than I am of this being some virus or radiation or government experiment? Maybe it's because knowing that there's some kind of higher power out there somewhere makes me think that there's some kind of real and true chance that we can pull out of this. We can appease a higher power, but can't talk our way out of the plague. I think today's the day I finally start believing in faith. Really. And here's why. We arrived at my house at about 9 a.m., The sunlight was exactly like I envisioned in my dream last night. It was a sunny, spring-esque day, and the air outside was cool and a little damp from all the melting snow. You know that fairly earthy smell of spring, when the grass starts digging down into the earth to grow? 
It smelled like that this morning. We backed the trucks into the parking lot and set them up so we could jump in and drive out in a hurry if need be. All four of us got out of the vehicles and checked the lower level of buildings in the complex to ensure that there were no undead about. Abby and Patty checked the windows of the units on the lower level and spotted a few undead milling about inside here and there, but they were lucky enough to not get their attention. Well, at the time, we thought we were lucky. But in retrospect, it's pretty damned obvious that they should have noticed us pull the trucks in, the two large trucks running, the air brakes on the HRT, plus all the truck doors shutting. Zombies have heard that much noise from a tenth of a mile away, let alone fifty feet. Something was pulling the wool over their eyes long enough for us to do what we had to do. Once we'd checked the surrounding area for danger, Patty and Abby volunteered to go inside and clear the house in case there was something inside I shouldn't see. I thanked them, but I said this was something I had to do. I wanted them with me, but I had to be the first in, finger on the trigger. I laugh now. Stupid things amuse me. I've kept my keys all this time. My key rings have all the keys for campus here, as well as my car keys and my house key. I've also still got the key to Cassie's car. It has never occurred to me to throw the keys I don't need anymore away. I've added keys to the rings, but I haven't taken any off. How strange we are. I walked up the steps to my front door and pulled open the storm door. The screen was still in the window from last summer. Seeing it made me remember how I used to leave the door open to get fresh air moving through the place. If I left the front door open with the storm door screen open, then went to the back and opened the kitchen slider, we got this wonderful cross breeze that aired the place out perfectly. I used to sit on the couch with Cassie, and we'd watch television together with Otis sandwiched in the middle, and... I pushed my key in the lock and gave it a twist. I did it with my left hand, so I had the Glock up and dangerous. I had this odd path of logic that using a shotgun was a bad idea in my own home. If I had to shoot something, I wanted to use my pistol, so the collateral damage was mitigated. I know, strange, huh? Just as I was about to push the door in, I had a strong flashback to my dream this morning. It all played out in my mind's eye as I pressed the door inward. I saw Steve's undead body turn towards the door as it swung in. I clearly recalled the angle of the golden sunlight streaming in through the window and hitting his rotting face, illuminating the gray and blue flesh. I watched as he stumbled past the edge of my couch and towards the open entrance, straight towards where I was now standing. The flashback ran in my mind like I was watching an old 8mm film strip. When the yellowing, grainy film ran dry, my point of view had reversed, and instead of being inside watching Steve shuffle away towards the opening door, I was seeing through my own eyes, bright and clear, into my living room. I saw Steve coming at me, precisely as my dream had shown he would. He was wearing one of my old white t-shirts. It hung on him like a drape. I was always much larger than he, and his body had shrunk dramatically from starvation. He was gaunt, haunting, and the combination of yellowing shirt and bright white sunlight almost made him look like a ghost. His jaw was shattered. One side of it hung down, scraping against the collar of the shirt. His left eye socket was ruptured, and the decayed brown eye hung loose and deflated on his cheek. It swung like a desiccated pendulum as he dragged his bad foot behind him. I instantly knew he'd tried to blow his head off by putting a gun to his chin. He'd gotten the angle wrong and managed to shoot his own face off instead. His death must have been slow and terrible in every way imaginable. So much pain. My heart broke apart for him, knowing he'd probably come here to find me, to survive with me, and I'd ran off to make my own future and save my ass. I slowly brought up the Glock and leveled it off at the bridge of his nose. From behind me, I heard Patty and Abby gasp. I don't know how they knew, but they realized that the person in front of me was familiar to me. As I started to squeeze the trigger gently, I locked my gaze, 
the one milky eye Steve still had left, and I swear on all that I have ever loved or held dear, he looked relieved to see me. I can't, I can't believe I shot my best friend today. I'm sobbing. I, I, I can't fucking believe I did it. I, I don't even know what to say. I don't even know if I should apologize or beg for forgiveness or thank him for warning me he was going to kill me. And make no mistake, Mr. Journal, my dreams were a warning from Steve. Somehow he knew I was coming. He reached out somehow from far beyond whatever it is that life means, and he told me exactly how his undead body was going to try and kill me. He saved my life, and unless everything I'm feeling is wrong, I think I repaid the favor by putting his mortal form to rest. I don't know if I saved his soul, but I think killing his body for him gave him some peace. At least now, wherever he is, he knows that he didn't kill me, and he is no longer a danger to anyone. The regret of having not been at home for him eats at me. It seems the more time passes, the more regret I find for myself. I failed to save my mother. I failed to get to Dorothy and John's home. I don't even know if they're dead or not. I failed to get to Steve's place before he left town, and I failed to return home to be here for him when he returned. I failed to look for my local siblings. I failed when Dan Haggerty tried to save his son and instead killed Mrs. Goodell and those students. I failed when I met that young couple with the young boy at the gas station. I failed when I forgot to close the door at that farm on Jones Road. I failed when Sean and his goons came here and I didn't kill him. Lieutenant Daniels and a slew of innocents died because of that failure. And we can't forget my greatest failure of all. Cassie. I feel like there is so much blood on my hands now. All I wanted to do was help people, but it seems I'm not very good at doing that. Humbling to sit here and evaluate myself. The truth really does hurt. It makes me realize just how shitty I am at being a hero. After today's events and the events of March 3rd, and the dreams we all seem to be sharing, I'm convinced that what is happening is far more than just a virus or a plague or a mind-controlling fungus or some toxic chemical the military made. I can say this with absolute certainty. This is happening for a reason. I do not mean that there is a definite cause. I mean there is a reason why this is happening. This is an event that is being controlled or orchestrated by a power that is not rooted in science. As if I had to explain that. Fucking hell, there are zombies walking around in my hometown. I watched the world implode and eat itself on you fucking tube before the internet died. I watched the undead rip the flesh from the living with gnashing teeth. Obviously, science is missing something. As I said before, I am comforted by this epiphany. I sit here, almost happily, imagining that we are being punished for our misdeeds. I think of this as a great test, a final judgment day where we are tried for our misdeeds, and I think to myself this lone thought. I would rather try to be a hero and fail than live as a successful coward. I hope that the blood on my hands as a result of my efforts is not an indication of my failures, past, present, and future. I now have supreme faith that whoever or whatever is watching knows that I am trying to do the right thing now. I just hope my good intentions don't pave the road to hell. 
Steve, from the bottom of my heart, I miss you. I love you. And I thank you. Adrian. March 27th. A decent, uninterrupted night of sleep has given me the focus needed to gather my thoughts. As your parents always tell you, Mr. Journal, sleep on it. Sage advice given the events of yesterday. I'm writing this in the morning. I wanted to get this out of my skull before I go off gallivanting about here on campus getting things done and reassuring my comrades that I am indeed of sound mind. Some of my day will likely be spent reassuring myself that I am of sound mind. It might take some serious convincing. I didn't have the mental fortitude to go over what I took from my house yesterday in last night's entry. I think if I can get that out and on paper here real quick before I eat breakfast, I'll have a great day and I'll be able to move forward more effectively. Steve's body came back to campus with us. I took him to the funeral pyre we have out near staff housing and I cremated him. I couldn't leave his body behind in my house. Not only was it gross to leave a dead body in my own home, but I needed to do something for him. I couldn't just leave him there. I'm debating doing something about my mother's body if I ever get back to the senior home she died in. That's a problem for a different day, I suppose. Steve had eaten every last morsel of food in my house, which, frankly, doesn't surprise me in the least. He also ate the bag of cat food hidden deep in the pantry, Steve was the type of guy who ate constantly and never put any weight on. Smoking weed all the time, eating Doritos and making macaroni and cheese was what he considered exercise, too. Lucky bastard. Obviously not finding my own food was a letdown. I did manage to reclaim a few bottles of my own liquor from the closet. From the looks of it, he drank a bunch of that as well before he died. However, I did take most of my worldly possessions from before the end. Seeing the pictures of Cassie and me on the fireplace mantle was rough. I've never been the kind of person who kept pictures in his wallet, and seeing the folders of pictures here on the laptop just isn't the same as seeing the pictures in frames on the walls in my house. After sending Steve's brains out the back of his head, looking at those pictures left me a little shook up. A lot shook up. Abby and Patty cleared the house of any danger while I started to pack shit up in the banana boxes we brought. Only fitting, right? After all this time, the banana boxes came home with me. I took all the pictures on the walls and mantle. Everything I tell the girls to leave behind when we clear houses came back with me. I even took the curtains. <laughs> so funny. I'm very pleased to have replaced my borrowed wardrobe with all of my own clothes. Much of them are large on me now, but it feels nice to wear the shirts I used to wear when things were normal. I'm happy to support all my local athletics teams and favorite bands, despite the fact that the members of them are all likely dead and will never take to the field, court, pitch, stage again. It gives me comfort to trick my mind by wearing their shirts and hats. I took much of my book collection. I've always been an avid reader, especially having a job where I had a lot of downtime. I used to buy books by the bag. Cassie used to tell me to buy a Kindle to save on space in the condo, but it'd be pretty useless now. I'm glad I bought all these books now. I've got entertainment for, well, a long time, if I ever find downtime to sit and read, that is. I grabbed all my movies and video games. I also grabbed my own PS3 because I've got saved data on that motherfucker for games I haven't beaten yet. Fuck you, Apocalypse. I've still got a video game agenda. I grabbed batteries, flashlights, shoes, boots, jackets, sheets, my remaining melee weapon collection, and even some furniture. Cassie and I have got a great living room set, and that fucker fit perfectly in the back of the Chevy. Mind you, the entire interior of the HRT was filled to the ceiling with boxes and whatnot, but at the time, I didn't want to leave anything I knew I wanted behind. I also grabbed my television. We had a widescreen HD TV too, and despite already having one in Hall E, two is always better than one, and while in Rome, 
Get a big television to watch porn in your bedroom on. Cross that off the list of things to do. The vicinity of my place remained clear of danger the entire time we were extricating my shit. You can't tell me that's just good luck. Pretty friggin' obvious we had some kind of a truce running for a bit with the powers that be. I'm thankful they gave us some time to get it done, because at the time I would have made for a pretty shitty combatant. The drive home was clear of undead until we got about a quarter mile away from my place. Ironically, we were right near Steve's place when we saw the zombies reappear magically from the surroundings, almost as if they were plucked away long enough for us to do what we needed to do and then returned once we were done. Every one of us exchanged strange looks and radio messages. I didn't do any of the driving home. They wouldn't let me. Probably a good decision. When we finally made it back to campus, I was not in any shape to unload everything, so we got the furniture inside Hall E. I dealt with Steve's body, and then I turned vegetative. Everyone else stepped up for me, though, and made sure I was taken care of. Yesterday really taught me that I can lean on these people, hard, if I have to. They're far more than just fellow survivors. They're, well, they're my family now. My parents are long gone, and I don't know where my brothers and sister are, and I don't know if I'll ever see them again. Even if they do come back into my life, Abby, Patty, and Gilbert are now permanent fixtures in the book of Adrian. I can't imagine trying to survive all this without them here. Today, we are unpacking my stuff and getting it into my room here. I've got so much crap now that I need to take up a second room. In fact, after I get everything inside, I'm going to ask if anyone minds if I knock out the wall that adjoins the small dorm room next to mine. It's peanuts to get it knocked out and fixed up, and it'd almost double my bedroom size. Then I'll actually have room to walk around in here. My new bed is quite literally taking up all the space. Fucking dorm rooms, always too small. I swear morons or halflings designed them. After today, we might take tomorrow off to plan for the future. I think I'm ready to move forward with our plans to clear more houses in the town. We need the supplies as well as trade bait for the Westfield people, and we'll be putting more dead folks to rest as we go. I'm also positive that somewhere in town we'll find more survivors. I know my original plan to build safe houses is still a good one, but I think we might find enough people in town that are continuing to hide that we can reestablish a town. Starting to feel a call to duty in this regard. Saving people is a noble duty. Every zombie we put down isn't just a threat removed. It's a soul saved. I'm not sure if I'm talking about their souls or mine. Otis sends his regards. Adrian. Gasoline. I have been preparing for this day since I was ten years old. I've got knives, axes, rifles, handguns, shotguns, muzzle loaders, ammunition, gunpowder... Reloading supplies, bulletproof vest, purchased at a steal on eBay, spare clothing, bandages, bacitracin, alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, diesel fuel, four 55-gallon drums, gasoline, 12 55-gallon drums, coffee, tea, cases and cases of MREs, over a thousand cans of food, seeds stockpiled to restart local agriculture, batteries, 9-volt, AA, AAA, C, and D in large quantities, car batteries, a large 4x4 truck with run-flat tires, and a rifle rack with a rifle and ammunition handy, a sturdy stockade fence around my property, firewood to last at least one winter for my stove, solar panels on the roof of my house, an artisan well despite being close enough to town to use town water if I wanted to, a spot welder and acetylene torch and two canisters of gas for it, a ham radio, a police scanner, pepper spray, three tasers with spare batteries, a battery charger, books on medicine, car repair, satellite communications, biology, agriculture, religion, your mom, how to make suppressors, how to make Italian food, general carpentry, and multiple other categories. 
I've also got enough lumber stored in my basement to reinforce my stockade wall or build an entire small home in my backyard. Binoculars, moisturizing lotion for dry skin, sex lube for copulation and masturbation, pornography, contraceptives, condoms, painkillers, illegally obtained via fake prescriptions at a pain control clinic, motor oil good for 10 oil changes in my truck, spare tires for that truck, not all run flat though, I'm not made out of freaking money here, maps for the entire western hemisphere, plans for extrication to multiple locations on said hemisphere should the house not hold in the event of the apocalypse, currently unfolding, one box of all my favorite candy bars slash candy plus 30 bonus bags of Twizzlers, I really like Twizzlers, one box of every kind of snack cake I've ever consumed and enjoyed, 35 12 packs of all the carbonated beverages I enjoy, five cases of Paps Blue Ribbon, two gas generators running in tandem and connected to a series of batteries capable of storing a week's worth of energy, 20 flats of bottled water, 10 cases of water filtration filters for my water filtration system, 50 packages of potassium iodine tablets in the event of a nuclear-based apocalypse, bomb shelter built into the basement for additional radiation shielding in the event of the aforementioned nuclear-based apocalypse, one twenty-two caliber semi-automatic handgun, one twenty-two caliber semi-automatic rifle, one AR-15 rifle with ten spare magazines, three bolt-action rifles in various calibers, five hundred rounds of ammunition or more of each caliber, and a slew of other useful things you want when the world comes crashing to an end. I am gonna rock this fucking apocalypse. This will be the best summer ever. These Zeds have nothing on me. Plan Z domination is in effect. Approximately one month later. I cannot believe this is happening. I'm having so much fun killing my neighbors. This is like a weird Disneyland where I get to legally shoot the people I don't like. I feel like I won the lotto. I've got a few shooting hides set up on the second floor of the run-down Victorian my mom and I call home. Well before she died. People in town used to laugh at me for having a house that looked like a pile of shit, but who's laughing now? And none of the dumb shits in town want to come here because they think there's either nothing of value inside or that I'm loony. Never mind the fact that I keep shooting anyone that comes close to my stockade fence. My neighbor across the street, Margaret Evans, she was a dental hygienist, tried to climb over my fence yesterday just after dusk. I bet her and her asshole son have finally run out of food. I always used to tell her when I saw her at the grocery store to buy durable foods. Stockpile as much as you can in the event of the apocalypse or an economic collapse, which was really quite feasible. I shot her in the head. It popped like a water balloon and sprayed her gray matter all over the sidewalk behind her. Through the scope on my rifle, I could see her son screaming inside their house. Poor kid's gonna die in there, all alone and hungry. He smartened up after a few hours of screaming bloody murder and shut the hell up. Of course, the sound of the gunshot drew in a bunch of the bleeding dead folks, and the sound of his screaming sent them right into his front yard. I figure I'll give it a few more days until he kicks it, then I'll start picking off the dead assholes in their yard. The internet and telephone have been down for weeks. The town's electricity has shit the bed as well. I'm glad the closest nuclear plant is downwind and a day's drive away. Last I saw in the local news was that it was secured by the National Guard and being powered down. It'd suck if it melted down and I died of ball cancer during the zombie apocalypse. Luckily, I've got the gas generators in the basement to keep the television and the fridge running. I don't know how much gasoline I have left. I've been watching a lot of movies to pass the time, and my fuel discipline needs to be tightened up. Them damn Arabs aren't shipping the black juice anymore, and... I need to make sure I make every last drop of the old go juice last as long as possible. Margaret was a retard. She should have been buying canned goods instead of frozen meals. Approximately one month later. I have drastically underestimated my ammunition requirements for surviving a Z-oriented apocalypse. I've already consumed 50% of my ammo store simply defending the perimeter fence. To counteract the constant attention of the horde of Zeds, I have broken out the circular saw and tape measure and fortified the fence as per plan Fence Upgrade 1.2. 
Unfortunately, I have used a little more of my wood than I had intended. During construction this week, I accidentally cut the cord to the circular saw, and I'm now down to using a manual saw. I wish I'd worked out more before the apocalypse. My arms are very sore. The fence is now fully upgraded, and I'm much more comfortable leaving larger amounts of undead circling the neighborhood. I no longer feel compelled to shoot every dead bastard that wanders down the street. I'm still shooting the living, though. They are here and up to no good. I'm sure they're interested in stealing my supplies and or taking over my home. I am now seriously debating setting up a perimeter system, as per plan, Dynamite Perimeter Defense Plan 6.3.1. That plan took a lot of time to perfect. Dynamite is dangerous stuff. Dynamite Perimeter Defense Plan 6.3.1 involves setting up trip wires inside the fence in the event the fence is climbed over or breached. I've got enough sticks of dynamite left over from my internet deal that I can place them about one stick every ten feet. I suspect the first asshole who hops my fence and gets blown to kingdom come will teach the others a lesson. Plus, if any of the Zeds manage to force their way through the fence, they'll get blown to smithereens. I'm using a lot of gasoline. I do not think my gasoline stores are sufficient for long-term survival. After evaluating my actual gasoline needs and consumption, I do not think that I need to watch the entire series of Buffy followed by the entire Star Trek TNG run next week. Just one should suffice. I need to procure more 55-gallon drums and then fill them with gas from a local gas station. I think I'll get the truck ready to go to the gas station. I know Mark's garage had two more drums in the back I can take, plus he had a barrel dolly as well, which is necessary to move the barrels when they are full of the old go juice. I am happy to have a hand crank to pump the fuel as well. All is moving according to plan. Approximately one month later. My run to the gas station last month ended splendidly. I found four 55-gallon drums at Mark's garage, and after cleaning them out properly, I brought them to the gas station to fill. It took me two days of gun running to clear the gas station long enough for me to accomplish the task. The number of Zeds still wandering about town continues to astound me. Why aren't they rotting? Why aren't they freezing solid on the cold overnights? I've heard gunfire in the distance periodically for weeks. Well, since June 23rd, really. And despite the intensity of gunfire dropping over time, I would have imagined that with all those shots fired, there would be a lot less zombies about. I guess people are really shitty with their guns. I had to shoot a few folks trying to take my gas. Well, technically, I don't know if they were going to steal it, but they saw me filling the barrels while I was at the pumps, and when they stopped their car and came towards the station, I shot their car up. It crashed into the metal posts at the end of the pump, and after a few minutes the people inside the car came back as Zeds. I shot them again. Upside, inside their car they had some food. Downside, one of the girls in the car was very pretty, and I would have liked to have met her, or at least brought her back home. She was as pretty as the young girls who go to that private school just outside of town on Auburn Lake. I miss sneaking into the woods near there with my binoculars and trying to catch a little peek. Now that's fun. Next time I shoot people, I'm going to try and shoot the ugly ones first. Darwinism. Approximately one month later. It got really cold late last month. Unseasonably cold, even. I've got a lot of home heating oil in the tank, and I can use the diesel when that runs low. The fence is holding up, and my ammunition seems to be lasting. I made a trip to Moore's Sporting Goods last week with the truck, and the place is empty. There are dead bodies all over the place near there. I wonder if there was a shootout over guns and ammo. Some people just can't share. Morons. Gasoline continues to be a problem for me. I'm wishing I cut more wood for the wood stove. I think it might have been a better idea for me to have stockpiled the wood rather than all the diesel and gasoline, but not like I can undo what's done now. I'm also pissed all the wood is stored outside, too. I hate walking all the way outside to get armloads of wood. Had I just stored it inside somewhere, like maybe in the hallway, life would be so much easier. Halloween is in two days. I think I'll dress up as a survivor of the apocalypse again. I've been doing that every Halloween for 25 years now, ever since I was 10. I remember watching all those old zombie movies from the 70s, especially the ones made in Europe that were super gross, and thinking how awesome it would be if zombies took over the world. 
I used to fantasize about getting to shoot the kids in school that were dickheads to me. I used to plot and plan where and how I'd hole up. I'm glad I did all that planning, because it's late October, months after the apocalypse, and I'm still surviving, still strong. Dickie Benedetto, eat my ass, you prick. I'm here, and you're dead in the street. Approximately one month later. I burnt down my garage. I was drinking some PBR while doing some metal work to make the truck a little more substantial against the Zeds, and I dropped the acetylene torch into a pile of greasy rags. Turns out they are super-duper flammable. Like a ninja, I saved the remainder of my beer and the truck. I can still drive downtown if I need to. I'll just have to cope with the truck as it is. My garage is separated from the house, and I had to let it burn down. The garden hose wasn't up to the task of dousing the flames. I'm a little worried because the explosion of the acetylene tank attracted a lot of the Zeds to this neighborhood again. The tall green metal cylinder launched about a hundred feet straight up in the air and stuck in the hood of a car in the street like an enormous lawn dart. I'd been really quiet for weeks, and the Zeds had been drawn off by shooting on the other side of town. I guess that's just more Zeds to shoot. Today is Thanksgiving, actually which is sort of awesome. I love turkey. Wish I had one to eat. Instead, I am eating a tin of Spam with a can of diced tomatoes cooked over the stove. For dessert, I'm having a cupcake. It is my last cupcake, and I plan on savoring it for an hour. Because I am now down to my last cupcake, I'm wondering if I should return to a local food-selling establishment and perhaps attempt to procure some of said food. Winter is upon me in just a few weeks, so if I'm going to do it, I should totally do it soon. I don't have anything other than my snowblower to remove snow, and that's just impractical. If I get bored, though, I might try and modify the snowblower into a Zed munching machine. I've got a loosely worked out plan for it called Zed Blower 1.7.3. I'm thinking I can get it up on wheels and set it at roughly chest height. With a slight tweak to the motor, it'll chew up Zed heads and toss them out the chute like confetti. I just need to weld the frame of the... Oh, shit. Never mind. Approximately one month later. Couple more days to Christmas. This year, I'm giving myself last year's gift again. I found some wrapping paper in the basement behind one of my gas barrels, and I rewrapped my Stargate complete boxed set and put it under a tree branch from my backyard that is doubling for my Christmas tree. I seriously debated converting to Judaism earlier in the month for the extra presents, then switching back, but there's nothing I want in my house that I don't already have. I'm kind of glad Mom's dead. She'd be pissed at me for thinking about drop-kicking Christ out of my life, even if it was just for eight days. The end never justified the means to her. Not like I go to church much anymore anyway since she died. Damn cigarettes. I need to go to the gas station again, but I don't know how I'm going to get there. I think the snow is too deep to drive through, even with my truck. I think I might be able to swing the trip there, but I don't quite know how I'd pump the gasoline into the barrels easily. The barrel dolly won't roll for poop in the snow, and I'd probably have to leave the barrels in the back and find a way to pump the gas myself using the hand crank like last time. I sure do wish I hadn't shot that pretty girl in the car. She would have been really useful right about now. I can hear mice in the walls now. They scratch all damn night trying to get near my food. There isn't anything for them to get at, though. I've got all the food locked up in an elevated dry cabinet that's sealed. Joke's on them. Approximately one month later. The mice got into my dry food supply. I may have underestimated their rodent resolve. They've managed to eat or poop in all my pasta and eat holes in the bottom of my bags of flour— That's how I found the food was tainted. I lifted a five-pound bag of flour out of the cupboard, and it ripped open and dumped all over me in the floor. Fucking mice. That's right, Mom. I said fucking. Nothing you can do about it now. The dynamite tripwires have been triggered twice this month due to falling snow. We've had a few warm days, and on those days the icicles fall, and even though the tripwires are buried under snow now, they've managed to trip the bombs. The resulting explosions have caused me to ruin my pants twice now. 
The bombs also managed to destroy large portions of my stockade fence, which has allowed the asshole Zeds to march right into my yard. I'd set them to blow together, and they didn't. They went off separately, which makes me wonder if I'm an idiot or if someone has messed with the wiring on the explosives. I suspect someone is out to get me. I'm getting low on gasoline again as well. The cold weather's causing me to piss through fuel like there's no tomorrow. I've switched to using primarily wood heat, but with the majority of my wood supplies stored outside under an awning along the back of the house, getting additional wood now doesn't seem all that awesome. I'm now looking at enacting a foolproof plan to blast out large numbers of the undead, using some of my remaining dynamite so I can get more gasoline to stay warm. If I can't get more gasoline, then I will freeze to death here in this old shithole house. I'm starting to wonder why I decided that a house near town was a good idea. I know my mom needed help doing stuff around the house, but a home further out of town would have been much more sensible for surviving the apocalypse. I wish I hadn't shot that girl. I'm very lonely. Approximately one month later. I lost most of my foot to dynamite a few weeks ago. I am not very smart. I had enough of being cold, only running the heat a few hours a day, and I opted to use three sticks of dynamite to clear a path to the truck in the driveway. I made it to the truck, shot the handful of Zed still hanging around, and loaded up four empty gasoline barrels into the bed of the truck. I lost a fingernail when it got pinched by a barrel. Wow, did that hurt. I made it to the same gas station and managed to run over a bunch of the Zeds that were hanging out near there. I don't know why Zeds would hang out at the gas station. It's not like they drive anywhere anymore. Maybe it's because they were sad about the pretty girl I shot there before. I can almost sense their jealousy when I think about it. As I was pumping the gas using my little hand crank on reverse, I looked into the crashed car at her body. I started to talk to it. I apologized for not seeing that she was as pretty as she was that day and shooting her. I told her how much I regretted that she didn't come and live with me in my old shitty house, and I told her all about how awesome my house was and how great my DVD collection was. I didn't want to over-nerd her and tell her about my Hustler collection. I'm so glad that my mom never found my boxes in the basement. She seemed to like me. She even told me that my arms were big and strong. I guess cranking the gas over and over for all that time really showed off my bulging biceps. She gave me the sexy eyes, and I told her she was pretty. And right before I left the gas station, I made sure I left her my phone number. I wrote it down on a McDonald's receipt and put it in her hand with a wink. She had such soft skin. When I got back to the house, I had a half stick of dynamite still in the truck with me, so I lit it and threw it out the window at a few Zeds near my garage as I pulled in. The damn thing didn't go off, though, so I went over to make sure the Zeds were dead, and wouldn't you know it, the damn half-stick blew up and blasted off all the toes on my left foot. My mom is now taken to calling me Eileen. Man, she pisses me off. I wish she'd just leave and wander out into the pile of Zeds outside. She's always telling me to grow up and stop watching cartoons and to ask girls to the dance and to get her cigarettes from the parlor. What a bitch. If she asks me to get her cigarettes once more, by golly, I'll stick a half stick of dynamite right down her gullet and show her who the boss is now. Approximately one month later. Most of my foot has joined the dinosaurs. Mom told me over and over to put it in Epsom salts to make sure it didn't get infected, but I ignored her because she's a jerk. Plus, I think she might be dead already, but I can't remember anymore. I don't even know what day of the week or month it is. I think it's almost spring because I can hear birds tweeting outside and the snow isn't falling as much anymore. I can get around the house pretty good when I borrow Mom's wheelchair. Sometimes I take her out of it and sometimes I just sit in her lap. It is far too painful to stand up now, though, so when I take her out of the chair, I just put her on the floor. She yells and screams until she's hoarse, but there was no other way for me to dynamite up the doors and windows. I just can't walk around with high explosives on one good foot. I'm asking for trouble. I think I have gangrene. The smell wafting up from my foot is a lot like the smell at the butcher's shop right after they start gutting cattle. It also kind of smells like poop. 
That pretty girl I met at the gas station has been with me off and on, helping me string up the deck cord and the dynamite. She says I'm handsome, and that once my foot heals up, she'd like to take me on a date. I'd like to go to Outback. I love their bread. I don't have the heart to tell her that I'm a virgin still. I think I caught her in the basement looking at my Hustler collection the other day, so she might have already figured that out. I also don't want to let her down because I think my foot will never heal. I think this is the injury that will do me in. I can't get into the basement to refuel the generator. I've got drums and drums of gasoline and diesel sitting down there, but there's no wheelchair ramp for the basement. I'm out of firewood to burn. I've started smashing apart furniture so I have something to burn, but without two good feet and with your mom yelling at you to shut the hell up from the kitchen floor, it's hard to get done. As you can imagine, it has gotten really chilly in the house here. The pretty girl and I have started to discuss the option of going out with a bang. Like I said, she's helped me put the last few sticks of dynamite all over the house in the event someone tries to break in. If anyone opens a door or breaks open a window, kaboom. They're wired to blow together, too, so clever dinks won't be able to get around my system. Anyway, I'm getting tired. My fever makes me hot, then cold off and on. And I'm now sitting in the front living room near the door. The pretty girl said she was going to her dormitory to get her sorority sisters to come back for a huge rager. I don't drink liquor, just PBR, but I guess now's as good a time as any to start. I hope the infection in my foot doesn't kill me before she gets back here with her friends. I really like pretty girls. They're so, well, pretty. My mom is yelling at me from the floor in the kitchen again. Her voice hurts my soul. Walter, come get me off this floor. Get my tapioca pudding. Joke's on you, Mom. I put dynamite in the pudding, too. I think I'll just take a nap. I'm very tired. The girls will wake me when they get back from college. I hope they come back. March 29th. I desperately needed a pleasant surprise today. I got one, if you can imagine that, Mr. Journal. Melancholy Adrian takes a vacation with negative Nancy, and reasonably optimistic Adrian moves in for a bit. We'd been planning on making a trip to Westfield on the 31st to do another one of our social trade days, but early this morning our radio lit up with traffic and our plans have since changed. Gavin was about five miles away and was asking for permission to come on to campus. When the call came in, Patty, Abby, and I were making a mediocre breakfast out of our mediocre breakfast supplies, and we all exchanged what-the-fuck looks. Abby lit up like the sun busted through the roof directly onto her. You could feel her barely restrained joy. Patty gave Gavin the green light to head on to campus, and we headed out to move the vans off the bridge so he could come in. Gavin drove onto campus a few minutes later in a beat-up Dodge pickup truck. He waved at us and parked the truck over near Hall A. I instantly knew what he was here for the moment he got out of the truck. Guys can speak to this, Mr. Journal. If you've ever had a girl in your life you really liked, then you know what I'm talking about here. Gavin got out of the truck and looked nervous and sheepish. He looked quickly at Abby and smiled, then immediately walked over to Patty and me. I think Patty knew what was up, too, because out of the corner of my eye, I caught her smiling. Gavin dragged both of his feet the entire twenty feet to us, and we waited for him to get to us. Abby stood frozen solid on the sidewalk near Hall A and watched the whole thing go down. Here's a basic account of the conversation. Mrs. Williams, Mr. Ring, I was wondering if I could talk to you today for a bit. Gavin looked like he'd stolen our bicycles and then shit on our doorstep, guilty and nervous as balls. I smiled and nodded, and Patty simply said, Sure thing, Gavin. He smiled again and asked if we'd mind going somewhere private. I gestured to the foyer of the school building right near us. Gavin pulled open the big glass door, and we ducked inside to escape the chilly morning air. Gavin shuffled his feet for a bit and swallowed hard, then did his man's deed. I would like to move here to campus so I can ask Abigail to be my girlfriend. He exhaled a deep sigh after saying it. His relief was palpable. My heart damn near popped for joy. I've been there, Mr. Journal. I've been the guy asking the dad for a date. I've been the guy who couldn't sleep because he was worried his girlfriend's dad wouldn't let her go to the prom with you. 
I've had that nervous flutter in my chest as I wondered what would happen between me and the girl I thought I loved. The moment brought me back twenty years in the span of a breath. I could see that it did the same for Patty. Her eyes were glossy by the time Gavin was done talking. I wonder how Charles would have reacted were he standing in my place. I was a little honored to have been included in this exchange. Made me feel like family. I waited for Patty to gather herself while Gavin looked at her with eyes filled with the fear of rejection. Gavin spoke before Patty did. I really like her, and I know she really likes me. We've talked already, and we know we're young, and living together would be weird, but we want to be close, and we want to try to make it work, and we understand— Patty cut him off. Gavin, shush. She said over heels for you. Gavin's eyes almost filled with his own tears when she said that. His chest puffed up, and he looked so much like the scared twenty-year-old he was— We've all become so hard that we forget how vulnerable we can be when our emotions are revealed again. Son, you seem like a good young man, and if Abby likes you as much as I think she does, I'm sure she'll feel the same in short order. But you understand this. Things aren't the same as they were in high school. You can't be causing drama and fighting. If you want to be in love, you need to work at it and never give up. Patty's tone was serious but gentle. She wanted her daughter to be happy, and she wanted Gavin to understand the seriousness of the matter. A broken heart in today's world had much larger consequences than a year ago. Gavin nodded at her, instantly listening. Patty looked to me. Adrian, Charles isn't here to speak for his daughter. Do you have anything to say to our poor defenseless young man here? I seriously debated dropping the I've got a shotgun, son, and I'm not afraid to go back to jail, speech, but he elected not to go that route. I kept it simple. Gavin, I've been your age before, and Patty's been Abby's age before, and did all the stuff you two want to do right now. Believe me, we understand exactly what's going through your minds. I need to know that you two are going to be smart about this. We can't have Abby pregnant. If you two are fooling around, you need to use protection. We've got plenty of it, no sense risking the alternative until we're very ready. And also, if you two don't work out, we need to keep the drama to a minimum. Gavin blushed something fierce and nodded emphatically. Yes, sir, I understand. I'm sorry about all that, too. Sorry for what? Being human and wanting to spend the best kind of time you can with the girl you love? There's nothing to apologize for there. Patty hit me in the arm, but she was smiling. She knew. Gavin looked pretty sheepish after the whole exchange and wound up shuffling his feet some more. Obviously, he had only thought his plan out this far. So, you're saying you want to move here to campus, Gavin? I asked him. Oh, yeah, totally. I'll live wherever, man. Gavin was stoked at the question. His eyes lit up with excitement as soon as I asked him the question. Well, you're certainly not going to room with Abby just yet, Buster. Patty pointed a finger at him with a sly smile. Gavin grinned, then made a sad face. We can stash you in one of the spare bedrooms on the top floor of Hall E, I think. That way, we're all in the same building. Or, if Ollie and Melissa wind up coming out here for sure, they can all shack up in Hall B. That way he and Abby can have little dates. I winked at him. He blushed some more. I'd prefer to live in the same building as you guys, if that's okay. We're not going to do anything, if you know what I mean. We'll be good, I promise. Gavin seemed sincere. Said that before, Patty smirked. I nodded in agreement. I've also made that promise, too. Well, Mom, she's your little girl. It's your call. Patty thought long and hard about it, then answered him just as he looked like he was about to explode from the weight. Well, Gavin, if we're going to start trusting each other, we might as well start doing it now. Let's get you set up in Hall E, and we'll see what happens. But you got to agree that if we say you got to move, then you move. No questions asked. Gavin cracked a smile that damn near showed every last one of his teeth. You bet, Mrs. Williams. I can't thank you enough. I promise I'll take good care of your daughter. You better. You think life is bad now? Hell hath no fury, buster. I patted him on the back, and we left the small glassed-in foyer of the school building. How funny is all that shit, right? 
Oh, it makes me sort of giddy like a schoolgirl. I can almost feel the affection coming off him like rays of sunshine. It literally warms the heart to be around the two of them. I'm very happy for them, and I hope they wind up lasting for a good long time. I know the odds are stacked against them, but I think the little smidge of hope they represent for me does my sanity good. We left Gavin and Abby to their devices outside for an hour or two, and they wound up walking around doing what young kids do, suck face. Patty kept going to the windows to look and see what they were doing, and every time she went, she made a gagging noise and pretended to throw up. I think she was appalled at the resolve the kids put forth in their kissing. She kept rambling on incessantly. Did you ever kiss that much? I don't remember kissing that much. Do all girls look like whores when they kiss? He looks like he's going to eat her face. Oh, God, what have I done? My poor little girl. Let it not go unsaid that Patty was far more worried about Gavin kissing her than the chances that they'd get attacked by a wandering zombie here on campus. There's something ironic and hilarious about that fact. You'd think this was Abby's first boyfriend, judging by Patty's reactions. You know, actually, that's a fairly legit question. Abby was cute, but she was a little bitchy and a little nerdy, and I know she was not a huge hit with the boys here when they were alive. They love her now, but mostly they're just interested in trying to kill her and eat her. It's actually possible she's still a virgin. Go Gavin, I suppose. I'm sure Patty was missing Charles right then, too. I know if I were in her shoes, I'd want my husband or wife with me to deal with such a momentous situation with our child. I hope this gives Patty the hope it has given me, too. After the two lovebirds got done with their tonsil hockey, they came back in, and Patty managed to compose herself. I busted out laughing at her just as the kids came in, and they turned the color of tomatoes. The beans had been spilled. After they composed themselves again, Gavin sat down and filled us in on news from Westfield. Things there were very good. Life post Sean had been good thus far, and Lisa Goldman has been what Gavin described as a kick-ass leader. She's organized training for folks so skills are shared, that way no one is the only person who knows anything. She's also made good safety decisions, puts everyone else before her, and seems like she actually cares. These are all exciting traits for a leader to have. They staged a mission a few days ago to a local construction company's yard to obtain something we've needed. I know I thought of the idea of getting a milk truck to haul water, and I still maintain that it worked just fine, but Lenny had his reservations, apparently. Something to do with the weight of water versus milk. Lenny instead realized that the local paving company had water trucks that they used to keep the dust down during hot, dry days. These trucks were about the size of the trucks that deliver your home heating oil. If the interior of the tank was cleaned and sterilized, then the water truck would serve admirably as a transportation device. Their operation went smoothly, and they encountered minimal zombie resistance. Gavin said they had something around 50 to deal with the entire operation. He went on to explain that they took longer to find the keys to the truck than they did to kill all the zombies near where the truck was parked. Personally, I'm not sure if hearing that they encountered 50 zombies was a good thing or a bad thing. I was under the impression they had already largely cleared the area, and if they found 50 all in the same vicinity, then that means they haven't cleared the area well, or the zombies have migrated in from elsewhere. Apparently, they've cleaned and prepped the truck already, and instead of us going there on the 31st, they're coming here so we can fill the water tank. With the garden hoses we have, we're looking at it taking hours to fill. Gavin felt like that truck was either a 2,000-gallon tank or a 2,500-gallon tank. Either way, that could be as much as 6 to 10 hours to completely fill, depending on how fast we can get the water going and how many hoses we can get going simultaneously. Either way you cut it, that totally solves our issue of supplying them with too little water or wasting fuel making constant water runs. The rate of water consumption for drinking is like, what, a gallon a day or something like that. If they have 40 people there, and that's high, and they each consume a gallon a day over a week, that adds up to 280 gallons a week. Triple that for bathing and washing dishes and whatnot. 
and were looking at having a 2,000-gallon tank being just about perfect to cover all their needs every week. Very exciting news. It's also pleasing to note that they did this on their own, and for once, one of my problems was solved by someone else. Yay, Westfield friends, and hooray for not having to be the muscle yet again. Gavin said Mike and company would be arriving on campus at about 9 a.m. to facilitate the water loading on the truck. He also thought Ollie and Melissa would be coming to double-check that they were still welcome here. Gavin felt that they were still very much excited to move here, Ollie especially, if only to get free of his dad's farm and to strike out on his own. So yeah, all good news. Gavin dropped off a short list of things that they need in Westfield, and we can fill most of their order with no problem. Mostly, they continue to need hygiene-oriented supplies. Bleach, detergent, toothpaste, soap, deodorant, etc. We've got that in spades, especially after getting the stuff from Stig. Mike's note also mentioned he has two ACOG scopes for us, as well as more ammo. More of Lenny's wares and diesel fuel if needed. I think it's funny that we're now giving them more than they need, and for the longest time I thought it'd be the opposite. I'm pleased that they're now scrounging for items to trade to us for our resources. I'm sure when summer and fall rolls around and our crops are being harvested, we'll have a more interesting set of trades. Until then, water is our oil, and we can trade it strong with them. I think we're being fair to everyone right now, too, which makes me happy. Yesterday, I ripped out the wall in my bedroom that adjoined the bedroom next to mine. Patty and Abby helped me, and surprisingly, it didn't take long at all to get the whole wall taken down, and the holes patched up with bits of drywall lingering around in the basements on campus. Pleasantly, I found several full sheets in a bunch of places, which means we've got some decent interior finishing supplies should we need to do some work. I had the spackle applied, and... We were cleaned up and drinking a beer after about six hours. As everyone was going to bed, I slapped a coat of paint from the basement over the new stuff we put up, and I moved everything into my room in an hour or two after that. Paint fumes for the win. I slept downstairs that night, though. (laughs) I couldn't deal with the fresh paint smell. I cracked a window and blacked out down here on my two-beer buzz. Huzzah for being a lightweight. I'm in a good place right now. I feel positive, almost invigorated. I've started to look at my life less in the light of my failings and more in the light of my successes. I know I'm not perfect, and I know I will make mistakes, but I can't murder myself over that anymore. I need to keep trying to be a better person and to help others. I can be defined by more than my past. I can choose my legacy and make my future. Something Gilbert said to me strikes me now as being particularly sagely. One day he and I were talking, I forget when, and he said something about how we had to earn our salvation now. That small concept has really sat with me and resonated, especially after having shot Steve. On paper, holy shit, I shot my friend Steve. Granted, he was dead at the time, but shit. I shot him in the face and killed him again. Then I threw his body into a fire and burnt it to ash. And I'm totally okay with that, because I genuinely believe I brought him peace. I don't know if I sent him to heaven or to hell or to wherever we get to go when our ticket is punched nowadays, but I feel down in the pit of my stomach that I brought him peace. And that brings me peace and I feel grateful that I'm still here, able to bring some kind of release to the dead, and to help the living survive as long as possible, and to help them live the best lives that they can. Now, I know I'm not perfect, and I know I swear and burp and fart, and when I need to, I'll push a turd down the drain of a shower. But I think the world needs someone like that, someone who is imperfect, but trying to be the best person they can, rising above life's challenges and rising above all the turds circling the drain. Maybe someone like me. Adrian March 31st Productive day. Productive couple of days. Exhaustion has now set in. I'm going to bang this out and face plant in my pillow. My 
pillow from my home. It smelled weird at first, but I washed it, and now it reminds me of comfort from home. I've noticed I'm sleeping better since I switched to it. I'm also sleeping better now that I have my TV from home mounted in the wall of my room, and I can rub one out and fall directly asleep afterwards. Yea, for half-asleep porno. Good times, Mr. Journal, good times. Mike, Ollie, Melissa, and a new guy came to visit us today in a Humvee and a brand spanking new water truck. Okay, so that's at least two new things to talk about. Gavin and Mike also had a nice moment where Mike asked him how it all went, and Gavin excitedly told him. There's a definite father-son thing going on there. It might just be a sergeant-private thing, too, but there's definitely some family love happening. Actually, that does no justice to the relationship a good sergeant has with the troops below them. Mike looked very proud of Gavin for having stepped up and come here to ask about moving here and dating Abby. That's actually the third thing to talk about. First things first, new guy. Small fella named Hector Gutierrez. He's a specialist in the unit Mike is now the head of. Well, that's sort of assuming they even still exist as a unit. I think Mike said there were only five or six of them left now, after everything that's happened. Hector is a small guy, maybe pushing five and a half feet, and he's a thick one, too. Not fat, just wide of shoulder and hip. As you might imagine, he has a Mexican lineage, and was not shy at all in reminding to never question his brown pride. Hector has a few years' experience working on vehicles, and Mike says he's their mechanic. He's funny, pretty clever, and I liked him from the jump. The water truck is pretty sweet. It's a big international truck with a giant steel water container mounted on the back. Mike and Hector hopped up and showed me that the interior was actually lined with a synthetic material, kind of like a sleeve, to prevent leaks and to fight mold and stuff. It should be absolutely perfect for us as we move forward. Well, it could be a little better because it took for fucking ever to fill up using two garden hoses. Mike knew it'd take forever, and he suggested we get the hoses going immediately. We hooked one up to the sink in Hall A, and the other up to an exterior nozzle on the side of the hall. We didn't want to stand or sit out there in the morning chill holding the hoses, so we jury-rigged a temporary duct tape system to hold the hoses pointing downward into the tank. I want to say it took us six hours to fill the tank, maybe seven. I'm not entirely positive, but the moral of the story is... It was a long-ass time. While we waited for the tank to fill, we had an early lunch and got our trade out of the way. I think this was our first heavily lopsided trade in favor of us. The quantity of water we sent their way in the truck was substantial, and the fact that we have a largely unlimited supply of it makes me think the value of our water might not be as high anymore. Not so much because it isn't as valuable, but because it's so damned easy for us to get. Westfield can't possibly continue to give us trades like today if they plan on having their own shit as time goes on. The truck filled with water is just shy of 2,500 gallons. If they use just that water, that's a week's worth for them, with spare, Mike felt. In addition to the water, we gave them some of the venison off the deer I got a while ago and six cans of fruit. Mike traded to us the following... Two ACOG scopes for the M4, M15 rifles, which substantially increases the range we can be accurate with them, as well as two chickens, butchered for eating, two dozen eggs, four bottles of milk, one almost full case of kosher MREs, uh, apparently no one likes the meal inside, chicken and black beans, by the way, oy vey, and four bags of field-grade fertilizer for Ollie to put to use when he and Melissa move here. All of that for some water out of the tap. How hilarious is that? Actually, it's not funny at all. I feel like a highway robber. Mike and I looked at the trade at the end, and granted, the amount of water is enormous, but the risk and work in obtaining it is negligible, whereas the risk and effort in getting the stuff they're trading to us is much higher. It definitely isn't fair, and we all agreed that the trade values needed adjusting as we moved forward, we need to be fair to preserve the relationship. Uh, what next? Oh, okay. Ollie and Melissa are moving here on the 2nd. We elected to have them come here in two days, mostly to avoid a really bad April Fool's joke. I know I'd be tempted to do something stupid that day, and 
It's just for the best if I avoid any kind of temptation. They are arriving with another large pickup, and from what Ollie says, a large amount of tools his father is sparing for him. Ollie and I talked about the tractor at the farm on Jones Road, and based off my description of it, he says we will be golden if he can get it running. So they'll be here on the second. Bitchin. I'm looking forward to their arrival. The more I hang out with Ollie and Melissa, the more I like them. They're salt-of-the-earth people, simple, strong, and smarter than anyone gives them credit for. I wish I'd known more folks like them. Abby and Gavin are already a couple. Big surprise, right, Mr. Journal? Jealous? Abby is pretty cute, and she's only going to get better looking as the years pile on to her. She's got to grow into her frame, and once she's found her woman's confidence, she'll be an absolute beast to handle. I feel so bad for Gavin. She is so clearly in control of their relationship. In a good way, mind you. She isn't domineering. She's just the dominant personality, and he's more than happy to sunbathe in her aura. If the mall was open, I could totally see her making him hold her purse while she tried some trendy logo t-shirt on at Hot Topic or something. It's cute. What else am I missing here? Ollie and Melissa, the truck, the new guy Hector. Oh, incidentally, Hector gave Gavin some pretty hilarious tongue lashings when he laid eyes on Abby. Hector has a slight accent and inserts Spanish words here and there for emphasis and humor. Our whiteness amuses him to no end. It's too funny watching him go off on Gavin. Here's a sample quote. Mi amigo, you have brass cojones to leave my sweet ass behind for that blonde chick. Look at me, I'm hot. And then he gestures at his fat Mexican ass like he's a playboy model. It's so funny. I thought at one point Abby was going to stab him, though. Abby and Patty have the same death ray stare, and she put it to good work making sure Hector knew the humor didn't outlast her patience. New couples can be so cute. Oh, uh, Mike and company said they drove past and handled two zombies right near the Auburn Lake Road Route 18 intersection, where the gas station burned down. He thought they were moving in this general direction, which makes me wonder if our recent forays into the new areas of town have drawn them back. Apparently, whatever truce we'd had that kept the bastards away is now officially over. Oh well. I guess that means some of the undead are headed our way to get put down. I've decided to think of this as a fuel-saving initiative on the undead's part, and I'm now officially thankful for it. Go green, come to the humans to get shot, save a gallon of gas. Now, if more than a few dozen do this at a time, I'll quickly lose my good-natured opinion about the matter— I reserve the right to change my mind. After our trade, we shot the shit, hung out, and we gave them a quick tour of Hall B, where Ollie and Melissa are going to set up. The expecting couple seemed very excited to have all that space to themselves. Neither of them seemed put off by the work that needed to be put into the place either, which was good news. Ollie seemed downright elated. He also said he knew of a few wood stoves in Westfield we could get if we couldn't find one locally, which is a pretty clutch bit of news on his part. They were both almost brought to tears when they saw the baby stuff we'd salvaged from the daycare a week and a half ago. Genuinely appreciative. Once the truck's water tank was filled to our satisfaction, we ripped the duct tape off, pulled the hoses, sealed her up, and they were off. Melissa and Patty had a very long goodbye, too. I think they're bonding as mother and soon-to-be mother. Warms the heart. So... Yesterday we got Gavin settled into Hall E with us. He's in his own room on the third floor, far from Abby's vagina. Patty slept well last night in the belief that she would be able to hear him sneaking down or her sneaking up. I'm pretty sure I heard one of them going one way or the other last night, but frankly, I'm not cock-blocking Abby. They've gotten the use a condom speech, and I think they're smart enough to listen to it. I'm just hoping they have a heady petting phase before they get into the more serious stuff. I miss serious stuff. I think I caught a light socket giving me the old wink the other night. I almost had sex with it just so I could say to myself I stuck my dick in something. Luckily, I waved that attack pattern off. The last thing I need is to electrocute my penis. Not much else happened yesterday. I think we were all pretty excited about the new face on campus. Gilbert came down and played the role of Abby's grandfather and gave Gavin several of the speeches, 
after which Gavin sat at least two or three extra inches away from her. A man has power, Mr. Journal. He can scare the penis right inside a twenty-year-old. I just realized I used the word penis in two consecutive paragraphs. That's got to be significant in some weird fashion, especially if you factor in that I am referring to more than my own penis. When a man talks about someone else's penis, you know this shit is for real. That, or I'm steadily going gay. I don't know. Tomorrow? I don't know about tomorrow yet. I'm thinking we lay low again and get some shit done around campus. I'd like to get more firewood cut and split for the wood stove in Hall A and for when we get a stove in Hall B. That job has Gavin and Abby written all over it. I think Patty, Gilbert, and I should go down Auburn Lake Road and assess the home heating oil supply. There's, what, 45 houses in this vicinity? And I bet 20 bucks most of them use heating oil. With a better idea of how much fuel we can bring to bear, we'll have a more accurate idea of how long we can heat the halls using oil. I know eventually we'll be switching to just wood heat, but... I'd obviously like to use the furnaces as long as possible. Nothing larger than that strikes me as prudent at this juncture. Heading back into town right before Ollie and Melissa arrive seems silly to me. Prepping here is the thing to do. Once they get here and are settled comfortably, we can start looking at heading back into town and clearing houses for supplies and to kill zombies. I'm also starting to think about marking houses as being cleared so folks can tell they're safe and so that we can know that we've cleared them already. With myself, Patty, Gilbert, Abby, and Gavin, we can probably clear two houses at the same time and roll in a three-vehicle unit, which is so much safer for everyone. Well, clearing two houses at once isn't safer, but it certainly will be faster. Before we do that, I need to see how Gavin is with the M4 he brought with him. It's a comforting thought to know that we have one more gun in the fight if shit gets thick. I'm starting to feel a lot less vulnerable with him here. Maybe it's because he's a soldier, or maybe it's because I'm coming to grips with reality. Or, maybe subconsciously, I feel like every time something nice happens near me, one more turd gets pushed down the drain by a giant cosmic toe. That's a funny image. Adrian April 2011 April 2nd Wow. By the time I'm done talking about everything that's gone down the past couple of days, I'm going to have carpal tunnel. So much going on. Idle hands are the devil's plaything, though, and at the rate we're going, no one is going to attract any devilish attention any time soon around here. Okay, so yesterday was a prep day for us, Mr. Journal. We wanted to cross all the T's and dot all the I's before Ollie and Melissa arrived today. Our first and primary goal for the entire day yesterday was to get our newest gas generator out of the gymnasium and in the Hall B so Ollie and Melissa had juice. Now, on paper, that seems fairly easy, but this is a big generator, and with the warm-slash-cold cycles we've had the past few days, the frost heaves in the streets on campus have more or less ruined the idea of dragging the generator on the ground or using the engine lift and rolling that over. The gym isn't that far from Hall B, but it's just far enough. We elected to use Gilbert's truck, Gavin's truck, some two-by-fours, and the engine lift to get it done. Long story short, we lifted the generator into the truck, then put the engine lift in the other truck, drove them over, shoveled the way clear to the Hall B bulkhead door, got the lift down, used the lift to get the generator down, then used the two-by-fours to slide said generator down the bulkhead steps. The expression, easier said than done, could not be more appropriate. Gilbert had cut some four-by-fours as a base for the generator, and after the three-hour process of busting our assholes, we got it settled in and patched it into the hall's power. A little bit of gas and some crossed fingers later, and for the first time in nine months, the lights came on in Hall B. The generator ran a little rough for a bit, but settled in after a few minutes. Don't know if that's the generator or if the gas is starting to lose potency, but we'll take it as long as we can. It's a small step, but every building that gets electricity here certainly feels substantial to me. One more place where light and warmth exists seems really important. 
Patty and Abby simply had to clean Hall B. Of course, Abby wouldn't let Gavin go off alone, and he wound up getting roped into the maid work while Gilbert and I ghosted into the basement to save our manliness and to get the furnace up and running. A filter change and a pilot light check later, the burner kicked on, and within minutes the vents were kicking out the heat. Being more intelligent and experienced than our younger male counterpart, Gilbert and I slipped out the bulkhead and enjoyed a stiff cocktail on the shores of Auburn Lake. Goslings and Coke, if you're curious, Mr. Journal. We were on our second drink when I noticed a zombie shuffling across the bridge. Gilbert and I sat there at our picnic table, contemplating the meaning of why the damned things keep finding their way up here for about five minutes before I decided to deal with it. Gilbert covered me with his forty-five while I dug a halligan out of the plow truck. The poor zombie was mangled pretty good. Seemed to me like it had been hit by a car or truck. The shape of its torso was off, squished or twisted or something. Using my typical circular approach, I brained it with the halligan, fetched the four-wheeler, and put it on the burn pile where Steve's body had gone. I said hi to Steve's ashes while I was there, and I puttered my way back to Gilbert, where we resumed our conversation about the meaning of life and plans for the future. I'll go over those plans in a bit, Mr. Journal. They're pretty important. So the rest of that night, after the girls got done cleaning the hall, was us sharing a pretty wonderful meal together. Gilbert agreed to cook some of our venison in the crock pot, and I tell you what, that man is a miracle worker with food. Canned carrots, potatoes, a jar of teeny white onions, some seasonings, some shit I couldn't even identify, and voila, venison stew. To die for. I want Gilbert's babies. Frankly, I'm also going to go on record and say I'd have that deer's babies too. Delicious, yummy deer. It's been a while since I'd had joy over food. I'm thinking we need to vote Gilbert officially into the resident chef role, and tough shit if he doesn't like it. I swear we're all happier after he cooks. I literally think that guy has a jar of happiness that he spikes dinners with. Anyway, venison erection aside, at and after dinner we discussed life after Ollie and Melissa, who we have begun to call Team Babymaker, or Team TB for short. Originally, we'd opted for Team BM, but that made us giggle every time we said it. Team TB still makes us giggle, but less often, and is thus preferable. Everyone is excited. Was excited. Whatever. However, the need to push on is strong in all of us, and with Gavin here as an extra shooter, we've never been stronger in a tactical sense. Clearing houses of the undead and acquiring supplies should go faster and smoother now, as long as we're intelligent about it. Our planning last night was over basic tactical stuff on clearings and how we've done stuff versus how Westfield had done it. Very similar ideas, but Westfield had a twist on the process I found interesting. Their idea is definitely on the table for later. So, today was excitement central here. Gavin wound up waking us all up at the fucking ass crack of dawn with a rifle shot. After I wiped the shit off my ass and found him, he'd taken out a zombie shuffling about near the far side of the bridge. Of course, he did that from the window at the end of the hallway on the third floor of Hall E, which was loud as a motherfucker inside, especially at 7 a.m. We reamed him out a bit, but then thanked him. Patty accused him of having been awake because he was slipping into or out of Abby's room, which nearly started World War III between daughter and mother. As it turns out, Gavin was an early riser because he always had the morning watch shift in Westfield. He was accustomed to waking at 6 a.m. and wasn't used to having his shots bother anyone. Note of the day on that, Mr. Journal. Gavin racked up a headshot. Through tree branches. In a breeze. On a moving zombie with his M4's iron sights on the first try at what I'd guess was about 150 yards. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. All is forgiven. If he can do that, he's got a lot of credit for fuck-ups with me. That's a rugged shot. I'll have to squeeze how he got that good at shooting out of him when I get some time. I'm betting he's got hunting experience, or he's just a natural. Breakfast was the order of the day, and with our fresh restock from Westfield, we had pancakes again. 
I'm thinking this is now our tradition. Patty made the pancakes with a smidge of applesauce in them and served a little plastic cup of the applesauce with the pancakes instead of the faux maple syrup we've been using, and it was really nice. I like the new tradition of eating together. It gives us a chance to see each other, make sure we're all on the same page, and gives us time to plan, communicate, and well, feel like a team. As we wrapped up doing the dishes, we heard the honking of a truck's horn, and lo and behold, Ollie and Melissa were on the far side of the bridge. Smiles were everywhere. Vans moved. We directed them to Hall B and helped them get settled in. Well, the girls split off to get settled, and the men split off to do work. Ollie had brought a gift from Lenny. Two huge rolls of chicken wire, wood, nails, screws— and once we get the coop built with all that, he had ten hens and a rooster for us to put in it. How cool is that? Seriously, Mr. Journal, we will have fresh eggs right here on campus in the very near future, as in, potentially, tomorrow. I cannot believe how awesome that is. It took us almost the entire day to get a chicken coop built, but that's with us making sure Gavin stayed with the men. I couldn't bear to have him stolen away by Abby and forced to deal with all that estrogen again. Two consecutive days of the Vagina Festival, and I think we officially need to pull his man card. Poor kid's penis will shrivel up if we don't look out for it. He's too young to know how to take proper care of it. We decided that keeping the coop near Hall B was a good idea. It was a shorter trip for Ollie and Melissa to check the chickens for eggs, and it meant they could keep closer eye on the coop in the event the foxes or raccoons ever come back and try to eat them. Two coops were built, one on one side of the building, the other on the other. We built a sturdy two-level coop where the hens could get off the ground on one side of the hall, and a smaller coop for the rooster. That way, the hens aren't all weirded out by the rooster, which is a problem, apparently. And that way Ollie can set up a single hen at a time, laying fertile eggs for more chickens. With just a little effort, he says by the end of the year, it's quite likely we'll have thirty or forty chickens if we don't eat them. I'm all for eggs. I'm also all for eating chickens. This will be a very difficult decision over time. I think there is considerable sense in not eating our own chickens until we've got a large, healthy base to work with. Ollie says his dad has something like eighty chickens and a dozen breeding at any given time, so we can always trade for chickens to eat from them. He was also kind enough to let us know that his dad would be willing to trade us a bull and a cow so we could start breeding our own cattle. However, all he said Lenny would likely trade hard for it, and we'd best think of something pretty special. All he had some ideas, but he wanted to ruminate on it for a bit. He also used the word ruminate, which I liked. He also asked if I knew of any local farms we might be able to find more cows or sheep at. I drew a blank. We took breaks to eat, and at one point we all froze as we heard some noises coming from the woods near the maintenance outbuildings. Actually, we think it came from the area near the building we converted into a smoker, but when we checked it out, there was nothing there. I'm wondering if it was wildlife returning, or if a branch fell or something. Who knows? We're so on the edge when we're outdoors, constantly checking for threats and being extra attentive. I'm looking forward to the day when... I can let my guard down and just let the sun hit me in the face without worry. I think we've got a long ways to go before that becomes reality. I think we need a really big fence surrounding campus for that to happen. That's for damn sure. After sundown, when we wrapped up, we all collapsed inside Hall B, and Ollie and Melissa made us all dinner. They were exhausted, but they insisted on making something. They brought a meager supply of food for themselves and made pasta with sauce for us. It wasn't anything special, but the company was. Dinner with new people, especially ones that you like, makes for a good evening. Short aside, I definitely need to reassess our food consumption. Three extra mouths to feed will literally eat through our food stores. We had a rough estimate on how long our food would last, but the added people will change that date. Most of us cracked open a few beers that were still in date, or close to it, and we put our tired feet up and soaked in each other's company. However, work had to be done, and with everyone gathered, rested, and largely coherent, prior to the beer soaking in at least, Gilbert and I decided to address the team. 
basic idea, what the fuck to do next. Everyone had ideas to share, with the exception of Ollie and Melissa. As the FNGs on campus, they had no opinion and would do whatever was asked of them. We forced opinions out of them eventually. New perspectives are important. The same old thinking tends to get you the same old results. I'll sum this up as fast as I can. We all universally acknowledged that the town must be cleared. This must happen for several reasons. We need to kill all the remaining zombies at a minimum for the sake of safety, moral responsibility aside. The houses must be checked for survivors so we can help them and give them the option of joining our little community. Tactically, we also need to know who we are competing with for whatever resources remain in town. We need to accumulate as many resources as we possibly can to ensure our survival through next winter. This is where finding out how long our food should last becomes really fucking important. We still want to set up the safe houses to screen new folks for coming up here. They might also serve us in opening up safe lines of communication with groups that do not want to join us here. We need to know what happened and is happening out there. That was enough to get everyone on board. With the reduced amount of undead in town, we all felt that forays deeper and deeper into the center were viable and survivable. Going by the town's population of maybe 8,000 folks, it seemed highly unlikely that all 8,000 people were in town when the shit hit the fan. Everyone knew that we were a suburb of the city and that at least 20% of the town's residents worked there or elsewhere out of town and were likely at work when it went down. Some folks left town for the north to the more rural areas of the state, and obviously many died and stayed dead. The X factor was the survivors. How many had made it this far and were still alive somewhere nearby? Were they hostile, hurt? Gilbert and I felt comfortable with a rough highball estimate of 4,000 zombies right here in town. What's more, for added emphasis, 4,000 zombies. We're going to need to get creative because we cannot afford to fire 4,000 rounds clearing this town. There's a whole world filled with these things out there, and we have to assume they'll find us sooner or later. Tomorrow, we're cutting wood for the wood stoves while the weather holds and it stays reasonably warm. Patty and Gilbert are checking the local homes for oil so we can get a firm idea of what we've got to work with. And while that's all going down, I'm going to scout the fringe of campus and see if I can't bring down a deer. Day after that, we are clearing houses moving towards the center of town. New standing rule. All daycares are burned flat on site. Adrian. April 4th. The greatest journeys begin with a single step. I forget who said that, or said something like that. I'd Google it to find out, but I'm dealing with this pesky apocalypse thing, and Google seems to be down. I'm hoping it comes up soon. There's a lot of shit I wish I'd looked up. The meaning stands true, whether or not Google is up, or whether or not I can tell you who said it. It's true. The smallest steps can build into the biggest journeys, and today we started to clear the houses of town. Yesterday first. Aaron Day, Yawnville, compared to today. I'll keep it simple, short, and hit the bullet points. Gavin and Abby took down the trees we'd scored with the chainsaw in preparation for the original Westfield assaults. It was risky leaving them like that all this time anyway, and we needed the wood for next winter anyhow. Gavin has some experience with a chainsaw, more on that later, and he made damn quick work of getting the tree down and dissected into Abby-sized pieces. The two of them worked that action all day, and last night they were fucking beat. They fell asleep propped up against each other on the living room couch, No risk of sex last night meant Patty slept like a baby. Speaking of Patty, she and Gilbert hit the entire lengths of Jones Road, Prospect Circle, and Auburn Lake Road checking for home heating oil. Diesel, of the 45 homes they checked, 38 used oil, and of them, the vast majority were half-full tanks or less. They used the existing gauges and a plumb bob thingamajigger Gilbert jury rig to get the quantities. The majority of the houses had either 275 or 330 gallon tanks, and in reality, those are never more than 80% full. So let's assume they were all 250 gallon tanks, 
and they were all at 40% capacity. That's 100 gallons per house and a total of 38 houses. Carry the one, use my laptop's calculator, and I get a grand total of 3,800 gallons of diesel just here. The other seven houses used wood for heat, one, and we already have that wood stove in Hall A, or propane. Here on campus, each dorm has a 3,000-gallon underground storage tank. The tanks were on regular bi-weekly delivery schedules and were always topped off. We had five halls, admissions, the office building, the main school building, the gymnasium, the cafeteria, the primary maintenance building, the art building, and the wood shop slash industrial arts building. Some of those smaller buildings shared a single tank, but as best we can figure out, there are at least eight oil tanks on campus. We have only consumed oil from Hall E and Hall A's tanks. That's roughly 24,000 gallons of oil, plus whatever remains in A and E's tank. Logistically, if we can stay in three halls as long as possible, I'm going to guess and say we will use 1,500 gallons per winter per hall, three halls, which means we should have heat for at least four to five years. And that's without the roughly 3,800 gallons in the houses nearby. All this is dandy, but the simple fact is that with no gasoline, there's no gas generator, and with no generator, there's no need for heating oil. So, we need a lot of gasoline to make that heating useful for heating. We're also exceptionally fortunate that the potency of the gas hasn't shit the bed. Gas has a shelf life, and I'm not an expert, but we've got to be pushing our luck within the next few months. The alternative is wood stoves and wood, which I know we will source by the end of spring. One wood stove in each of our buildings that we need heat in during the winter, and we essentially have heat forever and spare diesel to drive vehicles with for a very long time. When the gasoline dies, our gas-powered electric generators die. Then we will be sans hot water and operating off the solar panels and batteries. I'm starting to think a hydroelectric dam is the way to go. Mr. Journal, if you know how or know someone who does know how to build and maintain one, now would be a pretty fucking clutch time to speak up. Aside here, back in medieval ages, most folks lived and died in a few mile radius of where they were born. Long trips were too expensive and too dangerous to undertake unless you were martially skilled or very wealthy. You'd live in your parents' home until they died, probably marry your neighbor, probably have a few malnourished kids with them, and they'd live in your house until you kicked off, lather, rinse, repeat. That scenario sound disturbingly familiar to you, Mr. Journal? Because long trips for us are too dangerous and wasteful of fuel for us to undertake. We've regressed 800 years in nine months. Really sit back and think about that. Honestly, it's kind of neat, and also horrifying at the same time. How fragile our society was. Ollie and Melissa got things in their place just so, and Ollie finished the chicken coops. Coop I? Is that the plural for coop? Not a word I use a lot, Mr. Journal. And started to assess what we would be needing for fences, for crops, and any cattle we'd be acquiring down the line. Ollie also did some pretty clever measuring of our needs for a campus perimeter fence. He tied a length of rope between his feet, and each stride he took was a set measurement. He counted his paces, and at the end he had a near-perfect number of feet and yards for the fences. Melissa covered him in the event they were jumped. He felt that fencing the cattle into a small area was stupid, as they could easily eat all the grass on campus that we would need to mow anyway, and... Why build a fence for the cattle, then another fence for the zombies, then another fence for the crops? One perimeter fence, then perhaps a barbed wire fence around the crops to keep the cows out of the field. Fart smell of that, Ollie. Everyone hit the rack early, and we woke up with the sun at about 6 a.m. to start a long day of house clearing. There's a small gathering of streets off Route 18 that's somewhat separate from the mass of downtown. If you were to look at the layout of those streets on paper, there's a central street called Hickory Road. 
Off of Hickory Road on both sides are loops that make it look like a nine and a P back to back, like a skeleton key. Mouse ears. Hmm, that makes sense? Anyway, the left side loop is called Adam's Way, and the right side loop is called Harold Way. In total, there are seven houses on all three streets. They aren't connected to anything else other than Route 18, and there's at least a few hundred yards of forest between the houses there and anything else of note. It was an excellent chance for us to do a small house-clearing run to work out the kinks and see how Gavin fit in. As it turned out, it went excellent. Excellent Excellent-ish. As excellent as anything involving me, the human unlucky anal ponage rabbit's foot can be. Gilbert's Chevy, the Plow, and the HRT were our three vehicles for the day. They gave us cargo capacity, good ground clearance, mobility, and versatility. Two houses on Hickory are near the main road and are across from one another. We did quick loops of the roads off Hickory, dropped a few walkers with melee weapons that were moving around free, and then returned to the two houses to start the dirty work. We really need to make a concentrated effort to conserve ammo when we can. Our basic system of making noise, waiting for a sufficient intelligent response, then searching the exterior of the houses, then breaching and clearing the interior were still in effect. Gavin suggested in our prior discussions that we use the chainsaw method of clearing. During their time in Westfield, when they were going door-to-door, apartment to apartment, they'd knock, and if they heard noise or caught a whiff of that tell-tale rotting odor, they'd bore a hole in the door or wall at head height with a chainsaw and create a gun slot. They'd lure the undead inside the target home to the gun slot and shoot them from the relative safety of the outside. Ideally, this was done near a window so a spotter could see inside the house as it all went down. Once all visible zombies were cleared through the slot, they breached and repeated the process at every interior door until the entire house was made safe. I swear I thought of this idea myself, but it's been so long since I applied any gray matter to the idea of clearing houses, I can't remember. I'm also far too lazy to actually read this damn journal to find out if I wrote any awesome ideas down, too. This is a slow, laborious process that wastes gasoline, but seems very safe to me. We will use this method when breaching a certain home or business is clearly unsafe. We didn't need it today, which tells you roughly how our day went. Oh, as for a team, it was Gilbert, Gavin, Patty, Abby, and myself. Gilbert provided cover fire from the roof of the HRT, while Patty and Abby cleared left and Gavin and I cleared right. I felt comfortable letting the girls work as a team, and I wanted to personally gauge Gavin's abilities, attitude, and overall reaction to stress. He may be a good shot, but taking a shot at a hundred yards is a fucking shitload different than standing toe to motherfucking toe with a tango. Nice rhyme. Masturbatory high five. Gavin and I cleared four of the seven houses. Want to know why we cleared more houses than Team Vagina? Girls? Take. Everything. Gavin and I cleared our four houses fast and dirty, and then came back through a second time to gather our spoils. Opinion on Gavin. He's green in terms of combat experience, but he's a veteran in clearing houses. I can see that it bothers him to shoot people, which is reassuring, I guess. And he doesn't seem, like, fucked up by it. I think he's just weirded out by it. His nerves are good, his tactical sense is good, and... When we're in the shit, he seems on point. I'm comforted by his current skill level, and I am excited for his potential. The AAR for today was as such. Fourteen dead zombies in houses, shot by us. Three dead bodies, not undead, just regular old-school vanilla dead. Multiple dead pets, and I think we dropped four or five walkers on the streets during the whole day. Gilbert noted that almost all the walkers were dressed warmly, i.e. heavier pants and winter jackets. Put that together yet? That means those people survived at least until warm weather hit. I'm guessing they made it at least until September, and possibly even into a month or two ago. There's no way of telling. Gilbert said most of them had bite wounds, so my guess is that They were surviving and either had their sanctuary violated or got bitten while out scavenging like we are now. No matter how you slice it, 
It likely means there were survivors in this area for a few months after that day. Encouraging? Frightening? None of our kills were done in any real danger. Most of the shots were taken through windows or through closed doors with the Mossberg, or we beat the undead to death with a halligan or melee weapon. The girls had a similar experience in their three houses. No injuries, no wasted ammo, and really no drama. All in all, awesome. As for loot, it was a pretty dry hole for food. Most of the houses had been stripped bare, especially the ones with the dead bodies inside. Starvation? Suicide? No idea. I think we yielded a grand total of maybe twenty cans of food, and a few various boxes of pasta, cereal, etc. Really, a swing and a miss for food. Other supplies, however, were a great haul. Lots of hygiene products, toilet paper, etc., as well as a few handguns and a few rifles and shotguns. Ammunition was reasonable, clean and dry, and in usable calibers, which was nice. I'm still waiting on finding that mythical guy in town with the reloading set up. I know he's out there. It'd be nice to get that process up and running. I haven't done any reloading since I was a kid in my dad's shed, but I think I can figure it out in a hurry if I had to. We siphoned gasoline out of the car gas tanks in the neighborhood and found some extra gas cans, amazingly all full. We actually had to send Abby back in one of the trucks to pick up empty fuel cans so we could bring it all back. All told, I think the final tally was almost 70 gallons of gas. No new generators, but we did find a nice small wood stove. It'll go perfect in a small building on campus or as a second wood stove in the upper floor of a hall. Three of us were able to load it into one of the trucks by hand, which tells you how small it was. The same house had tons of bricks and concrete blocks, as well as a pile of dry bags of cement, which will come in handy for sure down the line. Tools, a new axe, another chainsaw, and a slew of other items that might be useful eventually, but not so awesome that I feel like typing them all out. I'm sure I'm forgetting something. Other than the fact that we found almost no food, considering how much real estate we cleared, today was an overwhelming success. No injuries, a little waste, good experience, and overall, everyone came home with a positive attitude. Chalking today up as a big win. As for tomorrow, well, I know of one more fairly large cul-de-sac that's isolated on this side of town that's another beta test of our group before we get into more congested areas where we'll need to be mistake-free and 100% dialed in. The cul-de-sac has six houses on it, and they're all pretty large and old. There's this old Victorian home that belonged to the Mayorga family. The mother died years ago, and I know the son Walter from around town. He was one of the resident kooks everyone gave wide berth to. I bet the inside of that dilapidated old house is a wreck. They were probably hoarders, and I bet anything there are like a hundred dead cats inside. That or a shitload of guns. Walter was convinced the revolution was just around the corner. Capital W Weirdo. We'll be hitting that neighborhood tomorrow, and I think for chuckles we'll hit the Victorian first. Let's see how many screws that family had loose. As my new friend Hector would say, adios, mi amigo. Adrian. April 6th. At first I was like, what the fuck? And then I lolled. Walter Mayorga was absolutely batshit crazy. I mean, fuck showing up a sandwich short, he showed up to the fucking picnic with no picnic basket. Not only was he not the sharpest tool in the shed, he probably tried to hammer in nails with marshmallows. Wow, fucking crazy. I am very, very happy we didn't run into him before he died, because his home was a goddamn charnel house. His neighborhood was covered with the undead. I drove point in the plow truck, and just on the initial drive through the loop, I hit at least twenty undead. We wound up dragging them back to the main road, where we set up a firing line using the trucks as support. All told, our body count was sixty-three undead just on the cul-de-sac. Now, as far as Walt's house, wow. Let me set the scene for you. The cul-de-sac is a straight road in, with the loop at the end. Walt's gray piece-of-shit Victorian was set in the far left-hand end of the loop. 
there were three houses in the loop and three houses along the straight shot in. Around Walt's home, standing almost seven feet high, in places, was the remnant of a very sturdy stockade fence. The fence had been smashed apart in what Gilbert supposed was a series of small explosions. He was thinking gas bomb or perhaps something like a stick of low-grade dynamite. Parked in his driveway was his trademark giant fucking yellow pickup truck covered in old blood stains and chunks of gore. Shit was caked on so thick and brown it had lasted through all the snow melt and rain we've had. Three of his tires were punctured, but he had run flats so the vehicle still moved. On the ground in every direction for a solid fifty yards were bodies. It took me the better part of an hour to push the bodies off the road so we could work safely to give you an idea of how thick it was. Most, as in ninety percent of the bodies in the cul-de-sac, were decapitated by headshots or had clear gunshot trauma to the nugget. Pretty obvious to all of us that these zombies had been put down by a shooter, and over time the shooter had continued to draw them in, eventually surrounding himself with far too many to deal with effectively. We honked, yelled, and cleared the interior of Walt's fenced-in yard using extra caution. On one side of his yard there was the burnt-out frame of what looked to be a garage or large workstation. The concrete floor was scorched black as oil in one corner, and we guessed there was some kind of explosion. Later on, Abby pointed out there was a giant gas cylinder and down impaling through a car across the street. The shit was like the Saturday morning Acme Warner Brothers Wiley Coyote bullshit. I was waiting for Walt to come out with a burnt cigar in his mouth and his face covered in black scorch marks while the wah-wah-wah music played in the background. We cleared the exterior for danger, set up a perimeter, and Gavin and I breached the home. We entered, moving inches at a time, looking for anything dangerous that might blow us up. I desperately wanted Silly String to check for tripwires, but... In the post-apocalyptic environment, Silly String's availability has dropped dramatically. What we found inside shocked us. For starters, directly inside the door, sitting in the middle of the foyer next to the grand staircase of the old Victorian, was poor old fucked-up Walt, sitting in an old-ass wheelchair. It was one of the old wooden ones with the creepy high back. His left leg was rotted straight off at the ankle, He smelled like fresh, gross asshole. He was dead as disco, and he was fixing to sit up and bite us. Gavin walked in, he froze solid, mouthed a what-the-fuck at me, and dropped the butt of the M4 right through old Walt's temple. Walt went limp right off, crumbled out of the wheelchair and onto the floor with a wet thud, and our town was down one village idiot. Fortunately, I'm still here carrying the torch. Walt's body was still very swollen from decaying, which reminded me of when a body is still fresh. You see, when we rot, there's a period where we bloat and get all Michelin Man meets Freddy Krueger. It's horrid. After a while, though, the gas dissipates and we shrink back down to a fairly normal size. Walt must have died real slow from gangrene and managed to rot before he died. Walt couldn't have been dead more than a week or two at most. Here's the real kicker. Gavin and I started to clear the interior of the house, and almost every window on the first floor had Twizzlers taped together with black electrical tape, forming some weird-ass rope that connected them all together. The rope was stuck into the ends of rotting hot dogs like a fuse might be stuck into the end of a stick of dynamite. I think that poor delusional fuck thought hot dogs were dynamite and the Twizzlers were debt cord. How detached from reality do you need to be to make that fucking mistake? Nonetheless, I am not detached from reality, and we backed out nice and slow, and I went in solo to clear the house for legitimate booby traps. After seeing the damage done to the fence outside, I didn't want to run the risk that old Walt actually had a real stick of TNT mixed in somewhere and we'd trip it. It took me almost two hours to check every door, every shelf, every step— every drawer and every knick-knack to make sure it was all clear. Once I was confident we were good to go, the place was like Walmart for the apocalypse. I cannot overstate the seriousness of that statement. Walt must have had a serious, serious thing about the end of the world or the impending disaster where food and goods would be unavailable. 
His house was packed to the gills with awesome shit. In fact, he had so much awesome shit, we needed to fetch our other truck to get it out in one day. For starters, he had food, lots of food, good food, flats and flats of canned goods, as well as prepackaged stuff like ramen, cups of noodles, boxes of pasta, flour, freeze-dried fruit, bags and bags of beef jerky, and he even had three cases of MREs packed away in a corner of his basement. Mind you, he'd eaten a lot already, and there was a pile of garbage six feet deep in his backyard outside his kitchen window to prove it, but there was still so much food left. All of the sweets he had were gone, though, which was a real bummer. Judging by the plastic wrappings piled up and blown all over his yard, the man had a long-term committed relationship with Hostess Cupcakes. As for other shit, what's the phrase I'm looking for? Oh yeah, Oprah Rich. He had a locked gun case filled with good shit. I had to get the key out of his corpse's pants pocket, though, which was nasty work, but it was well worth it in the end. Anywho, muzzle loaders, rifles, pistols, shotguns, you name it. He had 22 weapons in all, and at least a 100 rounds of ammunition or more for each weapon. The man had a fetish for 270 win. He had 750 rounds or so of it. One of the guns was a bit of a rarity, too. An old Enfield three hundred three rifle. That is, an old and pretty rare gun in these parts. I wonder if it was an heirloom. Grandpa's old gun. He had 80 rounds for it, which is amusing as all hell to me. The rest of the guns were mid- to low-grade quality, nothing I was particularly bonered over. Most of the guns were lever or bolt action, with pumps on the shotguns. His handguns were primarily revolvers, almost all of which were stainless steel, and two of them had pearl inlays on the grips. I don't know if this motherfucker thought he was General Patton, or if he was compensating for a very tiny penis or what, but he gets points on style from me. I need to match the pearl-handled six-shooters up with some holsters here, so I can pretend to be a flashy cowboy for Halloween next year. He had an ammunition reloading bench and reloading supplies to last a long time. I haven't gone through it all yet, but Gilbert and I eyeballed what looked to be something like a thousand rounds or more of supplies. Gilbert says he can run the reloading gear and show me how to do it again as well, so that's a huge weight off our shoulders. It won't last forever, but knowing we've got the gear now means if we find more of the supplies, we've got a leg up. Gilbert seemed enthused to work a reloading bench into his design for our new armory in the basement of Hall E. Tools, medicine, water, skin care items, Purell, bleach, detergent, Listerine, condoms. Jesus, he had it all. The true score, though, came in the form of a few very awesome barrels in the basement with the reloading shit. He had barrels and barrels of gas and diesel— I think it was sixteen barrels of gas and five barrels of diesel, or something like that. He had the barrels labeled with when they were filled, where they were filled, and what grade of fuel it was. Half of the barrels were labeled premium grade, so I wonder if they'll last longer for us because they're higher octane, and still sealed so the air and moisture hasn't gotten at it. I don't know for sure. It'll get used eventually." Get this, he also had a barrel dolly and a fucking barrel jack. It's like a pallet jack, but it only picks up barrels. Raises them up about three feet, give or take. Which means we can easily lift and move full barrels of fuel. No more of this half-barrel back-breaking hoopla we've been going through. Total home run on that. On his roof, he also has solar panels, and I'll be damned, but they're the same exact ones that are on the roof of Hall E., We can get them down and reinstall them on campus atop Hall E or on another dorm to spread out our solar resources. In other news, the house smelled like a dirty foot had been rubbed inside a sweaty armpit, then shat on and thrown in the bottom of a porta potty that was set on fire. Ripe. Awful. Patently odiferous. Wretched, even. It would have gagged a fucking maggot. It took us every moment of sunlight yesterday to get in there and get everything out and then transport it back here to campus. This morning, we spent two hours moving the rest of it into shelter in the buildings across campus, and as you can imagine, we lost out on house-clearing time today as a result. 
We had five houses to clear on the cul-de-sac, and we only managed to empty four in the time we had. We were also dragging major ass today after all the shit we carted out of old Walt's nut house. Fucking Bates Motel shit there, Mr. Journal. Fair amount of undead trapped in the houses we went into today, too. Tells me a lot about Walt's mental state. He shot everything that moved in his neighborhood, but apparently never stepped foot inside any of their homes to search for food or supplies or to put the undead to rest. What a weird bastard. Good news. Found more food and supplies. Bad news. Had to kill kids in the houses. Several of them. Many of them very small. Patty and Abby drew the short end on that deal. The kids all happened to be inside the houses they cleared. Sometimes that's the luck of the draw. I'm betting as we move forward here, we are going to encounter a lot of days like that, where we have to kill kids. What a morbid task we have on our hands. I don't envy myself. When we got back to the campus and got everything unloaded, Patty brought up the issue of sanitation. We're working around dead bodies, and they are just fucking festivals of disease. The cold weather keeps a lot of it in check, I'm sure, but once the bodies start to thaw and the bacteria and viruses flare back up, we are without doubt going to get very ill. It's not a question of whether or not we'll get sick. It's a question of when and how bad. I mean, shit. We're also seeing toilets overflowing with human waste, and that's not sanitary either. The world has literally gone to shit. Starting immediately, we're going to go about this with that in mind. We've happened to cross a large supply of latex and nitrile gloves, and we're now going to use them when we go hands-on. Don't laugh, but when I return to my house, I grab my old black baseball gloves to wear. I used to wear these fucking amazing Nomex gloves when I was in Iraq, but I gave them to Kevin forever ago, and it felt weird holding an M4 without some kind of glove on. Plus, batting gloves are great for getting a good grip on something. Anyway, I plan on wearing nitrile gloves under them because somewhere along the line I had the school administration order me a case of size extra extra large gloves. I was worried I'd need to render first aid to a kid that had hep or HIV or whatever. Never thought it would come to something like this. I should have seen it coming, I guess. We're going to use hand sanitizer when we come back and we're going to use bleach liberally on surfaces that appear to be contaminated with sickness. Door handles, counters, etc. Something else we noticed today as we were getting ready to go was the amount of garbage inside some of the houses. We've discovered that the houses that sheltered survivors almost always have a huge pile of garbage in a room or the basement or in the yard outside a window. Those people that lasted near town here had no place to start burn piles like mine on campus. I never thought of it until now, but any house that has garbage outside it is much more likely to have survivors or zombies in it. There also seems to be a direct correlation with garbage and remaining food and supplies. Basically, if they made garbage, they ate the food they had, and wiped their asses with all their toilet paper. So, from now on, garbage piles are red flags for extra caution for us. Speaking of disease... One thing that I distinctly recall from last summer when all this started was the lack of maggots and flies on the undead. Being in a war zone, you are inundated with flies and maggots. They go hand in hand like Irish people and puking binges. I'm not judging. It actually struck me as particularly odd when I was dealing with undead over July and August that they had no maggots and no flies buzzing around them, almost like they were... I don't know, not suitable for maggot consumption, tainted, already being consumed by something evil or whatever. Now, as I recall, the bodies that never animated used to get maggoty, and once I killed a given undead, i.e. blew their brains out, soon after they'd get flies on them, and then maggots would appear shortly thereafter. I can't make heads or tails of it. I don't know how this plays into the whole mysterious dreams bullshit and the dead coming back to life bullshit it's all bullshit it makes me bullshit i don't have all the pieces to this giant jigsaw puzzle yet one night i hope to have another dream that's lucid and i can talk to cassie again and ask questions of her
I bet anything she could answer a lot of my questions about this. Tomorrow, we are returning to the final house on that cul-de-sac and clearing it of shit. We ran through it and killed the zombies inside, but didn't bother taking anything out. There was some nice stuff, too, so we're going to hit it tomorrow. After that, I know of a couple houses a few miles away on Route 18 that are rural enough that they were likely left alone. We can do two of those, then call it a day so we can get some rest. Everyone's surprisingly ragged from this task. It's a lot like moving out of your house, and no one likes moving. Oh, holy shit, I completely forgot to mention. We heard dogs barking in the far distance as we were leaving today. We thought we heard two dogs barking, but it might have been an echo of just one dog, or even more than two. We were very, very pleased when we heard that. Well, everyone else was pleased. I was reminded of a large farmhouse and a sharp stabbing pain in my crotch. Fuck dogs, especially large ones. Adrian April 7th What a bizarre day. Genuinely fucking strange. Twilight Zone-esque, even. Mr. Journal, have you ever had that feeling right after a few things occur that there had to have been something at work for it to fall into place just so? Too many coincidences involved for it to be a random event. You know, like, you leave your apartment to go out with some friends, but just as you walk away, you realize you didn't brush your teeth, so you go back and do it. You leave again, and because of the unexpected delay, you wind up meeting glances with someone who you would not have had you just soldiered on without brushing your teeth. And that was like the only day you didn't brush teeth like that. Or... Like you notice your shoelaces are untied, so you bend down to tie them, and just as you do, something passes through the space your head was just in. One of those, wow, that was lucky moments. I have that feeling right now. The past few days, things have been like that. Today, especially. Remember back in the day when the first plow truck I took off campus hit the bed on me? I wound up leaving it on the side of Auburn Lake Road and walked back until I saw the tundra. Then I took that and used it for some time. Eventually, I put dry gas in the tank of the plow when I drove by it later, kind of randomly. And after some time, Charles, Patty, and the rest of the Williams people found the truck after their car died, and it started right up. That's pertinent for two reasons. One, mysterious fucking circumstances like that all come together like that over time. And two, Gilbert's Chevy died the same exact way today when we headed out to finish off that last house on old Walt's cul-de-sac. That was the start of our day. I should rewind a bit. Gavin is getting a cold or allergies. When he was making breakfast, he was sneezing and sniffling and had a runny nose that was pretty epic. Patty took his temp, and he was a little warm, and promptly sent him off to bed for the day. Because of that, Abby bailed on today's recon mission, and Patty had a sudden surge of paranoia that Abby and Gavin would make a baby at precisely that moment, so she opted to stay home and mother them both. Gilbert and I left with the HRT in his truck at about 11 a.m. and figured we'd hit the one house left near Walter's place, take our sweet-ass time if it went well, and call it a day. About a half mile from Walt Street, Gilbert radioed that his truck was sputtering, and about two seconds after that, it died, and he drifted over into the half-inch of slush in the breakdown lane. We couldn't start it. Both of us are largely mechanically disinclined, though, so that's not a surprise. I immediately thought of sweet-ass Hector and wished he was nearby. We gotta get him back here for sure to check out our vehicles. So... As we're looking under Gilbert's hood, trying to make heads or tails of our mechanical failures as human beings, we hear a gunshot. Loud as hell. It couldn't have come from more than a mile away in the general direction of Walt's place. Sounded pretty damned heavy, almost like an M107 going off. Not quite that heavy, but you get the idea, Mr. Journal. It was a big gun. The shots weren't fired directly at us, but that didn't mean they weren't just bad shots and they were siding on us. We had a live one. Gilbert and I ate pavement and we took cover behind the HRT. I got my rifle down from the truck cabin as Gilbert covered me. We heard two more shots spaced out over about a minute. Once it fell silent, we went over a plan and I infilled towards the area on foot 
and Gilbert got up and into the HRT to drive slowly. I started to go into the woods, then I realized more than likely I'd lose a boot in the muck, so I stuck to the very edge of the shoulder. If I needed, I could dive down into the ditch there for cover. When we came to the street old Walt's place was on, it was on our left, there was one more loud-ass shot, and it clearly came from the cul-de-sac. I hit the dirt and low-crawled after telling Gilbert over the radio that something was up. Right about then, Patty came over the radio back on campus and was completely farting out bricks. OMFG, I should be there. Don't move, we're coming, etc., etc. Gilbert told her to chill and wait while we figured it out, and I kept crawling through the slush that had formed from the light snow we had the past few days. God, it was cold, and I was soaked right to the bone in just a few seconds. I came to the edge of the trees and stopped. With the ACOG scope, I was able to see all the way to the end of the loop easily, and standing, sort of near the center, was a tall, skinny-as-rails guy with a ragged black hiking backpack holding a large hunting rifle. He was standing at ease, scanning the area for threats, and was about to rotate to my slice of the pie, and for some unfathomable reason, I stood up. I held the M4 low, so hopefully he didn't think I was a threat, and I started to wave at him with my left hand. As soon as he saw me, he brought his rifle up at me, and I dove behind a tree a few feet to my left. He didn't fire, and I kept flat, and I brought the M4 up to sight him in to see what he was doing. From behind me, Gilbert watched it all played out, and he told Patty and Abby to get their shoes on. I thought about it for a few seconds as he slowly walked down the street at me. He was wearing a beat-to-hell winter jacket and dirty jeans, long dark hair that hadn't been cut in some time, and he had a five o'clock shadow that was a few hours past five. He was so skinny. He looked my age, or maybe a year or two older. I started to holler out to him when he got about seventy-five yards away. Hey, I'm alive. Please stop shooting. He froze solid. I don't mean like he stopped and realized, like, holy shit, I'm shooting at a living person. I mean, he literally froze completely still. Like when prey knows it's being hunted. The look on his face through the scope was one of restrained panic and utter confusion. You okay? Are you bitten? You need medical assistance? I stayed low. He turned around and looked behind him, almost as if he was expecting to be snuck up on while I was talking to him. Well, that, or he was looking for someone else that he thought I might have been yelling to. After he searched the area to his six adequately, he turned back and lowered his rifle until it was pointed at the ground. He stood, licked his lips, and responded suddenly with a half-hearted wave in my general direction. After a few seconds of that, he finally started yelling back to me. Uh, hey, hi, uh, I'm, uh, sorry, I'm Blake. Much better. I hollered back. I'm Adrian. Nice to meet you, sir. I saw him smile through the scope in a really odd way, almost manic. Well, not in a scary way, but like a happy way. I think he started to hitch his breath like he was about to cry. I guess it's possible he had asthma, too, and I think he'd been alone a very long time. Yeah, it's uh, it's nice to meet you, too. Uh, were you the people shooting here yesterday and the day before? I, I heard you from my hiding spot and came over to see what happened. I haven't heard guns in a long time. He looked behind him again, Good survival instincts, always checking his periphery. Yeah, that was us. We are clearing houses of the dead and collecting supplies and stuff, I hollered back. Wow, wait, we? There's, there's more than one of you? How many people are you? He looked ecstatic, but also worried at the same time. I played the honesty card. Seven of us. We live on the outskirts of town in a secure facility, we're making the town as safe as we can now that spring is coming. Again, the look on his face was one of excitement and fear. He looked like he had no idea how to react to that news. Enthusiastic confusion. I radioed Gilbert. I told him this Blake guy's description and that I felt he was alone and I was going to try and take it to the next level. Gilbert said he had my back and do this smart. Right before I stood up, I hotkeyed the radio so everyone could hear our conversation. 
Blake, we've got a truck nearby. You mind if we drive it to the cul-de-sac here? I hate to have our people split up for too long. Petrified. You guys have a working truck still? Uh, how are you getting fuel? Most of the gas in town is total shit already. Interesting, eh? I wonder what the exact shelf life of gasoline is. Diesel, for that matter. I wonder if all those barrels of fuel we just brought back to campus were worth a piss hole in the snow. You having trouble with the gas in town, Blake? Yeah, it's all gummed up and has water in it. You need to filter it a bunch to get it to work right again, and there's no safe place to do that here in town, not since that massive explosion in the industrial park. Apparently, news had traveled fast about that. I bet it made a fucking mushroom cloud when it went down. You okay with us bringing up the truck? I hollered again. Hell yeah. He looked excited about the truck, genuinely so. I radioed to Gilbert to pull the truck up near the street, and as soon as he did, I stood up and tried the same slow wave. Blake matched my wave with one of his own, and I slowly walked towards him as Gilbert powered down the window of the truck and readied his AK for fire if it needed to happen. That's an assumption. I couldn't actually see Gilbert doing that, but I was betting my life on the fact that he was. After a while, you just know some folks have your back. Blake and I met in the middle of the street. We stopped about ten feet apart and hung our weapons low. If something went bad, we could raise them up in a hurry, but we weren't threatening each other. I kept a smile on my face the walk up to him, and as we exchanged hellos, here's the basic gist of what was said. Hi, I'm Adrian. Nice to meet you. You're all wet, man. You, you've fallen in the snow? He pointed his nose at the giant wet spot I had from neck to knees where I face-planted in the slush. About then I caught a whiff of his body odor. He smelled sour and funky. He probably hadn't had a real shower or bath in who knows how long. Yeah, we hit the deck when we heard you shooting. Didn't think you were shooting at us, but we couldn't risk it. Some folks are bad shots. I smiled again at him. He nodded. Yeah, some folks are. I watched quite a few try and shoot the dead people and miss a lot. Waste of ammo. Well, shooting can be nerve-wracking, and I'm sure there's a lot of folks using guns lately that have no business doing so. Looks like you've got some time with your weapon. What are you carrying? He lifted his rifle out to the side, and immediately the pit of my stomach dropped. He had an Enfield three o three, almost exactly the same as the one I'd gotten out of Walt's place. I got my uncle's Enfield. It's a beast, but it's accurate as all hell, and I've been shooting it for years now. Running low on ammo, though. Tough being alone out here. Blake looked at his rifle lovingly. I could see he had a history with it just based on his eyes. I thought it was odd that he had the same gun as the one we'd just found. I thought it was odd he was almost out of ammo and we'd just found some. I thought it was odd that Gilbert's truck died just far enough away that we weren't threatened by him but could still hear him. I thought it was odd that had it not died this morning, we'd have driven right up on him. I thought it was odd that, of all of us, just Gilbert and I were the first to meet him. We might have been shot, shot him, or gotten him bitten if we scared him. Mysterious ways. I'm just saying. You've been alone all this time? I was sincerely concerned. The more I observed him up close, the younger he appeared. With the gaunt features and long, scraggly hair, I initially placed him at thirty or even thirty-five. But the more I watched, the more I thought he was twenty-five or so. Yeah. He looked down at the ground and shuffled his feet. He wasn't embarrassed, like Gavin was when he talked to Patty and me. Blake was, I don't know, almost regretful, guilty. I identified. Wow. How old are you, man? Twenty-five? I cradled the M4 as we settled into the conversation. I'm twenty-three. Been alone for a while. My parent died when I was seventeen, and I lived with my uncle for a year, but he died too. I used to live in his trailer over in Douglas Park off Route 18. I stay on the move now, though. Can't fortify anything. Takes too long and makes too much noise. He put his chin up slightly when he said all that. 
He was proud he made it this far, proud that he was a survivor, rightfully so in my book. That's smart. We are pretty remote, and we've taken down all the undead nearby. We can make a fair amount of noise now, so there's no worry about that. Where are you living now? He frowned. I'd rather not say. I, I don't know you. I smirked. That's also smart. Awkward silence. So, we planned on taking the stuff out of that beige cape right there today. It was the last house on this street for us to empty of stuff. Do you need anything? You're welcome to anything inside. I gestured at the house as I talked about it. Blake turned and looked at it. He started to say something, then hesitated. Finally, he said, Is there food? All I need is food and ammunition. He looked back, vaguely hopeful. I'm sure there's some food in there. You want to go ahead in and check it out yourself? Take whatever you need and check in with us after. I shrugged at him. I wanted to show him we were generous, peaceful, altruistic even. He turned and looked at the place again, thought about it, and took a few steps directly at the house without saying anything. I started to turn away to walk back to the truck, but I stopped when I heard him stop walking. Adrian? he asked. Yeah, Blake? I stopped, half facing him. You don't mind? You guys did all the work inside to make it safe, right? Uh, I feel like I'm stealing if I just walk in and take stuff. I, I don't want to take advantage of you. I waited and thought good and plenty about how to answer that, then came up with this. Blake, we have food, we have water, we have soap, and we have guns and ammo. Judging by your general disheveled appearance, your real thin body, and your stink, you need whatever's in there a lot more than us today. I'd rather you ate and we made friends. I'm sure you can think of something you can do for us later to square it away. Blake lit up when I said the part about how he could do something for us. I don't think he's been in a position to do anything for anyone else in a long time, and the thought of being useful to someone definitely appealed to him. He nodded with a slow smile and trudged off in the thin layer of melting snow. I listened to the sound of his boots crunching in the slush as I made my way to Gilbert. I killed the hot key on the walkie and climbed up the gas tank to get to the window of the HRT where he sat. Gilbert nodded slowly and told me that was well played. We went over what to do next, and we both agreed that this kid was shaky, unsocialized in a big, bad way, and he needed to be brought in slow. We went over a few different conversational tactics for when he came out, and just as we wrapped up our last idea, he came walking out of the house. His beat-up black backpack was noticeably fuller than when he'd gone in. I hopped off the gas tank and hotkeyed the walkie again. We met at almost the exact same spot in the middle of the street. He had a look on his face of almost joy, nearly glee, I'd say. He started talking at me before I reached him, and I waved for him to stop. When I got closer, he started again. Well, man, they, they had a lot of good food in there. There was a whole box of dry spaghetti, a jar of sauce, two cans of sauerkraut, whatever that is, and three cans of fruit cocktail. Gonna eat damn good this week. Blake looked stoked. You gonna make that last all week? I lifted one eyebrow skeptically. Hells yes. That's a haul, man. Uh, you guys big time. Nonsense, Blake. Mind if I ask you what you did for work before all this shit went down? We're trying to figure out what everyone can do. I was a, well, a bouncer and a soldier. I didn't want to tell him right off I worked at the school. He might put two and two together and figure out where our secure facility was. I worked at Mark's garage doing auto body and mechanic work. Mostly auto body, welding, buffing, painting, you know. I liked it. That crazy motherfucker Walter stopped in there sometime in, like, September and took all the barrels we had. Dude, he was loony. He, he shot so many people here, I didn't dare to come this way. Things went quiet here about two weeks ago, and when I heard you all shooting it up the other day, I, I decided I'd finally investigate. I'm glad he's gone. He was fucking dangerous. Blake looked appreciative. Yeah, he injured his leg bad, and it killed him from the looks of it. We put him down again when we breached his house. He was crazier than you can imagine, man. He 
He had his house wired to blow with hot dogs and Twizzlers. I laughed. Blake didn't. You know, he had real dynamite, right? He drove around town a couple times, tossing sticks out the window of his truck late in the summer. I heard him go off at least 20 times. He drew so many of those, those things over here. It was impossible to move around on foot for a long time. That was humbling to hear. We kind of knew Walt had explosives, but hearing it confirmed from someone was a different matter entirely. I nodded at him. What are your plans now, Blake? Do you, uh, you need a place to live? Are you safe? I wanted to extend a gentle offer of assistance. I move around. The only way to stay safe and find food reliably. I've been moving around more and more after dark since the snow levels came down. They have a hard time seeing me, but I also have a hard time seeing them. I, I might start laying low more often, though. They're getting around a lot easier, and I think the rest of us still around are getting nervous. The rest of us? I thought you said you were alone. I was confused. I am alone, but when I move around, I sometimes see other people moving around, or I can see lights at night, or smell the smoke coming from their fires. If I can, I watch them with the scope on the end field. I, I kind of know some of the pockets of survivors now. Blake seemed unfazed by how amazing this information was in the big scope of things. Blake, that's outstanding. We can save lives with all that. How many people are still here in town? I was giddy. Blake thought hard about it for a minute or two before replying, I can't say for sure. I, I haven't done a real loop in some time. I know there are two or three houses with folks in them, maybe two or three people in each house. Plus, right near the high school, there's a small apartment building that got secured down early on, and I think there might be five or six folks there, maybe... 25 survivors across town and all, that I know of, at least. Mr. Journal, I'm not sure how to respond to that. 25 seems absurdly low for a town our size. I guess if you factor in us, as well as the people who died at Stig, we might be approaching what I thought was a correct amount. 25 seems like such a small number. Well, Blake, I'm sure that information will be useful later on. Is there any chance you can show me where those houses are? On a map, maybe? Knowing where we might encounter survivors might make things a lot safer for both us and them. I would like to get to know you better, man. I I don't know you from a hole in the wall, and if I point out where those folks are and you raid them or something, I'd be pretty damn sore about it. He looked defiant, serious. I nodded at him in agreement. Well, can we agree to meet again somewhere and maybe trade for it? After we learn more about each other, maybe. Trade for what? He licked his lips. A little creepy, but I think he just had chapped lips. Well, you said you need food, and you said you needed ammo, right? 303 British, if my memory still works in my advanced age. Yeah, wow, you have some? I snagged four boxes of shells from Moore's when everything went to hell last summer. Uh, apparently, I was the only person who used it around here. I'd love more, that and 38 shells. I'm getting slim on that, too. Blake, you're slim everywhere. I need to fatten you up so the girls will like you. I winked and grinned. The joke was entirely lost on him. He looked utterly lost when I said girls. Anyway, man... I've got some 303 British I can trade you, as well as some canned food, and if you want, I think I can spare some milk and a few cans of food. I shit you not, Mr. Journal, but his mouth slowly opened and his jaw drifted downward until he looked like he was going into shock. He had no reply for a solid minute. Finally, I waved my hands in front of his face, and he snapped back to reality. Wow, totally. What, what what can I do to make it up to you? It was his turn to be giddy. Well, for starters, we had a truck die on the way here about a half a mile, maybe up the road. You said you had a little mechanical experience, and if you could, I'd like you to take a look at it. If you can get it running, drive it back here to the cul-de-sac. And also, if you feel comfortable, 
Anything at all you can tell us about the town would be really helpful. I don't even mean telling us about the survivors. I mean, where we can find good stuff, equipment, concentrations of the dead people, whatever. Any intelligence is going to either save our lives or the lives of other folks. Blake nodded emphatically. I'll get moving right now. I'll see you tomorrow at noon right here. I checked my watch and agreed with him. He literally jogged away past me, and I waved at Gilbert and the HRT as he went. Gilbert smiled in his clever-ass old man way, and we both knew this could be an important day for us. When I got into the HRT, all Gilbert said to me was, And that's how you develop local allies. Well done, kid. I beamed. We cleared the house of remaining goods, marginally worth the time, drove by Blake with his head under the hood of Gilbert's truck, and made our way home. We're meeting him again tomorrow at noon. Hopefully, he's a little less edgy and a little more trusting. I'm excited. Adrian The Siege of Mildenhall Are you sure this is a good idea? Fitz asked Kevin from the back seat as their lead Humvee rounded a tight corner in the British city of Manchester. Out of habit and an excess of adrenaline, the older mercenary flicked the safety of his M4 SOP mod back and forth from semi to full auto. Putting it on safe at this point seemed unreasonably dangerous to him. After all, the city was overrun with the dead. From the front passenger seat of the Humvee, Kevin glared out the windows at the brown brick buildings and parked cars they sped by, just a foot or two from the windows in the essentially stolen military truck. Their driver, Kyle, drove evasively around a small crashed compact in the road. Kevin smirked as he tried to think of a clever answer to Fitz's smart-ass question. The front fender of the heavy vehicle clipped a shambling zombie on the side of the street, and sent it careening off the wall of an apartment building. Kevin heard a faint crunch fading away as the thing's bones broke on impact. Finally, his brain came out of neutral, and he responded to his friend. Well, Fitzy, I look at it this way. We've certainly had better ideas. I mean, that harem of prostitutes Alan brought back to our suite in Phuket was a pretty shitty idea, and I think that was a lot better an idea than this. Well, look at the bright side, gentlemen— we are not likely to get crotch-rot on this op, unlike in Thailand. All four men in the speeding Humvee laughed. Kyle, Kevin's driver, was a young ex-Army airborne soldier, and Quan, in the back seat with Fitz, was former Vietnamese Army and had years in EOD work. The four men were all that remained of Kevin's original nine-man protection team from June in Jerusalem. Kevin and his squad had been tasked to protect a high-ranking senator in Israel the day the undead reared their gory, ugly heads. That was June 23rd, actually, about 40 days prior. They'd evacuated Jerusalem, Rikitik, and fled on a U.S. Department of State bird for London and what they thought would be relative safety. One of his men had died from what appeared to be a superficial bite wound on the plane, and as soon as they landed at Heathrow, he'd returned to life and bitten another of Kevin's men. In the end, the team leader had to put bullets in both of their heads. The apocalypse had been hard on his men, demoralizing and painful beyond all imagination. Today, they were trying to do the right thing and reclaim their own. Hopefully, they'd be alive. Before they had boarded the plane and left Jerusalem, Kevin had lost one of his close operator friends, Alan, a British national. Alan had missed a video call with his wife and child in Manchester, England that day, and Kevin vowed he'd see to it that Alan's six-year-old daughter Shelby and Alan's wife Becky were taken care of. The ranger motto of leave no man behind transferred to family in Kevin's mind. He'd made a promise, and he'd see it through. When their helicopter had touched down at RAF Mildenhall, a massive military airbase outside of London, the first thing Kevin did was get in touch with her and tell her to button up in their flat. Don't you dare leave. I know Alan has food and supplies there to last you some time. As soon as we can get to you, we're coming. Becky couldn't even manage a response through her gut-wrenching sobs. She knew a man in Alan's line of work might die, and as much as she told herself she was prepared for it, she wasn't. All she could do was look at the growing hurt in her little girl's eyes. Kevin heard her choke out a half-hearted, yeah, Yes, oh, okay. 
They kept in touch via the landlines for a few days until the phones died in the UK. And after that, Kevin made sure she had Alan's spare satellite phone charged and working. From the roof of their small Manchester apartment building, they could talk for a few minutes a day. Every time they talked, they talked about today, the day Kevin's men came to make good on his promise to come get them. Everyone's good to go on the floor plan? Kevin asked over the throat mics to his men in both of the Humvees they'd borrowed from the good men and women of the United States Air Force. Everyone chimed in with positive responses. Even the borrowed Royal Marine in the back truck was in the affirmative. His name, and largely former rank, was Corporal Harold Parker, or Hal for short. He'd shown his considerable value when their chopper had crashed after leaving Heathrow in the center of London, fighting their way to their extraction point like a man possessed. Since then, he'd done the same, protecting the airbase perimeter from the never-ending hordes of undead. In the rear truck with Hal were three Air Force special operators, para-jumpers, to be exact. Normally, these folks existed primarily to rescue downed pilots behind enemy lines or to serve as medics attached to special operations units. But as many special operators find themselves sooner or later, adrenaline becomes more important to them than air. Stealing a few trucks and taking off to rescue one of Kevin's teammates' family members deep inside a city overrun with the walking dead sounded like a fun day out to them. It didn't hurt that they were all expert marksmen, trained to the highest degree in land navigation and combat tactics, and had medical training that rivaled the most well-schooled trauma physicians. Yeah, Kevin thought. When I roll heavy, I roll motherfucking heavy. Just thinking of the quality of team he'd brought to make good on his promise to Alan's memory made his heart swell with pride. He was still a little pissed over not being able to finagle some air support as well, but thieves can't be choosy. You pick the pocket, you get the lint. Alan's building approached them at the end of the narrow Manchester City street like a looming fortress. Three brick-and-mortar stories grew up from the street like a funeral monument to a dead city. Kevin's Air Force friends had retasked a drone on the sly a few days ago to get a good look at the surrounds, and, as it was just now, the sidewalk at the door was clear of vehicles. It was not clear of the undead. The two Humvees screeched to a stop next to the building, hitting a few of the shiftless dead, sending them sprawling onto the damp pavement with twisted arms and legs. Kevin stepped out into the middle of the street and started firing his M4 on semi, lining up the red dot of his aim point on the faces of his targets before gently squeezing off rounds. He watched with detached emotion as face after face exploded in a dull brown and gray mist. From all sides, he heard his teammates doing the same thing, slowly, carefully taking well-aimed headshots. They'd learned any other shot was a wasted round. Lock the street down. Form a perimeter on the trucks. Exhale in five. Kevin hollered to the men. Over the hammering gunfire, everyone replied again in the affirmative, and Kevin took his breaching team up the granite steps to the heavy oak door of the old three-story stone apartment building. Kevin grabbed the heavy door's handle, and as Becky had told him, it was locked firmly shut. Kevin nodded to Quan to take the door out after tying a small lanyard to the door handle. Kyle and Fitz covered Quan as he slapped two small breaching charges on the hinges of the sturdy door. Becky said there was no way to kick it in quickly, so they didn't waste time trying. Quan had the two small charges applied in record time and waved everyone away from the doorway. As soon as everyone was clear, he belted out, File in the whore! in his thick, absurd Vietnamese American accent, and everyone took cover. The two charges exploded with a viciously loud bang that the men felt in their chests, even behind cover. In slow motion, the cracked and tattered door tipped forward through the puffy white haze of the explosion and thundered down onto the steps with a crash shattering the thick panes of glass in the center. It skidded down the stone stairs and came to a stop cockeyed on the sidewalk. Kevin tugged on the nylon cord attached to the door handle and yanked the door clear of the steps and the sidewalk near the entrance. It wouldn't do if one of the men tripped on it. Go, go, go! Kevin waved his men forward and they stacked up without a thought and entered the dark innards of the building through the drifting cloud of explosive residue. 
Each man was a professional warrior. For a week prior to today, the team had done late-night exercises near the airfield as bombers and fighters took off to do their carpet-bombing runs of English cities. Kevin had laid out a grid on the tarmac that matched the walls and doors of the halls, and over and over they visualized each and every potential threat and came up with a plan to deal with it. They committed the layout of the building to memory. They could do this with their eyes closed. To them, this was just another spray-painted grid on the tarmac, with a lot of special effects for show, mind you. The grizzled veteran with the brand-new handlebar mustache was on point, and Kevin heard his M4 start barking immediately. Kevin had hoped the halls would be clear of the undead, but by the sound of Fitz's immediate rate of fire, his hopes were illusory. Kevin was in the center of the stack with Quan ahead of him and Kyle to his rear. Once inside the foyer, the wide staircase was straight ahead and to their left. They moved immediately up the steps with Fitz laying out a steady stream of shots heading upward every second or so. It was hard to see in the dark inside the building, but after a moment or two, Kevin's eyes adjusted. Dead bodies were everywhere. Some had clearly died within the past month, but others were still coming to a rest with punctured skulls from Kevin and now Quan's rifles. Even under his helmet and through his earpiece, the two guns firing were deafening. The men were stepping on top of the bodies before long, feet slipping to and fro on the loose flesh of the deceased. They'd all be covered in gore within minutes. Good to go in there? Hearing very heavy fire out here, Kevin heard Jaden, team leader of the PJs, ask over the radio. One hand holding his M4 at the hip, Kevin thumbed the throat mic. Good to go. We are currently experiencing a target-rich environment. Ah, shit, Kevin, I'm jealous. There's nothing good to shoot out here yet, Jaden sulked. Just as Jaden finished speaking, Kevin saw a zombie round the corner of the stairwell directly behind where Fitz was. Kevin's friend was facing down the hall in the opposite direction, firing with Quan, and without a moment's hesitation, Kevin fired from the hip and hit the zombie in the throat, sending it stumbling backwards. A spray of gray and brown fluids covered the wall behind the creature. He shouldered his rifle like a professional and put a second round through its forehead, dropping it for good. After a heavy burst of fire on the second floor landing, Fitz looked back at the body and nodded with a wink to Kevin. Kevin blew him a kiss, and they pushed farther up the stairs to their destination on the third floor. Kyle and Kevin slowed the pace as they ascended the stairs behind Quan and Fitz. Zombies were shuffling down the hallway of the second floor as they left the landing, and neither man wanted any surprises later when they came back down the steps. A few seconds of accurate gunfire changed that worry, and all that remained were oozing bodies piled knee-high in the hall. The two men sprinted up the steps to catch up to the leaders. Fitz and Quan didn't leave breadcrumbs behind to mark their trail. Kyle and Kevin needed only to look for freshly killed zombies. The two men in the lead had stopped at the top of the hall's edge, peering around the corner after dropping everything moving that shouldn't have been. Over his shoulder, Fitz spoke to Kevin. Hall's all clear, Kevin. There are four doors down on the right. He nodded down the right hallway towards the flat Alan's family lived in. Kevin stepped up to the top of the stairs and motioned for them to keep moving in that direction. Fitz took two steps down the hall when one of the doors to their left suddenly swung inward and a living man stepped out, bloodied and wide-eyed like a lunatic. He held a massive cricket bat in his right hand as he stepped into the passage, seemingly challenging them to pass. Kevin's first thought was of the old Aussie movie Mad Max. Warden Protective Group, drop the bat now, Fitz hollered to the man. The manic bastard kept creeping forward, slowing, inching the bat upwards, becoming more of a threat. The look in his eyes was that of confusion and fear with growing rage. Drop it now! Ruse the bat! Stop! Each man hollered out their own command, but nothing had an effect. Eventually the man's slow movements turned into a spasm of aggression, and he launched his wiry frame forward, raising the bat over his shoulder to hit Fitz atop the skull. Nearly twenty years of experience kicked in for the team, and with one simultaneous action— Each man fired a double tap into the chest and head of the man. Rather than exploding into fits with the cricket bat, his body took a sad forward motion, plunging and face-planting into the hallway, dead as a man could be.
His shattered skull issued far too much blood onto the tiled floor, and the men stepped over his carcass, moving towards the flat that contained Becky and little Shelby. As agreed, the mother and daughter would remain inside until the men knocked for them. Fitz reached the door, and the men broke up into pairs of two on each side. Kevin was the first to wrap his old Nomex glove-covered knuckles on the door. Internally, he remarked how sturdy the door felt, and how thankful he was of old European buildings. From the other side of the sturdy door, the men heard Becky's lightly accented voice over the ringing in their ears. Kevin? Fitz? Is it you? God, I hope so. The men exchanged a smirk, and Kevin replied to her, It's us, Becky. We need to move fast. Open up. No sooner had Kevin finished speaking than the door swung inward, and the tiny frame of Becky Masters appeared. Becky was no bigger than a short minute, barely scraping the roof of five feet. She had her dark, unwashed hair pulled back in a ponytail, and her skin was pale. She looked thin and scared to Kevin, and that bothered him deeply. Alan had married a woman harder than he was, and to see her in this state was unsettling. Kevin worked up the best smile he could manage for her. She clutched on to him immediately, and they exchanged a long, genuine hug. She wiped a smear of blood off his face and gave him a wet kiss on the cheek. She released him and wiped a tear off her own. Becky smiled warmly at the other men and gave them quick hugs. From behind her, Kevin watched the little angel Shelby wander up to her mom, looking at the big, scary men with amazingly wide, innocent brown eyes behind well-trimmed bangs. Kevin's heart didn't know whether to feel sorrow for the little girl or joy for finally having reached her. He managed to fight back the hitching in his breathing to smile at her. It had been a long time since he saw the brown-haired little girl, Alan's pride and joy, the tiny center of his friend's life. Becky scooped her up and kissed her on the cheek just as wetly as she'd kissed Kevin. Daddy's friends are here to sweep us away like a couple of princesses from the castle. How brilliant! She strode with purpose back into the small flat and pointed at two bags sitting in the middle of the floor. As they'd agreed on, everything going with the women had to fit in two bags that could be carried on the back or by a single hand. Quan scooped up the largest duffel bag, olive drab and clearly a leftover from a military surplus store, and flung it across his back over the bag he was already wearing. Kevin snagged the large hiking backpack and slung it quickly on his back snapping the waist strap closed and drawing the nylon band tight across his vest. Becky licked her lips nervously and locked gazes with Kevin. No words were spoken. Nothing had to be said. You didn't say goodbye to a place. Only to people. With that, they reformed their stack with the daughter being held by the mother in the center, and they pushed back out into the hallway. As they left the tiny flat, the rate of fire down in the street noticeably picked up. Kevin thumbed the mic to speak to the two teams. Okay, down there? We're on our way down with the principals. They walked with purpose toward the stairs, descending them at a controlled but rapid pace. Jaden responded, Just starting to get fun down here. Our environment is now an embarrassment of riches. We are no longer jealous of your previous good fortune inside. Kevin could barely make out his false, smarmy tone over the gunfire. Kevin grinned as Fitz's gun spoke up ahead of him, dropping more undead in the stairwell below. Seriously, though, faster would be better, Kevin. Those breaching charges were like the fucking dinner call. I think all these dead assholes thought it was happy hour at the pub over here. We are engaging heavy. The slight alarm in Jaden's tone did not go unnoticed by Kevin and company. Fitz and Quan started leaping the stairs two at a time to get further ahead of Shelby and Becky, and Kevin immediately moved in front of them so they were sandwiched between he and Kyle. Kevin peered over the railings just in time to see Quan and Fitz opening up on the opening door of a flat. Three zombies, clearly a mother, father, and small son, had somehow opened the door and were grasping at the operators as they approached. The combined men's fire sent the dead to where they belonged— and they walked past the crumpling corpses mechanically and professionally. Seconds later, Kevin's team reached the blasted open front entrance of the apartment building. They waited for the entire breaching team to gather, and for Kevin to call out their exit. Six friendlies coming out the front. Roll this red carpet up and let's get the fuck out. Hooah, Kev, was Jaden's response. 
Kevin got Becky and little Shelby into the back of the lead Humvee with Fitz and Quan. Kyle and Kevin supported with fire at the suddenly overwhelming mass of undead approaching them from both directions of the street. Down both avenues of the narrow street there were hundreds of the dead pushing forward with silent ferocity. The dead collapsed on them like the rise of a vile tide. Kevin circled the back of the truck, snapped off a few rounds, and got in the passenger side. Kyle threw the big sand-colored beast in gear, and they lurched forward, smashing into the approaching mob of undead. Everybody hold on, Kevin yelled out, and everyone grabbed on to whatever they could find. The truck smashed the bodies of the dead to the street and drove over them like wretched, gory speed bumps. The heavy Humvee slammed back and forth violently, sending the passengers to and fro, nearly launching the little girl out of her mother's arms. Her cries of fear were piercing. Quan put his palm firmly on her back, holding her steady in Becky's arms, and quickly she simmered down, desperately clutching her mother. A hundred yards and a turn onto a different street opened up the road for them, and they looped around to head south, back to Mildenhall. The Humvee's bumper tagged a walking zombie almost out of spite, and the two trucks accelerated away. With that, they left a city teeming with the dead. The bombers would come soon enough, Kevin hoped, as they picked up speed. You stupid cocksucker! What the fuck were you thinking? Wait, I know, I know, you weren't thinking at all, you bunch of goddamn cowboys! General Reeves was fuming down at Kevin's cot, with Kevin laying in it, trying to rest. The men had returned just a few hours ago from their drive to Manchester. A full day's drive in both directions through hell had left the men drained, and Reeves couldn't have given less of a shit. Kevin opened his eyes and looked up at the balding, diminutive paper shuffler from his cot in the office or classroom they had kidnapped to be their barracks. Ultimately, Reeves was a good man and a good general, and he hadn't deserved the raw deal Kevin and his friends had handed him by stealing the trucks and borrowing a few of his operators. Tough shit, Kevin thought. Not like things were normal anymore. He heard the rumbling of another bomber taking off outside. Kevin secretly hoped that aircraft was headed to Manchester to bomb the living piss out of it. How much further from normal could you get than a nation's bombers leaving to bomb its own cities? Look, Reeves, I said I was sorry. No one got hurt, we rescued some civilians, and we all smell like fucking roses now. Dig the sand out of your fucking vagina and get over it. Kevin's tone was flat and disinterested. There was no sense in getting angry over this. Talk to me like that again, you asshole. I fucking dare you. Reeves stabbed a finger down at Kevin. Reeves looked silly, wearing his fatigues and full IOTV kit inside the office building. Was he afraid one of the fucking zombies was going to shoot him right here in the middle of the child care building? Maybe it was smart after all, Kevin mused. He was thinking of shooting Reeves. Sir, I sincerely apologize for any inconvenience our operation caused for you in the base. If you'd like, I can take my team immediately and leave with one of your birds if you prefer. After all, we've got that nice senator fellow stored away in the officer's barracks with you guys, and... He's supposed to get stateside pronto. No time like the present, after all. Reeves hated Senator Hankey with a passion. All day, every day, Hankey was underfoot, trying to tell him how to run the base, or pleading with Reeves to free up a plane to bring him back to the United States, but under presidential order, every man, woman, and plane at Mildenhall was dedicated to the European theater of this war. Immediately after they'd arrived from Heathrow Airport, Mildenhall launched into a fervor of activity. Twenty-four hours a day aircraft launched from the base to move troops, supplies, or drop bombs. England hadn't seen this kind of military activity since the days of World War II and the invasion of mainland Europe. Every military base in England had been fortified with HESCO barriers, Jersey barriers, and hastily rigged reinforcements to their chain-link fencing. Guard towers were built where there were none, and floodlights were put up to aid the guards pulling security when they had to thin the advances of the seemingly unending horde of undead. Each base was an island of relative safety. Kevin's original mission was to escort the senator back to the U.S. once they arrived at Mildenhall back in late June. But Reeves cock-blocked their exit, 
waving the presidential order, and after waiting for a few days hoping he'd free up a bird for them, the mysterious men at the Department of State that had been controlling the game from behind the scenes told them not to rush back anyway. Kevin's mind drifted back to that conversation as Reeves continued to rip into him. Lancaster, the gravel-voiced DOS man, had answered the phone and patiently listened to Kevin rail on about how fucked up the situation in Mildenhall was. Once Kevin had gotten the entire bitch session out of him, Lancaster clucked his tongue as he often did and added his two cents. Kevin, don't sweat it, son. Kevin had been shocked at that statement. Up until that moment, every time they'd talked about it, getting Hanky back to the state safe and secure was a national security priority. And with one sentence, Lancaster had shat right in the middle of that bowl of cornflakes. What? Kevin had asked. It's a fucking mess here, Witten. Even if you had a clean bird, there aren't that many places to put you down safely here anyway. Airspace is still being controlled by NORAD or whoever, and and communications disconnect between the left hand and the right hand of agencies is bad enough to not risk anything with you and Hanky. Plus, roads are a goddamn mess with accidents. Those things running all over the place. And D.C. is like Mogadishu, for Christ's sake. You're just as safe there in England as you'd be anywhere here. Sit tight, be safe, and be thankful you're not anywhere we're planning on bombing soon. That was all before the bombings in England had begun. Hearing the B-word from Lancaster made Kevin's mouth go dry. Bombings? What are you talking about? (sighs) Son, the president has given the green light to start dropping conventional ordinance on cities that are deemed irrevocably overrun by the dead. Lancaster's voice had no hint of the deep smoker's voice he normally had. It was soft, reflective, and sad instead. Kevin had no response for almost a minute. Where are they bombing first? Some of the largest cities have been written off. Any large area that's geographically flat in terms of structures is high on the list. Boston, Los Angeles, Houston, St. Louis, places like that. They're starting east and heading west for the most part. Urban sprawl is a bad place to be right now. Kevin was from Boston. His mother still lived in Southie, right near Logan Airport. The sounds of transatlantic planes landing used to lull him to sleep at night. To this day, he slept better around airfields and noisy places. Fuck my life, man. That's messed up. There's no other solution? Kevin had sat down, holding the satellite phone on the floor in the hallway of the base command to talk. I haven't seen the whole briefing. I know from the reports I've seen, there well, there are a lot of areas that are just utterly overrun with the dead bastards. For example, yesterday, we received a report that an airliner refusing to turn around on the west coast near Seattle was downed by civil defense jets. And the fucking thing went down smack on top of the dome there, where they had a big shelter set up killed just about every last person there, and now the reports are saying that the rest of the city has gone to shit. They're saying the Seahawks might have to skip a season or two. Been hearing other stories from all over like that, too. I guess Boston got it real bad due to all the hospitals and schools there. China, Libya, Russia, and a few other countries have already started dropping bombs on their own soil. No one has gone nuclear yet, thank God. It's a real shit show. Kevin had swallowed the rising bile in his throat. The rest of the conversation that day didn't matter. Not anymore, he thought. They'd been discarded. Hanky was reasonably safe. Kevin and the remnants of his team were reasonably safe. And the only way home would have been fraught with danger. For all intents and purposes, Lancaster had considered their loose end tied up. Kevin came back to reality when he realized Reeves was addressing him directly again. Shit, I'm sorry, General, I was spacing out. What'd you say again? Reeves' eyes flared open in a fresh batch of fury at Kevin. His lips trembled as he tried to find the words to properly express his newfound fury over being ignored while he was on his soapbox. On the cots around the two sparring men, Quan, Fitz, Harold, and Kyle watched on, trying to contain their laughter. Reeves caught on that he was the butt of their joke, and after releasing a rather substantial and rather impressive string of colorful profanity, 
He stormed out of the converted office the men shared together. After a few awkward moments of stifled laughter, the men busted out with thick, raucous guffaws. Boys will be boys, after all. Even when you've long since been out of the actual military, fucking with the chain of command never gets old. Kevin watched his men laugh and rested his head into the flattened pillow and tried to get some sleep. It had been a hell of a trip back from Manchester. Kevin was in a conversation he didn't remember starting. Look, sir, there's no need to apologize. We knew what we were getting into when we enlisted. We knew what we were getting into when we signed the contract with WPG-2. Dying was always a possibility, and you couldn't have known what was going to happen that day. Let it go, Kevin. Let it go. Kevin listened to the bloody-faced young Marine in his dress blues. Dimly, Kevin realized that Nate was dead, but still talking to him somehow. Kevin couldn't figure out where the hell this conversation was being held. It seemed to him like they were standing in a white room filled with warm white light. He thought he made out the shape of a small round table behind the two Marines, but he was too confused to make heads or tails of what was going on. Was this a dream? Was everything that happened all a dream? Would Kevin wake up in his bed back in South Boston or wherever it was he'd been sent on contract for WPG. Corey, the other dead Marine that had served on Kevin's protection detail in Jerusalem back in June, was standing next to Nate and shared the same bloody face. Corey had the same vaguely chipper demeanor, despite being dead. Yeah, Kevin, relax. Besides, shit is about to get thick for you, and you need to be on motherfucking point if Quan, Fitz, and Kyle are going to make it out this time. There won't be much time when it happens, plus there's Alan's family to think about, too. Little Shelby. What in the holy fuck were they talking about? Kevin tried to ask them, but his mouth felt like it was filled with sand. He forced his lungs to fill with air to speak, but when he tried to talk, nothing happened. It was like treading water in an ocean of confused silence. Nate and Corey looked at each other and laughed. They adjusted their brilliant white covers with equally snow-white dress gloves. Kevin suddenly realized that, even bloodied and dead, they were handsome and still exuded the quiet confidence that made him put them on his team in the first place. Suddenly, Corey's dress saber appeared in his hands, and he swung it to attention at his shoulder, presenting it to Kevin in some unfamiliar ritual. Kevin tried to ask him why he was acting weird with the sword, but again his mouth came up empty of words. The soft white light of the dreamscape surrounding them made the polished steel of the sword gleam with inner radiance. Kevin was transfixed by the sword as Corey swung it around deftly and slid it into the scabbard with practiced precision. Even sheathed, Kevin could feel the restrained power of the weapon, a faint glow emanated from the scabbard, teasing at the potential of the blade within. Corey patted the hilt of the sword intently three times. The three men were silent for an eternity before one of them spoke again. Nate was the one who broke the ethereal silence. Time for you to go, boss. Oh yeah, remember, man, the rule of three. We were supposed to tell you that. Don't forget. Rule of three, Kevin. It's very important. Be strong for Shelby. Give her and Becky our love. Nate patted Kevin on the shoulder three times as Kevin tried to ask what the fuck the rule of three meant. He was so lost. Tap. 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 Kevin's eyes snapped open in the dark office where his men slept aside him soundly. His arms were tucked above his head and under his pillow where his glock was. His fingers slid around the grip as he tried to see where the tapping on his shoulder came from in the pitch-black room. Above his head, he saw the white light of the flood lamps swinging left and right from the roof. Even without pointing directly at them, the lights were powerful enough to illuminate the office, and Kevin saw there was no one in the room with them. His bizarre dream came back to him in a familiar wave, and his heart rate settled down. All a dream, buddy. All a dream he muttered to himself under his breath. Kevin sat up on the edge of his squeaky cot, resting his bare feet on the cool tile, and he realized that he was covered in a thin film of salty sweat. 
He felt a bead of it trickle down the center of his chest between his chest hairs. He'd been lying with nothing on top of him, and he felt it was odd to be so warm as to sweat that bad. This was England in early autumn, not Abu Dhabi in summer. Maybe he was getting a case of the shits, he thought. Fresh air would help. Kevin tugged his trousers on and slid the Glock into the ever-present thigh holster. He didn't bother putting a heavier shirt on over his tank top. It was late enough, and anyone who felt like giving him shit about it could suck his cock. Kevin noticed Hal wasn't in his bed, and made sure the rest of his men were all safe and sound in the dark room. He slipped out into the hall and wandered to the stairwell to get to the roof. The roof was his escape at night. When he pushed through the fire door at the top of the stairwell onto the squat old office building they lived in, he inhaled deeply of the early August English air. There had been a light rain recently, and the dampness clung to the nighttime like a comforting blanket. The air had a rich volume to it, and it cleared his mind as he stood there, head tilted back, letting it flush his lungs of the stuffy air from the building. Fancy meeting you here, old man. Kevin heard a familiar British voice call out to him. He looked over and saw Harold standing ten paces away holding a pair of NVGs at chest height. The dark-skinned man smiled, and Kevin saw the gleam of his pearly white teeth in the faint moonlight. Kevin smiled back at his adopted operator and walked over, looking out at the far perimeter of the base beyond the wire and into the no-man's land of southeast England. Up late, huh? What's got you out and about? Kevin fished a pack of cigarettes out of a pants pocket and fired the cancerous rod up with a flick of his old Zippo. Old habits die hard, he thought, as he tugged his lungs full of the rich smoke. I heard one of the sniper teams talking when I was shutting off my radio earlier. There's a lot of strange movement on the barrier and at the gates. I wanted to check it out myself. The heavy floodlights had extinguished, and the world was dark again. Hal held up the NVGs to his eyes and scoped out the distant wall of Hesco barriers. Strange movement. Is that a fucking joke? Any time the dead stand back up and move around and shit, that's the pure dictionary deafened fucking ition of strange movement, Hal. You gotta present something really fucking bizarre to classify as strange movement nowadays. Kevin laughed at his own joke as he exhaled the smoke. Harold didn't respond at all. He just stared out over the barrier at the darkness in the distance. Kevin saw him swallow hard and lower the night vision device. We need to get to one of the sniper teams, mate. If what I think I just saw is really happening out there, then we are bloody well fucked. What's the expression you like so much? A, a real toe-pusher. Kevin had never seen Hal nervous. That made him nervous. Are you guys seeing this on your ends? One of the special operations snipers asked into his small throat microphone, talking to some other shooter-slash-spotter team somewhere else on the massive airbase. There could be fifty or more of these shooter-spotter teams out there, spread out to watch for events on the wire. Mildenhall housed something like fifteen or sixteen thousand people normally, and had enough people inside its walls and fences now to classify itself as a city. Even more people called it home now. They'd let locals in, especially the ones that worked on the base or were friends with service members on the base. The base's population had swollen by a few thousand more at the very least. Kevin couldn't hear the responses the spotter got in his earpiece. He resorted to watching the operator hold his hand to his ear and nod, reading his body language told Kevin everything he needed to know. Something strange was indeed afoot out in the wilds on the edge of the base. The shooter member of the team in the tower Harold and Kevin had ascended to the top of was laying flat on his stomach on the floor. He had the heavy barrel of his rifle aimed at a slot cut in the wall of the tower. Conventional sniper wisdom always told the shooter to remain far inside their hut so the barrel wasn't visible, and just like Kevin's smoking, old habits die hard. The shooter looked over his shoulder, and Kevin recognized him as Ethan, one of the PJs that had rolled out to Manchester with them. The two exchanged greetings quietly. You want to see this? Ethan asked Kevin, pointing to the night vision optics on the rifle. It's pretty fucked up, man. Kevin didn't even reply. He dropped to his chest immediately next to Ethan, and the man slid over so Kevin could get behind the assassin's tool. 
Kevin shouldered the weapon, and through his right eye, the pitch-black world took on a toxic green light. The technology that brought light to the dark did so with a green effect. The night through the scope was the color of neon green, dark forests, limes, and clovers. It took some adjusting to truly see the world in those colors, but a soldier with his experience took to the NVG world like a fish would to water. Kevin panned left and right at a spot in the fence where the base hadn't done sufficient improvements or repairs yet. The only thing keeping the undead out of the base at that particular location was a chain-link fence and the accurate shooting of the teams in a trio of hastily built towers just like this one. The less fortified gap in the wall around the base was shoulder to shoulder with the undead. Mildenhall was far enough away from any large population center that the amount of undead that trickled to the base was manageable. The shooters took down large groups of them when they got out of hand, and for the most part there had been no issues. This was disturbing to Ethan, Kevin, and Harold for two reasons. Kevin listened to Ethan as he narrated Kevin's thoughts. Shit, Kev. We've never seen so many here before. The other teams are saying it's just as thick at every point around the base. They started showing up a couple hours ago, right around 0330 or so. Kevin's mind flashed back to Nate and Corey in his dream just minutes before. The rule of three. Any chance it was about 0333? Kevin asked. Yeah, actually, right about then. Uh, not like we were looking at our watches exactly when it happened, but yeah. We don't know how they got so close with all of us watching. I mean, it's like they fucking turned invisible or something, or, or someone pulled the wool over our eyes with super-secret technology or magic or whatever to sneak them up. Romulan cloaking devices or the Predator or, or Gandalf or some shit. Ethan laughed nervously. Kevin didn't. Ethan's last observation chilled the veteran straight to his bones. But uh, can you see what they're carrying? All of them— each and every last one of the motherfuckers. Kevin looked through the scope and nodded silently, not wanting to say it aloud. Each of the undead Kevin could see were carrying knives, swords, machetes, sickles, and a whole assortment of bladed weapons. The dead held the weapons in limp, uninterested hands, oblivious to the value of the tools they clutched. I mean, how the hell did they figure out how to use weapons all of a sudden? It's fucking creepy, Kevin. It makes my damn blood run cold. Ethan shivered in the warm English night. All Kevin could see was Corey's dress saber, gleaming in the white room of his dream in his mind's eye. The relative calm of August and September gave way to a nightmare straight from the depths of hell in October and November. Through the cold, rainy autumn, Milden Hall endured an epic siege of the dead. General Reeves' immediate response to the sudden appearance of thousands of the dead was to observe and do nothing. As the first few days wore on, it became apparent the undead were behaving like never before. Each held a bladed weapon in its right hand, just as Kevin had seen. All of the dead stood at the gates and makeshift fences, barriers, and walls impassively, even when the living came into their view. Previously, the murderous dead would surge forward when the living appeared, scratching and biting through the fences. But they stopped that. It appeared as if the undead had a strategy, and it was one of terrible patience. The initial time of the encroachment continued on until the base was surrounded by a full legion of the damned. The undead stacked themselves a hundred deep in every direction, creating a moat of shuffling putrid flesh. Opening the gates of the airbase to leave or to allow others to come in became an impossible dream. The only way to come and go was via aircraft. The bombing sorties leaving the base left constantly, all day and night under the watchful vigil of the wretched army standing mysteriously idle so close by. Kevin and his team had gently removed themselves from the childcare building late in September when it became apparent things were not going to go well for the residents of RAF Mildenhall. Kevin searched far and wide on the base for old friends and friends of friends who could pull strings to get them a more secure place to live. Eventually, they sacrificed peace and quiet for safety, 
by moving into a ramshackle home made of hesco barriers, two-by-fours, plywood, and canvas near the tarmac and next to the hangars for the MC-130 transport aircraft. Kevin searched out an MC-130 flight crew that were acquaintances of Jaden and Ethan. Kevin desperately needed a plan B, and immediately he knew they were it. The flight crew was led by the pretty and feisty 32-year-old Captain Kate Haskett, and just like Kevin and his men, she and her crew wanted a plan B. Kate, Jaden, and Kevin's teams worked together to ensure that if the airfield was overrun or the proper opportunity presented itself, they were able to leave. Normally, Kate and her crew transported special operations forces and supplies around the world, but her sorties were largely changed to ferrying cargo about England. Mostly, she shuttled ammunition and ordnance. Jaden's men were considerably busier because of the base's security needs and overwhelming amount of military aircraft flying at the time. Jaden's men were often tasked to the combat search and rescue teams in the event planes went down, and they frequently did. Parts were becoming harder and harder to obtain for the aging planes and helicopters. Every flight was considered high risk now. What the fuck are we going to do when none of the planes can fly? Kate had asked the assembled group late one August night under the shadow of her plane's enormous wing. Swim home? They can kiss my dyke ass. She swigged from her bud light and shook her head in disgust. Kate's opinion on the military's don't ask, don't tell policy was more of a deal with or I'll fist you policy. The military's policy on Kate specifically was one of reluctant tolerance. She was a damn fine pilot. Everyone around her loved her. Kevin thought she was a hot shit. Everyone at that conversation that night had agreed with her. Things were not getting better fast enough, and morale on the sprawling airbase had slipped dramatically. No one wanted to be the first to suggest treason and steal a plane to leave, or even knew where to fly it to, but it was on everyone's mind. We need to squirrel supplies away for us, enough for everyone here to survive for some time in the event we need to be wheels up in twenty minutes, Kevin suggested. Murmurs of agreement issued from those gathered around. Jaden nodded. Parts, fuel, ammunition, weapons, MREs, comms gear, shitload of medical supplies, batteries, anything we'd need on a long insertion. We'd need to assume we are never getting a resupply again after we take off. We all need to know that if we leave the wire like this, there's no coming back inside it. Sobering thought. If they took a bird and flew the coop, there really was no going back. Reeves may not be able to bring a court-martial against Kevin's men, but he could see to it the still-serving pilots and airmen were executed. The high price of treason. No one says shit to anyone not sitting here right now. We take us and only us. We formulate an exit strategy to get off from the base. We quietly accumulate supplies that we need until then. And we have a few flight plans ready to go in the event our fuel level isn't sufficient to make it to the States. Kevin looked over at Becky playing with Shelby in the corner of the massive hangar. The child had taken to the environment like a champ and having all the people around pulled Becky back to the real world again. He then looked to Harold, the British Marine who had been with them since their narrow escape from London back in June. Harold rubbed the short hair on his head as everyone around aimed their attention at him. He looked around quizzically, wondering why they were looking at him. Eventually he smiled. Oh, I see. No one wants the black guy to come, eh? Fucking Americans. He shook his head, sarcasm thick in the air. Everyone laughed at his joke. It cut the tension in the echo-filled hangar bay. Kevin addressed him. Hal, you're not American. This is your home. I guess I just expected you to stay behind. I I don't want to presume you're going to leave your home for this. With us. I think we all want you to know you're more than welcome to come along. I'd love to have you. All those gathered added their two cents. Fitz, even, took the time to set his beard down and pat the Brit on his shoulders, showing his admiration for the young man. Fitz rarely sat a beard down that still had beer in it, and the immensity of the gesture was not lost on Kevin. Hal looked over his shoulder at Fitz, then at everyone around thoughtfully. He reflected on the situation before responding with a sad smile. Well, I used to fight for my queen and country— 
At least that's what I told everyone who had a higher rank than me, but we all know the real truth of it, yeah? And we fight for the men and women who stand with us, beside us. It's been a long time since I did anything for anyone but you blokes here. I was told to stand by your side and get my mission accomplished. That's what I think I should do. My home is wherever we are now. Here, here, brother. Jaden bumped knuckles with the Marine, and the pact was fully formed. They'd ride together or hang together. Everyone nodded, and they started the secret process of being ready for their world to come crashing down yet again. The dam broke in late November when General Reeves decided to start thinning the herd. The pressing mass of rotting dead flesh was moving some of the impossibly heavy Hesco and Jersey barriers and folding the chain-link fences over like paper. In preparation for the failure of the defenses, an inner perimeter was established around the airfield and the structures nearest to it. Sandbag and plywood walls were built, vehicles were flipped on their sides to create blockades, and additional fortifications erected. The engineers even went so far as to dig giant trenches across open areas in the hopes the undead would shamble straight forward and plummet into the gaps cut into the earth. A second inner ring of guard towers was constructed as well to give the sniper teams a place to fall back should the outer defenses fail. Reeves had an opulent Thanksgiving meal served to the survivors in the base confines, and the day following he ordered the triggers pulled. Once the snipers began to open fire into the middle of the undead ringing the base, it was as if the power was abruptly routed to the inside of the zombie mines, and the delicious living flesh inside the walls of Mildenhall suddenly appeared to them. The snipers observing the dead through their high-powered optics reported seeing a simultaneous expression cross the collective faces of the dead. All at once their visages lost the passive, blank looks they shared— and immediately registered an expression of betrayed fury and life-strangling rage. It was exactly as if a veil had been lifted, and their infernal hunger returned with a vengeance. They surged inward in a stampede of raw, unrestrained evil the likes of which the world had never seen. The outer wall of defense is held for nearly two weeks before they fell to the horde. The snipers worked in shifts around the clock, trying to cull them. They would shoot for two solid hours, switching out gun barrels as they overheated and taking breaks to ice their black and blue shoulders. No one was left idle for long. Those unable to fire rifles were put to work repairing defenses as they failed or building new defenses. For the first time since the planes left to bomb the cities of the United Kingdom, each aircraft sat on the tarmac, idling, as their crews drew their handguns and rifles to beat back the bloody tide— surging in to suffocate them, to drown them in teeth and pain. The outer walls were finally defeated when someone operating a heavy-duty forklift made a minor mistake. He had been working for fourteen straight hours, and when he lifted the tines of his fork to gently set a small compact on its side, near a weak portion of the gate, he'd lifted it just a bit too far, and the car precariously tipped over, smashing into the plywood sheets that had been propped against a portion of the chain fence. Despite being a small car, its weight and momentum carried it through the thin wood as if it were so much tissue, and smashed the relatively flimsy chain from the steel supports it had been attached to. The wretched mass on the other side stood still, clutching their knives, swords, and implements of destruction as the car tumbled into them. The clatter of their metal weapons was drowned out by the sickening crunches of their bones under the wreckage. In a desperate and suicidal attempt to plug the breach he'd just created, the forklift operator floored the pedal of his massive lift and sent it into the gap. He was torn down from the seat of the lift, screaming as the people around him fled for the inner security of the base. The gun towers observing the situation immediately opened fire, blowing the screaming airman's head off before he was forced to experience the pain of having his flesh torn from his bones one bite at a time. His sacrifice was for naught. The warning klaxons began sounding the death knell of Mildenhall. 
Kevin and his men were eating lunch with Kate and her flight crew in their ghetto-esque Hesco home off the airfield at the time. It was high noon on a windy mid-December cloudy day, and they were discussing the merits of the different MRE meals when the dreaded klaxon began blaring. No one said a word as they exchanged glances. Kevin and Kate both reached for their stashed satellite phones to dial Jaden to see what he knew, wherever he was. Kate waved Kevin off as she dialed his number first. Jaden answered after two rings. Jaden here, he sounded winded. This is Kate, what's going on? She bit her lip and looked at Kevin as she waited for his response. The wall was breached on the southwest side near the ball fields and the end of the runways. A large gap in the fence, I guess. They're in, and we're responding to the towers over there to lend support. Jaden huffed and puffed as he ran. Kate could hear the echoes of the gunfire nearby through the phone speaker. The reverberation coming from the real ear and the electronic speaker threw her off for a bit. Is it bad? Are we compromised? Or is this just scary? Everyone else in the makeshift home bunker was getting their kit on to go to war. Every gun might need to get in the fight. I don't know. I don't have eyes on yet. I'll advise. I'll get shit ready, though, just in case. We'll advise in ten. I'm out. And with that, he hung up the phone. His fire team is moving to the southwest to lend assistance. He'll advise in ten. I'm fueling the bitch up anyway. Kate got up to leave, but Kevin snagged her by the arm, stopping her. Get everything loaded. I got a bad feeling about this. Kevin's feelings were almost never wrong, and Kate had heard of his reputation as Sergeant Nostradamus. She nodded at him, and Kevin let her go. Kevin's men watched her team leave out of the heavy fabric door they'd put up. Fitz, Quan, Harold, and Kyle all looked intently at their leader as he donned his white cap once more. Kevin realized they were all looking at him, and he took a deep breath steadying his heartbeat. From outside, they heard the distant rumble of thunder, and the heavy fabric roof of their shelter began to pitter-patter with swollen English raindrops. It was like the tears of God. Kevin charged his M4, chambering around. Sounds like rain. Bring your big toes, fellas. Let's go push some turds down the drain. Jaden and his three fire team members had relocated to a high spot in the southwest corner of the airbase near the building that had previously served as the base's post office. The engineers had bulldozed a swath of trees and dropped massive steel shipping containers down to create a makeshift barrier and elevated firing position. He and his men dropped to the prone firing position after climbing to the top of the now slick steel container, and within seconds they were sending accurate rounds through the increasingly heavy rain across the baseball fields into the skulls of the undead swarming around the hole in the fence. Jaden observed the situation through his optics. A few dozen still living souls were hoofing it across the large field in their general direction, evidently having failed to get into the abandoned vehicles left at the fence. He watched as they slipped repeatedly on the rain-soaked grass, and struggled back to their feet. Keep those folks running clean. Fuck the dead assholes at the perimeter, Jaden told his men. Immediately, they adjusted for range and started picking off the undead nearest the fleeing people. He carefully observed the wall as the hole's edge slowly eroded and became larger under the streams of armed undead. The mystery of how they were still moving in the first place was lost on him as he pondered why the hell they were holding onto weapons and not using them. Right before his eyes he watched three of the mangled dead toss the weapons aside and tackle a rain-soaked uniformed airman to the ground. Jaden watched him mouth a scream from the distance as he was murdered by the savages. Why in the world would these things all pick up weapons, then discard them at the moment they should be used? Jaden tested the wind with his shooter senses and put the crosshairs on the dying airman's skull. He sent the dying man's brains all over the gray jersey barrier, releasing him from his pain and the curse of returning as one of his killers. The undead mauling him stopped their attack when he slumped lifelessly, and they turned to join the flood of their brethren pushing into Mildenhall. Jaden's earpiece crackled to life. This is Lincoln Tower 2. 
We have a severe breach at our gate. The situation is foobar. All Lincoln Towers are falling back to the inner perimeter wall. We are being overrun. Jaden didn't know who was in any of the towers on Lincoln Road, but he knew it had to be bad for them to call out foobar and fall back already. He fired off a few more rounds into the host heading their way, and when he saw the running survivors get past their position, he reached for his satellite phone. Normally, men in his specific line of work would sacrifice themselves so that others may live. In fact, it was his unit motto. This was different. If they didn't escape Mildenhall right here and right now, there would be no one here left to save. It was time for him and his men to get the fuck out. Mildenhall was lost. They're on their way. Hurry the fuck up. Logan, the loadmaster of Kate's MC-130 plane, barked out to the men fueling it up. There was precious little time left. From deep inside the MC-130's cargo bay, Kate yelled to Logan, Two Humvees are locked down, right? We have all the supplies loaded in already? All but half of one pallet of ammo and food we'd stashed in the back. We got spare parts, fuel, and everything else good to go as well. It'll be heavier than I'd like, but we can work it. Logan grunted as he walked past her, carrying crates of five five six millimeter ammunition. Kate nodded, observing the professionalism of her crew as they got the massive cargo plane ready to move. They could be wheels up in less than twenty minutes at this rate. She looked out the massive opening in the side of the hangar to the gray rain that was drenching the world. She wondered if the rain was God's tears over their fate. Fan fucking tabulous. She smiled glumly and trotted over to the pallet Logan was moving into the belly of her big fat beast. Kevin's rifle kicked into his shoulder one round after another. The spent shell casings flung out the ejection port and soared across the concrete, tinkling and spinning in the virgin puddles. He and his team had wandered out of their shelter and towards the end of the runways near the breach that was closest to them. The other four of Kevin's men formed a rough firing line with him, staggered slightly to prevent the hot shell casings from hitting the man to their right. Each of the men walked at a snail's pace, snapping off rounds into the heads of the undead streaming across the field from their left to right. After a hundred yards and three magazine charges, the men simultaneously dropped to one knee and poured it on. Kevin and his men quickly emptied the contents of their magazine, dropping zombie after zombie into the grass. Kevin stood to look around at their surroundings. He was paranoid they'd be surrounded. As the white cap team leader stopped to look around, the throng of undead a hundred yards ahead ebbed. Through his ACOG, Fitz saw the heads of the undead spin sideways suddenly, as if they were twisted marionettes with suddenly broken necks. Their milky white eyes glared with a ferocity he had never seen before as they looked in unison at a single thing they clearly hated. They stared directly at Kevin Witten. Kev, brother, we got fucking issues here, bro. The rain clinging to Fitz's enormous mustache flew off as he hollered over to his friend. Kevin looked back to their front at the undead that had been streaming in one direction and were now streaming directly at them directly at him. Kevin brought his rifle up and observed the intent the undead had. Every last one of them was fixated directly on his person, and they were moving straight at him. The rest of his men slowly stood and realized what was happening. Holy shit, Kev! Quan's head swung left to right and back again as he made the connection. Hal didn't stop firing. He had shelled his standard-issue L-85 rifle for the M-4 the rest of the men used. The last thing he wanted was for it to break and then not be able to find spare parts. He fumbled a bit as he swapped out the magazine and stopped to absorb what was happening all around him. They were all thinking it, but Kyle said it first. They're here for you. Kevin swallowed. In the back of his mind, Corey's words from the dream in the white room came back to him. Shit's gonna get thick for you. Kevin and his men turned and ran for their lives. Jaden and his fire team leapt off the metal shipping container when they saw the pulsating mass of the dead do a ninety-degree turn and head for the four small shapes that he knew to be the WPG men.
Jaden had no idea how they'd managed to get the attention of all those fucking dead pricks, but they were headed right at them, and past where they were was the MC-130 that was their ticket out of here. To the hangar! Stop for nothing! We're out of here! Jaden's men responded by covering the pavement at nearly superhuman speed. The men were all loaded for bear with hundreds of rounds of ammunition, multiple weapon systems, and medical gear and more, but they ran like the wind. Each of the men was already soaked to the bone in the frigid downpour. Jaden was thankful the training he and his men received was so thorough and hellish. It made real life almost tolerable on days like this. The men crossed through a small copse of tree stumps and turned on a surface road to head towards the hangar and the plane that, hopefully, would have a clear enough runway for them to leave on. Jaden's men began shooting on the run as the undead closed in around them like a vice. Kate and her co-pilot Nick sat in the cockpit of their plane and went through the pre-flight checklist. One by one they affirmed and reaffirmed every single item, readout, and setting that the plane needed to ensure a safe takeoff and flight. They were attentive and mechanical in their process, missing nothing. In her helmet speaker she heard overwhelming chatter from multiple locations across the base. The talk over the channels was frightening. People were dying. Lots of people were dying. The frequencies normally reserved for their communication had been retasked for ground use, and it irritated the fucking piss out of her and her younger co-pilot Nick. They shook their heads in disgust as they finally switched over to a frequency they had planned to use with Kevin and Jaden's teams, should this moment occur. It started, Kate! Get it started! They're headed right at the hangar! Kevin was screaming into the microphone. Kate winced as her ear recoiled in pain from his yell. Jump in Jehoshaphat, Kevin, relax. We're a few minutes from starting it. We need more fuel. Her response was even and flat. She wasn't the panicking type. Jaden came over the radio. No time, he's right. Spin that bitch up now. If we need to land in the middle of the goddamn M11 in 15 minutes, that's better than what's coming our way. Kate could clearly hear Jaden was sprinting again. Kate laughed at herself and wondered if Jaden was always running. All right, we'll figure it out when we get in the air. She toggled the comms to the interior channel and addressed the rest of her flight team. They were refueling the plane. Yank the pumps, guys. We gotta move now. Kate gestured to Nick to skip the more essential pre-flight stuff. Emergency takeoff procedures. Captain, we're less than half full right now. We won't make it home on a half-empty belly. Her flight engineer, Dale, came back over the channel, telling her what she already knew. I know, Dale. No time to bitch. We'll find a meal for her somewhere other than here. Yank the shit and get this thing moving. Jaden and Kevin are coming in hot, and they're saying we gotta scram. Kate's voice again was calm and indifferent to the horror out of her view outside the hangar. Dale responded with a, You bet, Captain. And they stopped pumping the plane's lifeblood. Kate continued with her checklist and readied the plane to go. Kevin's men ran diagonally to meet Jaden's men in a full sprint heading towards the hangar. Despite being significantly faster than their pursuers, the men ran with every single ounce of strength they could muster. The only thing that made any of them feel safer was putting additional real estate between them and the thousands of hungry, bloody mouths behind them. Jaden and Kevin exchanged breathless haste as the two teams met each other's stride. After just a few moments, it became clear the younger, active Air Force men were much faster than most of them. Only Hal kept up with them. They eventually moved ahead of the WPG men, leaving them a few yards behind and falling back fast. Fitz's side split painfully with a stitch. He started to pull up lame, clutching the burning muscle on the side of his torso. Oh, you motherfucking bitch, he cussed as softly as he could manage. The WPG men slowed their sprint to assist the aging Fitz. The Air Force men ahead with Harold instinctively slowed their gait as well, sensing something was amiss behind them. That prick! Kevin threw his arm under Fitz's and, without missing a step, soldiered on carrying a heavy portion of the man's weight. Ahead of him he watched as the elite Air Force men fanned out and began to fire past him into the bulging horde of undead closing in on them. 
Jaden bucked off ten quick rounds, dropping ten bodies to the slick grass just as fast. When he finished, he started walking backwards, assessing their new situation. He thumbed his throat mic and hailed Kate in the plane's cockpit. Captain, I think we need a ride. Can you come out and start to taxi in our general direction? We've got a minor casualty and could use a little hand from you. He fired five more rounds at the dead before Kate came back to him. We're spinning up and pulling out now. We'll drop the back ramp. Make sure that fucking runway is clear for me or this'll be less of a flying away operation and more of a driving in circles operation. See you in a minute. Once again, Kate's calm demeanor dominated the tension. She would be legendary if they survived this. Roger that. Guys, she's coming to us. We can slow down. Jaden's men dropped to a knee and they picked up their rate of fire. Kevin and Fitz shuffled past Harold as he poured red-hot rounds out of his M4's barrel into the undead behind them. The wall of flesh pressing at their rear was horrifying. The men shooting didn't have the time or the interest to look at the faces of the dead people they were shooting. They lined up their weapon sights on the shape of a head and sent a projectile into it. The bodies dropped like gory, headless bowling pins, tumbling down and into the way of the undead behind them. The men trying to get on the plane might be rescued by the sheer incompetence of the dead. They were simply too stupid to step over the bodies falling in front of them. From the direction they had been running in, Kate's enormous MC-130 slid out of the massive hangar opening. The four turboprops picked up speed, and the chest-shaking buzz grew in intensity. The silent rage of the wall of undead approaching them from one direction was almost overshadowed by the raw mechanical power of the approaching special operations aircraft. The men looked quickly behind them and saw Kate's face through the tiny cockpit window. She powered the plane up and swung it wide. When the massive wing passed over their heads, the rain stopped for a moment. Immediately after, they were nearly tossed their asses when the backwash from the massive engines hit them. The men scrambled to their feet with the scores and scores of undead a mere fifty feet away now. The plane slowed its forward progress, and they noticed the tail cargo door was now dropping slowly for them to get in. Taxi, Kate announced over their comms. Fitz and Kevin turned one last time toward their pursuers and separated to empty their weapons. Time for a little sweet payback. They emptied the remainder of the magazines they had, and slapped in fresh ones. Let's get the fuck out of here. Kevin and the warriors surrounding him ran with their last reserves and climbed up into the plane's rear ramp. Harold yanked Fitz up as the older man grimaced from the burning in his stomach. Ten thousand hands, half filled with sharp weapons, reached out towards Kevin as he looked back from the inside of the plane. A white-haired elder male zombie, dressed as he would have been in life, dressed in the garb of a priest, walked out from the now halted army of dead. Mysteriously, he locked gazes with Kevin from afar, and he raised a long archaic sword above his head triumphantly. Kevin noticed the downpour came to a halt immediately, and with a single unified purpose, the collective mass of undead behind them dropped the weapons they had clutched for so long. Their target lost, They disseminated immediately, spreading out to find fresh flesh to murder. The priest lowered the sword slowly and dropped the tip three distinct times in midair as if he were knighting Kevin from afar. Then, with supernatural strength, the priest stabbed the point of the sword down into the concrete, sending a spiderweb of fractures out from the blade and embedding it there. The hilt wobbled, and Kevin could feel the vibration in his chest even over the rumbling of the massive plane's engines. The army of undead spilled around the form of the priest as if he were a dam stopping a small portion of a flood. The dead priest slowly lifted his left arm and gently pulled up his blood-encrusted black sleeve, revealing his wristwatch underneath. Then, with ominous intelligence, the priest rested his finger down on the bezel, counting out for those watching that there would be another time, and soon. Tap. 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 
The men gathered around Kevin in the back of the plane, watched all this as the ramp door lifted up, shutting the solitary dead priest out from their newly safe environment. The plane powered up further as it made the turn onto the runway for takeoff. Fitz stepped in front of Kevin and waved a hand in front of his face, snapping Kevin out of his sudden trance. Yeah, what? Kevin shook the cobwebs out of his head. What the fuck was that? Fitz looked at Kevin intently with fear-filled eyes. I don't know, Kevin muttered. Harold, standing next to them, added his two cents before walking away deep into the cargo bay of the plane. Mate, they didn't get what they came for. Now they're taking what they can get. Kevin didn't like that thought one little bit. After he double-checked to make sure Becky and Shelby had made it aboard the plane, Kevin made his way up to the cockpit to talk to his pilot. He leaned over in between the two seats in the cockpit as he adjusted the microphone on the bulky aviation helmet. Kate looked over her shoulder at him for a moment as she leveled the bird out. The glass of the cockpit was covered in rivulets of water from the rainstorms that had just ended. "'What's the plan, Captain?' Kevin asked her as he tried to see something, anything, through the thick clouds they were in. The plane shuddered with heavy turbulence, causing Kate to pause. Well, Mr. Witten, due to an inability to top off our tanks, we definitely cannot follow our ideal flight pattern. We are now on Plan B. Her sarcasm was unmistakable. Kevin sighed. How fucked up is Plan B? Ever been to Morocco? Kate asked. Long time ago, what the hell's in Morocco? Kevin asked her as the clouds parted and the sunlight burst into view. The golden orb was still far above, and from the vantage high atop the angry clouds below, they looked white and puffy and even friendly. There's a small FOB there that we're doing covert shit out of. It should have an ass ton of fuel for us, and if we're lucky, some of the green berets that were there might want to go home with us. She turned and winked at him. They're going to be all men, Kate. You're shit out of luck, Kevin poked her. Hey, head is head. I'm gay, but I'm not that gay. Kate adjusted some controls and sat back as the two men laughed at her. What's after Morocco, Kevin asked. We bunny hop to the Azores, refuel again there, hopefully, then we fly all the way home. Kate and Nick crossed their fingers in unison. Um, what the fuck was that? Kevin pointed his wagging finger at their superstitious activity. It was bad juju to pull that bullshit. Well, even if we top off at both locations, we're going to be flying on fumes when we reach the eastern seaboard. It's going to come down to how bad the headwinds are. There you go talking about head again. How close is it going to be? What if there's no fuel for us in the Azores? I mean... Should I seriously think about buying a timeshare while we're in Morocco and skipping this whole trip home idea? Kevin scratched his ass. Well, Kevin, if there's no fuel for us in the Azores... Yeah. Kate looked straight forward as she responded to him. Then we fucking swim home. Kevin clucked his tongue like Lancaster used to during their phone conversations. He hoped that wasn't a new habit he'd formed. Sounds cool. Let's do it. Kate smiled. Kevin shrugged as he sat the helmet down and turned to leave the cockpit. Some tickets are one way, he thought to himself. He wondered what interesting things awaited them in wonderful dark Africa, where this bullshit all began. April 9th There's always drama when people collect together. Always. Sometimes the drama is good, and other times the drama is bad. Right now, we're teeter-tottering back and forth between the two. Good drama, Gavin and Abby are getting along well, and they seem to be very mature and level-headed about their relationship. Also good is Ollie and Melissa. They're clearly awesome together, and both are workaholics here on campus. They're machines that are happy to do their work. Bad drama, arguing over plans. Everything was going great until we met Blake. Not that he himself has been a problem. He's pretty good, all things considered, especially when there's food involved for him. What's been shitty is the information he's revealed to us. Sometimes ignorance is bliss. I'll get to that in a bit. We returned back to the cul-de-sac yesterday with the HRT, 
Gavin's truck and the plow. Obviously, Gilbert's vehicle was abandoned on the side of the road, but when we approached the cul-de-sac for our pre-scheduled noon meeting, we noticed the truck was gone from the spot where it died. It seemed unlikely that the police had towed it, which boded well for us. Parked in the middle of Walt's Road was Gilbert's truck. Blake was sitting on the hood, patiently waiting for us with a smile on his face a yard wide. All I could think of was the guilty cat with the feather in his mouth. He looked like he'd gotten his cake, and it was delicious. We parked at the end of the road, and as agreed, I walked towards him alone. We thought it best not to scare him by showing up with a bunch of folks right off the bat. He slid off the hood of the truck as I approached. We said our hellos, and right off the bat you could tell he was far more prepared for this. He almost seemed, well, like his dialogue was scripted. Mr. Adrian, uh, pleasure to see you again, was the first thing he said. I was reminded of when Gavin was all nervous to talk to Patty. It felt like he was a little nervous as well as a little excited. Nice to see you as well, Blake. Hope all's well with you. I smiled at him and noticed his color was better than the day before. He didn't look fatter or anything, but he looked, I don't know, healthier. I'm great. Eating pretty good. Had a safe night last night, and I got your truck working too. Feeling like I earned all that food from the house over there. He thumbed at the beige cape we let him get all the food out of. I nodded at him in agreement and thanked him. We made idle chat about the truck, then the weather for a bit, and he pointed at the plow truck as well as Gavin's Dodge and mentioned some neat facts about the vehicles that I think were supposed to highlight his usefulness and intelligence. He obviously liked vehicles and knew quite a bit about them. I was secretly hoping that he could be our Hector. He didn't look Mexican, though. We'd have to make do. Blake explained the gas tank of the trunk was almost one-third water. He siphoned the tank dry, emptied the fuel lines, found some usable gas somewhere, added in a thing of fuel additive, and he said it turned right over. He could not have looked happier. He also told us our vehicles were probably all going to shit the bed in a similar fashion sooner or later. I'm not an expert, please keep that in mind, Mr. Journal, but he seems pretty bright on the subject. Our fuel will be accumulating moisture, even if stored in drums and sealed. As the moisture content rises, the fuel loses potency, and eventually it becomes inert. We need to maintain our fuel, removing the water every so often, or it'll go bad, even the diesel. As he explained it all right over my head, I kept a close watch on our surroundings. We didn't hotkey this conversation over the walkie in the event something happened, and midstream he was interrupted by Abby, calling out the presence of a zombie on Route 18, slowly shuffling our way. Blake's face straight up went stiff as a board when he heard the radio crackle with her voice. His response after hearing her over the radio was, Holy shit, a girl? How old is she? I grinned, and before I responded to Abby's radio call, I said to him, She's younger than you prettier than me, and more dangerous than both of us. He looked defeated. I radioed back for her and Gavin to deal with it, preferably without a gun involved, and after a minute or so of nervous waiting, they gave the all clear. Blake looked more relieved than I felt. I changed the subject. So, Blake, we've got an offer for you. I'd like to hear your opinion on it, and if you're game, I'd like to get started on it immediately. Let's hear it. He licked his lips again. I vowed to find him some chapstick. You know more about downtown than any of us do at the moment, and like I said the other day, that information is valuable to us. We've got ammunition for the guns you're using, as well as spare food and clean water we can trade you for that information and other help down the line. He chewed on that thought for a few seconds and came back with, I'll tell you where the zombies are. I'll tell you where I think food is. I, I can also tell you where some of the asshole survivors are, too. I, I mean, there are a few groups out there that are pretty nasty people. I don't care what happens to them. I won't tell you where the good people are yet. I need to know you're all good folks first. I nodded, understanding most of what he meant. Asshole survivors? He looked very displeased having to talk about it, but... The tale he told explained why. Here's as much of his tale as I can recall. When 
Things first went bad. Everyone in town scrambled to get everything they could. The grocery store had a gum battle. Moore's got all shot up. The used car dealership across town got robbed, and even the damn gas stations got ugly. After a few weeks, though, everyone kind of settled in, and the haves ate well, and the have-nots starved, or had to come out with all the fresh dead wandering. Those folks usually died. Those that made it out and back from my trailer park before they died, too, told me about this huge house south of town where you could get some food and water for a price. Yeah, you had to bring bullets or something of value to trade for it, but they had a lot of food, I guess, so I went to check it out one day about three months after everything happened, just as the cool weather hit and the leaves started to turn. The house had a huge reinforced metal fence around it, one built originally because it was a small farm. I saw a few cows inside the fence, and at the gate they'd built some kind of guard shack or gatehouse or whatever out of plywood and corrugated metal roofing. The house was a big white farm, and it sat about a hundred yards back at the end of a long dirt driveway. They hollered out to me to stop moving when I got to within maybe fifty feet of the shack, and they asked what I was there for. I told them I needed food and water if they had it, and the older man's voice from inside the shack asked me what I had to trade for it. Back then, I had little to nothing, and I said just that. And he said to get moving then, because all I'd be was a burden. I tried to say I could work for them, but he said I couldn't be trusted and uh, go my way. When I left, I, I looped around wide and came back to a good hide in the woods where I could see the gatehouse, and I hid there, watching for a few days to see what happened. I watched all day, every day. I saw about ten or twelve folks all over the farm working. There were maybe five men. Each had a rifle, one just like the one you have, Adrian, and they came out at night to farm, to harvest the back garden they had. After the first day, I recognized the old man as the husband of the family that ran the big farm stand on the south end of town. You know the one, right? They just built an ice cream window on it. They used to make their own ice cream. So, anyway, the people on that farm run that farm stand. Well, used to run it. During the time I watched, I saw them trade with people several times. Once, the last trade I saw before I took off, I watched the old man and his wife come out of the shack to look at two kids that had come with two parents. Now, I can't read lips, and I can't say for certain what they were saying, but I think they traded for those two kids. I mean, yeah, it's possible that they just took them in, but Adrian, I tell you, they were looking at them like sides of beef. You know, looking at their arms and legs and seeing if they were strong, making sure they were healthy and shit. I ran off after that because I had a bad feeling. About when the snow started to fall, I, I was hunting down in that area trying to get a deer or some rabbits or something, and I realized that I was near the farm. I figured I should look back into it to see what had happened there, and wouldn't you know, they were still there. I even saw the two kids they'd traded for out on the land inside the fence, working the few cows they had. After a few hours, I could just tell those kids were miserable. I mean, Adrian, they, they looked like death warmed over. They looked like me, for crap's sake. Someone yelled from the farm after a while, and the kids went inside. I went to leave, but I noticed outside on the road there were a lot of bodies. I mean, a lot, man. Looked like they'd been shooting zombies a lot lately. I couldn't help but wonder how many of those bodies belonged to living, breathing people, though. I don't know, man. Maybe they're good. Maybe they're shit. By the way, I don't trust them. Yeah, not cool, Mr. Journal. His story gave me the creeps. He told me exactly where to find that farm. He also told me about six or seven concentrated spots of undead around town. He didn't know why those spots were heavily overrun with the dead. I guess it could mean that there are survivors there. Or maybe there's something making noise there. Or maybe, just maybe, it's utterly fucking random. On principle, Blake agreed that he would look at our vehicles when he could— 
He said the fuel line douche and fuel tank emptying wasn't that big of a deal on normal cars, and he thought it'd be a good idea in the long run. Of course, by long run, we're talking about maybe having our gas-powered vehicles last until the end of the year. Hopefully, we'll last as long as them. Blake said that in order for him to do the work, we'd need to get him the parts and tools. He said Mike's garage was largely clear of the dead, but there weren't sufficient parts there. There was an auto parts store just on the other side of downtown, though, and he said it was fairly clear. Based on what he said, I got the impression we could roll in, empty the area of zombies, and gather up the parts he needs to do whatever it is he needs to do. In exchange for his information and the repair work on the vehicle, I fetched two gallon jugs of water for him and a half gallon of the milk we had on campus. It was a lot of our milk, but I kind of promised it to him, and I try to keep my word as best I can. I also grabbed a few cans of spaghetti-type stuff, as well as two containers of cup of noodles, a can of dinty more, and a small container of concentrated OJ. I also gave him twenty rounds of the three o three British for his Enfield rifle, and a small box of eighteen thirty eight caliber shells. He was so happy. He was happier when I asked him if he was up for meeting someone new. He asked who, and I said it was Gilbert, our elder statesman and owner of the truck he'd fixed. He seemed nervous, but was willing to meet him. Gilbert hopped out of the HRT and shuffled his way to us and stuck out his hand for Blake to shake. Blake took it, and Gilbert pumped his hand vigorously, not saying a word. Gilbert sized him up good and plenty. "'You fix my truck. Fine work, son.' Gilbert adjusted the AK on his back as he said it. The handshake had slid it to a funny angle on the sling. Blake smiled shyly. "Uh, "'Yeah, I sure did. It was an easy fix.' "'Yeah, maybe so, but... I'm sure you did it where there was danger, and performance under dangerous conditions warrants extreme merit, son. You deserve more than that food. I'd like for you to keep that truck. That way you got a means to get around should shit get thick for you. Gilbert assessed the truck behind the boy and nodded, confirming the wisdom of his own statement. Blake looked back at the truck himself and shook his head. He was about to say no to Gilbert, but the old man cut his ass off at the pass. Don't say a word to me, Blake. I've made up my mind, and at my age, if I can't have my way on some things, I might as well check out. I ain't checking out today. Blake smiled thankfully. The two had already bonded. With Gilbert there, we explained to Blake that we had radios that we communicated with, but until we knew him more, we weren't quite comfortable with giving him one of ours. He said that was fair, and that we could always set up regular meeting times and places. Gilbert suggested that we meet again, right here, in four days' time on the 13th. Blake had no idea what the date was, and was fairly surprised when we told him it was the 9th of April yesterday. Time flies when you're running away from undead cannibals. Our meeting was concluded after everything was exchanged and he got into his new truck and sped off. I don't know where he's going to get fuel for it, but if he refilled the gas tank after draining it, he's got a source somewhere. We'll see him on the 13th at noon. After that, we decided we would roll on some neighborhoods to scout them for undead contents. Our new plan was sticking with the recon to contact idea. Literally, we find trouble and then kill it. Killing every single zombie in town is a goal, and we put a decent dent in the populace yesterday and today. Most of it was stopping just on the fringe of a large pack of them and popping them off with the twenty-two rifles. Once the crowd had been thinned to just one or two, we waded in with the Halligans or Bats or whatever and went to town face to face. We really need to conserve ammo as much as possible, especially in light of Blake's conservative estimate of 25 survivors in town. Could mean there are a lot of undead out there. Yesterday, we cleared zero homes, but put down about 30 undead and formulated our plan for today. Now, As for last night, it got ugly when we got back. Maybe ugly isn't the right word. Animated. Spirited, even. I want to check out that farm, as does Patty and Abby. Gavin wants whatever Abby wants, but Gilbert is adamantly opposed to the idea of checking it out now. I'm concerned that we'll leave them alone long enough to establish a strong enough power base that, if they're indeed doing what we think they're doing... 
trafficking in humans for food or slavery or whatever, when we finally go at them, they'll be dug in like an Alabama tick. Awesome movie reference for you, Mr. Journal. Gilbert is fully confident that when we decide to visit them, we can handle them, but we need to think on it for a few weeks and let the idea percolate. More of town needs to be cleared out before we can just saunter over and start an intel-gathering operation on what seems to be a fairly heavily armed group of people. Now, during the heat of the moment, I disagreed rather adamantly with him, and the girls joined in. We got pretty nasty and mean to each other, and at one point I walked the fuck out. Ollie and Melissa were clearly uncomfortable. I was sitting on an old plastic lawn chair on the side deck of Hall E, pissed at the world, when Ollie came out to visit me. He patted me on the shoulder, gave me a short message, then went back inside. He said, Adrian, uh, this isn't Westfield. This town is still overflowing with the dead. For all we know, they took those children in to shelter them, and we can't change all our plans based on what some young man saw through a rifle scope six months ago. You've got a responsibility to us, and gathering food and supplies and cutting down the number of dead is the real priority for this family. I can't argue with that. I just can't. I went back inside, apologized to everyone, quickly finalized our plans for today, and went to bed. I didn't want my shitty attitude to be a cancer anymore that night. Today was very awkward. Gilbert didn't say shit to me all morning, and finally he only spoke to me after I approached him and apologized. I told him I was an ass, and he was right, and I was being hasty because I wanted to fly right over there and rescue those kids. I guess I really want to be a hero. Gilbert nodded and said he understood. After that, things were better. We started on some houses nearing the more industrial area of Main Street, There are a lot of loop side streets to do, as well as some dead-end streets and a couple general neighborhoods that are somewhat isolated. I figure we've got the remainder of the entire month of April before we actually reach the area where the grocery store and the pharmacy are. I'll post updates as necessary, but frankly I'm guessing most of it will be the same old, same old. After we clear for a few weeks, maybe we can reassess the farm idea. Or... Maybe I can talk Blake into sneaking over there for us and gathering information for us. We'll have a meeting with Mike and the Westfield folks on the 15th as well. Hopefully, we've got some things for them, and I hope they have some neat things for us. Adrian April 11th We cleared a few houses today. I'm happy to report that our rule of observing for trash piles at houses has already paid dividends. One of us saw a house with a massive pile of garbage outside of it, and, wouldn't you know, we encountered about six undead inside. Without doubt, that could have been a messy clear for us, but it wound up going really well due to our Westfield chainsaw tactic. Gavin continues to be useful for us. Go Gavin. I am so exhausted, genuinely tired. I'm so tired that I have reached the point of being loopy. I think I'm catching the cold thing Gavin had a few days back. It might be allergies, I suppose. I'm not a doctor, Jim. My head is stuffy. My damn nose is periodically super runny, like dry and fine or complete sinus purge. And I'm fighting a bitch of a headache in my temples right after I wake up in the mornings. I'm taking a few ibuprofen here and there to stave off the worst of it. It's irritating more than disabling, though. We've had amazingly good weather. I'd guess and say almost 60 to 70 during the day and reasonably warm at night. The heat has only kicked on a few times during the night, which is awesome news. One of the houses we found today was burnt almost to the ground, All that remained were a few of the timber frames and the scorched plumbing. Obviously, there was nothing there today, but one strange thing was left behind. For some reason, the roof of the garage on the house survived the blaze, and painted on the shingles in bright yellow paint were the words, Help us, we are freezing. When we saw that, we all stopped and took a moment to absorb it, All we see are the words now, but if you think about what was happening to the people who wrote it at the time they wrote it, it hits you. 
It hits me, at least. The thing that I can't escape is when it was painted on the shingles. In order for them to have written it on the roof, they would have had to go up on the roof before the snow in either October or November at the latest. If they were freezing then, I can't imagine how bad it was for them when the temperatures really dropped. In my mind, I envision that desperation drove them to start a fire, and something bad happened, and now whoever lived there is dead by their own hands. Remember when I was on the roof of the grocery store way back when? Uh, January, was it? February, maybe. And I saw all the houses across town burnt out and still smoking. Morbid thinking to sit back and try and do the math to see how many people died just like this this past few months. People forced to set their furniture on fire or run their propane stoves at night for warmth. We've, I've found a few zombies over the cold months that had no wounds at all, no markings, no injuries, no nothing. They died through no noticeable exterior violence. Maybe they died of a heart attack or diabetes or cancer or masturbatory chafing, but I'm starting to realize that a lot of them probably froze to death. The really skinny ones, you know the kind, with the exposed ribs, bloated stomach, and bony elbows that look sharp enough to pass for a garden trowel, it's obvious that those people starved. So many fucking questions are raised every time we go off campus. How did this guy die? Where did these people get three cases of air fresheners? Why did that zombie tap his watch three times that day? Questions upon riddles wrapped up in feces and crusted enigmas. I tire of trying to figure it out day after day. Gilbert sits back and just takes it all in. He works on a different level than the rest of us, seeing things that we haven't or won't. I know he's still sandbagging us on something, but I don't quite know what it is yet or when he'll finally come clean to me. I trust him, but there's still some great secret to the old green beret that has yet to come out into the light. One day it will, though, and I'm sure we'll all ship bricks. I just hope it's a good shitting of bricks and not a bad shitting of bricks, i.e., oh my fucking god, I won the lottery, versus, oh my fucking god, my nana died in an S&M den dressed up as a French maid while being DP'd by a donkey and a horse. That'd be awkward. Poor nana. I'm still a little pissed and hurt over the farm discussion we had the other night. I'd like to say I'm over it completely, but that'd be a lie. I still feel like I'm the best decision maker here, and that might well be true, but I need to remember that I don't always make the best decisions. I might be right 90% of the time, but that other 10% of the time, I have this awesome knack of getting someone killed. I am the Uba. I need to remember that 10% every time someone disagrees with me. It might be someone's life riding on me listening to what they have to say. It's astounding what kind of decisions are now life or death for us. Walking outside on campus, the safest place in town right now, as far as we know, is still a potentially life or death activity. Let me illustrate how ludicrous my life is. Rewind life a year from right now, April of 2010. Imagine you're sitting on your couch, sipping on a tall glass of your favorite refreshing carbonated beverage while watching some lame sitcom because you can't afford to go out and do the things you want to do because you're responsible or too old to have fun anymore. You think to yourself, wow, I could really go for some fucking tortillas and salsa. But then you realize, ah, shit, I watched the news earlier and I know all those crazy murderers that killed everyone in the area are outside somewhere. I don't know where they are, but I know if they see me, they'll try and kill me. I know they won't stop trying to kill me until I'm successfully hidden or I kill them first. Kill all of them first, of course. So as you sit there on your couch, sipping your favorite carbonated beverage, watching your lame sitcom, lamenting that you should have spent more time doing your homework and focusing on grades instead of trying to get laid or have fun, 
wishing you had tortillas and salsa, you ask yourself, am I willing to die for that tortillas and salsa? That's our life right now. Seriously, minus the lame sitcom part. If we want to walk over to the cafeteria to get one of the few remaining bags of Doritos, we need to realistically weigh the likelihood of whether or not we'll die doing it. Granted, campus is about as close to 100% safe as anywhere can get right now, so the likelihood of one of us biting it going across the way on campus is slim, but you get the point, right? Right? Crazy shit to wrap your nugget around. Almost as crazy as hearing that your nana died while dressed as a French maid in an S&M club while being DP'd by a horse and a donkey. Almost. Unless you kind of knew your nana was a freak to begin with. That'd change everything. Like, a lot. I'm all over the place from this damn cold, or allergies, or whatever the hell I've got going on. I feel like I've got cotton balls packed into my skull, and all the pressure inside is making me stupid, making me more stupid. I can damn near feel my IQ sinking as I type this. Otis has decided to knead my stomach and shoulder as I type this. He starts at the top and works his way down, then starts over again. Otis wants Adrian to go to bed so he can crawl up into Adrian's taint to stay warm. I love Otis, but man, he's fucking needy. I need to get laid. Cassie, I love you, and I seriously hope you understand what's happening to my penis. It's dying a slow, lonely death. I'm drowning it in an assortment of lubricants. My current idea of sexual variety is whether or not I use KY or Juniper Breeze lotion to beat off with at night. I've done the St. Louis dry rub a few times, too, just to have it a little rough, but I chafed a smidge, and frankly, penis chafing is just rotten especially when you start to sweat the next day while clearing houses filled with the undead. This shit stings. I'm hoping I have a dream of Cassie here shortly, so I can ask her if she minds if I try and get my dick wet. I feel weird wanting to find someone to sleep with after all that's happened, but I've got to get this tension out, and I desperately need to feel... I need to feel wanted again. Wanted in that way, if only for a little bit. Tomorrow we're clearing more houses yet again. I hope we find some decent shit, because the last couple of days have been less than stellar. Just lots and lots of houses that have already been picked over by people. We're meeting with Blake on Walt Street at noon on the 13th to touch base with him to see what's new in the land of ostracized strange young men. Hopefully he shows up alive for the meeting. I say alive because, let's be honest, there's a chance that he might still show up and not be alive, and that'd pretty much suck. Westfield is scheduled to visit us here on the 15th. I'm thinking I might talk to Mike about maybe having one or two more people come here to live. I don't know if that's too soon. It probably is. I definitely think I'll talk to Mike about whether or not he thinks I have a legit shot at hooking up with one of the girls over there. I can't recall too many faces, but... There has to be a girl over there willing to get with me. Once is really all I'm looking for, but a repeat offender wouldn't be turned away. I feel terrible for thinking about sex, but I know I need to find a way to move on. Perhaps frivolous sex is the key. I keep reminding myself of the dream I had where Cassie told me that someone else was out there for me. I wonder when it's okay for me to listen to her. Huh. As I've already said, I'm sick of trying to figure all this shit out. I'm off to bed before Otis chisels a hole in me. Peace out, Mr. J. Keep your powder dry. Adrian April 13th I think I found something yesterday that I never wanted to find. That's not accurate. I'm sure I found something yesterday that I didn't ever want to find— Saying that I think I found it is just me trying to trick myself into thinking that there's a chance that it wasn't what I actually saw. Acceptance of the truth is freedom. God, this is such a bummer. One huge whack to the crotch of hope. Assuming hope has a crotch, of course. If it does, then it just got a huge thump to the groin. 
Yesterday, we were out clearing more and more homes, as has been our usual day-to-day modus operandi. To be honest, the past couple days of house clearing have been pretty mundane. Our system has settled in, everyone now works well together, and overall, we're becoming a well-oiled machine. We've managed to find a few houses with really small supply scores, but the simple truth is that there isn't much of shit to salvage where we've been so far. To say that's a little discouraging is an understatement. If we don't find stuff, we seem to get a little depressed, which I guess is natural. It reminds me, once again, of kicking in doors in Baghdad. We'd get a frago in the middle of the night that some insurgent or weapons cache was at a house, and we'd roll on it. In goes the door, everyone gets zip-cuffed and bagged. Sometimes people would get shot— and I'd say 75% of the time we'd find a normal house with nothing of note in it. That shit got fucking old. One of the houses we hit yesterday was pretty well fortified up with a sturdy steel front door and decorative ironwork on the windows that doubled as burglary protection. The crime rate here was pretty fucking low, though, which made me wonder if the people living there were originally from the city or something. The city has had some pretty rough years for crime rates, like about four or five years ago when meth reared its ugly head for the first time. That was a bit of an ugly stretch for the local and state police. Anyway, my point is that the house hadn't been broken into post-apocalypse, and when we got inside, it was empty, save for a single undead housewife that Patty put down with a twenty-two round to the eye. One of the cleanest kills I've ever seen, to be frank— One little pop, and the woman went down in a heap, and we dragged her outside. I wish they were all that easy and clean. The house had a decent haul of food and consumables, but the real treasure was a small propane heater. Well, not that small. It's big enough to warm a building or area the size of a two-car garage. And Weirdly enough, that's where we found it. It'll be a great way for us to heat an area on campus, as well as good outlet for us to use up the propane we have on hand. I'm not sure how we'll do it, but there's a lot of it on just Auburn Lake Road. Figuring out useful ways to consume our various kinds of resources is going to be a really big deal as we move forward. We really need to make use of everything that we can. When we were leaving that street, I happened to notice something in a deep ditch that we hadn't seen when we were pulling in. This street had a large drainage ditch on the side at the bottom of a steep embankment. Far down in the bottom of that embankment, plowed straight into the concrete culvert at the bottom, was a car. Gilbert and I hopped out of the HRT, and I climbed down into the culvert with everyone else covering me. It was a small station wagon, a Subaru Legacy, actually. Inside was a baby seat in the back, with a half-eaten, undead young boy still belted into it. I shot him in the face as he reached out with tiny little fingers to get me. It's going to bother me for a very long time. A dead mom was in the front, head dashed to bits on the steering wheel. There were bags of groceries that looked familiar in the back seat. Baby food, water, all stuff from the old gas station near Alpa for sure. I think it's safe to say that this was the car from mid-October that I encountered at the gas station. The young mother who shot her husband with the little boy in the back. God damn, what a bitch it was to find that, and also to put around through that kid's little skull. I had to leave to ditch and take some space to get my fucking noggin back in one piece after that. Gavin went down in the ditch to clean the car out for us while I sat on the edge of the guardrail and let the king's men do their work in the old brain pan. Patty and Abby were both sweet about it after I told them the situation. Honestly, I felt pretty good about things within a few minutes. I think maybe once I knew they were dead, I was kind of relieved. I think all this time I've been harboring worry for their fate, wondering if they were safe or even alive. They must have been eating at me somehow. Once I saw their bodies, and I knew there was nothing I could do for them, I think I experienced relief. Yay? Not much else to say about that. Early this morning, after a fresh breakfast of egg omelets, we rolled out to clear more houses moving towards the industrial area of town. The houses are getting more congested, and that means more zombies, so our speed is diminishing pretty noticeably. 
Instead of clearing two houses at the same time with two people each, we're now clearing one house with three people and posting two guards to deal with anything approaching us. To relax ourselves a bit, we're going to rotate who's on watch with Gilbert. This morning, we had Patty take the break. At noon, we broke up to go meet Blake over near Walt's place. Ironically, we were reminded to go meet him when Gilbert called out of the radio that Blake had just driven by in his truck, headed towards Walt's road. Too funny. Gilbert and I peeled off from the group and left the others to finish up the house we were clearing. We'd put everything down that was moving, in terms of the undead, and Gavin posted watch while the women emptied the house. We felt safe leaving them alone. Blake was sitting on the hood of his truck just the same as the last time we saw him. He hopped off, shook our hands like a big boy, and we shot the shit for nearly twenty minutes about the town news, such as it is nowadays. We came into this meeting with Blake with no agenda. We hadn't asked him for anything, and he hadn't asked anything of us. Nevertheless, when Gilbert and I rolled out, we brought him three eggs, a can of green beans, and a random can of fruit cocktail. He was, once again, thrilled beyond belief. We wanted nothing in return for these things either. We just wanted to make sure he was eating, and we also wanted to show him we were good people. Blake has been busy. Apparently, our donation of the truck to him has inspired him to travel all over town and draw us some rudimentary maps of the areas we need to be careful of. He's got a good eye for detail, which Gilbert and I both highly appreciated. In addition to cruising around town, Blake has also identified several vehicles around town that he suggested we look into getting. Diesel is the way to go. We knew this. It lasts longer, and there's a lot more of it available to us than we really appreciated. I know I used to have the mindset that gasoline was far more prevalent, and I think that was mostly because 90% of the cars here ran on gasoline. When we go to the gas station, all but one or two of the pumps is gas, the remainder are diesel. I think I was programmed to think that gas was just around more or something. Wrong. Diesel is fucking everywhere. Almost every one of the houses we've cleared this month has oil furnaces, and home heating oil is diesel. If the tank is sealed, largely dry from water, and is cool, then the diesel inside is probably still good to go. Gasoline gets nasty and or goes inert much faster, plus there's just less of it around. Blake has found us five diesel trucks scattered across town and three diesel cars that he suggests we obtain so we can stop using gasoline-powered vehicles entirely. That'll allow us to keep our fuel fresh for the gas generators, ergo allowing us to keep them running longer so we have electricity longer. Speaking of that... Ollie and Melissa have been very frugal with their use of gas in the generator. They run it only when needed and use as little energy as possible. Ollie says we need to keep an eye out for rechargeable batteries so we can double dip on our energy use. Anyway, Blake also suggested yet again that we clear out and make safe the auto parts store so he can get working on fixing and repairing cars at Mike's garage. I'm all for that idea and I think we're going to table it for the group tomorrow night. Clearing the auto parts store should be a cinch, according to Blake. He says it's pretty clear in that area. Once he's in, then he can restock everything to the garage, as well as get books so he can be a more serviceable mechanic in the long run. Blake seems desperate to be useful. I don't know if it's because he's been so isolated and alone for so long, or if he's just a good kid. It's hard to tell. Back when the world was normal, and I worked with kids, you could always sniff out the ones that came from shitty families. They had a certain air about them. Maybe the kid was always picking fights, or always hiding from the public eye, or they were jumpy, or a slew of other little things. Bottom line for me is that I could always see kids from bad families. I get that same vibe off of him. I know he said his parents died when he was 17, I think, and that he lived with his uncle at some point, but I can't shake the feeling he's got that... Shit, I don't know how to say it, but that need to please because he was never good enough vibe. Maybe I'm way off track here on this, but I'd bet Gilbert's hairy gray ball sack that kid was either abused or abandoned or something along those lines. Blake said this, Hey, uh, you guys have more of the 303 you can trade me? 
I'm using it up moving around town, and if there's anything I can do for you guys to get it off of you, I'd, I'd be all over that. It'd be pretty sick if I could get some more thirty-eight too. Uh-huh. Gilbert and I later on both admitted to each other that's when we knew we had him hooked. Obviously, if this kid had mechanical skills, we want him working with us. We know we want him to get the garage up and running again, and to do that, we need to get everything out of the auto parts shop. We also want to scout that farm he told us about, and we need to clear houses. It's just too much shit to do, not enough time in the damn day. So we knew from before that we wanted to offload some of the work on him. We also knew we had bullets to spare, as well as parts for his end field, and that's not even scratching the surface of how much food we can offer this kid. You should have seen his eyes, Mr. Journal, when we handed him those three eggs. Gilbert and I suggested to him that he check out the farm for us. Strictly, and I mean under strict, no-bullshit, no-nonsense, impossible-to-fuck-up instructions, we told him to observe from a distance and report back to us. He was to do nothing unless we asked him to. Do not engage them under any circumstances. No shooting, no waving, no talking, no nothing. Just watching from a safe distance. Blake didn't even hesitate in saying yes. He felt pretty optimistic he could set up in a good hide with a good view of the area, and that he'd be more than willing to do it for days if necessary. With us in the HRT, we had another 20-round box of 303, as well as a tiny jar of instant coffee. We weren't sure if he was a coffee drinker, but we figured he'd be desperate to drink, well, anything other than water. We also threw in a small packet of Kool-Aid drink mix, which he just looked at with an amazed smile. His plan is that he'll set up in the morning, sneaking in before first light. He'll stay in his hide all day and exfil after the sun goes down. He swears it'll be easy for him, especially with the truck. He says there's an old logging road nearby that'll get him to a good spot for a short walk. We shook on it, and we parted ways. I think he'll do well for us on this project. If he does well, it'll tell us that he's a damn good scout and that he'll always have some kind of work. Let's not even start the discussion of him being able to fix cars. If he can swing that, the little bastard might as well be made out of gunpowder and spam. He'll be so damn valuable. We returned to our group, cleared one more house without incident, and came back here to campus to unload and organize and stuff. Ollie had managed to bag a rabbit with his twenty-two and had it skinned and was cooking it over the spit outside of Hall B when we returned. Melissa had some stuff in Hall B's kitchen to serve with it, and when we got everything settled in, we all went over there for a nice family dinner. I haven't had rabbit in a very long time, and to have fresh meat cooked over an open fire, it was just terrific. It was a great way to end a pretty damn good day, if I must say. Awesome rhyming skills arrived just on time. Go me, masturbatory high five. Um, not much else to say. Oh, we're meeting with Blake again on the 19th, and the Westfield folks will be here on the 15th, which I think I already mentioned at some point. We're going to search campus to see if we can find a decent camera to give Blake to take pictures when we see him next. We're kind of low on batteries, though, and most of the cell phones I've found here have shitty cameras, or I couldn't find the charger cords. If we can't find something decent here or somewhere else, we'll go without, I guess. Funny how all those damn smartphones have ruined our chances of finding a damn regular camera. Fucking technology. We're getting close to clearing a few small businesses in town, so with any luck, there will be a few neat things we can salvage out. I'm a little less than impressed about the whole lack of awesome shit problem we're experiencing, but I guess with evidence of other survivors out there, it should be expected. Can you imagine the cities, Mr. Journal? All those people packed in with all those zombies, all competing for the same real estate and food stores. Must have been a goddamn soup sandwich when things got thick. Oh, crap. Can you imagine how bad it might have been in one of the big apartment buildings when the toilets stopped working? Fucking ew. Zombies and poo everywhere. Charming thoughts to end our day with. I'm off to bed shortly. Tomorrow we're doing more of the friggin' same. Like I said, we're moving pretty slow now due to danger, so there will be a lot of boring-ass entries. 
I hope I can keep you entertained with my inner awesomeness, Mr. Journal. Adrian April 15th Yo, I need to use that as a greeting more often. I think it's highly underrated as a means to opening up dialogue. For example, the next time I see a zombie shuffling its dead ass down the street at me, I'll belt out a, yo, and then I'll shoot it. Can't say I wasn't fair in greeting at first. Feeling a little silly today. It's been a good couple of days, and everyone is in high spirits. We're all waiting for the inevitable shitstorm to come around. Mr. Journal, if you haven't figured it out by now, things are never that good for long. Technically, the last bad thing that happened to us was when I found that crash station wagon, and if I look at it in a certain light, that incident wasn't much of anything. I found some dead bodies. Big whoop. Lots to shoot the shit about today. Been busy as all hell. Uh, where to start? Well, the weather has been pretty awesome. A little cloudy and rainy here and there, but for the most part, it's been pretty warm. Temperatures have hovered in the 60s, and when the sun comes out, it's pretty fucking awesome outside. It almost makes risking our lives when we're out worth it. Yesterday, we cleared three houses, which was less than we normally manage. It seems like our sustainable rate of house clearing is about four houses a day. Three sucks, but then again, we ran into a lot of undead yesterday. Fortunately, they were spaced out physically as well as over time, and at no point did we get overrun or anything of that sort. With two of us pulling security, we were safe the entire day. The shitty part about yesterday was the usage of our 556 supply. I drew the long straw and hung out with Gilbert, and we poured through almost two magazines worth of 556 during the day. If we have ten more days like yesterday, we'll be at the oh shit we need to trade for more ammo point, and that's not good. I hate being low on ammo. I hate the thought of being low on ammo. I hate Neil Diamond, and that has nothing to do with my previously stated hatred for being low on ammo. I just felt like I needed to add a third thing I hated to make that sentence balance for you, Mr. Journal. Yesterday was a positive day for several reasons. Primarily, it was good because no one got hurt, and I think Gilbert and I counted out 85 kills over the course of the entire day. That's a lot of additional safety added to town. It was also awesome because we finally found a few houses with some decent shit inside. I won't go over every single item, but the main score was an industrial food dehydrator. This thing is the shit. It's electric, plugs into the wall like a toaster oven, but is the size of a regular oven. I think it has 20 racks to make dried food on. Think that'll come in handy when we bag our next deer? Can you say venison jerky for the win? I got a chubber just thinking about it. Note the capital C for extra emphasis on chubber. Adult strength chubbation sighting. Enough about my erection. Same place, oddly enough, also had a pretty sweet handgun. It was a Kimber 10 millimeter. Now, Kimber brand guns are fine weapons, and this 1911 clone is just that. I'm kind of pissed, though, that it was in 10 millimeter. We haven't found jack shit for 10 millimeter ammo up until yesterday, and despite being pretty terrific as a caliber, all we have is the ammo we found with it. Four boxes, totaling 80 rounds. I guess it was great, because in the gun case with the gun, the owner had two spare magazines. It's a great handgun. But with that small amount of ammo, I guess I'm bummed. I stashed it away for use at a later date. Oh, shit. Yeah, forgot. Uh, one thing that I've been doing since... October? December? Whenever I started clearing houses, basically, is stashing away fire extinguishers. I know they have a shelf life, and eventually they'll shit the bed, but with the lack of fire department response, I've been grabbing them when I see them. I guess it's on my mind because, for whatever reason, we brought back six the past few days from the houses we've been to. Thought that was kind of neat and weird at the same time. Anyway, last night we had another family dinner, and it was nice. We polished off some more of the venison cooked on a charcoal grill that was stashed here on campus. The charcoal took forever to light, but once it was all said and done, the meat was out of this world. Huzzah for warm weather. We're also already kind of low on venison. I think I need to spend some time wandering into the woods looking for more deer. 
I know they're out there. I just need to make time to bag one. I think Ollie could be tapped for that, but he's already working on clearing out crap on the field to get crops rolling. He's asked for help with getting the tractor out of the barn at the farm on Jones Road, so that needs to be addressed. Mike came to campus earlier today for another water run. Seems like forever since we sat down with those guys. For this trip, he brought LaFriends back, as well as Hector, complete with sweet ass, and a new face. Namely, he brought a middle-aged lady he introduced as Vicky Brown. Vicky was maybe fifty years old or so, with short gray hair and a fairly severe face. As it turns out, she is, was, a teacher. Apparently, she made the trip over here for the express purpose of checking out our library and seeing if we had any useful books. Abby gave her the nickel tour, and she wound up borrowing a few books none of us will miss if they don't get returned. I will never understand the allure of Moby Dick. Just like their last visit, we got the hoses running into the truck, and we chilled out for a few hours while it filled. We completed a trade that was pretty awesome, in my opinion. Lenny had been baking bread this week, I guess, and Mike brought over four fresh loaves of it. He also brought a fairly substantial amount of medical supplies, which was fucking rad. Trying to bring back the word rad as well here, Mr. Journal. I guess there was a small medical supply company over in Westfield that somehow had been overlooked by them. Mike said on a routine patrol they went inside and found a bunch of awesome stuff. He had crutches, canes, splint materials, casting materials— bandages, scalpels, forceps, additional medications, lotions, ointments, and all different kinds of surgical gear that would be great in the event of a medical emergency. He said there was a ton of it, and there was a lot to spare. Mike also traded us a chicken to eat, as well as two tires that will work as spares on the HRT should we get a flat. Like I said, that's pretty awesome shit. I guess he found the tires at a construction site over there, locked away in the back of a large truck or something. Don't know for sure, I'm just glad they were found, and traded to us. Now for all that, he wanted the water, a couple dozen cans of various foods, something to drink, which translated to a canister of iced tea mix, a 12-pack of soda, and a half-empty bottle of Bacardi, and two handguns, sans ammo. They needed the guns for starter shooters, so... We decided on 38 revolvers, of which we had two spare. They'll work out well for them, I believe. If not, they'll figure something out. We told them about our Blake encounter and his story of the farm. Mike threw his lot in with the Gilbert waited out plan. Mike was pretty cut and dried on the matter of making town safe. He basically said that if they could clear their town of undead, then we could get our town safe as well. Not much sense in dragging ass on it splitting the group up, or wasting resources investigating a farm that may or may not have anything sketchy happening at it. Once again, I am overruled, and I guess I should just sit in my pile of rejection and eat crow. I suppose I should take that as a sign that my initial reaction to investigate and or launch a full-scale attack immediately was a bad idea. Everyone else can't be crazy, right? Although I love me an ass whooping. I could really go for some ass whooping too. Killing zombies isn't satisfying like manhandling someone is. It's my sincere hope I get to punch someone in the face soon. I never got to punch Sean, and I think I'm harboring repressed physical violence over that. Oh, what else? I can't think of much regarding our trade, or the meeting, or whatever you want to call it. Oh yeah, me getting laid. (laughs) Speaking of repressed urges... As we were heading them out to go home, I pulled Mike aside and straight up told him what was going on. I basically said it had been a very, very long time since my you-know-what got stuck in a woman's you-know-what, and it was high time I addressed the issue. He laughed. I think he knows exactly what I'm talking about. I went on and explained how there was no one around here that I could hook up with, and I wanted to know if he knew someone over there that may or may not be interested in me that wasn't batshit crazy and might be decent looking. I'm not looking for marriage or babies or even a second time around. I don't even know what I'm looking for. Does that sound selfish? I think it does. Hey, female, I'm interested in fucking. 
Nothing you have to offer me other than your vagina is of issue or interest to me. In fact, if you could not talk or have any kind of emotional attachment to me, I'd be thrilled with that. Yeah, that's selfish. Jesus, I'm a dickhead. I'm now slightly regretting having asked Mike to help me get laid at the expense of his female populace. I guess the lemons into lemonade part of this story is that Mike said I'd have the pick of the litter over at the school where they're at. He said I was decent looking, cleaner than his guys, and as long as I wasn't a totally awkward asshole, I shouldn't have any trouble getting my dick wet. Of course, now I'm all nervous about it. What if she doesn't like me? What if she wants a commitment? What if I like her and she doesn't want a commitment? What if she has herpes or something worse? What if she wants to stick a finger in my ass unexpectedly? What if she's into German poop porn and she wants to take a dump on my chest? So much to worry about. Maybe I should just stick with beating my meat. I can't pussy out on this. I need to get some and deal with the consequences later. I'm sure it'll go fine, and I'm just being weird about it because I'm nervous. I'm sure I'll march into there like the pimp I am, and within no time I'll have three chicks all swinging for my dick like chimpanzees on an enormous banana. <laughs> Yeah, sure. I'm headed there on the 17th to begin phase one of Operation Snatch. Wish me luck. Adrian. April 17th. Westfield women are horny and nutty as squirrel turds. I can't think of any other way to say it. I mean, on one hand, they're horny. On the other hand... They're nutty as squirrel turds. Normally, I'd be all excited about finding a bunch of women just itching to get it on, but this isn't really a normal situation we're all living in. Well, I guess this is what passes for normal now. Might as well make do as best I can. That means I might get laid soon. Cassie, forgive me and my hormones. Love you, babe, but I need to get laid in the worst way. In fact... The closer I get to getting laid, the worse off I get about it. Have you ever been in a situation where you pretty much know you're going to get some, but there's like this disconnect of time or distance where you have to twiddle your thumbs and you just sit in anticipation until that prescribed time passes for it to happen? Like a long drive to the significant other. Or, for example, they're at work and you have to wait until their shift ends and, you know, you just fucking know that when the time is up or that distance is traveled, sensual, nasty, dirty, filthy sex is there for you. You know that waiting period, Mr. Journal? Oh, man, it is horrid in the best way. That anticipation is killer. Nice tangent, huh? I'm fucking hardcore loony for a vagina right now. I guess flirting will do that to you. So, anyway, stuff happened yesterday. It isn't as interesting to me as talking about women, so, Mr. Journal, you get squat. Suffice to say, no one was hurt, no one was died, and we managed to get the solar panels off of Crazy Walt's roof. Nothing more important than my quest for vagina occurred. Back to the subject at hand. Today was much more interesting to me than clearing houses on a personal level. I went to Westfield to hang out for the day under the false auspices of a social meeting with Mike and Lisa Goldman. I didn't feel like driving the plow all the way over there, so I borrowed Gavin's truck. I told all the folks on campus that Mike and I were talking about things, and he wanted me to go over, and he was going to show me some stuff at the school. Nothing serious, of course, just social things and whatnot. I also said we needed to set a firm date for their next visit. Apparently, I am a terrible liar. Abby gave me the, you're full of shit, I know it, and I'm judging you look the whole time I was spinning my yarn. Maybe it's because she's still young and she's in a sexual relationship herself at the moment. Well, I think it's sexual. If Gavin hasn't managed to hit that yet, he needs more help with his penis than we realize. Anyway, I skedaddled over to Westfield in what felt like record time, and I made it to the school with no problems. The zombie population between here and there has more or less disappeared. I guess hitting them with the plow over and over, going back and forth all winter, has actually paid dividends. I radioed Mike that I was en route when I was a mile or two out. 
There weren't any undead surrounding the car barriers at the school, so they let me ride in. I said hi to everyone as I went inside. Mike met me in the parking lot, and we went inside to sit down with Lisa for a bit. The school seems nicer and friendlier than when we first visited. I should say that. Everyone has a much more positive outlook, and it's palpable in the environment there now. Lisa herself seems a little weary of having the lead role, but she strikes me as a strong lady and I think she'll be fine. She might want to retire after her first year in office, though. However, I think her first term has served to bring a much-needed stability to their constituency. Constituency? That's a big word for me, huh? I deserve a fucking snack for that one. So, things in the school are good. Very good, actually. They have damn little to complain about, all things considered. They have two very, very pregnant ladies that are both about to pop. Megan is due in late May, and I think she's about 25, and she's kind of pretty. She's huge. Lisa said Megan's got just one baby on board, but judging by the size of her belly, I think that kid's coming out the size of a fourth grader. Poor woman. I get the impression her junk will be destroyed when she gives birth. The other prego chick is Jeanette. Jeanette looks about my age, maybe a little older, and she's due at any moment. She reminds me a lot of my little sister. Well, if my sister were a few years older. Pretty brown eyes and hair and a cute face. I guess Lisa is more excited for births than anything. I'd be shitting bullets having to give birth without a full medical staff in a hospital on hand, but I guess she'll make it work. After meeting them, Mike and I took the grand tour of the school— yet again. This tour, unlike the other one, was specifically designed by Mike so I could meet a bunch of the women, rather than see what the school offered in terms of defenses and survivability. Oh, he did show me how they're putting the water we're trading them to work. They've got the water truck parked right next to the building, and they've got a manual pump set up connected to fire hoses, and when they get the water back here, they pump it to a tank on the roof where it feeds downward into the water system of the building somehow. It's a lot of work, but it seems pretty slick from what I gleaned. Overall, the women of Westfield are decent-looking and pleasant enough. The older ladies are as you'd expect, some good-looking for their age, some not. The younger women are all fairly good-looking, one upside to the end of the world, dieting. Everyone is much thinner than we were before the dead stopped staying that way. The biggest person I've seen in some time was Melissa, and she's nowhere even near what I'd call fat, just curvy, I guess. My normal type for women would be the curvy ones, I guess. I like butts and boobs. I also like short chicks. Shit, I pretty much just described myself as Sir Mix-a-Lot, didn't I? God damn it, I do like a nice butt. I am unable to lie. I guess there's no denying it. There's some irony that Cassie was taller than I normally would be attracted to and thinner than I normally would like. I guess maybe I don't have a type. Maybe my type is whatever is currently available. Females, preferably. Males in a pinch. Don't judge me. I'm fucking desperate. Like, literally. I shouldn't be fussy. I've always said low standards makes for a more interesting sex life. Might not be top shelf ass, but there is something to be said for quantity. The more I talk, the more I realize that I'm probably a terrible person. I bet the devil has a lazy boy right next to some lava waiting for me. I arrived so that when we were done with our stupid little meeting, we'd have time to wander about, then go to lunch with the folks there. I chummed a bit with Hector and LaFriends, who I've gotten to know reasonably well through our little trade meetings, but after saying hi to them, I wandered over to a table filled with younger girls. And don't be a fucking perv, Mr. Journal. They're legal. I'm not that terrible a person. I think they were mostly mid-twenties. It may be one or two at my age. It's hard to tell now. These younger people are survivors, and they carry themselves like it. They're harder, wiser, more skeptical— and it's just harder to gauge their age. The end of the world is an accelerated maturation process, so it would seem. I ate lunch with them, and I'd say within maybe five minutes I was the most unpopular man there, amongst the other guys, I mean. Seething hatred was coming my way from the men. 
It actually got a little uncomfortable when a couple of the dudes came over to strike up conversation with the girls, basically to cock block me. They were pleasantly talking to the girls and staring at me the entire time, almost saying, fuck you, buddy, this is our harem. Or maybe I'm just reading too much into it. I played dumb and shot the shit with everyone, but Mike swept in like a cock-enabling superhero and got them whisked away to do something menial. Once lunch kind of ended, I chilled out at the table and three of the girls remained behind to talk. This is going to sound bad, but I can't remember two of their names. I know one of them was called Siobhan, and I can only remember her name because it's kind of a cool name. The other girls had fairly common names, and they were also nice, but in that forgettable, uncompelling way. I still wanted to have sex with at least one of them, though. Let me make that perfectly clear. Any port in a storm, Mr. Journal. So I sat with them for the better part of a half hour, and we shot the shit, flirted some, and if I'm not an entire moron, I'm pretty sure they were all doing the delicate jockeying of position to get my interest. I left them kind of high and dry, pun not really intended. I would have preferred to have them left high and wet, and wandered back towards Mike's office slash room to check in with him and see what he thought of the two girls. I was stopped in the hall by a powerful whack to the back of my head. Damn near sent me flat out on my face, and I spun as soon as I righted myself, expecting to defend myself from some jackass who felt I was encroaching on his territory. When I faced off with my attacker, it was fucking Mallory, the stylist chick who came to campus with Mike and Lisa back in... February? She had a shit-eating grin on her face, and I nearly smacked the snot out of her for jumping me like that. I gave her a rash of shit about hitting a man in the head that was carrying a gun, and she told me to hike up my skirt and drop a pair. What a dipshit. She told me I looked like hell, and it would be professionally unacceptable for her to allow me to leave the school today without giving me another haircut. It's hard to believe it's been, what, almost two months since my last trim? Time flies when you're killing undead on the regular, it seems. Mallory has a sweet classroom all to herself on the first floor that she's set up as a salon of sorts. Someone somehow got a stylist chair back to the school and placed in there, and she has a few mirrors set up. If you ignore the fact that she doesn't have one of those fancy sinks to wash your head in, it looks and feels pretty much just like a normal place to get your hair cut. She insisted I let her give me a haircut more fitting for me than the high and tight I got last time, and after she flicked my ear several times, I told her to do whatever it was she wanted. I was sick of her hitting me. Abusive chick, Mr. Journal. Sketchy. She gave me a mohawk. Mind you, my hair isn't that long anyway, so it's not like a Sid Vicious punk rock style two-foot-tall hawk. It's just a quasi-Mr. T on a white guy mohawk, and even that's a stretch. I've never had one before, and I gotta hand it to her. It was a cool idea. I can rock a mohawk. I thanked her, gave her a quick hug, and made my way over to Mike. It was nice to see her. I dig her. She's a hot shit. We sat down, and I asked him about the three chicks I talked to at lunch, and he said I'd be good to go with any of them. He said there were no claims on any of the three, which is one thing I wanted to make sure of, and I really didn't want to step on toes any more than I already did. It was bad enough I was already here and basically had the sanction of Mike to pick through the women to try and get laid. God, this is wretched. I feel like such a scumbag. However, Mike seemed to think it was a fairly minor deal in the big scope of things. He explained it all like this. Thirty-five survivors, and of them, just eight men. The odds of the remaining men getting some was pretty fucking good, and if I struck first, then good for me. Early bird gets the vagina. Oh. Mike and I made permanent plans for them to come visit us on the 25th, which was chosen because that's when he thought they'd be just about ready for water again. We went over basic supply needs, and I told him at the rate we were going, I'd need another crate of 5.56 millimeter soon. He said they had a fair amount left, and he'd bring one with him on the 25th. I got home just in time for dinner. Gilbert was absentee for chow, as he'd been spending the nights back at his house lately. I think he's sick of us, and plus, at his age, I can't help but think he needs relaxation time away from us youngins. 
We move obnoxiously quick compared to his plodding pace. I'm pleased to announce, as well, that everyone thought that I can indeed rock a mohawk. Abby and Gavin had made this kind of vegetarian lasagna cheese casserole mess. It was actually damn good. They took cans of that cheese soup, mixed it with canned carrots, green beans, peas, etc., and added in layers of lasagna noodles, making basically poor man's veggie lasagna. They baked it in the oven to give it a little crust, sprinkled some of the remaining breadcrumbs we have on it, and placed it in the middle of the table like it was a solemn offering to a collection of kings. I was skeptical at first, but it turned out good. Ollie and Melissa joined us in Hall E, and all was well. Ollie says he needs help tomorrow getting the tractor up and running, then moved here so he can start working the field. He's actually working on prepping the land right now to make it more fertile, so it'll take to growing food faster. He's assembled all the bags of fertilizer and potting soil type shit we have, and he's getting ready to mix it and spread it. He keeps bitching about the field grass and the soil. I don't know what the hell he's doing, but he talks an awful lot about it, and he seems to know his shit. He seems really fixated on the grass. I don't mean weed. He wants grass trimmings to use as compost or something. Gavin suggested we save our own poop as fertilizer, and not only is that gross, but it's kind of dangerous. Bacteria, parasites, etc. Ollie looked like he was going to smack the stupid off Gavin's face just for suggesting it. I know in third world countries they use human waste as a fertilizer, but oddly enough, in third world countries they have a real problem with intestinal worms, parasites, diseases, sickness, blah blah blah. Not risking it. So, tomorrow, we're helping Ollie get the tractor. Either Gilbert or I will do it, depending on how the OG feels in the morning. The rest of us are peeling off to head back down into town to clear more houses. No rest for the wicked, right? Speaking of being wicked, when I left Mike, I asked him if he could do me another solid and check in with the three girls I spoke with and ask if they were into me and make a good call and maybe bring one back here on the 25th, so... I could maybe institute phase two of Operation Snatch. Is it funny to you too, Mr. Journal, that all this shit is going down at a pair of high schools? Seems like we've stepped back in time a little. I'm excited for the 25th. One step closer to... sex. Speaking of sex, I'm gonna go have some with my hand. Adrian. April 18th. I found a letter in a house today. It was written on a piece of yellow legal paper sitting on the floor in front of a man who'd tied himself to a radiator. He was dead. Well, undead, actually. He fought at the ropes he'd managed to bind himself with as we walked inside the house. I killed him, saw the note, and took it. I thought it was worth copying here. I did the best I could, but there were bloody smudges all over it, and the handwriting was difficult in places. Amanda... I tried to last it out. I'm sorry, I failed. Your mother and father wouldn't leave the house here before we get illegible, rounded. And I told them we'd die if we stayed. I was right. Your dad ran out of insulin, and you know him. He just was illegible, ling to watch what he ate. I hate to say this about your dad, but he was a fat asshole right up to the end. He had one of his insulin reactions right after you left when we ran out of that shitty boxed macaroni and cheese he ate all the time. I swear your mu- Illegible. Was trying to kill him with that crap all these years. Ironic that a lack of it did him in. He went down in a heap in the kitchen, smashing that ancient department store piece of shit table to bits and pieces. Your mother screamed in hysterics until I tackled her and held her to the ground. I had to stuff a dish towel in her mouth to keep her cr- illegible. It didn't work. She kept cry illegible and making these sad noises, and within just a few minutes, those damn things were outside again, banging on the windows. She finally calmed down, and I apologized and let her up. There's a few sentences here where I couldn't make anything out. Smears of blood covered too much of the writing for me to make sense of it. She sat there next to your dad's beached whale carcass for an hour. I snuck off to the basement to get some time away and fire up a smoke. I ran back upstairs when I heard her scream. 
I hate to be the bearer of more and more bad news, but your dad killed your mother. When I got upstairs and back to the kitchen, he was pinning her to the floor with his massive girth, just as I had earlier, except I was trying to keep her quiet and he was eating one of her breasts. I wish I could say something wise and comforting. I'm sure when you read this, if you make it back here at all, you'll be crying yourself hysterical, just like your mom. I beat your father off her with a busted leg of the table. He kicked and scratched at me while I crushed his skull in. He was a tough man, Amanda, and I guess there's something to be said in him not going down without a fight. That's when your mom bit my leg. I guess I was so focused on making sure your dad couldn't hurt her anymore, I completely forgot to make sure she wasn't dead. I killed her with the table leg, too. I knew I'd die from the bite. I didn't know your dad would come back from dying, even though he wasn't bitten. I guess those movies didn't have it all right. There's another entire paragraph here that's nonsensical. I mean, it was entirely gibberish. He might have been drunk or on something. I don't have the guts to kill myself. Your dad's gun is too cold and impersonal in my hands, and it's the only thing here that I can kill myself with that will destroy my brain. I'm so scared of that last loud bang if I pull the trigger. Instead of blowing my own head off and collapsing to the floor for you to find, I've decided to make my last task one that will ensure I can't hurt anyone else, least of all you. After all, you might return from your sister's house eventually, and I hate to think that I might bite you and do to you what your mother did to me. As soon as I finish writing this, I'm sticking a ping-pong ball in my mouth and sealing it shut with some duct tape under the kitchen counter. I've also found some nylon rope, and I'm planning on tying my arms to the radiator in the living illegible. If you return, please kill me. Your father's gun is on the recliner a few feet from where I'm sitting. I don't think I can reach that far, so you should be safe. It would mean a lot to me if it were you who put me down. There's no one else in the world I'd rather have end my life, such as it is. I want to tell you that I love you immensely. Even though we've had hard times lately, you need to know that I've always loved you. I may have been a shitty husband at times, and... We treated each other poorly, too, and I can never say I'm sorry enough about my part in that. Through everything, you were an amazing mother to our children, and I hope they're safe at your sister's. Give them my love until you can't give it any more. I love you. Me. There's a bloody thumbprint right next to where he wrote me. His wallet was on the floor just beyond his legs, propped open to a picture of his family. He and his wife, Amanda, had two kids. Heavy shit. Adrian. April 19th. Am I the law? Are we the authority here now? I suppose we are a jury, but are we the judge and executioner as well? This is a question that we discussed today. We don't have an answer yet. The only thing that we did agree on was that campus was ours and we had every right to make sure that we were safe here and that anyone here was either a guest or a trespasser. Guests get greeted, trespassers get warned, and if that fails, they get shot. Twice, if necessary. But what about when we're out clearing houses in town or if we're patrolling to thin the herds of the undead? Should the morals and rules we have established for ourselves be the law and order for the whole town now? Who will challenge us? Why did these questions come up today? Well, we met Blake again earlier, and he had some intriguing news that did more to disturb us than encourage us. I'll cut to the short of it. Blake said some cars came into town yesterday and this morning. Not many. He said he saw two yesterday and two more today. He recognized a couple of the cars from last summer when everyone left for the north. He said they were locals. Based on what he said, that means people are coming home. Fuck. I'm not going to lie, and I'm not going to act like this doesn't completely fucking horrify me. This is so bad for us on every level. In fact, 
I can't think of a single realistic scenario where this is good for us. The only one that comes to mind that could be good for me is if an entire busload of busty whorish models pulls into town with a convoy of tractor trailers filled with food and sex lube. Seems like a stretch for that. I'm holding out hope, but I'm not holding my breath. Fuck me. This blows big time. More living movers in town means more competition for the remaining resources. More vehicles means more drain on gas supplies as well as home heating oil and remaining diesel. More people means more loose guns in town, and I'd bet dollars to donuts whoever these people are, they don't have adequate heads on their shoulders to be wandering in my town armed. At the same time, it's fucking insanity to expect people to survive now without being armed. I can't even imagine going across campus without a handgun at the very least on me. It's silly to expect someone else not to do the same, the right to bear arms and all. This changes everything. Everything. We need to move through town so much more carefully now. I'm glad we got a spare vest at Walt's place, because we desperately need it. We had one good vest from the original Westfield assault, one bad one from then as well, and two more from Mike, plus Gavin had his own. Gavin's also the other person here with a ballistic-rated helmet. I'm wondering where the ballistics helmets went from the police station. I bet they were incinerated when Stig ate shit. Motherfucker. So that's a grand total of four and a half vests for Gilbert, Abby, Patty, Gavin, and me. I'm operating under the assumption that Melissa isn't moving anywhere off campus unless entirely fucking necessary— and there's no sense in leaving her behind alone, so that means Ollie is here with her 24-7. Do the math on that, Mr. Journal. We're a vest short. That means I'm headed to Westfield to twist Mike's arm to try and get another IOTV off him, so we're all vested up. Of course, I go into this talk about vests, but the simple fact of the matter is a high-powered hunting rifle will penetrate a vest. Luckily, we have ballistics plates for the IOTVs, but the simple fact is we got shit all to protect us against headshots or high-powered rifles shot at close proximity. God damn. I'm as nervous as an epileptic in a disco, fixing to have a seizure here. We talked about this for hours tonight. It dominated the discussion while we were making dinner, eating dinner, digesting dinner, and figuring out what the fuck we're doing tomorrow. I'm shocked by the fact that after all our discussion regarding it and all our different personalities, we pretty much came to the same conclusions. Town is not ours. Sadly, might makes right, and we are not strong enough to enforce our will, whether or not it is needed or appropriate and justified. If someone attacks us or presents a clear and present danger to us, then we should do the thing that is best for us. That means, if necessary, we kill other people to protect our people. Gotta take care of our own. As for resources, that's a whole different can of worms. Do we simply assume that if we get to it first, it's ours to keep? Seems fair, right? But morally... Should we share the things we find with any survivors we come across? I mean, survival of humanity as a species needs to be some kind of priority, right? Or do we sit back, make ourselves as safe and comfortable as possible, and then worry about rescuing others in a year, two years, or what? Furthermore, where the fuck is the government? You'd think by now things would have started to get rebuilt. National Guard troops moving through communities, planes and helicopters flying overhead looking for survivors, or maybe the fucking radio stations would be working again. Something should be happening, and it isn't. None of that has happened. I don't know why. I suspect it has a lot to do with the lack of power and food. Never mind the fuel issue. If the military shared any of its fuel stores, then they'll be running on E soon enough. Probably already are. How long could their planes fly before they ran out of fuel? I highly doubt the refineries are still running. Maybe this is much worse than I realize. Maybe this is it. Maybe this is all I've got to work with for the rest of my life. 
Maybe this isn't a survive-until-it-passes-over situation, and more of a survive-as-long-as-you-can-because-this-is-it, Adrian. This is a giant bag of douche, enormous and vinegary. So, obviously this new information changes plans slightly. It pushes some things forward and pushes some things back. I suck balls at organizing life. I want to point that out. I don't want you to get this false impression that I'm a good leader or anything. Fuck that noise. I figure this shit out as I go the best I can. (laughs) My head hurts. Runny nose or headaches is pretty much the norm right now. Abby was nice enough to point out to me all these new gray hairs I have earlier. Cute kid. She points them out again, I might put icy hot in her underwear. (laughs) That actually cheered me up considerably. Just the thought of the expression on her face as she ran around the hall here, holding onto her crotch trying to figure out if Gavin gave her the clap or not would be worth the inevitable beating I'd suffer. Definitely need to source a helmet and a cup before I pull that stunt. All right, so a fucking agenda. We desperately need to figure out how and when we are going to get this shit all done and done in a fast enough manner. Safety is important, mind you. Too fast and we get hurt. Too slow and we get hurt. Sweet deal, huh? The whole rock in a hard place. Ollie needs more supplies for a fence for the crops and the campus security. We have no local lumber yards or Home Depot or Lowe's, so we need to look specifically for supplies of lumber that might be at construction sites or contracting businesses or things of the like. Pressure treated or GTFO, too. Ollie suggested we shamble our dumb asses to any building with a chain link fence around it and straight up rip the fucking stuff right out of the ground. He assures us it might be easier to do that than find enough homogenous lumber to build a fence. Ollie's got the tractor here now due to Gilbert's assistance, and he's working the field into a plantable surface, but he says there's little sense in planting anything significant until we can fence it off to protect against skunks, raccoons, etc. He says they're around, he's seen them, they'll dig the shit up and eat it. I guess it's cool that he's seeing them, though. I haven't seen those kind of animals anywhere since June, and I was worried they were all dead. We need to establish a safe house in the area near downtown that we've cleared, preferably one right near the road so it's visible to folks in vehicles. That might be a fast, easy fix. I think we can get it set up in maybe half a day, less if we have our shit together. We need to clear houses and gather food and supplies. I've got a bad, bad feeling that this summer is going to fly by, and the last thing I need, read, we need, is to have us not make it through this coming winter because we didn't gather up the food that's friggin' sitting all over the place ripe for the taking. I've got to get in touch with Mike and get some IOTVs off him pronto. I'm betting he's got a few spares stashed away in the basement of that school over there, and I hope he won't bend me over and do me dry for them. I guess I could pull an asshole move and tell him no water, but that seems prickish. I guess we'll see how he reacts. I'm seriously debating trading him something for labor. Any labor will work. I just need more hands to put to work to get what needs to be done, done. I need to insert my penis into a woman. Any orifice will suffice. Any woman will suffice. God, my standards have plummeted. My brothers would string me up, even the gay one. We must fortify campus. The sooner the better. At the very least, we desperately need to make it hard for someone to drive up to campus. In some respects, being at the end of a dead-end country road is good. It's heavily forested, very hilly, and we've got the water more or less cutting off avenues of ground, foot approach, so the road is an excellent choke point. I think our current plan is to take a page from Romero's book and jack a semi to park across the road at the Jones Road turn. We can back the truck up Jones Road when we come and go easily. Prospect Circle, where Gilbert's home is, is on this side of Jones Road as well, so his house will fall inside that gate. We need to keep Blake's eyes on that farm. His report today on the farm was that he saw more adults working outside there, but none of the kids he mentioned before. He says they're prepping the farmland inside their fence for planting, 
Judging by the description, they've got an area maybe six to eight acres in size inside the fence, and then maybe as much as 50 or 60 acres outside. Not sure how much food that'll make, but it sounds like a lot. Speaking of Blake, we need to hit that fucking auto parts store to get him geared up so he can reopen Mike's automotive. If we can manage that, then we can get him up to snuff on diesel work, and before you know it, we might actually be able to fix a fucking vehicle when one breaks. We told him we'd meet him at Mike's Auto on the 23rd for our next update. If that meeting goes well, I think we're going to get him a walkie so he can contact us in an emergency. Of course, now I'm scared that the people at that fucking farm might have walkies too, and they'll hear everything. Maybe we need to start rotating frequencies for communication security. SOP. Tactically, we need to up our game when we're out. I guess shame on us for not being as attentive all along, but frankly, we can only pay so much attention for so long before our brains either go on autopilot or we need a break. From now on, we are making more noise as we move, periodically honking our horns so folks know we're moving and we're not dangerous. I'd hate to roll up on some paranoid guy new to the neighborhood and have him open up on us. Fuck clearing houses. Gilbert says he'll go without a vest for the meantime. That does make some sense, because most of the time he's prone on the roof of the HRT, and in the event we do take hostile fire, he'll draw a lot less fire than the rest of us moving around. Insert jinx joke here. Fuck me. I've also got to train the girls on basic squad-level tactics. Suppressing fire, Australian peels, blah blah blah. They've never had to think about what to do when someone's shooting at them. I'm pushing so much shit right now, my toe is caught in the drain. Fuck that, I'm up to my knee in pushed shit. This is the moment when something will go wrong. I can feel it. I'm going to make a mistake soon or overlook some important detail, and someone's going to pay the price. It's sure as shit, you mark my words, Mr. Journal. Tomorrow, we're driving directly to the industrial complex where Stig was, and we're finding a semi and bringing it back here. That'll address the road issue and add some security to the campus. If we have time, we're going to try and rip up chain link fencing where we see it so Ollie and who the fuck ever has free time can get it into the ground up here so we can have some kind of overland security that doesn't involve us just crossing our fingers and praying to the god of ironic ass rape to not cornhole us with a sneaky butthole assault in the meantime. <sighs> After that, I'll find a hole somewhere in the schedule to head over to Stig to get an IOTV off Mike. I think I'll also try and get another crate of ammo while I'm there, and also, while I'm feeling like a hopeless schmuck, I'll ask him if he has any spare hands he can send our way to help get this shit done. See how far I can stretch his goodwill. If I get laid, too, awesome. Frankly, I've got bigger fish to fry right now. We are now in fortify campus mode. With folks moving around town that actually have functioning brains inside their skulls, we need to be cognizant that we don't draw them back up to campus, and if we do, we need to make sure we can keep what we've claimed. Oh yeah, yesterday we hit some houses, cleaned them out, and did okay for loot. Main thing of note is we hit the HVAC place and Yarn Heaven by Doris, or whatever it's called. The HVAC place had furnace filters, cleaning supplies, maintenance instructions, tools, parts, and a bunch of ducting and related crap. All in all, awesome stuff for the future. Yarn Heaven was a score because we can use the stuff there to make hats, mittens, sweaters, etc. Doesn't sound like much, but in case you missed the memo, Mr. Journal, the mall is closed. I'm a little messed up over that letter I found yesterday, too. The face of the wife in that picture looked familiar to me, but I can't quite place her face. I'm sure I saw her downtown somewhere, somehow, before all this shit happened. I felt flippant about all this getting laid talk lately. Every house has a story. Every empty home is the carcass of a life, the bloated corpse of a rancid family, the end of someone's entire livelihood, and we pick over it like human vultures. I can't forget that we are treading on the graves of neighbors and friends here. I know I joke and jest about how awesome the loot was here, or how we put down ten zombies today and whatnot, but we, I at least, 
can't forget that we're stealing from the dead. Finding that letter the other day left me feeling sad and not just a little filthy over what we're doing to survive now. This is all going to get ugly soon. I can feel it in my bones. Adrian. April 21st. I feel like my whole world has been squeezed inside a tiny snow globe and then strapped on the back of one of those mechanical bulls you find in shady or awesome, depending on your personal tastes, bars. My life is shaken, not stirred, and there's shit flying everywhere that I really feel like I can't do anything about. I feel like I'm spread thin, like too little butter on toast, some very famous person said. I can't do everything that needs to be done fast enough. Gilbert told me today I need to let it all go and just do what I can and only worry about what I can actually control. He's right, and I do need to do that and start that damn soon. Abby pointed out a new gray hair on my head this morning, and I glared at her. I've got some icy hot set aside with her name on it. I just need to find a cup to protect my balls, and that bitch will learn not to pick on my gray hair issues. <laughs> All right. Where to begin on this one? We're busy, really, really fucking busy. However, things are going well which tells me we're about to get bent, sans lube, or reach around. Nothing bad happened to us the past two days, which I guess constitutes what passes for a miracle nowadays. No one was hurt, no one was shot, nothing of note was broken, and my headaches and runny nose have improved to the point that I'm not miserable and bitching about it nonstop. My cohorts have approved of my lightened complaining regimen, I told them to fuck themselves, and they all approved of that idea. We are such a demented bunch. We actually followed through on a plan the past two days with minimal resistance. Fuck, I can't say that. There was pretty harsh resistance both days, but we managed it. It's almost to the point where the only noteworthy fighting is when someone gets hurt or almost dies. Sad, but true. Anyway, yesterday we hit Stig again, spent the entire day at the industrial complex, and came away with goodies. There are perhaps half a dozen buildings in the complex, along with the wreckage of the Stig facility. Three of them are the equivalent of strip malls, only for offices and light manufacturing businesses. The remainder is warehouses or distribution facilities, with one being a larger manufacturing place. They actually make cardboard boxes, which might be of use down the line. We can burn them, use them as boxes, or we can find some form of application for them, I'm sure. They had a very full inventory on their warehouse racks. So we essentially needed to leave that complex with one semi-truck. That was it. That was all we needed. We took some measurements of Auburn Lake Road and decided that a trailer of 48 feet would be more than enough to serve as an adequate front gate. As it happens, 53 feet is the standard trailer length nowadays. I guess even after the apocalypse, you learn something new every day. The industrial complex was crawling with the undead again. Hardcore. I don't know why, either. The only thing we could divine was that survivors new to the area had visited the complex and somehow let a fucking boatload of them into the area and then figured out how to leave them there afterwards. And that doesn't make a ton of sense, either. I've said this before, but weirdness abounds. Like a fucking pro, we didn't bring the plow truck either, so we had to make do with what we brought. We had the HRT, as well as Gavin's truck, and the Tundra. The Tundra is pretty well fucking beat up now, so I switched out with Patty and went Grand Theft Auto on the parking lots as best I could. Doing it that way is effective, but, I mean, this is wretched shit, Mr. Journal. The sound of running over dead people is enough to put a fucking kink in your spine. When the fucking truck's front tires crush the rib cage of a dead body, you can feel it in the steering wheel and you know it's happening. <laughs> Not to mention the smell over there was something else. The bodies from when we'd cleared the place before were now rotting in massive piles on the fringes of the parking lots where I'd plowed them. Fuck, it was awful. So bad, in fact, we had to tie moist rags on our faces when we were outside to keep from yakking up breakfast. 
It smelled just fucking bad. Bad badness. Once I'd demolished as many of the walking dead in the parking lots and streets of the complex with the tundra, we all opened up and dropped those that were still foot mobile at range with the 22s. Honestly, it made me really uncomfortable to make that much noise, considering there were people moving back into the area, but we had no choice. We were too thick to kill manually until the movers were downed. After maybe, I don't know, a hundred rounds amongst all of us, the crowd was thinned out to the point where we could go in and put them down by hand with halligans and bats. I tell you what, Mr. Journal, it's a lot safer to smash the skulls of the dead when they're more or less prone on the ground, but it gives me a fair amount of confidence when we're wearing Abby's shin guards. We've had enough close scrapes with undead biting at our heels doing this shit that we won't go anywhere anymore without the guards on. In fact, it seems stupid to us now to even go off campus without wearing them. As an aside, the last time we had to smash this many nuts near there, you might recall that both Patty and Abby went off the deep end as a result. This time, they were on point and were fucking champions. Honestly, I really think having Gavin there had a lot to do with that. He's a really good guy, and I mean that. He keeps one eye on the zombie in front of him and the other on Abby, making sure she's safe. I think he'd jump on a pike for that girl. We knocked out everything moving, everything lying down, and few things halfway in between. Once we felt like we had some real estate to work in for a buffer zone, we went into the warehouse to take care of business. The warehouse we cleared yesterday was the cardboard box factory I already mentioned. We didn't want to waste time clearing the other places, and plus, none of them seemed like they'd be primo loot territory anyway. Mainly, we were attracted to that building because they had two trucks parked right at the docks in the back. So, yeah... Creepy. I mean, capital C, creepy. I haven't been this unnerved since our first visit to the police station. The interior of the offices in the box factory was pitch black. Not many windows to speak of, and obviously the juice there was long since gone. Small streams of faint skylights slipped through cracks in doors and under the jams here and there, but for the most part it was dark as a mausoleum inside. I cleared the building with Gavin, both of us holding flashlights in our off hands and our M4s in the other. I really wish we had foregrip lights on our M4s, but there aren't any handy. We almost went in with just handguns, but I thought the added firepower might be necessary. Turned out to be irrelevant. The entire factory was empty. Well, empty of the living and the dead. It had plenty of shit worth stealing, though. <clears throat> uh, acquiring. Stealing sounds so harsh. Lots of tools. They also had some drywall and interior finish quality lumber, and from the looks of it, they were building some offices inside and didn't get to finish the project. Yay for that, I suppose. Paint, a little bit of cleaning supplies, a small amount of toilet paper and paper towels, multiple huge-ass water jugs, as well as a couple of those neat water cooler dispensers, which might come in handy at some point. We also found industrial cleaners, grease, filters, a small lathe, just a mess of shit that was or could be useful. They had vending machines in their break room, but they were smashed open and stripped clean. I suppose Brian's people raided the shit out of these area businesses some time ago. Honestly, I'm astonished to find anything left over in here. Maybe he decided to leave it where it sat, figuring he could come back any time he wanted. Sad. Oh, and pallets. Lots and lots and lots of pallets. We wound up filling an entire trailer just with pallets. Pallet wood makes for great firewood, but I'm wondering if we can't ramshackle something together using them as raw materials. At the very least, we can use them as some kind of building material. They also had a forklift, but it was set up with the hard small wheels that won't run for shit outside didn't make much sense to steal a forklift that we couldn't drive outside with. The only places on campus that would be large enough to use it in would be the gym or cafeteria, and there's no need for that unless we bring racking back for storage. And maybe that's a whole other good idea. Not to mention, how the hell would we get it back to campus? Put it in the trailer, get it back to campus, and what? How do we get it out of the fucking trailer and onto the ground? Can you picture that going down? Me getting into the forklift and driving it off the back end of the damn truck. 
Ye smash. Both forks implanted into the middle of the road on campus. Then it tumbles ass over Bambox and I get smushed underneath it. If we need a forklift that bad, we'll find one somewhere else. We found the truck keys and a key storage thingy on the wall of an office. Both trucks, too. I'm going to mix this up and say I feel Warren Buffett rich for that find. One truck and I'll revert back to Oprah rich. Two trucks means the big leagues and Mr. Buffett. As I said, we filled one entirely with pallets and the other we put all our loot from the warehouse in. It wasn't a massive haul, I suppose, but we were stoked nonetheless. As far as driving the damn things are concerned, I've got a smidge of experience with the big rigs, and so does Gavin. So the two of us drove them. The other vehicles were piloted by Gilbert and Abby. Now, we knew in our heart of hearts that we needed to get chain-link fencing, so when we pulled the trucks away from the docks, we decided that we would rip out all the fencing in the park while we were there. Mr. Journal... There was a lot of chain-link fence around that place. We were dead as doornails when we finished last night as a result. We got perhaps a tenth of the fencing there, too. Pro tip number one. Winching a chain-link fence post out of the ground with the HRT is a big old bucket of fail. Pretty much just bends the fucking pole right over like a pipe cleaner or a steel bendy straw. Lost two poles in said manner before abandoning that as a removal strategy. Pro tip number two. Shoveling out the fence post manually takes four fucking ever and is a giant waste of time and is thus a similarly sized bucket of fail. Pro tip number three. Shoveling out one side of the fence post, then winching it carefully in that direction results in the clean removal of said fence post. Pro tip number four. At the bottom of every fence post removed in this manner, there is an enormous blob of concrete shaped like a wedge that the post was stuck in. Said blob of concrete is very heavy and remarkably unwieldy. Pro tip number five, hydrate. That's just good advice. In fact, this whole process sucks so much fucking ass, I went inside the warehouse and grabbed a phone book to see if there were any fencing companies anywhere that we could just pick the shit up from and skip this whole affair. Sadly, there are not any nearby. Weirdly enough, there are several companies that offer fences or fencing supplies in the city, and I'd rather have sex with a garbage disposal than go into that fucking city. More on that later, Mr. Journal. Not the having sex with a garbage disposal part. Fucking weirdo. So... Once we figured out that was how we could get them out reasonably fast, we went to work with the Halligans, a pickaxe from the HRT, and a couple of shovels we brought just for the occasion. Gilbert plopped his ass on the roof of the truck, and we yanked out about 25 of the fence posts and something along the lines of 250 feet of fencing. It'll be a hardcore bitch to install it in the next few days or weeks, but it needs to be done. When we returned to campus, we parked the truck filled with pallets in the road, creating our official Auburn Lake roadblock. The way the road is set up, there's no way around the truck in a vehicle or any way to get in front of it or behind it to tow it out of the way. Someone would have to cut down trees, fill a culvert, etc., etc. The point is, it ain't happening without a shitload of work and us hearing it. Obviously, we took the keys out, too. Hopefully that'll cut down on the chances of anyone driving right up here and straight to the bridge. Incidentally, we are still leaving one van parked on the bridge as a secondary roadblock. Defenses need to be layered. These might be paper thin, but we're working on it. We told Ollie we checked the phone book, and he suggested we hit up the garden supply store in town. The same one I got the seeds from that day. He said those businesses almost always have raw materials somewhere to build fences. After all, what sense is it planting a garden if the animals can get to it at night? Sage advice, Ollie. You're worth your weight in green beans, or bullets, and that's really valuable. We slept very, very well last night. Today's op was of a different nature. Remember that unfinished development I saw back when I scouted this side of town? The one with all the bricks under tarps and concrete blocks and cement mix and stuff? We returned there bright and early with a reduced crew size. Gilbert said he was tired last night and needed a break, so he took today off. 
I can't blame him. It's silly of us to expect a guy his age to keep up with our pace. Patty also asked to bow out due to requiring a mental health day. She said that she wanted to spend some time with Melissa, and that's a great idea. I think we should all spend some time with Ollie and Melissa as we move forward. And the fuck we'll find that time is someone else's guess, because I'm a little short of spare time lately. Bright and motherfucking early, we rolled out once more. I guess the early wake-up wasn't that harsh, because we all pretty much ate pillow right after chow. Nothing puts you to sleep like physical and mental exhaustion. I'm happy to report no weird dreams, either. The construction site is, was, in an area we haven't reached yet in terms of clearing the area. It's about a quarter mile out from where we've been so far, so it stands to reason that the undead presence there would be slightly reduced. After all, we're making noise as we clear, and as we've learned, noise draws them in. I think there might have been a grand total of a dozen undead over the course of the morning and early afternoon to contend with, and Abby was Johnny on the spot dealing with them as Gavin and I loaded everything into the back of the trucks. Oh, that reminds me. The damn tundra was sputtering, kind of like when Gilbert's old Chevy died. I think it might have something to do with specific fuel we're using. I'm thinking on it. So, there were two whole pallets stacked waist-high filled with bricks. There was a third pallet filled with cement blocks as well. We loaded those onto two trucks brick by fucking brick, as well as twelve bags of cement mix. Downside of the apocalypse, physical labor is a motherfucker. Upside of the apocalypse, by the end of summer, we will all be jacked up like a home-run hitter from the steroid era. Strong like bull. We also hitched up a small, portable, gas-powered generator, which is great, because the key to it was still in it, and that means as long as we can keep it running, we have electricity on the go. There was also a fair amount of pressure-treated lumber, as well as some waist-high chain-link fencing, but we left that behind after throwing a tarp on the lumber. It looked surprisingly good on inspection, and I think it'll be usable for us somewhere on campus. We returned back here, trucks bottoming out the entire way, enlisted the labor force that had remained behind to unload the trucks, and made the no-huddle offense call to go to the garden center. Gilbert wasn't around to call us idiots, and Gavin and Abby were 100% with the idea, so we grabbed a decent late lunch and headed out to cross town. I'll be the first person to raise my hand from the corner of the room while wearing the dunce cap and say this was not my best idea. Last-second plans like these are never, ever bright, and really should only be attempted under dire circumstances— This was a, hey, we have time and we should get something cool done situation, which is not particularly dire. The trip across town in the trucks was eerily quiet. I had fully expected to see a lot of undead milling about, but in actuality, there were very few. Unnerving. With all our noise, it made all the sense in the world that they would be moving across town towards our general direction, but I guess that's not the case. To me, that means there's something else making noise or drawing their attention. More on that later. The garden center is set back in a decent-sized parking lot. Right next to the land the garden center is on, there's a small strip mall with a Chinese restaurant, awesome dumplings, and a few small businesses. There's a check cashing place, a thrift store, etc. We should think about hitting the restaurant soon. I wonder if there are cooking supplies left in there. Or cats kitty on stick. I'd guess and say the building is perhaps the size of a gymnasium with some extra fat on the sides. It's big, but not like Kmart or Walmart big. It's a small town garden center. On one side of the place is an outdoor lawn center type dealio where they stored the trees and shrubs and shit they sold. Some of those were still behind. I guess stealing plants that don't produce food just wasn't a high priority for anyone. I know, weird, right? I was just thinking campus needed a few hedges, because hedges are awesome. Sadly, a hedge might be some serious anti-zombie technology. If it was a good thick hedge, they'd eat shit trying to walk over it, then spend a retarded amount of time trying to right themselves with their asses hung up in the air. File hedges under to be considered. Anyway, the parking lot of the place had an unreasonably large amount of undead in it, which was troubling. 
It definitely led us all to think that there was some kind of reason for them to be there, and we were correct. About a third of the undead were at the double glass doors, banging away, trying to get inside. To prevent us from shattering the doors, we parked the trucks at the end of the building on the corner and started shooting across the front of the place. On the outside chance there were survivors inside, we really wanted to protect the doors. As soon as we started unloading at them, the entire crowd wheeled on us and surged. It was, without a doubt, a pants-wrecking moment. It was almost like they were in unison, hive-mind-thinking-esque or something. Creepy, once again. Recurring theme lately. At one point, they were getting so close, Gavin and I went cyclic at head level to buy us time to load into the trucks and back away out into the road. Bodies were piling up as we backed away, And once we got out into the road, we noticed that there were a few dozen more approaching down the street from both sides. I called for an ammo count, and once we all confirmed that we still had a good amount, we opened up again. Sweaty balls, Mr. Journal, sweaty balls. Sphincter tightening, to say the least. Abby and Gavin are both nearly deaf tonight, and the only reason why I'm not saying I'm nearly deaf tonight is because I was already nearly deaf going into today. Daily fucking gunfire with no hearing protection will be the death of our eardrums. I know, I know, I never stop bitching. We got inside the garden center by smashing out the glass doors that we tried so hard not to shoot. Oh, the irony. Someone had locked the double doors and all the exterior entrances were zipped up tight. Inside, right at the same counter where the young girl barely paid attention to me that day, was a man with a huge bite mark on his arm and an obliterated head. There was a double-barrel scattergun on the floor between his feet. Do the math on what happened there. The blood was still slick and gooey, which meant he'd died damned recently. Not sure on the coagulation rate of human blood, but he couldn't have been dead for more than a day or two at most. Gavin watched the front door and took out the slow stream of stragglers that were headed into our AO. He called them out over the radio as they approached, then smashed in their heads with the halligan. Luckily, once we'd dealt with that fat rush of the dead, the crowd never got overwhelming again. We only had to stop to assist him once, and that was a piece of cake. Maybe eight of them roaming towards us in a small pack. Shoot a few to thin them out smash the rest of the heads once it's safer. It's all about managing threat density with these assholes. I'll make an already ridiculously long story short. The garden center did indeed have fencing materials. They had a dozen or so rolls of waist-high chain link and the uprights to match. They had fertilizer still, as well as potting soil, more seeds, pots, bird feeders, which Ollie requested oddly enough, and blah blah blah. They also had more bricks, patio stones, concrete blocks, and farming-oriented tools, which we actually didn't grab, as there's a small farm nearby and Ollie hadn't mentioned needing anything tool-oriented. With any luck, we won't have to return here. We took all of what I've already mentioned, and then some. Both truck beds were full to the top, and we actually had to use a rope to get it secured for the trip home. Good thing, too, because we had to evade a rather large-scale increase of the zombie population on the roads heading back, too. I think the noise that had attracted them away had abated, and our much more interesting noise had lured them in our general direction. Noise is like zombie pong, zombie in the middle, or maybe even keep away, but we're living bait. I hope Lake is okay. When we were coming back through town, I caught the smell of fresh wood smoke, which I haven't smelled in a very long time in that area. Someone is staying warm with a fire, or their house is burning down. Either way, it strikes me as signs of life where there were none recently. Oh, and I also realized while we were loading shit at the garden center that dumpsters might be great barricades or obstacles. One in the middle of a road would do wonders to stop traffic. If we can find a trash truck to pick them up, we could totally line them up to create some serious barrier action. I'll add that to my list of shit to do, right after I scratch my balls. I am dead, just flat out exhausted. I just inhaled half a dozen ibuprofen and an allergy pill. 
my poor fucking liver. Drifting off into the sweet realm of sleep as Otis circled my feet, waiting for me to get finalized on my sleeping position. I'm putting some soft music on to rest to as well. I think tonight I'll opt for some Frank Sinatra. Old blue eyes can lull me to sleep. Peace out, Mr. Journal. Adrian The Golden Palace Yo, bitch, get in the car! Zack hollered out the window of the SUV as he turned down the stereo. The thumping bass beat of Kanye's latest hit was far too loud, even for his twenty-year-old rap-damaged ears. The late afternoon heat of June was almost enough to make him roll up the windows of the big black truck. That wasn't going to happen, though. There were far too many people around that might hear his stereo, too loud or not, and the air conditioning would cock-block that from happening. Pimp's got to roll strong, as Zack often said to anyone who would listen. Zack's friend Ryan grinned ear to ear and hiked up his drooping pants as he jogged across the lawn to the car. He caught himself at the dead last moment before they dropped too low and sent him sprawling. The pimp's uniform was dangerous to those uninitiated to its secret ways. If the pants were too high, you weren't gangsta enough. Too low, and you ran the risk of falling on your face. Ryan covered his pasty white ass with his three sizes too large jeans and shuffled around the big four-by-four and hopped in. Zack leaned back in an exaggerated gangsta pose and bumped knuckles with his longtime homeboy. They'd been running the streets here in town for almost nine months, which is as close to a lifetime friendship as these two would ever get. Sup, bitch? Ryan asked as he slammed the door of the truck and reclined the seat so far it was practically horizontal. He adjusted his cockeyed Atlanta Falcons hat so it was slightly more off-center and crossed his arms. He'd never even been to Atlanta or watched a Falcons game. Chinese food, yo. Zack slid the shifter into reverse and the truck lurched backwards like a drunk elephant. Zack's primary source of driving instruction was Steven Seagal movies, and the Fast and the Furious franchise. He was a public menace on the streets, and his parents' insurance bill was the bleeding truth of it. Ah, oh, shit! Golden Palace into house! Ryan laughed in his tinny way and fished a small pipe from his enormous jean pockets. He proceeded to pack the bowl for the two of them as Zack put the truck into drive and sped off, leaving the echo of screeching tires and a wake of black skid marks behind them. Kanye's music made a thumping reappearance as the two boys began their trip to the home of the world's greatest Peking dumplings. Baked is the term. Stoned also applies, as does blazed, toe-up, lit, and many, many more clever phrases. Zack and Ryan pulled into the parking lot of the small strip mall the Golden Palace was located in, barely able to park the truck. Zack's best effort resulted in half the truck's tires sitting inside the handicapped parking spot at the front of the lot. In all honesty, this wasn't that far from what he could have achieved while straight up sober. The two young men, one twenty, one nineteen, fell out of the large SUV giggling and goofing on one another. As they started to walk from the truck, Zack's phone blew up with the sounds of DMX warning those listening that he was about to act a fool up in here. Zack stopped and leaned on the hood of the car and attempted to clear his head to do business. The cush he and Ryan had just smoked was the good shit, and it gave him a high that felt more like he'd taken a handful of clonopin, which, incidentally, he could procure for someone on short order if needed. Zemak here, what up, foo? Zack asked the caller. Hi, Zack, it's Kimmy. Are you busy? Kimmy was clearly worried about something. Zack was stoned and an emotional moron. He did not pick up on that fact. Yeah, I'm giving food, girl. You need a bag or something? You want to get crossfaded later or something? Zack leaned heavily on the front grill of the truck as Ryan rolled his eyes at him. Bitches always got in the way. Um, 
No, I, I just wanted to make sure you were okay. You're okay, right? Kimmy was clearly distressed. Zack was irritated and an asshole. Yo, bitch, I'm not okay. I'm fine. He and Ryan burst into their stereotypical stoner laughter over one of Thug History's lamest jokes. Well, my family is leaving to go north to our summer home on the lake because of all the stuff that's happening and what the news is showing. We're leaving now. I, I just wanted to see if you would come. Kimmy's tone could not have conveyed more worry. She was nearly crying, and her voice cracked multiple times. Zack was mentally handicapped. What shit on the news, yo? DEA up in town? MS-13 running up on my shit again? Is Zachary McDonald gonna have to bust a cap in someone again? His demeanor shifted from pleasantly stoned moron to posturing wannabe tough guy moron. He hiked up the front of his wife-beater shirt in typical gangsta fashion, revealing where a pistol should have been, were he actually a gangsta and not just a small-town drug dealer that had a trust fund from his grampy, who was a stockbroker from Greenwich. Kimmy's voice finally cracked entirely, and she let slip a small sob. Kimmy had been dealing with a little bit of a crush on Zack since he was a senior, twice. She'd always bought his weed, not because it was the best in town, but because she was secretly hoping one day he'd fall in love with her. She could change him. She knew it. Now it might be too late for that. Oh, Zack, there are people dying everywhere. Crazy people biting each other, and soldiers in the streets, and martial law in the cities, and everything. It's, it's so scary. I just I don't want you to get hurt. My mom and dad say you can come with us north. There's room for you and everything. Please go. Please? She sold it with every ounce of her being. By that point, Zack had put the call on speaker, and the two assholes hovered over it, listening anxiously. When she finished, the two small-time crooks looked up at each other and burst out in snorting belly laughter. Ha-ho! We ain't scared of nothing. Bring the soldiers on. We be selling them chronic too, motherfuckers. Ryan attempted in his best possible fashion to sound as intimidating as possible. Ryan and Zack exchanged a blown-up bro fist in celebration. From the curb twenty feet away, a middle-aged lady pushing a baby cart choked down a wretch at their lunacy. Yeah, yo, Kimmy, we be fine. I'm gonna get us some dumplings and some lo mein and shit and... Head back to the crib and get blazed all night, you know? We got, like, call of duty and shit to do. We all have fun and shit at the lake and stuff, baby. That's how Zack always did it. Sealed the deal with the baby. Sophomores always fell for the baby. Kimmy choked back some tears. Okay. Be safe. Don't let them bite you. Zack and Ryan snorted at her idiocy. Yeah, you too, yo. See you on Friday and shit. Party in my apartment, yo. Zack blew her a wet-sounding kiss and hung up on her. Bitches, yo, Ryan said sadly. (laughs) Yeah, yo, bitches. Ho, Kim, motherfucker! Zack threw up some random mishmash of fingers at the Asian man behind the counter in an attempt at forming some strange East Coast, West Coast gang sign, the middle-aged man shook his head in disgust. My name is Alan, thanks. What can I get for you two gentlemen today? Alan grabbed the small order pad and pen off the glass countertop. He perked an eyebrow in anticipation of the two idiots' order. Zack and Ryan leaned in close to one another, nearly smacking their temples into one another. In hushed tones, they pointed at the menu mounted on the wall above Alan's head. After nearly five minutes of heated debate, Zack stepped forward to place the order. All right, yo, I need two orders of dumplings, two house-style lo mains, one Szechuan chicken, an order of crab rangoons, uh, an orange chicken, two egg rolls, a pork fried rice, and some of that stuff I used to eat all the time back in the day. You know what I'm talking about, right, son? Zack winked at the man taking his order as he handed him the cash for the food. 
lead paint chips, Alan said flatly back to him as he took the cash. No, man, pussy, ain't you seen that movie? Zack and Ryan busted out laughing yet again. Another epic brofist signaled the importance of the joke. Alan stared at them. After a long moment of awkward silence, he ripped the order off, handed Zack his change, and walked away to the kitchen to give it to the cooks. How about a scorpion bowl while we wait? Ryan hollered out to him. Nope, Alan said, not missing a beat. He walked through the swinging double doors and into the kitchen. It's assholes like him that made us invade Toshiba. My grandfather died there putting that famous flag up. He died for our freedom, man. Zack shook his head in disgust. Ryan nodded solemnly in agreement, and the two men sat down alone in the restaurant to watch the news on the television mounted on the wall. Fifteen minutes of blank, drug-inhibited stares at the news channel led to the two men not realizing that the world was crumbling outside. Zack did manage to point out that the newswoman had fly tits three times, which does indicate that he was capable of noticing some things. Ryan was only able to point out how sick the special effects were on that movie trailer. The movie trailer he was referring to was actually the live footage from Athens, Greece earlier that day. A security camera mounted on a building near the Greek capital caught video of a few dozen men running at top speed through traffic in the congested city. The small European cars darted to and fro, trying to miss the panicked men as they ran for their life from an unseen menace. Moments into the grainy black-and-white footage, more shambling figures came into the frame, reaching out blindly, staggering directly into the path of the frantic vehicles. The camera caught a vaguely feral expression on their darkly stained faces. Ryan pointed out that they looked like those old-school zombies from that movie, yo. One small car couldn't make a swerve in time and took one of the shambling zombies out at the knees, sending it up and over the hood, then straight through the windshield. The tiny car veered directly into the door of another car, smashing it sideways and into a row of parked vehicles. The newswoman with fly tits informed the watchers capable of paying attention that They were fast-forwarding the video a minute or so, where the camera caught unnatural motion inside the crashed vehicles. One of the drivers climbed out of the smashed door and dragged their shattered body slowly back out into the traffic that was attempting to give the crash a wide berth. Another car sped through the accident scene and, with a silent thump, sped over the body of the crawling driver. After stopping its dreadful crawling for a moment, Impossibly, it began to move further, heading directly at the camera, in the direction the men had been running moments earlier. Had Ryan and Zack been able to clear the haze of the cush out of their fried brains, they would have heard Ms. Fly Tits going over how the dead were returning to life, and how they only seemed interested in destroying the living. By then, the two cooks and Alan the counterman had assembled in the restaurant with the two stoned gangsta wannabes. They watched with their mouths agape as the footage rolled on and on, revealing nothing but horror across the globe. Before the network cut to commercial, they were rolling gory and deadly hand-shot video from the East Coast not too far away. Just a few scant hours drive away. In unison, the two cooks exchanged worried glances and untied their food-stained aprons. They balled them up and tossed them over their shoulder. Alan nodded in agreement at his co-workers and went to the counter where he popped the register open, dug out all the cash, and retrieved a small automatic handgun from under the counter. The cooks grabbed their small collection of personal items from a locker just inside the kitchen doors, and they walked directly past the two idiots who were still discussing the overall quality of the movie trailer they were watching. The cooks left the front door with a ding of the bell as Alan stopped to evaluate his moron customers. Neither of the men had realized the entire restaurant staff had exited right in front of their eyes.
He heard one of them compare the video of a woman getting attacked in Krakow, Poland, to a moment in the video game left for dead. Alan sighed softly, let himself out of the store, and locked the door behind him. Fifteen minutes later, when their conversation regarding whether or not they'd fuck the newswoman with fly tits in the mouth or ass first ended, Zack stopped suddenly and stood up. He looked slowly left to the kitchen, then slowly right to the counter, before looking down at Ryan sitting in the chair beside him. Yo, what the fuck is our food? he asked loudly enough to offend anyone still working or eating in the Golden Palace. No one replied. Ryan stood up beside him and adjusted his cockeyed falcon's hat rapidly, surely indicating to anyone observing that shit was about to get real. Shit, yo, they left us. Zack hit Ryan in the chest, obviously excited at being left alone in a Chinese restaurant. Aw, yeah, son. Ryan bounced up and down excitedly, and the two men took off running through the double doors into the kitchen, where their food was just about to start burning. Holy shit, yo! This is dank chink food, homie! Ryan exclaimed around a mouthful of greasy lo mein. Shh, nigga, they have cameras here. Don't be racist and shit. Zack glared at Ryan. Ryan's response was to slowly chew the noodles like a confused cow working a cud. He carefully lifted his homemade scorpion bowl and, after finding the red straw with his searching, wagging tongue, took a long drag from the alcoholic tub. The two young men were fat as fuck. Once they realized Alan and the two cooks were not coming back, they turned the sign in the door of the Golden Palace to closed and they dug out the cookbooks to make more food. About ten minutes into the cooking process, they realized all the cookbooks were in some form of gook sign language. That looked a lot like Zack's chest tattoo. Unfortunately, neither of them knew sign language, and they resorted to mixing various items in a wok once they'd eaten all the food the cooks had prepared for them earlier. The news channel was obviously glitched up when it started to get dark outside. Zack and Ryan were sick and tired of seeing the zombie movie trailer over and over again, so they changed the channel to MTV and absorbed some real entertainment, the Jersey Shore. They ate every ounce of the food the cooks made, plus their walk concoction, before the cable went out. Sitting in the neon lights of the empty and still restaurant, with the last rays of the fading sun peeking through the large panes of glass, the two men were at a loss of what to do next. They were full. In fact, both men had reported to one another in great detail that they were indeed full as fuck. Cooking more food didn't seem like a solution for their boredom. You got more kush? Ryan asked Zack, spread-eagled on the floor. Zack sat up on top of the table that he had been lying on just a moment before. No, man, but I got sour diesel like a motherfucker. Go get that shit. Let's smoke it in here, man. They ain't coming back. How fat would it be to say we got toe up in the Golden Palace? Ryan's enthusiasm for the idea was only contained by the bowling ball-sized lump in his belly. He looked about five months pregnant, perhaps six. Yeah, yeah, boy! With extreme effort, Zack slid off the table and shuffled to the door. He searched his enormous jean pockets for the keys, and once he was satisfied that he did indeed have the keys, he pushed the plunger bar and walked out into the warm summer evening. Zack rubbed his belly and felt slightly remorseful over eating all the food. He knew tomorrow he'd be pissed because leftover Chinese was his favorite— and there was nothing left over. He laughed at his and Ryan's good fortune over the Chinese people leaving. He still couldn't figure out why they'd just leave them behind in the restaurant. Zack dropped his keys on the ground in front of him. His liquor-addled brain swam back and forth as he assessed the depth of a bend required to pick up the exceedingly important item. Once he was satisfied with the distance, he abruptly doubled over to grab the keys— and face-planted into blackness in the middle of the empty parking lot.
Motherfucker, wake up! Ryan poked his head out of the restaurant's large glass door. He couldn't leave. He knew the door would lock behind them and shut them out for good. One of Ryan's few lucid moments. Zack was face down in the middle of the parking lot, unconscious. Ryan had gotten worried after an hour of waiting. He became considerably bothered when he heard gunshots nearby. Ryan's first clear thought after hearing the rapid succession of gunfire was that Big E and Tupac had died too young. They were stolen from the world before they had a chance to truly flourish. Once he shook the drunk moron moment off, he suddenly became aware that his best friend, his homeboy, his fellow Jackson Street posse founding father Zack McDonald, was still outside getting their sour diesel from the truck. Ryan half walked, half crawled to the door, fighting the immense power of the booze from the scorpion bowl he had downed through the evil red straw earlier. He threw it up along with what was probably three or four pounds of poorly chewed Chinese food all over a fake bamboo tree in a plastic pot right near the door. Once he purged, the world came into sharper focus and he opened the door to holler at his collapsed friend. Zack's dented weed and liquor-filled skull responded sluggishly to his friend's calls. For a dim moment he had a vision that Ryan was getting shot in a drive-by reminiscent of one he had heard about from someone who may or may not have actually been a real thug. The stabbing, stinging pain in his face snapped him to reality before he had a chance to draw his dream gat and whoop up on some bitches. Ryan stopped screaming his name when Zack rolled over onto his back. He felt the sharp prod of the keys jab into the small of his back right through the XXL hoodie he was wearing. His face and head felt like the time he tripped over his bong and face-planted against his entertainment system. It felt fucked, yo. Yo, Zack, get the fuck up, man. Someone's shooting out there, Ryan screamed. In response, Zack slowly sat up and snagged his keys from the ground behind him. He slouched his shoulders and rubbed the tender spots on his forehead and cheekbone. They stung something fierce. It won't make you smart, but there's nothing quite like pain to sober the mind. Ryan, what the fuck happened to me, man? I get jumped? He shook his head as he hollered out to his friend inside the restaurant. I don't know, man. You've been out here for like an hour, bro. Get the fuck in here for you get shot up. Motherfuckers be shooting it up like like a motherfucker. As if on some ironic cue, a trio of pistol shots rang out from across the street, only a hundred feet away at most. Ryan looked up as Zack spun on his ass to face the source of the loud pops. Walking backwards away from the gas pumps at a small convenience store was a tall man wearing a flannel shirt and jeans. He had a large black handgun that looked to Zack like something Seagal would use in one of his movies. The tall man grimaced as he stuck the gun in the front of his pants. He rolled up the sleeves on his left arm, revealing a circular, ragged bite wound. Crimson streams of fresh blood ran down towards his wrist as he made a fist testing the wounded arm's strength. He gritted his teeth in agony. Approaching him from the pumps was another man, also dressed in jeans and a flannel shirt. The other man staggered, bent over, and only barely staying upright. Losing his balance, he careened forward and slammed his shoulder into the corner of a large metal gas pump, and from across the street both Zack and Ryan heard his collarbone crack wetly. They flinched. Errol, you get the fuck away from me now. I already shot you once. I'll shoot you again, goddammit. The tall man hollered out as he aimed the large black pistol again. Ryan and Zack had never seen anything like this before. Boys in the Hood, New Jack City, Steven Seagal movies, and Chuck Norris had nothing on the sheer terror of watching a man draw a weapon on a maniac within shouting distance. Zack peed a little. Answer me, goddammit! The tall man hollered out, leveling the gun at the chest of the man with the newly busted shoulder. Seconds painfully ticked by with the two punks watching, fixated on reality for a change. The broken and bleeding man took another step, threatening the tall man. God forgive me, the tall man muttered softly.
His pistol boomed twice, sending two lead missiles into the chest of the other man. His forward progress halted with the impact of the heavy slugs. He staggered back and pressed against the same pump he broke himself on just seconds before. When the beaten, bloodied, and now shot man regained his forward angle, he took one plodding step forward, and the tall man pulled the trigger a final time. The massive pistol round exploded the man's head, just like the time Zack and Ryan put an M-80 in a cantaloupe. Well, to be honest, this was a hell of a lot bloodier and a shitload more bowel-wrenching. Ryan peed some. Zack threw up on his lap. The tall man took a few steps back and came to a rest against the back of the station wagon parked at the pump. He clutched suddenly at his wounded arm. Even the two stoners were with it enough to realize he was in pain. They were far too self-absorbed to go help the man, however. The tall man surveyed the area around him and made eye contact with Zack, then with Ryan. He drew the handgun again, swapped out the magazine deftly, even with his hurt arm, and walked around to the driver's side of the wagon. He stared at it and... Frozen in shock, Zack and Ryan watched as he pulled out of the gas station and drove straight up to where Zack sat in the parking lot. Both of the boys licked their lips in sync as the tall man got out of the seat of the car, wincing as he tried to use his damaged arm. Once he reached his full height, he towered over the sitting form of Zack. Zack stared up at the grip of the gun in the man's waistband as he slowly walked right up to his feet. The gun looked big enough to take down an elephant this close. The man stood silently for a moment, then, in a calm, resonating voice, addressed the vomit and pea-soaked idiot slouched in lazy fear on the ground in front of him. You saw that, huh? All Zack could manage was a weak nod. From the restaurant door, Ryan watched in abject horror, expecting the tall man to blow his friend's head off at any moment. He was already dead, you see, you saw me shoot him in the chest, right? And he didn't die. I had to blow Daryl's gourd off to do him proper. The tall man's lip trembled slightly at the thought of having just shot someone he obviously knew well. Once again, Zack's chemically damaged brain only allowed him to nod in agreement. We just got back from Moore's down the way there, getting more guns and ammo to last through all this shit. Of course, some assholes had to get uppity and try and take what we already had. Things got ugly, and Daryl took one to the belly. Killed him, too, but it took a bit. I got those fuckers, though. Gave it to him good. The tall man slid the smooth black pistol menacingly from his belt and gripped it tightly in anger. He noticed the fear on Zack's face immediately and put the pistol away with a faint look of regret. You boys ain't hurt, right? You... You ain't gonna be dying, right? The tall man asked them impulsively, fearfully. Had they any sense, they would have realized an answer of yes would have fetched them one of the tall man's bullets to the forehead. Fortunately, they had no wounds, and their shaking heads saved them from a fast end at the tall man's hand. Well, good. You got food in that restaurant? He asked in as close to a friendly tone as he could manage. Yeah, we got plenty of Chinese food, Zack answered him meekly. No shit, Sherlock, it's the Golden Palace. It's a fucking Chinese restaurant. The tall man shook his head at Zack in disbelief. Zack was too afraid to act indignant as he normally would. You've pissed yourself, son. The tall man pointed at Zack's wet crotch. Zack looked down at the dark wet stain and nodded meekly. I'm hungry. I'm going in. After the tall man pushed his way past Ryan to get inside, Zack got to his feet and schlepped slowly to the door where his friend held it open for him. The sudden disappearance of the gun-wielding man allowed Zack's true asshole nature to return in force. Dude, you're a bitch. Where were you? I was going to blast that fool when he rolled up on us. Zack menaced Ryan with a sneer. I had your back from here, homie. Death before dishonor. Ryan could not have looked more serious. 
Let's see what this tall bitch has to say for himself. Walking up into our restaurant like he owns the place. Bitch, please. Zack and Ryan sat there until midnight, saying nothing, watching the tall man eat, then bandage his arm, then eat some more, then drink a few stiff cocktails, and then sit down in a half-circle booth to finally relax. The tall man assessed their value and immediately told them how he felt. You two are worthless fucks, aren't you? Zack and Ryan were sitting on a table across from the booth when he said it. They looked sheepishly at each other, then back at the grip of the big pistol in the man's waistband. There was an almost moment when Zack sort of had the courage to say something smart assed back, but the heavy pistol stopped that cold. Yelp, they said, in defeated unison. Thought so. You don't even have guns, do you? The tall man used a teriyaki skewer to pick at something lodged in his teeth. The boys shook their head, obviously ashamed at their lack of proper gangsta accoutrement. The tall man shook his head, clearly disappointed at the two. You have any fucking idea what's happening out there now? The tall man spat the fleck of food that had been stuck in his teeth. He seemed satisfied with it gone. We don't know, man. The television's been out forever. Ryan answered him. The tall man nodded before replying, The end of times, boys. The dead walk the earth. Madness and insanity have set upon us, and we have been judged unworthy. I suspect you too will be the next to go from here. The religious explanation flew so high over the two kids' heads, they literally had no response whatsoever. They waited for him to continue, as if that was just the prologue of a much longer story. Seeing their obvious lost demeanor, the tall man let slip a long, frustrated sigh. (sighs) Boys, we got zombies. Dead folk walking around eating living folk. Holy shit, for real, yo? Zack leapt from the table as if he'd been electrocuted in the anus forcefully. He dropped flat on his stomach and scuttled under the table that Ryan still sat on. The tall man watched Zack's behavior with a sad look on his face. He solemnly nodded, realizing he had to use the smallest words possible to convey anything that'd stick. Yes, shoot them in the head, eat you alive, zombies. Holy shit, for real, yo? Ryan's second shift brain responded to that. Just like his only slightly more gifted idiot friend, he scrambled off the table with a nut-busting thud and crawled underneath it next to Zack. Apparently, hiding under a table was a sure-fire way to protect oneself from the undead. That and idiots love company. Yes, for real, yo. The tall man answered them sarcastically. He shook his head. Maybe the end of times had started when idiots like these two started being born in bulk. What the fuck are we going to do? We can't go out there. Them shits will bite us, bro. I don't want to be bitten by no zombie and shit, Zack blubbered. Son, I've been bitten and I'm fine. That's all movie garbage. We will be fine. Tomorrow morning we will take our cars and we will head up and out of town to the hills where my house is and we'll hunker down until this all blows over, God willing, the tall man assured the two men. That seemed to appease them. I'm taking last watch. You two watch that damn door and don't let no one inside, not your mom, not your pop, and certainly no one that looks deader than you two numbnuts. Wake me at four in the morning. The tall man evaluated the cushions of the booth and lay down in the circular seat, resting his head on his good arm. He scratched at the burning emanating from the oozing bite wound. Much like the rest of reality that went over their heads, they missed out on his pale skin tone, clammy, sickly appearance, and sunken cheeks. He already looked dead. One thing that Zack and Ryan were infallibly reliable about was being entirely unreliable. 
Both of them were fast asleep on the floor next to the front door within an hour. They were woken up by the plastic bamboo tree toppling over, spilling stale vomit all over and hitting Zack flush in the nose, breaking it cleanly with an audible pop. Yow! Zack blurted as he reached up to clutch his smashed nose. Blood flowed freely from the nostrils all over his enormous fubu hoodie. Who the fuck did that, you cunt? Zack punched Ryan in the arm, waking him. Zack was fully sure it was a prank and he would show Ryan that shit wasn't funny, mercilessly once he was awake like he was. What, huh? Ryan's half-asleep voice responded. Why'd you fucking deck me with this big fucking tree, bitch? Zack asked him, spitting and spattering blood all over his groggy friend's face. Ryan was shocked wide awake by the warm, wet spray. Dude, I didn't fucking touch you. Get off my shit, man. Where's that fucking old dude? Maybe he did it. Both of the young men sat up from the floor like a pair of moles in a -a whack-a-mole machine. The tall man's feet were gone from the booth. Behind them, the dawn light illuminated the cluttered restaurant interior with an otherworldly faint blue glow. Ryan's brain experienced a miracle, and he realized a shadow was being cast over them, spilling out past their feet. He turned slowly, knowing full well the tall man stood behind them. They heard the scrape of a man's foot on the doormat before their heads turned. Much like the true cowards they were, they screamed like bitches and dove out of the way, just as the undead body of the tall man pounced on the space they had just occupied. Ryan's scream was a lot like his tinny laugh. It was shrill and high-pitched, reminiscent of a ten-year-old boy who might have been kicked square in his newly dropped balls. Imagine the most irritating way you can scream this. <coughs> and you're fairly close to his situation in life. Zack's much more stoic scream included profanity, an admission that yes, indeed, he peed the bed, and a short, unintelligible sentence about Bob Saget. The tall man was dead. His skin had gone ashen, and his eyes were sickly and a color of white that looked like pus. His mouth sagged open, slowly drawing itself shut again as if the tendons and muscles tightened with a murderous mind of their own. Fuck me! Get the fuck up! Zack's plan worked marvelously. He continued to scream at maximum volume, crawling backwards until he clocked himself in the head on the leg of a chair. Shocked by the impact, he got to his feet and dragged Ryan to his, despite his insufferable cries of fear. The two boys blasted their way through the double doors leading to the kitchen and slammed into a stainless steel prep table. When the doors swung shut, the light disappeared in the kitchen and they were left in the dark. Two square windows worth of the faint morning glow poked through the creaking doors. Ryan took a step towards them after he turned, creeping his chin up high to catch a glimpse of what was happening out in the restaurant with the tall man. No sooner had he got close enough to see, his vocal cords began their infernal magic and he began his nerve-rattling wail. Ryan spun like a top and took off at top speed, smashing his hips once more into the steel table, sending dirty pots and pans flying with a tremendous racket. Both of the wannabe hoods dropped down low and reached out in a panic, trying to find something to use as a weapon. From behind them, the double doors creaked loudly, and the long black silhouette of the tall man appeared, framed between the doors like the grim reaper manifested. Zack popped to his feet like a prairie dog, clutching a pot just as Ryan leapt up holding a rolling pin like a bat. The two men issued a war cry that had a fair chance of scaring several kindergartners straight back into a classroom, and they charged the zombie of the tall man. Like demented bookends, the two men swung their weapons together, smashing into both sides of the tall man's dead head. Unfortunately, neither Zack nor Ryan spent any time doing anything more physical than packing bongs or bowls, and they struck with the combined fury of two nursing home residents. 
The tall man took a step back and lunged into the kitchen towards them. Screams sharp enough to shatter bulletproof glass echoed in the dark, hot kitchen as the boys dove away from the grasping claws of the tall man. Ryan bricked his face square on the corner of the stove hood, sending streamers of light across his vision. In a stroke of good fortune, his brain was already so useless the concussion barely hindered him. Zack felt his way along the table as proficiently as anyone in that situation could, which may or may not prove that God does love idiots. Halfway down the length of the kitchen, his blindly searching hands knocked over a tin can, and the tell-tale spilling of sharp sticks reached his ears. Like a greedy child reaching for more candy, he snagged a handful of teriyaki skewers and wielded them in his left hand like a vampire hunter's steak, with the stove pot serving as his holy mallet. Ryan, get my back, homie, he screamed out, suddenly filled with righteous confidence. Get blarb, shizzy, for Rosilio. Ryan hollered back in a brain-damaged stupor. Perhaps the concussion did more damage than first appreciated. In a move that could only be described as mediocre and only slightly impressive, Zack barrel-rolled across the flat, cold steel table and came up on his feet, losing his balance for but a moment. The tall man loomed above him like a massive undead puppet with arms too long and legs toweringly thin. Take this, biat! And with that, Zack backhanded the mitt filled with teriyaki skewers straight into the eye of the tall man. The thin bamboo stick struck several inches in, rupturing the eyeball and sending its goo all over Zack's hand. He heaved powerfully as the tall man dropped to his knees, nearly felled by the astoundingly lucky blow. In the dark of the kitchen, Zack brought the pot back in a slugger's stance, and with a Pong! He hammered the sticks fully into the brain of the macabre menace. The tall man's long body dropped face forward and fell fully dead in the middle of the black kitchen. I got you, bitch. You see that, Ryan? I killed that zombie motherfucker. Zack spun to where Ryan was and saw that his head was rolling back and forth, going in and out of consciousness. Yo, Zack, he muttered. What's up, Ryan? I'm a fucking hero, yo. I saved your shit. What's up, homie? Say something. Yo, Zack. Your lazy ass forgot the sour diesel in the truck last night. You fucking dildo. April 23rd. Productivity up in this bitch. I feel like Superman on crack. <laughs> yo. Hadn't used that in a while. I thought I'd throw it out as a rerun for you, Mr. Journal. As I said, I feel that's an underused greeting. The last two days, we have made a concentrated effort to focus more on getting things done on campus. Well, not all of us, but a fair part of us. We've split our group evenly down the middle to kill two birds with one... Shit, that doesn't make any sense. Um, burning the candle at both ends? Fuck. That doesn't apply either. We will be doing two things at once. There, it's not fancy, but it says exactly what I'm trying to say. I suck at this writing thing. Periodically, I ponder what the hell made me want to do this so much. Reading my writing must be like watching a chimpanzee pick its nose. Because Ollie is all hot and horny to get the damn field planted, we got the fencing started there. This will be a serious project. The area we're trying to fence in is huge. Granted, we already have a lot of the waist-high chain fencing already, and we're trying to work that in as well, but this will still take forever. Ollie, in his infinite usefulness, has built a gate already out of pressure-treated lumber that was kicking around from our loot runs in campus or whatever. I don't know where he got the hinges, but frankly I don't care. The gate is large enough to fit the tractor through, and it latches with a pin latch. I think that's what it's called. And it's damn sturdy. Of course, a gate in the middle of a field with no fence attached to it just looks silly, but we're working on that. 
Next to the soccer field are the baseball and softball fields. The backstops are on the soccer field side, and we started there because it formed a perfect fence side on one edge. If you hold both your hands in front of you, making the index finger and thumb gun shape with the fingers pointed out to the sides, that's how the backstops are laid out. All we had to do to seal it was put up a section of fence in between the two backstops, which was maybe 65 feet or so. For extra sturdy measure, we put up one upright pole every six feet, and we made sure to use our eight-foot lengths so the fence was head height. Now, we got the entire length of fence done for that yesterday, mostly because we already had the poles with concrete still stuck on the bottom. All we had to do was use a post digger and a shovel to make the hole, then drop the pole in, straighten it out, pack it tight, and then move on, no waiting for concrete to dry. When we have to do that, we'll slow down dramatically. We also dug a small furrow in the field so we could sink the chain link into the ground to help prevent animals from digging under it. Ollie says that won't stop them permanently, but it'll slow them and tip us off so we can plink them off later on. Ollie and I are also going to reinforce that side of the fence because it's outward facing. We've got a ton of waist-high fence poles, and we don't want to use them on the defensive side of the fence. On the close side that faces the center of campus, sure, so we're planning on using some of the shorter poles to buttress the outer fence in the event we get mobbed. If we place them at 45-degree angles facing outward, the fence should be very strong if a mob finds itself pressing against it. Of course, we've never seen a dead guy or gal coming from that direction, so it's sort of a secondary wish. Until we've got the field fenced off entirely, there's no sense in reinforcing half a fence. That's like putting a screen door on a submarine. Booyah, motherfucker, that one made sense. That was my entire yesterday. Sixty-five odd feet of chain-link fence with Ollie. I'll say this about the guy. He doesn't know shit about what he doesn't know shit about. But the shit he knows, he fucking knows. He's such an odd guy. I equate him to the farm boy savant. I am fairly sure he can build us a tractor out of a tampon and an RC radio car. However, if I ask him to explain even just the basics of how to balance a checkbook... He gets this glossed-over look in his eye, and a streak of drool runs down his chin. It's so strange. Amusing, though, and I'm super grateful that he's here. I keep finding things he's done around campus to make things work better or to make life easier, and I'm astounded that he's outside working alone while we're away all day risking our lives. It's too easy to think he's back here on Easy Street. He is getting it done on the home front. Melissa's awesome, too. She's a sweetheart. She brought us out hot coffee in the morning, iced tea in the afternoon, and fed us lunch as well. I apparently equate awesome with being fed. Maybe it's true that the fastest way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Still no signs of a tummy bump on her, but she and Ollie both said that she's now getting mild off-and-on morning sickness. I don't know shit about pregnancy, but I guess that's normal. It did occur to me that she should probably see Lisa back in Westfield soon, because I've been told prenatal care is, like, important and shit. Again, I'd just like to defend my ignorance regarding pregnancies and all things baby, and point to my penis as an excuse. It's not my fault. Not that one, at least. None, to my knowledge, actually. Crossing fingers... While Ollie and I worked the shit out of the fields, Gilbert, Patty, Abby, and Gavin were off fence and lumber hunting. Yesterday, they returned to the Stig complex and ripped up another 200-plus feet of pole and fence. That was their entire day. They said the undead population was a motherfucker downtown again. That, once again, leads me to believe that something is stirring the proverbial pot down there. More motion in the ocean, getting the undead moving back and forth— Seems like a shitstorm waiting to happen for us. Happily, no one was hurt during yesterday's fence operation. Last night, we fired up the grill and cooked up some of the last tidbits of our venison. I guess it's almost time to pray for a deer to be stupid enough to walk near campus again. While we were cooking, we all pitched in and built a new home for the small wood stove we found a week or two ago. In the center of Hall E's large dining area, we slapped down a brick floor and backing against the wall and made sure the floor could handle the weight. 
Like I said before, the stove is small as hell, and the bricks are fairly light, so there's no issue. We got a hole in the wall and got the pipes fed through, sealed up good and proper, and voila, now we have a wood stove in Hall E. Heat in the event the generator or furnace shits the bed. This will cut down big time on our fuel consumption, as we're not in Hall E all day, so we can kill the generator for longer and use the batteries linked up to the solar panels, which, incidentally, are generating good juice. We now have wood stoves and gas generators installed in Hall E, Hall A, and Hall B. I almost feel like a fucking boss when I look around here now. Straight up pimptastic survivors in the hizzy. Today was also a busy day. I really need to stop saying that. When was the last time I was like, hey, Mr. Journal, sat around with my thumb lodged in my asshole today because there was nothing to do around here. Sure wish I had something productive to do. (laughs) Never. We're human doings, not human beings, lately. I'd love to sit down and just be there, chilling out. Sipping on a Mai Tai, watching the sunset, perhaps jamming out to some Bob Marley or something, but no, someone had to flip the switch and go all apocalyptic on the world. Whoever or whatever did this, you better have a good fucking reason for it, because I'd love for this shit to just chill the hell out. Moving along before I incur the wrath of the Almighty, again. Today we had our meeting with Blake. We promised him we'd meet him at noon at his old place of work, Mike's Automotive, and that's what we did. Oddly enough, the area around Mike's was deadly clear of anything remotely close to a zombie. Patty and Gavin went with me, and they both pointed it out as being weird. By the time we pulled into the small parking lot where Blake's truck was, we had come to the conclusion that Blake was in fact living at the garage— and he was keeping quiet and putting the few undead around down using something silent like a bat or a wrench or whatever. Blake was inside the garage's office, and he came out to meet us. I had Patty and Gavin stay inside the HRT and Gavin's truck, respectively, until I knew Blake was chilled out and was willing to meet two new faces. Almost immediately he seemed at ease, and after we bullshitted for a few more minutes, I asked him if he was game, and he said, "'Hell yeah!' Patty and Gavin came over when I waved to them, and they introduced themselves to him. Right from the jump, he took to Patty, but there was a little cold shoulder action towards Gavin. I don't know why. Maybe it was his camo trousers, or his perpetual smile, or the fact that they were similarly aged guys, but Blake seemed a little weirded out. After a bit, I asked Gavin to pull security to make it less odd. Blake took to Patty. It was like an aunt and a nephew from old times. I think Patty just wanted to eat him right up. I can't tell if it's a motherly thing, and she just exuded her willingness to be a friend to him, or maybe if it was the whole failure to save Tony from Stig, loss of a son thing. Either way you slice it, they were thick like thieves in short order, and I was more than happy to see it develop. Blake had good news and bad news. Bad news first— Moving about town, he has seen quite a few folks. He guessed it may be as many as twenty since we last saw him. Blake said that most of them seemed like returning families or locals who somehow had remained completely out of sight the entire winter. That seemed unlikely to us, though. He unfortunately reported that he had personally watched many of them get killed, repeating the same fucking mistakes that people made back in June. He said several of them returned to the grocery store, which is now empty, as well as the police station, also empty, and the pharmacy, yet again, empty. Basically, people who left town are returning and going where there's nothing left, hoping or expecting shit to still be there for them. Shit, I think most of the food in town is now either incinerated in the wreckage of Stig or sitting in our cafeteria here at Alpa. Of the twenty or so people he has seen in the past four days, Blake thinks maybe ten are still alive. Morons have no idea what they're doing. Trying to clear a major group of undead with a fucking bolt-action rifle, no armor to speak of, no backup, and no goddamn plan to GTFO safely. How did they think it was going to end? (sighs) The good news is this. Stupid people die and leave their shit behind. Blake showed us his haul inside the gas station, and he's picked up five rifles and seven handguns. 
I'm very happy to report that one of the handguns was a 10 millimeter, and Blake was more than happy to part with the ammo and the weapon, which suddenly made the Kimber back here a lot more attractive as a sidearm. It's just a fine weapon, and honestly, I'd really like to carry it at one point. Blake also said that the farm has been lackluster in terms of evidence. He pushed pretty hard for someone to join him on his daily recon mission, but we kindly backed out of that idea. I still don't trust him fully, and the last thing I want to do is disappear somewhere in the woods with someone who strikes me as a few letters short of an alphabet. A-E-I-U and pretty much never Y. Nonetheless, he claims that there is daily activity there, and he thinks it's very sketchy. As a big thank you, we gave him a few eggs, about ten cans of various foodstuffs, a six-pack of Coke, and I kicked him another ten rounds of three oh three. I'm hoping I find more, as keeping him slightly dependent on me for Enfield ammo makes me think he's less likely to do anything weird. Of course, he has other guns now, as well as ammo, so maybe that's entirely moot and I'm just a dipshit. You ever stop to think about that expression, Mr. Journal? Dipshit? Implying that one has been dipped in shit, like some kind of fucked up eclair or something. When you break it down... That's fucking gross. Blake said he's all set for stuff, but he'd really like us to hit the auto parts store so he can get the garage back up and running. Of course, I pointed out that he'd need more security there if he was making noise, and that building a fence would be a necessity. His expression was priceless when he looked around outside after I said that. I imagine it was a lot like the face I was making when I realized how much fucking crap needed to be done on campus. Sort of a... Are you shitting me? Face mixed with a, oh yeah, that's right. Fuck my life. Face. Our next meeting with the Blakester is on the 29th, six days hence. We told him we would do our level best on the auto parts store, and if he found any building supplies, especially ones that built chain link fences, to give us a call. We almost gave him a walkie today, but for some reason I bailed on it. I don't know. Chalk it up to a gut feeling. Oh, so the return trip back here was a clusterfuck of undead. Downtown's population of zombies has literally doubled, which begs the question, where the fuck were they? More noises and activity from locals returning is starting to interfere with my quality of life, and that's saying something, because my life sucks. You really need to fuck things up to make it worse for me right now. Highlight of the day... Gilbert is the fucking man. All those nights he went home and blew us off to rest or whatever, he was working on building weapons racks and a workbench for the reloading gear. While we were gone earlier today, he had Abby and Ollie help him move it and install it in the new armory in Hall E's basement. All of our unused weapons are now stored in a cool, dark, reasonably dry environment under lock and key. He says we can start reloading brass as early as tomorrow if we want. Fortunately, Walt had oodles of 556 and 762 reloading supplies, and Gilbert says we've got at least 2,000 rounds between the two. That's the best news, Mr. Journal. Straight up made my day. More good bullets is good. God, I are good at English. Tomorrow, I'm back on house clearing and fence acquisition duty. We'll see which happens after a scout of some areas we haven't spent too much time in. I know there's a shitload of fencing at the schools, but that's like dead friggin' center in town, and there were a lot of undead there earlier today. Mike is coming for more water on the 25th, too, so hopefully he has news regarding Operation Snatch. All right, I am out like a boner in sweatpants. Adrian. April 25th. Abby smashed the living shit out of her right middle finger yesterday. Lost the nail and everything. Poor girl cried her eyes out. Nice start to our chat, eh? I figured I'd start with a jolt to get you on board, Mr. Journal. We were on fence acquisition duty yesterday when it happened. Scattered around town are these little municipal properties that were part of the water department, I think. There's a little outbuilding, a raised area that I think is some kind of leech field, and... It's all surrounded by a six-foot chain-link fence. I never thought I'd type chain-link fence quite so much in my life, 
nor did I think my genuine personal safety and well-being relied so much on finding enough of it. It amuses me as well that such a simple invention can be so effective in providing safety for me and my people. The concerns of the barely alive, I suppose. We were rolling through the side of town that we've been clearing house to house, and Abby pointed out the fence and the fact that it was pretty damn clear of anything moving. We opted to get the fence while it looked clear. It also helped that there was a large duplex right next door that we hadn't cleared, so we figured it was a nice twofer. House came first, as we didn't want to risk there being living people inside. We breached and cleared one side, then the other side. Mercifully, the houses were empty, and actually we had a really large amount of food between the two of them. Of course, what passes for a large amount of food each day gets smaller. Enchilada sauce was the gem find of the day. One of the sides of the duplex had a crib and a spare bedroom, and as you'd expect, there was some formula and baby food in the cupboards. A breast milk pump as well. Melissa and Ollie were very thankful for that. We were stoked to find two more small wood stoves. They were the small ones, like the stove we just put into Hall E, and we were able to remove them and get them into the truck with little trouble. We also grabbed the chimney piping, or whatever it's called, as well. One of the duplexes had a well-stocked gun case, too, which was a nice find. No weapons of note, really, but more usable ammo and a variety of calibers and gauges. I'm starting to note a local love affair with the three fifty seven Magnum. I swear I've found more three fifty seven revolvers than anything else here. It's a good caliber, but kind of heavy for what we need guns for. Once that was done, we had about six hours of light remaining in the day, and that was exactly enough time to roll up the entire fence surrounding the area we'd scoped out. It was a square area about 50 feet on a side, and we got the last of the poles into the truck at right about 7.30 p.m. or so. That's when Abby pancaked her finger. The big blob of concrete the last pole had sat in was still on the pole, and when she was helping Patty get it situated, I guess it shifted and rolled right onto her middle finger. Her yelp of pain sent both Gavin and I into a fit as we were checking around the back of the duplex when it happened and didn't see it go down. Both of us bolted around the corner, and to be honest, were relieved when we saw her clutching her finger like she was. We'll take a busted fingernail any day over a bite wound. Today, Abby is enjoying the fact that she has a huge bulbous white bandage at the tip of her middle finger. She now has a super powerful fuck you gesture to give when she's feeling generous, and believe me, she was feeling generous. We gave her half a vike to cut the pain a few times, and it made her loopy as hell. Gavin couldn't stop laughing at how stupid she was on the painkiller, and that made her even more pissed. I think he did more to prevent his getting laid by laughing at Abby than Patty could ever achieve professionally cock-blocking him. Oh, kids. Her finger's pretty fucked up. I think she cracked the bone, and it's swollen up good, but... Luckily, it's just the tip of the finger, and as long as she takes it easy for a few days, I think she'll be okay. She might have some serious PTSD over being a nail short for a month or two, but she'll live. Unfortunately, her busted finger has her on campus patrol. I can't risk her out on a run anywhere, and if we don't get the swelling down, she'll be in a world of hurt. Upside for Abby, painting just nine fingernails should save her approximately 10% of the time she normally invests in nail painting. Let's not think about how she'll hold that teeny fucking brush in her bad hand, though. Today we spent the day with yet another Mike and crew visit from Westfield. We experienced our first pain in the ass over the semi we're using as a roadblock, though. When they radio, we need to move the van blocking the bridge, then drive the semi, then move the semi, let them through, move it back, blah, blah, fucking blah. Pain in the ass. However, it's a lot like the old TSA grope festivals before the end of the world. We need to give up some comfort for security. I need to go on record and say officially that Mike is a straight-up badass. He's been so good to us here, it's insane. To think now that we were so close to going to war with this guy kills me. It makes me wonder about how many people that wind up fighting each other could have been good friends if circumstances were only a little different. I guess that's spilt milk. Mike brought Hector with him as well as LaFrenz again, and I guess Mallory tagged along to offer haircuts to everyone here. I was hoping he was going to bring one of the three girls I was talking to the other day, but oh well, 
I guess trying to pick up a chick really ought to be on the back burner for me. Mike didn't bring a ton of trade bait for the water. I guess that's because they didn't really need anything of ours. He says the warmer weather has let them search some of the houses that were buried in snow on the fringes of town, and they found a fair amount of food themselves. He also said they're knee-deep at Lenny's farm, getting the fields prepared for planting and whatnot. Ollie had to laugh at that. He alluded to the fact that his father was a wee bit of a slave driver during the spring. I'm wondering now if Ollie left strictly to escape working for his father right now. Hector took a time out with LaFriends and worked on our trucks. He brought spark plugs, oil filters, and other shit, and actually did oil changes and what amounted to a poor man's tune-up. That was super nice of him. Mike took a tour of our field work, and actually we spent the majority of our afternoon out there working as a group. Having a good-sized, physically-able dude to help really sped things up. Mallory came out as well after she gave everyone that would sit still long enough a fresh haircut. She's a good worker as well. In about five hours, we put up something like 80 feet of fence. I think it also helped that Ollie and I more or less perfected the installation system the other day, and being able to start off doing it efficiently cut down on wasted time. During our work, I dropped the hint to Mike again that we needed more 556 ammo due to the town being suddenly overwhelmed with moving undead. Our target-rich environment was making us a wee bit ammo poor. I told him about the living stragglers returning slash appearing in town, and he said they were experiencing the same problem, though to a lesser degree. You see, they managed to clear town of the vast majority of undead before winter due to having a lot more military-grade hardware and ammo plus personnel at their disposal. We have no armory here in town. In fact, the closest armory slash base is Westfields. I know on the opposite side of the city there was an Air National Guard base with a reserve center, but that might as well be on the far side of the moon. Anyway, Mike said that the folks arriving in town were avoiding his people like the plague, which I thought was odd, considering Mike and his men roll in military vehicles wearing their BTUs and body armor 24-7. They are clearly American soldiers in America doing their job, so to speak, and the fact that people are literally scattering when they appear doesn't bode well for whatever was happening where they were all winter. I'm now wondering if there are other units of guardsmen that aren't being quite as proper as the fallen Lieutenant Daniels' men. That's a scary thought. I'm envisioning scenarios of small vacation towns up north suddenly being overrun with people trying to escape this area where it's more densely populated, only to find all the people from down here suddenly went to the same place at the same time. That's the inherent problem with everyone having the same escape plan, I guess. Do something no one else is thinking of. I did. There are almost no businesses in the rural vacation areas that aren't entertainment-oriented. Lots of restaurants, ski slopes, ice cream shops, bike rental places, etc. There are a lot of hotels, bed and breakfast joints, etc. Per capita, there has to be half the grocery capacity of this area. There are towns of 300 or 500 people that swell to two or 3,000 during the summer months as folks escape the city. Those extra people don't grocery shop, they eat out. If all those people suddenly appeared in that town, we're talking ten, twenty thousand folks trying to survive off two, maybe three grocery stores total. Seasonal businesses aren't stocked up for long periods of time. They only carry enough food and supplies to last their season. Granted, most grocery stores turn their inventory quickly, but there was a mass exodus from here, and I'm certain now that more food was left behind here than bought and transported away. I wonder if all those folks that escaped here and headed up there found themselves fighting each other over the scraps of an empty town, incapable of hosting all the people that suddenly arrived. I wonder if the National Guard there had to put boot to ass to enforce order and things got out of hand. It could have been much, much worse there than how it was here. I've seen that the worst of this nightmare can come from the living as well as the dead. It certainly explains why people would leave the relative safety of nowhere to return to the towns and cities they left behind that they had to suspect were now filled with the walking dead. I mean, how bad does it have to be for you to leave where you're holed up to come here? Back to Mike being the fucking man. 
When we wrapped up the field work, Melissa invited us all to Hall B for dinner, and we sat and shared a nice big meal of the very last remainder of the venison and rabbit we had. Mallory sat next to me, and I'm pretty sure she was role-playing the part of a chipper shredder as she ate that meat. Gobbled that stuff right down. Fairly sure I got hit with spatter, too. When we were about done with the food, Mike said he'd brought another crate of 223 for us, which was phenomenal news. Amping up our 556 five, millimeter stores by 1,700 rounds, or whatever, is a very nice cushion to rest on. I also mentioned the fact that we were short an IOTV vest, and I shit you not, he took the vest he had worn earlier and handed it to me. I asked him what he and his folks needed in exchange, and he said not to worry about it. With a constant supply of water, support, and good meals, he said we were square on it. I could have kissed him. It's heartwarming to see the good side of human nature. I think living in a world of shit enhances the moments where we are genuinely good people to one another. Mike wouldn't take no for an answer on it, and I was at a loss for words. He's such a good person. Hector is a phenomenal guy, and despite the fact that LaFriends wouldn't say shit if he had a mouthful, I like him too. Mallory is badass as well. She's always making me laugh with her smarmy sense of humor. I can see how she made good money as a stylist before all this bullshit went down. I'm glad she made the trip over. She's pretty awesome. They all vacated the premises shortly after our town clearing crew returned. Mike asked for the water, obviously. A few cartons of cigarettes we've stockpiled, plus a bottle or two of booze and a few assorted tidbits of things that are neat and useful. Never underestimate the value of manual can openers in bulk. They don't last long, and we eat a lot of canned goods. Gospel, Mr. Journal. Write that shit down. Gilbert, Gavin, and Patty were on the road today, and due to a lack of muscle, they simply cleared a few houses. Gilbert was complaining about his toes, which he hasn't mentioned in some time. To be honest, I had forgotten they got smashed up at the daycare. We had raw, wet weather lately, and I suspect that's fucking with him. He's moving around good, just bitching up a storm. Their loot return was mediocre, but they did find a house with a Ruger 1022, which is a sweet find for us. Very nice rifle for the armory. I definitely missed out on something, though, because after Mike and Hector and Mallory and LaFriends left, everyone was looking at me like I was retarded or something. It was totally one of those, are you an idiot, moments, but I can't figure out what was up. I asked them why they were all looking at me, and to a one, they all just shook their heads and walked away. Hmph. I wish women didn't do the whole hinting thing. Neither Abby nor Patty would come out and say why they were looking at me funny and shaking their heads. Damn women and their subtle gestures. Tomorrow, we have vowed to clear the auto parts store so Blake can get his supplies to start up Mike's automotive again. I'm hoping this is also a gesture that he will appreciate and understand the full importance of. I'm still not entirely sure he's with us, but I'm hoping this is the nail in the coffin of uncertainty. Blake has assured us multiple times that the auto parts store is largely free and clear of the undead, but everything has changed with people returning to town. The day after that, we're setting up a safe house. We've picked one of the houses we've already cleared that's right on Main Street. It'll see a lot of traffic, and hopefully it'll allow us a safe way to start up conversation with other survivors that have been here all along, or some of the survivors that are just now returning to the town. Either way, we'll be out and about, and minus Abby, which leaves us a good gun short. I hate the idea now of rolling without her eyes and trigger covering my ass. Everyone else is good to go, but I hate leaving a quality gun behind. I'm still waiting for my mistake to cost us. It's coming. My dread waxes and wanes, but it hasn't disappeared. Adrian April 27th Did I ever tell you the story about how I got shot in the chest? It's a shitty story. I'll tell it now. I was out setting up a safe house downtown today, and I got shot in the chest. Awesome story, huh? Having a lot of trouble breathing. My lungs are on fucking fire, and my torso feels like I've been skewered with a rusty fucking crowbar. I'm fucking A-lucky that I was wearing my vest, because if I wasn't, April 25th would have been the end of this story, and that's kind of a shitty ending. I haven't gotten laid yet. 
I'm on bed rest as per Gilbert, Patty, Abby, and Gavin's instructions. Ollie and Melissa, I think, are still out of the loop, but I can't be sure. I was rushed up here and tended to pretty much without seeing them. My head is swimming like a bitch. I need to take something for the pain, but I need to write this all down before I forget, because a lot has happened, and if I pop a couple of vikes to numb the pain and sleep, I might forget it all. I'll deal with the pain and get this done, even if it takes me all fucking night. I have to stay upright. I'm sitting against the headboard of the bed with my black and blue chest as tightly wrapped as I can bear. I struggle breathing at all without the wrap, and now that it's wrapped tight, I can breathe a tiny bit, and it's just sore as hell. Lose-lose, I suppose. Yesterday went awesome by comparison. As I said before, I think, we went to the auto parts store that Blake has been pining for and got the bitch cleared out. The auto parts store is just off Main Street near the garden center we cleared the other day. It's near the post office and some other local businesses that are useless to us now. Greeting cards? Previously awesome. Currently, the only thing they are useful for is making a fire. My head is pounding from breathing all fucked up. Patty and Abby just came in for a few minutes with some soup and a couple of scrambled eggs for me. We've got unopened jars of salsa coming out the ass here, and they were kind enough to scoop out a few large spoons of it on the eggs. It's really quite yummy, but it hurts to swallow. More or less everything from my chin to my balls hurts. Where was I? In the auto parts store. It's a long building. And I mean deep. It isn't wide. I think the parking lot for the place is only maybe six cars wide, and that's the entire width of the building. Depth-wise, though, it had to be a hundred feet or better to the back door. Does this paragraph make sense? It does in my head. The entire front of the store was glass, and half of the windows were either smashed out or had bullet holes in them. From the looks of it, there had been an exchange of gunfire in the street, and... Later on, the window had been busted out so someone could get inside. The giveaway is where the broken glass fell. The interior of the building was empty of threats, but the streets for a block or so in every direction were cluttered with a fair amount of the dead. Fortunately, they were very spread out, and we started thinning them while on the move in the trucks. About 300 feet from the auto parts store, we felt it was a good idea to stop and take down everything we saw moving, and then drive a 100 feet and do the same again. That way, we didn't wait until we were surrounded at the store. I hate not having options, and being surrounded reduces options. It worked good. Really good, actually. It makes me want to build a moving gun platform that we don't have to leave if we do it again. Shit, we could kill the damn undead with sharp sticks off the back of a semi-truck if we put enough brains into it. I'll add that to the list of shit we should probably do after we're healed up. So yeah, lots of dead zombies. I forget exactly, but I think between all of us we came back with ten empty AR M4 magazines from that site, which is at least 300 rounds expended. And that's not counting any sidearm fire. We are almost one shot one kill efficient now, so I'd guess we put down a solid 250 plus dead. They're fucking everywhere downtown now. We can't shit without wiping our ass on a zombie, it seems. Seems like it's getting worse every day. At any rate, we were down Abbey yesterday due to her finger, and when we pulled up to the shop and cleared it, we had to split our group down the middle. Patty and Gilbert stayed outside to pull security, while Gavin and I made sure it was safe inside. We went extra slow and careful due to the increased undead presence, proximity to downtown, as well as the broken windows. There was no telling how many were inside. None if you're curious, Mr. Journal. Vehicle parts are apparently not high on the list of things that draw the undead. Once we felt we had a clear building and a largely secure perimeter, we started taking shit out by the box full and arm load. We took lots of electronics, spark plugs, brake pads, oil filters, fuel additives, blah, blah, blah. We left the large shit like mufflers and whatnot behind for the moment because it's all so subjective. We really only need the parts that apply to the vehicles we have, and we don't know which of the parts in the store are the right ones, so there's little sense in taking everything at this juncture. We can always return later for the parts needed for major repairs. Do you vaguely remember me talking about the largest apartment building in town? I think I talked about it the day we all went to the grocery store and got on the roof to retrieve the bags of guns. Anyway, 
There's a fairly large apartment building in town, and it's on the same street as the auto parts store. Now, back in whenever the fuck it was I talked about the building before, I think I said I saw smoke coming from a few of the apartment windows or balconies or whatever. I remember saying that because the idea of burning to death in an apartment while undead banged on the door horrified me to the core. When we were leaving the auto parts store, I noticed right at the base of the building a fairly large debris field. Garbage. Large amounts of garbage. And, as we've seen so far, where there is garbage, there are people. Or zombies. That told me that in all likelihood, somewhere on the upper floors of the building, there are or were survivors. Using the ACOG, I went window to window looking for signs of life for nearly half an hour, but I didn't see shit. We should get back there sometime to check it out, although a large building like that scares me. Lots of halls, closets, doors, and dark nooks and crannies for the dead to hide in. Lots of danger involved. Filed under, fucked if I care. All things considered, the trip downtown yesterday was an entire success. Today, not so much. We knew last night today was the day we were going to set up a house as a communications point and refuge for folks. As I've said a hundred times, we are calling them safe houses. In these houses, we're setting up a single walkie, a small supply of fresh water, basic first aid supplies, and a small amount of food and spare clothing. We also decided to put a notebook and pen inside in the event someone stops in, doesn't want to contact us via radio, but wants to leave a note. Any way we can get information is good, we're supposing. These houses will be set up with signs outside them, so folks returning to or passing through will know there are some supplies inside— and that the house is safe. The idea is we will screen potential campus residents, feed the hungry, hydrate the dry, and give folks worse off than us a safe place, even if it's only for a short time. We'd chosen a house on our side of town right on Main Street, but not quite in the more built-up area. This was a test run, really, and we've already discussed altering plans for future safe houses. We chose a home right near Walt's Nut House. It was close to the road, had good parking, a large U-shaped driveway that you could pull into and out of quickly if needed, and the windows on the side street were a good distance above the ground. All in all, it was a fine choice. We pulled our vehicles into that huge driveway and began the process of setting the house up. I think we started fairly late, maybe noon or so. The morning was spent with us finalizing what we were leaving behind at the safe house and painting up a huge sheet of ratty plywood as our safe house sign. The sign says, Food, Water, Radio, Safe on April 27th. We felt putting the date on there was important because who knew how long that sign could have sat there for? What if we set up a safe house on October 1st and it had been overrun ten times since then and we hadn't updated the sign? We're thinking we update the thing once a month or as needed. Because this was a largely low-key op, Gilbert and Abby remained behind. We figured it'd be a quick in and out, maybe taking an hour or two. We really wanted to chill out for an afternoon today. I hate making plans. They get ruined so fucking often. I should be spontaneous, so when things go right for me, I'm pleasantly surprised. But not meeting my expectations blows. Gavin stayed outside, providing cover. Patty assisted me as we got everything inside and got the few spots in the house that needed reinforcement fixed up. There were a couple of windows in the back of the house we slapped a couple pieces of two-by-four on to make safe, and the large bay window in the living room also had a two-by-four slapped in the front of it. We put it up low in the frame so it would serve almost like a railing might. The dead can't crawl over it, so it was as good as boarding the whole window up. Patty ran out to the HRT to grab the final batch of supplies we planned on leaving behind when I heard a noise from the back of the house. The house itself was sort of shit, like a split-level ranch, but only the back half of the house was on a different level, kind of like you had to take a couple of steps down into the living room and kitchen, but the bedrooms in the front of the house were higher. Does it make any sense at all? Anyway, the noise I heard came from a rear mudroom where the laundry machines were, That was right off the kitchen. I instantly figured a zombie had made its way through cover to the back of the home and was knocking on the door or something. I called out on the radio that I heard contact to the rear of the house, and I advised that I was checking it from the inside. 
I went around the hall and down the couple steps into the kitchen and came to a dead stop right in front of the island when I heard keys jingling. I scanned quickly, and in the faint light of the back door's small window, I saw the outline of a person standing, and I knew as soon as I laid eyes on that silhouette, it was a living person and not a zombie. I was fucking done. Had a cooked goose. Flat-footed and fucked. Freeze right there, asshole! I heard a man's voice call out from the mudroom. So I did. I was thankful the first thing I heard wasn't that last loud gunshot that finished my ass. I literally froze solid with my hand on the M4's grip. Luckily, I had thumbed the safety to semi before going into the kitchen, so I was a tenth of a second away from shooting if need be, but if he had a gun on me already, that still wouldn't have been fast enough. What the fuck are you doing in my house? Stealing my shit, you asshole? Who the fuck are you? As he asked, he came closer. When he stepped out of the dark mudroom, I saw he indeed had a revolver trained on me. He was middle-aged, had long, scraggly hair, and a beard to match. He had dirty clothes on and glasses with one lens cracked. He looked like a hobo. A hobo with a gun on me. I talked as slowly as I could. I'm Adrian. We're checking houses to clear them for the dead. I'm sorry. We thought this home was empty. Yeah, well, we're home now. D drop your gun and all your food and ammo. He said the last part with a stammer. I could tell he had no fucking clue what was happening, no control over the situation, and he was scared as hell. Now, I knew that if I put down my gun and ammo, he'd either kill me or shoo me out, and I'd likely never see it again. I could gamble and see if he'd let me walk out with my handgun and that ammo, but that risked him popping me like a wannabe gangster by accident. I thought all this over and looked at him hard. I think my delayed response made him nervous because he piped up again. Drop the damn gun! He cocked the pistol and leveled it straight at me, dead nuts on my Adam's apple. I didn't have to decide about dropping my M4 or my Glock. Right then, Patty came back in the front door, arms filled with the shit we'd planned on leaving behind, and that was the end of it. The homeowner rotated the gun towards Patty, and I saw the look in his eyes. Wild and afraid. And I knew, as soon as he got that front sight on her, she was going to take one. I brought the muzzle of the M4 up as fast as I could, and nearly simultaneously he and I pulled the trigger. I misfired. He didn't. Anyone who has fired a gun in anger will tell you gunfire is loud as a motherfucker. But the louder sound is pulling that fucking trigger and not hearing that round in the chamber go off, not feeling that buck against your shoulder and not seeing that little flash as the gas escapes the barrel— it's the exact opposite of adrenaline. Stops your heart fucking cold. Someone didn't want Patty to die that day because his shot sailed high and splintered the doorframe about ten inches above her forehead. I can still remember the look of shock on her face. I always will, I think. I'm struggling to type right now, thinking that would have been my last memory of her face had that bullet split her forehead and killed her. I dropped the M4 on the sling and, without missing a beat, threw it around my hip and drew the glock to hip fire. That fucking guy was fast as hell, though, and he leveled back on me just as I drew on him, and this time when we fired, both guns went off. I saw his muzzle flash, and I felt his bullet hit me before I registered that my bullet hit him. Being shot hurts. A fucking lot. I'd compare it to someone getting a good running start and hitting you at full force with a hammer— Granted, my vest kept the bullet from punching into me and scrambling my insides, but it did fuck all from saving me from that motherfucking impact. God damn it, Mr. Journal. Seriously. It hit me just right of center mass, just under the bottom edge of the rib cage, tossed me two feet back and into the fridge like I'd been tackled by a linebacker. I caught the handle on the fridge door right in my spine, too, which was a sharp stab in the asshole that I didn't need. Here's the reason why a heavier caliber is better for people. My Glock is a forty-five APC. It's a heavy, thunderous round with serious impact power. Just getting clipped by the bitch will send most men spinning and tossed to the ground. Hobo took my round to the hip, and he was flung in a circle, losing his revolver in the process, 
and he crashed to the floor. Somehow I stayed on my feet, clutching my side where I was shot, and came around the island to find him scratching at his shirt, trying to get to the bleeding hole in him. I stood there watching as he ripped open his shirt, exposing the leaking dime-sized hole. Once he saw it, he snapped back to reality and looked up at me, almost standing over him. By that point, the radio was going off as Gavin began running inside, and Patty as well had leapt into action. She dropped her shit and was approaching us, AR-15 up, ready to kill the guy on the floor. I could barely see. I had stars in my eyes and was leaning heavily on the island, trying to keep my gun on him. It was clear to me that he knew things were bad for him, and he rolled over and started to crawl back into the mudroom to escape. He cried out in pain, screaming, really. He scratched and clawed to gain purchase, dragging a long throw rug towards him, making no progress forward. That's when I saw the forty-five's exit wound. They go in small, but sure as shit don't come out that way. He had a hole in his back coming out near the spine the size of my fist. He could have pushed a coffee mug in the gap where his body used to be. I could see his perforated, ragged kidney shake like jelly inside him as he tried to get away. That's when I went down. I couldn't breathe for shit, and I think I was hyperventilating, too. Everything went black for a few seconds, and when I came to, Gavin had me propped up against that fridge again, and he was ripping my vest off to check for similar holes in me. I still don't know what happened to the guy. I think Patty or Gavin dragged him out back at some point. I think they killed him, which was the only sensible thing to do at that point. There was no fix in what I did to him. It makes me sad that he had to die. He shot me because he was scared, not because he wanted to kill me. It's easy to kill people who you hate. That's why soldiers demonize their enemy. We can kill who we can hate. Simple as that. Nazis, gooks, nips, japs, hajis, mooj. You name it something bad, and we'll kill it. This guy had no bad name. I didn't hate him, and he didn't deserve to die. He was just scared. I feel rotten tonight, and not just because I took a three fifty seven to the chest. Incidentally, that caliber can go fuck itself sideways with a cactus. I will never forget I got shot with it, and from this point forward, I will probably hold an unreasonable grudge against it and all those who use it. Fuck it, and fuck you all. I just took two Vicodin. I'm on a coherency clock. Obviously, this changes things for me personally. I can't move much especially if it turns out that I've got any broken ribs. I think I might have one that's cracked. The one on the very bottom on the side I was shot on. I need to go see Lisa and have her check me out. No one here can tell me for sure. Best thing is, I'm not coughing up any blood, which means no perforations to the lung. Anyone want lemonade? Just made some. It's fresh. Everyone's all worried, me included. I know they'll be okay with me bedridden for a bit, but... I can feel that I'm going a little mental when I realize that we will fall behind on our already overloaded schedule. I know I can trust them to get shit done, but it still leaves me itchy thinking I can't lend some kind of support. I did not need this, Mr. Journal. Fuck me. Adrian April 29th I'm going to go ahead and admit that driving to Westfield yesterday was likely a mistake on my part. I'm in a world of hurt tonight, and last night it was even worse. I could be clever about it and blame my friends for not stopping me, which sort of sounds like fun. However, I really wanted Lisa to give me a quick once-over to make sure I didn't have internal bleeding or broken ribs from the shot I took to the chest. Other fucking 357s, Mr. Journal. It's on my shit list now. I'm going to punch that caliber in the face. I'm pretty much about to eat pillow here. Yay, painkillers. So I need to keep this short. Yesterday, everyone else rolled out to get that friggin' safe house set up. They left early, set it up fast, and hit another one of those little town properties with fencing all around it strictly to get the fence up and out for use here. I felt like a freeloading bitch when they left. I wasn't helping them because I was hurt, and I wanted to go to Westfield. I took the tundra and drove there as slowly as I could over the last remnants of the frost heaves. No rush, really, so driving fast seems stupid. Even taking my time, I paid the price. I'm in less pain when I'm sitting or standing, so you'd think that being behind the wheel would be a good place to be, but no. 
Fucking bumps caused my chest to compress. Every single flaw in the road is pretty similar to having a mischievous toddler stab me in the ribs with a sharpened number two pencil. Big bumps felt like the toddler was kicking the pencil. Really big bumps sent my vision to that wonderful black place where I see stars and can actually count the seconds off where I can't see where I'm driving or what I'm doing. It's a fucking miracle I didn't wrap my ass around a guardrail or a tree. You can get a freebie on this one, God. One. Lisa and Mike came out to meet me in the parking lot of the school when I told them over the radio I wasn't in much shape to walk. In fact, I chewed a vike right there in the driver's seat while I waited for them. It didn't take long for them to come and get me. In fact, they moved me from the tundra to the back seat of a Humvee and immediately drove me over to their town clinic so Lisa could x-ray me. I was lucid enough on the trip over to the clinic to see that the supposedly empty town of Westfield was not empty anymore. When we were moving about in town over there in the early months of the year, we saw almost no one dead, twenty over the whole winter. I saw at least forty today on the way over and back to the clinic. For some reason, that really bothers me, to the core, even. I think it's because I had this preconceived notion that Westfield was safe, or at least safer, and now it seems it isn't. My illusion is shattered. Maybe I'm overreacting. It isn't like the car barrier at the school there is being tipped over by a war host of the dead. Forty zombies isn't the end of the world. All it really takes is just one. Lisa is not a very good x-ray technician. I don't think she's given more than a handful based on how long it took her to fire the machine up and get me imaged. They managed to get the backup generators at the clinic working, so there's power if they need it there. Go them. They're anticipating one of the pregnant women to fart out a baby literally any moment now, so they're trying to get all their ducks in a row. Looking at it in a positive light, my injury and their response to my arrival was a nice oh-shit practice run for them. X-ray came back negative. No cracked ribs. No internal bleeding. She did say that it looked like the bottom rib was detached slightly, or something to that effect. She said I'd be sore for a week or more, and would have trouble breathing deeply for a long time maybe even a month. Running and heavy lifting was out of the question. I should be excited for a rest, but I'm not. This feels just like being back in the army when I sprained my wrist real bad and couldn't do shit for a few days. The feeling of guilt is unreal over leaving my fellow soldiers behind. It didn't matter how much they told me they were fine and that I wasn't needed and to get better, I still felt like a fucking bliver. Ever heard that expression, Mr. Journal? Bliver? My dad used to say that all the time, and all us kids do too now. He used to tell us a bliver was the technical word for a bucket of shit. For example, you could say, Wow, that farmer is carrying around a bliver. Or even, That girl is so ugly she looks like a bliver. Or even, Dinner tasted like a big old bliver. Feel free to use that one however you choose. Mike refused me when I said I wanted to drive myself home. <laughs> you know what's funny? I can't remember shit about the rest of that visit. Yay, painkillers. I don't remember the drive home either, but I do remember coming home with extra people. Mike and Lisa said because things were shitty over here, we needed labor and help, and they sent me home with an escort. I think this is Mike's way of setting me up for sympathy, pussy. Mike is my herp, a uh, hero. He sent me home with the three girls that I talked to that day I reconned the school looking for vagina. He was also kind enough to stick a note in my holster with their names and basic description, so I didn't look like a fucking dolt. This guy will have a claim to any kids I have at this rate. The names of the girls are Siobhan, Sarah, and Jenna. They are all really thin, fairly pretty, and almost 100% forgettable. In my Vicodin haze, I found all of them lacking on some level. I'm not sure why. I mean, they're all pleasant, but I'm not feeling like going out of my way to bang any of them. Don't get me wrong, if one of them jumped on my cock, I wouldn't ask him to stop. Actually, I might, because that shit could hurt my chest right now. Most anything hurts my chest right now. Even typing that hurt a little bit. The fourth person I came home with was a younger guy named Chris. He's tallish, pretty thick, a little nerdy, and his skin is loose. 
He looked almost deflated now. The girls were saying earlier he used to be huge, like orca fat, and with this whole end-of-the-world thing going on, he's lost all the weight. Once they said that, it made sense. He reminds me of the people from those weight loss shows that lose it too fast and have saggy skin. It's kind of funny as well, because he had glasses originally, had them broken, and now he can't see for shit. He's always squinting. Saving grace, he's damn funny and strong as a motherfucker. Ollie was chummy with him back at the school, and the two of them paired off immediately today to work on the fences. I guess the four folks are here for a few days. I think they said until tomorrow, which makes a few days. Yay, Vicodin. I'm making much sense right now. Taking a break. Yay, naps. Adrian. April 29th, Second Entry A few hours of rest via nap does the brain wonders. I've managed to trade mental clarity for pain, though. Vicodin wears off, and I can think clearly, but then the Vicodin wears off, and now I can't see straight because every little thing I do feels horrible. Pro tip, long movies are awesome when you can't move for shit. I got myself up and moving a minute ago and put the first Lord of the Rings movie in. What's that? Two and a half hours of hobbitlicious entertainment? Score. Up next, Black Hawk Down. Masturbatory high five. That's assuming I don't pass out first, which at best is 50-50. Where was I? Right, the four folks are going back to Westfield tomorrow. The sink day. Clarity for the win. Drama today, though, like a motherfucker. It was drama bukkake all over our faces. It was high school Friday dance right after the most popular cheerleader dumped the starting quarterback drama here. Not just because we are plus four chicks, either. This drama has fuck all to do with our current estrogen levels. I know, weird, right? We were scheduled to meet Blake today, and obviously I wasn't in any shape to go for the meet, so Patty and Gavin went in my stead. Actually, Gilbert went as well, Maybe my clarity isn't as hot as I thought. AFK, Advil. Took me three minutes to move to the side of the bed, get four ibuprofen, take them, then shimmy my way back to position to continue typing. I'm sweating like a Catholic priest in a daycare. Twenty minutes and I'll be good to go. Gilbert visited me earlier for more than an hour and filled me in on the trip to Blake's. He wanted to make sure I heard it straight from the horse's mouth. I guess Blake has arranged the cars around Mike's garage into a defensive pattern not unlike the one at the Westfield School. It's serviceable as a defensive barrier, according to Gilbert. Gilbert also said that Blake has obviously spent a lot of time working on the garage, and he was very skeptical that Blake has actually spent any time observing the farm as we'd asked him to. That caused some friction, especially in light of his report on said farm. According to Gilbert, Blake was agitated during their meeting earlier. Blake said that he's seen the same kids that he originally saw back in the fall. Remember them? The parents apparently traded a daughter and son in to the people at the farm for food or supplies or something. And we theorized that the farm was essentially trading for slave labor. Well... Blake says those kids reappeared the past couple days, and they're working in the field outside. On the surface, based on the information he has supplied, this seems like a fairly minor change in the details. We suspected the kids had been there all along, and confirming that fact doesn't strike Gilbert or I as particularly game-plan changing. Apparently Blake feels otherwise. Gilbert said he was agitated, and based on Gilbert's account of what he said and how he acted— I think that description might be an understatement. Gilbert essentially said that Blake stopped just short of demanding that we take this more seriously. Blake wants us to start putting our own eyes on the farm day in and day out to see what's happening firsthand. Now, based on what he's fed us for info so far, there isn't anything out of the ordinary happening there. Just like Gilbert pointed out when I was all hot and horny to take this place down back when we first learned about it, we haven't heard or seen shit that tells us it's necessary. So far, the evidence says they have a fortified farm that's well guarded, they've traded other people food and supplies, and they took in a pair of kids, and now those kids are working on the farm. Where's the drama? Why the urgency from Blake? 
Furthermore, if he had time to find the keys to or hotwire all the cars around Mike's auto to get them set up, when the fuck was he observing the farm to see all this shit? Doesn't pass the sniff test for Gilbert or me. Fishy, plain and simple. Patty, ever the diplomat, managed to appease him when they showed him all the stuff we got from the auto parts store. I guess he got all kinds of giddy and immediately dropped the subject. Once they unloaded everything into the shop and he took inventory, he put in a new order for the remainder of the shop's contents. I'm not sure whether he was kidding or was serious about that. It doesn't make much sense to risk another run to the store for parts we probably don't need. We're thinking he's getting greedy. Makes sense, right? He's getting all this stuff off of us. Apparently, isn't doing all the work he should be doing to earn it, and we stock his entire garage, more or less. As easy as one, two, three, and it seems like he's not quite appreciating how much effort we've put in to get where we are today. Of course, we're not observing him 24-7 either, and we can't make assumptions like this. There are too many variables in this equation, and I think I've said I suck hardcore at math. Need me to analyze the trajectory of a 700-yard shot? I can figure that out in my head. Figure out all this interpersonal politics or graph a math problem? Might as well ask me to cure cancer. It ain't happening. Something else that struck me as really weird was when Gilbert said that Blake and Gavin were shooting the shit like two old buddies. Last time they met, it was awkward at best, hostile at worst, two young rams butting heads or something like that. It doesn't sit well that things are suddenly all good between the two of them, although weirder shit has happened, and recently, to boot. Maybe they realize that bygones are bygones, and friendship is superior to animosity. I've got a bliver here for you, Mr. Journal, if you think that's the case. Our next meeting with him is on the 3rd of May, and I plan on being there to assess his ass firsthand. If he's sketchy, I'm calling his ass out. And for the record... This whole farm business creeps me out. I got a bad feeling about it. Sleepy time. Adrian. Hi, this is James Foster, and I hope you've enjoyed listening to The Failed Coward, Adrian's Undead Diary, Book 4, Volume 4, written by Chris Philbrook, narrated by James Foster. Copyright 2011 by Chris Philbrook. Production Copyright 2014 by Chris Philbrook Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.